Gears of War Colchins and the Gears of War Timeline. All dates are shown in the modern Saran calendar before emergence or after emergence. 80 Before Emergence A long-running global conflict begins to sweep the world of Sera as the coalition of ordered governments and the union of independent republics fight over emulsion energy resources. This becomes known as the Pendulum Wars. 17 Before Emergence Infantry Lieutenant Victor Hoffman holds the besieged Anvil Gate garrison against Yar forces and makes his name. Adam Phoenix, a weapons physicist, leaves the army to work on his dream of the ultimate deterrent, an orbital laser weapon to end the Pendulum Wars. 9 Before Emergence Adam's wife, Ellen, a biologist, goes missing in the underground caves of Jacinto, leaving him with a young son to care for, Marcus. For before emergence Marcus Phoenix enlists in the COG army against his father Adam's wishes, serving alongside his boyhood friend Carlos Santiago. 3. Before emergence Carlos's younger brother Dominic Dom enlists. 2. Before emergence intelligence reveals the UIR is close to building its own satellite weapons system. A commando raid headed by Hoffman is staged to sabotage the UIR research station at ASFO and seize its data. Carlos Santiago and Major Helena Stroud are killed in the battle. Hoffman, Marcus and Dom are decorated for gallantry. The seized data enables Adam Phoenix to perfect his Hammer of Dawn orbital laser, which eventually brings the UIR to the negotiating table. Six weeks before Emergence Day, the UIR surrenders and the Pendulum Wars are finally at an end, although a handful of small UIR states, including Goris Nea, refuse to accept the armistice and vow to fight on. With no apparent warning or motive, an unknown species of sentient creatures, the Locust Horde, erupts from underground caverns and attacks cities across Sarah simultaneously. A quarter of Sarah's population is slaughtered in the initial attack. E-Day, as it becomes known, is the start of a 15-year war for survival. One after emergence the COG, fighting a losing regard action against the Locust, is driven back to Ephra, the granite plateau where the Locust can't tunnel. In a desperate bid to stop the Locust advance, new COG chairman Richard Prescott orders the destruction of all Sarah's major cities using the Hammer of Dawn. Although civilians are urged to take refuge in Ephra, Few can reach the plateau in time and many millions die in the hammer strikes. Two after emergence the locusts, slowed but not stopped by the global destruction, are back in even greater numbers. The few civilians outside Ephra who survived the hammer strikes band together in gangs, living hand to mouth in the ruins. The stranded, as they call themselves, see the COG as an enemy. Ten after emergence the locusts attack Ephra. Sergeant Marcus Phoenix disobeys Colonel Hoffman's orders and tries to rescue his father, a decision that leads to the fall of Ephra. Adam Phoenix is buried in the rubble of the Phoenix Mansion when the locusts attack, and Marcus faces a court-martial. His death sentence is commuted to forty years in Jacinto's notoriously brutal prison, nicknamed the Slab. Fourteen after emergence the locusts overrun the prison, and the inmates are set free, except Marcus. Dom Santiago rescues him and Marcus rejoins the COG army. Using Adam Phoenix's research notes on the locust tunnels, the COG detonates a light mass bomb underground, but the grubs are back in force a few weeks later. The human population of Sarah has been reduced from billions to a handful, and the last COG bastion, Jacinto, is now under threat. Fourteen after emergence Chairman Prescott plans a final all-out assault on the Locust Warrens by tunneling into their strongholds around Jacinto. The Locust in turn begin their push to take the city. The COG finds that the Locust have been waging an underground war with another aggressive species known as the Lambent, and were forced to the surface by them. Marcus and his fellow Gears find recordings by Adam Phoenix in the Locust Command Center, describing how to flood the tunnels and the COG makes a final, desperate decision to wipe out the advancing locust. Evacuating the city, they deployed the Hammer of Dawn to sink Jacinto and drown the locust forces. Fourteen after emergence the column of refugees moves from place to place evading the few surviving locusts, eventually settling on a remote volcanic island that the locusts never reached, Vex, a former COG naval base. The local population has never seen a grub.
but is plagued by stranded pirate gangs. Forming an unexpected alliance with the last of the Uyars Goris Nayans, the COG newcomers and the islanders drive off stranded pirate gangs and begin to rebuild civilization. Fifteen after emergence the brief peace is shattered when Lambert life forms appear in the seas around Vex, destroying ships and sinking a Goris Nayan emulsion drilling platform, the last remaining source of emulsion fuel. Chairman Prescott is found to have an encrypted data disk, the contents of which he refuses to reveal to Colonel Hoffman. The remnant of the COG is now effectively besieged on Vex, fending off lambent attacks from the sea. Prologue transmission begins. Lambency detected in increasing range of existing life forms, including leviathans and smaller marine creatures. Two previously unknown species now spreading. Ambulant polyps appear to parasitize fast-growing organic structures nicknamed stalks. Polyps self-detonate. Please advise. Data and images to follow. Cog Personnel Phoenix, Santiago, Stroud Unharmed. Transmission ends. Transmission source, unknown. Receiving station, unknown. Boathouse 7 Workshop, Naval Base, New Jacinto, Late Storm. 15A Sam's laughing her ass off. She's been fixing her bike and giggling to herself for a while now, and then she just busts out laughing like someone invisible told her a joke. Now, I get moments like that, too. But it's the hooch. You understand, don't ya? It's been a long, long war. We all cope the best way we can. So I ask her, You gonna share? She's almost crying. She has to set down the wrench while she gets her breath back. Dizzy, have you seen Baird? Yeah, plenty. But he ain't that funny. I mean his new workshop. His private workshop. Can't say I have. He's. She takes a deep breath and tries again. It's. Finally, she screws her eyes shut and takes a run at it. Cause it's the only way she's gonna get it out, I reckon. It's in the old lavatory block. He's set up his kit in one of the stalls and he's using the crapper for a seat. I saw him. That does it. She's bent right over and I can't hear anything now except wheezy gulps of air, but eventually she straightens up and there's tears running down her face. Damn, it's a nice thing to see someone laugh like that. However bad things get, and shit, they're bad right now, some folks can still see the funny side of life. See, if you don't concentrate on the good stuff, you go crazy. You gotta laugh, or you gotta love, or you gotta drink. That's how you get through the day when you've been at war for as long as anyone can remember. The one thing you just can't do is look it in the eye and see just what a goddamn mess we're in, or else you end up like Hoffman. Or Marcus. Both of them with the weight of the world on their shoulders, and a lot older than either of them needs to be. But... Lord Almighty know it all Corporal Damon S. Baird sitting on the john, all full of piss and importance. This I gotta see. I'd better go take a look. He's out on patrol this morning. Sam says. I'll take you over there tonight. We'll grab a camera from Barber and stalk him. Record the moment for posterity. She starts giggling again. Caption contest. Baird, full of shit. Ah, uh, so many jokes, so little time. What's he doing, then? What's so secret? No idea. I think Hoffman's given him something to fix. She winks. But he spends a lot of time tinkering with that bot, too. I think they want to be alone. She's laughed herself out now, so she carries on working on her bike. But I can see she's still thinking about Baird sat on his porcelain throne because every so often I catch her grinning to herself. Sometimes I'm glad he's such a tosser. She says, I need an outlet, you know? A focus for my negative side. Like that thing they have on ship's hulls. She gestures with the wrench, frowning like she's forgotten the word. Come on, Diz, what's it called? You were in the merchant navy. You know what I mean. A sacrifice block? That's it. It takes the hit, and stops the other metal getting corroded. Exactly. That's it. Baird's my sacrifice block. She laughs and gets back to work. The world ain't funny at all, truth to tell. 
We've run and run for fifteen years, and now we've painted our asses into a corner. This island's just about the last nice place left on Sarah because the locusts couldn't tunnel this far out into the Serrano Ocean. But the Lambent, those assholes found us. They're worse than those goddamn grubs, believe me, and now they're here, right on our coast, blowing up our boats. They detonate, see? Walking bombs. They come in all shapes and sizes, crab things called polyps, tree things called stalks, even whale's eyes things and buttedly eels, and they got this weird glow about em kinda like jellyfish. That was why the grubs came out of their tunnels and started killing us. The glowies was down there killing them. Well, that's one mystery solved, anyhow, even if we still don't know squat about the glowies. And now we got nowhere left to run. Damn shame. It's a real pretty island. I thought it'd be a good place for my girls to grow up safe, but all I'd done was drag em somewhere else even more dangerous. Maybe we should've stayed stranded. You can hide better. You're just a little rat in a sewer. Nobody knows you're there. Anyway, it's all quiet again, for the moment. I'm changing Betty's gearbox fluid. The old girl's showing her age. It's tough to find parts for grindlift rigs, so Baird helps me make him. He ain't so bad, really. As long as I keep his mind on the nuts and bolts, he forgets that he thinks I'm a bum. So anyway, I'm under Betty, draining her reservoir, and I hear the doors open. I see Boots walk by and I hear Colonel Hoffman say, Sam, you got five minutes? Yes, sir, she says, and the two of them wander outside. She's gone for some time, maybe half an hour. By the time she comes back, I'm working on Betty's electrics, so I can see Sam's face as soon as she walks in. She don't look so happy now. What did Hoffman want? I ask. The colonel's real strung out at the moment. It's the latest polyp attack. It started him fretting over Anvil Gate again, just when he ought to be forgetting it. Everything okay? He finally told me how my dad got killed. Sam sort of shakes her head. He thought it was time I knew. All this polyp siege shits brought it back to him. The siege of Anvil Gate was more than thirty years ago, way back in the Pendulum Wars, when we didn't even know what a grub or a glowy was. Hoffman's taken his own sweet time with that. It ain't like him to be so squeamish. Sam's named after her old man. He never lived to see her born. Damn, that just breaks my heart. You wanna talk about it, Sam? It was quick. I can see she's hurting. But Dad decided to stay. And then she just stops. I got daughters. I can handle this. Sorry, sweetie. I don't understand. He stayed to defend the fort. She says, picking up the wrench again like she needs something to take her mind off the news. Hoffman said Dad had the chance to leave Anvil Gate when they evacuated the civvies. He could have left with my mother. But Hoffman said he wouldn't leave his platoon behind. Now most folks would call that a hero. Damn right, a man who stands his ground for his buddies, that's a hero. The best man you can be. But I can tell Sam don't agree with that. Gear or not, she's still a little girl who never knew her daddy. I gotta pick my words real careful now. Must have been a tough call for him, Sam. She nods and starts working on the bike again. But her mind ain't on it. She's just going through the motions, working a plug this way and that without really moving it. I hate myself, she says at last. All I could think at first was that he left me and mum to stay with his mates. But I'm a gear. I know it's not that simple. No, it ain't, and it ain't simple being a dad, either. I didn't exactly choose to join the army, see? I got drafted Operation Lifeboat, Prescott's smart-ass idea to turn stranded bums like me into gears. You do your bit, and the government gives your family food and medicine. I let the COG press gang me to save my little girls. You'd be amazed what a fellow will do for his kids. Your dad must have been real scared that you and your mom wouldn't make it if he let the Indies win. I say at last. Like I was real scared my girls would die if I didn't join the COG. Hardest goddamn thing I ever did. I didn't know Sergeant Samuel Byrne, but Colonel Hoffman says he was a good man. 
That's word enough for me. I'm just telling Sam, Samantha Byrne, the truth as I see it. She looks up at me, eyes kinda glassy. You know what I like about her? She ain't afraid to admit what she's feeling. Tough don't mean keeping it all bottled up. I hope she's getting somewhere with Dom, poor bastard still grieving, because they'd fit real well together. It'd do em both the power of good. Thanks, Diz, she says. I'll be okay. You can look at it a couple of ways. Either Sam's dad stayed at his post, or else he abandoned his family. I don't know why Sam's dad chose to stay and die. He had a whole lot of reasons, I reckon. Some of them wouldn't make a speck of sense to anyone who wasn't there, so they can just shut their mouths until they're in the same shit and have to make the call. But I know Gears will die for their buddies. And I know that I'd do anything to make sure my girls grow up, even if I'm not there to see it. Because that's what good fathers do. And your kids might not always love you for doing what's best for them, but that goes with the territory. The right thing ain't always the popular thing for a fella to do. You just gotta hope that one day they all understand what we had to do to survive. Chapter 1 So how many different varieties do those friggin' glowies come in? King Raven KR-80 on patrol over Northern Vex, 10 days after the initial lambent landing, Storm, 15A. E. Damon Baird tried to recall exactly how he'd felt on E-Day when he saw his first grub. He remembered the detail but not much of the emotion that went with it. But he guessed it had been pretty much like he felt now, a churning gut, a tight scalp, and a hardwired animal reflex to run or fight. He didn't know why these stalks looked different from the others, or what those big red blisters were doing on their trunks, but he knew at an instinctive level that he either had to blow the shit out of them or run like hell. Being twenty meters off the ground in a hovering raven ruled out making a run for it. He sighted up on the nearest blister instead. Control, this is KR-80, contact in grid Echo 5. Get in a repeated, like she was explaining it to the thickest kid in the class. Major stock incursion. Three of the bastards have just erupted. I know Delta Squad's a regular mini-army, but we could still do with some help. Matheson's voice never rose above flat calm, no matter how much shit hit the fan. I heard you, 80, but Echo 5 is inland. Please confirm your position. I know it's damn well inland, Matheson. That's why it's significant, and why we'd like a little backup. They shouldn't be here. How many polyps? None. Yet. Understood, Major. Stand by. Baird adjusted his aim again. Gittiner was a charmlessly acid bitch, but she was right. The stalks, the monstrous tree-like growths they'd first encountered only weeks ago, should have been a long way out to sea. No. We got that wrong. They're here, and that means they've found a way to come up through granite. This place was supposed to be safe. Yeah, like Ephra. Like Jacinto. Why do I always believe that crap? The stalks had already sunk a warship, an emulsion drilling platform, and any number of small boats. Maybe busting up through igneous rock was all in a day's work for them. Phoenix, I can't hold this bird here all day, Gedina said. Those things had better shit or get off the pot. Yeah, I'll pass that on, Major. Marcus stared down the sights of the door gun while Nat Barber, Gedina's crew chief, took recon images. How long has it been now? Two minutes, she said. Give him ten. Okay. Talk among yourselves, kids. I'll just waste some more of our extremely limited fuel. This wasn't the way it was supposed to be. Stalks erupted in seconds, and then the polyps, evil little shits, all legs and fangs, poured off them like giant homicidal crabs and blew up in your damn face. But there was no sign of them. The stalks just stood there, glowing and waiting. I've never seen blisters on stalks before. The more Baird looked, the more he could see a cross on the membrane, almost dividing it into quadrants. Okay, what the fuck are those things? He asked, more for the comfort of hearing his own voice than to get an answer. The blisters, I mean. Answers on a postcard, please. Dom Santiago shrugged. Seed pods. 
That makes me feel so much better. Well, you asked? Dom looked over his shoulder. Hey, Cole Train? That remind you of anything? Yeah, Cole said. Everyone, six gears and a dog, was jostling for position on the edge of the crew bay, trying to get a clear shot for when the inevitable polyp spatterfest kicked off. Those weeds you get on old construction sites. The ones with those big seed heads that go off with a bang. Man, I used to laugh my ass off playing with those as a kid. Me too, Dom said. Don't tell me you never popped them to see how far the seeds would shoot, Baird. Baird was reminded of his solitary, miserable childhood again. He was a rich kid from a founding family. He didn't have adventures in forbidden places. He had extra lessons. I never played on construction sites, he said, feigning disdain but wishing he'd climbed over a keep-out sign just once in his youth. Dear Mama would send the butler to do that shit for me. The bitch. Dom turned to Bernie Mataki. What about you, Sarge? We didn't have them on the South Islands. Construction sites? No, that kind of plant. Marcus was hunched over the door gun, scowling at the stalks. Efren Balsam, he said. Oh, so he knew what Dom meant, too. Gunweed. Glandulifera Ephirica. Marcus Phoenix had never played on any damn building site, Baird was sure of that. His family, no, his dynasty, was even richer than Baird's. The Bairds had a few nice paintings and a gated mansion. The Phoenixes had a walled estate and more priceless art treasures than the frigging National Museum of Ephira. And now nobody had anything. The grubs believed in equality, at least. Oh, yeah, I forgot, Baird said. You and Dom, carefree childhood buddies, yada yada yada. My mom, Marcus growled, used to take me for walks around the hollow. My mom the biologist. Dom gave Baird a discreet jab with his elbow. Just zip it, Baird. He said it in a weary voice barely audible over the noise of the raven even on the radio link. So Marcus had lost his folks, big deal. Everyone else had, too, and Baird didn't think the how and the when of it made much difference now. But he shut up anyway. He kept his eyes on the blisters as the raven hovered level with the tops of the branches, feeling the air buffeting and drying his eyes. He didn't dare look away to put on his goggles. Mac the asshole hound squeezed his head between Baird's leg and Dom as if he was keeping an eye on the stalks too. Five minutes. Six. And still nobody said a word. Then the blister that Baird was focused on suddenly stopped throbbing. Whoa, heads up. Here it comes. Baird's finger tightened on the lancer's trigger. Any second now. Steady, people, Marcus said. Make every round count. Then the blisters stopped pulsing, all of them, all at once. The red glowing patches dimmed like cooling embers and turned a dull gray. It was hard to define, but Baird felt he was watching something set hard like concrete, all the life draining out of it. I think the show's over, baby, Cole said. Hell, I want my money back. I paid to see glowy crabs. Get in her back the raven away from the stalks climbing ten meters to do a slow loop above the branches. Okay, I'm setting down, she said. They look dead to me. You sure? Baird asked. You're the glowy expert. You've sawed up a dead stalk. Can't you tell? Baird shrugged. Nobody knew enough about the lambent yet, not even him. I have trust issues. Especially when it comes to glowies. So where were the polyps? His best guess was that they didn't emerge from stalks but with them, just like they turned up with lamb and leviathans. It wasn't a comforting thought either way. It was just a missing piece of a jigsaw puzzle, and Bear didn't like uncertainty. Gidina landed in the open field a good fifty meters away from the stalks, so maybe she was having second thoughts. Okay. Let's get this over with. Mac rumbled deep in his throat, eyes fixed on the gnarled trunks. Bernie bent down to talk to him. The mutt was nearly hip height, a leggy, scruffy deer hound thing with a gray wiry coat and a mournful thousand yard stare. He was still peppered with small burns from his last skirmish with the polyps. No glowies, sweetie, 
Bernie said. It's okay. No nasty polyps. He's got some scores to settle, Baird said. Haven't we all? She jumped down and wound Max's leash tight around her hand. Well, at least we get to examine the things properly now. Marcus led the slow walk across to the stocks with the caution usually reserved for an unexploded bomb. I'm counting on the dog, he said. Animals sense all this shit long before we do. Baird gave Mac a wide berth. He might have looked lovable and slobbery now, but Baird had seen him nearly rip a guy's scalp off. The locals trained their dogs to run loose and attack stranded raiding parties. Baird didn't have a problem with that, seeing as most of the stranded gangs were vermin who only came to vex for a spot of rape and pillage. He just didn't want to test how good the dog's asshole recognition skills were. Dumb walked up to the first stock and wrapped his knuckles against the rock-hard trunk. They look like weathered stone. Yeah. If Baird hadn't seen the stalks erupt from the soil he'd have been willing to believe they'd been there for centuries. There was no sign that they'd ever been alive. Or petrified wood. Marcus looked down the trunk. Wonder what it uses for roots. Look, this is a volcanic island, Baird said. We should be safe here. If this place is grub-proof, why isn't it glowy-proof? Yeah, good point. To Baird's ears, that was as good as a medal. Marcus wasn't big on praise. At least we can find out more about these things now they're not growing in a hundred meters of water. Marcus paused and pressed his finger to his earpiece, listening to some incoming message. He shut his eyes for a couple of seconds, a sure sign that the news pissed him off. Yeah, I hear you, Colonel, he said. No, we found the dog. Yeah, Bernie's fine. What is he now, a goddamn geologist? Okay, we'll secure the area and wait until you show. Phoenix out. Bernie looked at Marcus, jaw clenched, doing that sergeant-to-sergeant -sergeant telepathy thing. Baird watched, fascinated. Oh, she said ominously. Marcus pulled off his do-rag for a moment and scratched his scalp, showing a lot more gray in his black hair than Baird remembered. It was rare and weird to see him bareheaded. Somehow just removing a scrap of faded black cloth made him look human and vulnerable, not a hairy-assed war hero at all. Hoffman's bitching that you didn't tell him you were off camp, Marcus said, reading the durag. And the chairman's coming to take a look for himself. That was all they needed, a royal visit from Prescott. Is he bored or something? Baird said. Cause if he is, there's got to be some latrine that needs digging. Just humor him, Baird. Marcus might have meant Hoffman, come to that. He's sending Dizzy to uproot one of these things for analysis, wherever the hell he thinks we're going to get that. Bernie slipped off Max's leash and let him sniff around. That'll be you, Blondie. You're the nearest thing we've got to a scientist these days. She tapped Baird's chest plate. Just don't lose that bloody disc. It's all Hoffman goes on about. Baird never forgot about the day to disc. He kept it tucked inside his armor. He slept with it under his mattress. He even kept it within arm's reach when he took a shower. Hoffman was counting on him to decrypt the thing and his technical honor depended on it. Wow, you two have some really boring pillow talk, Granny, he said, pulling it out to waft it under her nose. But it's kind of hard to look Prescott in the eye. I think he knows I've got it. Mac barked a couple of times. Bernie turned to see where he was. And what's he going to do about it? Wrestle you to the ground and take it off you? She set off to see what the dog was yapping about. Actually, I'd pay good money to see that. Cole ambled over to Baird and gave the stock an experimental prod with his boot. Weird shit, baby. Yeah, the whole frigging world's made of weird these days. Mac kept barking. Cole looked past Baird and frowned into the distance. I ain't a dog expert, he said, but Max the silent and deadly kind of puppy. He don't usually bark. Marcus and Dom turned around at the same time. Bernie had caught up with Mac and was watching him cast around with his nose buried in the grass as if he was picking up a scent. Bernie slipped her rifle off her back and gestured to Marcus to come over. I don't think he's found a bone. 
Baird said. A herd of cows was watching from the next field, heads poking over the low hedge. Then they all wheeled around and cantered away as if something had spooked them. Max started growling, eyes fixed on a spot on the ground. Baird braced for the worst. Mac pawed the grass, still growling, then began digging frantically. But Bernie yanked him back by his collar. I think we should get airborne again, Marcus said. But Baird couldn't feel any vibration under his boots. Back in old Jacinto, that was the first warning of a grub emergence hole opening up. He was about to point that out to Marcus when Mac broke free of Bernie's grip. The pasture around them heaved and cracked open like an earthquake, and Baird realized they were further from the waiting raven than he'd first thought. A huge charcoal gray trunk erupted ten meters away, speckled with red luminescence. Baird caught a face full of wet soil flung out by the sheer force of the emergence. He ducked his head, pure reflex, and that was when he saw the flurry of legs coming up over the edge of a crater like a spider crawling out of a plow hole. Polyps! Dom yelled. Yeah, the little assholes had finally decided to show up. But at least Baird had answered one question now. They came with the stalks. Not out of them. Polyp emergence hole, northern vex. It was tough to say which kind of lambent, or locust was the worst. But Dom had his personal freakout league table, and polyps had taken the top slot from locust tickers. They were landmines, walking, running, hunting landmines. They were small fry compared to a berserker, but they swarmed. They scuttled. And that hit a primal nerve deep within him. All those fast-moving legs and the sea of fanged mouths were an unstoppable tide of destruction sweeping in to devour him. It was hard to hold his ground and fight the urge to run. But if he turned, they'd overwhelm him, and he'd be dead. Some days he wasn't sure if that mattered, not now that Maria and the kids were gone, but today it felt like it mattered a lot. The creatures surged up from the gaping pit around the stalk, rushing out in all directions like milk boiling over the sides of a pan. All Dom could take in was the mass of dark gray legs. The first polyp he had detonated in a spray of greasy guts and took out a couple of its buddies as well, but the others kept coming as if nothing had happened. Maybe they were buoyed up on adrenaline and instinct, just like him. The only thing he could focus on was a ninety-degree cone of the wave coming straight at him so that was where he emptied his clip, sweeping left to right and back again, ears ringing from explosions and automatic fire. Then the deafening noise of a raven drowned out everything. It's downdraft through leaves and grit in his face. Gedina yelled over the radio even though she didn't need to. Get out of there! Delta! Just get the hell out and let Barbara hose them. Can't, Marcus panted. Try not to hit us. Shit, Marcus, there's maybe a hundred of. Kittenus' voice was silenced for a moment by the rattle of the raven's door gun right over Dom's head. Polyp spatter and mud rained on him, peppering his face with sharp fragments. They're splitting up. They're breaking away. Track them, Marcus snapped. Go on, get after them. Gidden ignored him. You sergeant. Me major. I'm staying. Dom reloaded without looking. If he glanced away from the front rank of polyps, they'd be on him and he'd lose his legs or worse. He just had to keep firing. He was aware of Baird and Cole just in front of him to the right, but beyond that everything was a blur with only the jagged legs and fanged mouths of the polyps in ultra-sharp focus. So he aimed, and he fired, and kept firing until he emptied the clip. He could hear his own ragged breaths. It felt like the oncoming wave was never going to end. Every time he hit a polyp, two more popped up. How many? He yelled to Baird. How many did she say? I estimate a metric fuckton. Baird swapped out an ammo clip. Stop me if I'm getting too technical. From one stock? Don't worry about the math, Dom. Cole pulled out a grenade and drew back his arm, ready to swing it. Just frag the bitches. Dom saw the grenade arc out into the polyps and sink in the sea of thrashing legs. There was no sound, just a blinding white light that engulfed him and left a neon afterimage on the sky. 
It took him a few seconds to realize he was flat on his back under a rain of mud, winded and gasping, still firing his lancer into the air. Gotta get up. Polyps. Gotta get up. Once I'm down I'm dead. Oh shit. Dom scrambled to his knees and spat out soil. For a moment there was nothing, no noise, no movement, no pain, just an awareness that he was caked in mud and not able to stand. Is it over? Is it? Then someone grabbed the back of his collar and hauled him up. Whoa, maybe I didn't judge that right, Cole said in his ear. He sounded like he was underwater. Sorry, baby. You okay? Cause the crab fuckers ain't. Baird appeared from nowhere and stared into Dom's face, frowning. Yeah, Cole throws like a girl these days. How many geniuses can you see? None. Dom said. It wasn't the first blast he'd been too close to. Now he knew it wasn't going to be his last. That's A terrific. kind of shaky anger Two took would over. mean concussion. Just one asshole. Which would be bad. Dom managed to look up and make some sense of what was happening. He couldn't see any polyps now, and judging by the way Marcus was searching from side to side in the grass, he'd lost sight of them too. The field was churned up. A trail of craters led into the long grass. Did we get them all? Dom called. You okay, Dom? Yeah, fine. I said, did we get them all? No. Two packs split off. Marcus turned around, covered in polyp spatter. He wiped his face with the back of his hand before pressing his earpiece. Eight zero, we're clear here. Can you see the rest? I'm following one, Gedina said. Hard to tell what's downdraft and what's actual movement in the grass. I'll take the other pack on foot. Phoenix out. Where's Boomer Lady? Cole asked. Wherever the dog is. He's gone after the polyps. Marcus turned to jog away. I'll catch up with her. You stay here and wait for Hoffman. Cole spread his arms in exasperation. He felt obliged to keep an eye on Bernie, even though she really didn't need it. Baird slapped him on the back. Come on, Granny's indestructible, he said. Look what she survived. Two wars. God knows how many fights with grubs and stranded. Roadside bombs. Oh, and she eats cats, for fuck's sake. If that hasn't killed her, nothing will. She's sixty, Cole said defensively. And it's starting to show, even if she don't accept it. Baird put on his couldn't-give-a-damn face, which Dom knew was an act, and knelt on the edge of a crater to inspect it. Dom could hear Gedinus Raven circling the fields on a search pattern, fading in and out as she changed direction. At least he knew his hearing wasn't permanently damaged. But if he had a few more close calls like that, he'd be the one they'd scrape up in a bucket, not Bernie. What can you see? Dom called. Sweet F.A. Baird had his head down the crater. I can't tell if this is a hole they came out of, or a hole we made fragging them. Cole ruffled Dom's hair apologetically with a huge hand. You sure you're okay? You look pretty spacey. I'm all right. I see that nobody's asking how I am, Baird said. Oh, sure. You turn glowy yet, Baird? Cole had a knack of bursting Baird's anxiety bubble. One of those bitches skewered your leg and you ain't griped about it for days. That ain't normal for you. Baird was convinced Glowy's had some kind of infection and that he might have caught it. They'd seen Glowy grubs, bromax, and leviathans, so the idea of a Glowy Baird wasn't unreasonable, just disturbing. Baird knelt back on his heels and prodded his ankle as if he was testing it. I check, Cole, he said. Trust me, I check. Every day. In the dark. Cole chuckled. Yeah, I wondered what you was doing in the closet, all on your own. Hey, I can hear another raven. Now everybody smile and play nice for Prescott, okay? Mel Sorotki's voice broke into the comms channel. This is KR239, we have a visual on you. Interesting crop you've grown there. Can't wait to see your roses. Ooh, thanks for joining us, Lieutenant. Baird made his usual pft of contempt. Did you stop for directions? All complaints in writing to the chairman Baird. 
And gosh, here he is. A couple of fields away, the sound of a machine gun followed by a firecracker sequence of detonations was loud enough to get Dom's attention. Gideners found her glowies. Cole said, See, Dom, there's always a silver linen. When you hit those bitches, you know they ain't gonna come back and fight another day. And you can see the assholes in the dark. Didn't help the locusts much, though, did it? Baird said. Siraki's raven dipped low over the pasture and circled the first batch of stalks before setting down. Hoffman jumped out of the raven and headed Dom's way with a determined stride. Victor Hoffman had been Dom's CO in his commando days, way back in the Pendulum Wars. Dom still found it hard to think of the old man as the chief of the defense staff. Cities had burned and sunk, most of the world's population was dead and the mighty C.O.G. was now just a town of refugees with a fancy flag and a few ships. But Colonel Hoffman still remained, the last senior officer left standing. He was a rare fixed point in Dom's life. Anyone injured? Hoffman asked. God damn, Dom, you look like hell. I look better than the polyps do now, sir. Where's everyone? They went after Mac to get the stragglers, Dom said. Don't worry. Bernie's okay. Hoffman made an unconvincing attempt to look more interested in the stocks. She damn well better be. If you want to go find her, sir, I can stall Prescott. Dom had always been fond of Hoffman, but he really felt for the poor old bastard these days. He was widowed and he blamed himself for it. Dom knew that pain all too well. But Hoffman had eventually taken the risk of another relationship and Dom knew that was something he'd never do. Thanks, Dom, Hoffman said at last. But it's easier for all of us if I keep an eye on the chairman. He clambered over the churned soil to inspect one of the blisters, now just a rock-hard gray bulge with a mark on it like cross wires. How the hell did these bastards get inland? Dom could still hear the occasional crack of an exploding polyp in the distance as he watched Prescott Emble across the field stopping to prod at the grass around the stalks. In his low-cloth jacket and muddy boots, he looked more like a country squire inspecting his crops. It wasn't a casual inspection, though. Dom felt he knew Prescott well enough by now to spot the difference between Prescott going through the motions and Prescott on a mission, and this was a very focused Prescott indeed. He squatted to pick something up and examine it in his palm. Then he pulled out a scrap of paper and carefully wrapped it. What's he doing? Baird asked. You still think he'd tell me? Hoffman muttered, giving Prescott the hairy eyeball, as Sam called it. It was a look of pure suspicious venom, eyes narrowed and lips pressed into a tight and unforgiving line. Don't get me started, Corporal. This was the war within the war, Prescott versus Hoffman. Dom had taken sides and there was never any question that he would stick by his old boss until the bitter end. What kind of head of state still kept secrets from his right-hand man, from the head of his armed forces, when the whole world was going to ratchet around them? Prescott did. And whatever his last remaining secrets were, they were on the data disk that Baird was incubating in his shirt like a demented hen. It was hard to have any conversation with Prescott these days without wanting to grab the asshole's collar and shake the truth out of him, whatever it was. Only the prospect of more lambent stalks finding their way ashore distracted Dom from doing exactly that. Prescott walked up to them with that look that said he expected their undivided attention. He was clutching something else in his hand now, and he held it up to the light between his thumb and forefinger like a diamond. It looked like a finger-length thorn attached to a chunk of polyp shell. Gentlemen, he said, but when he looked away from his prize he was staring straight at Baird. Have you noticed anything new about the polyps? We're still cataloging all the nifty new features on the stocks, Chairman, Baird said. But stick it on our list and we'll get around to it. Spines. The things have grown spines, Corporal. Prescott handed it to him as if he hadn't even heard the back chat. Dom peered over Baird's shoulder and saw it was a sharp spur made of the same stuff as a polyp carapace, thick green-gray shell. I think they might be evolving. Three kilometers from the stock site. Bernie caught up with Marcus in a field of oilseed and tried not to look old and out of breath. 
The crop was in flower, a hazy carpet of brilliant saffron with a sickly perfume that hung over it like incense. Marcus waded through it waist-deep, calling for Mac. He's in there somewhere, Bernie panted. Her head was starting to ache from the intensity of the smell. He'll let us know when he finds something. Maybe they self-destruct if they don't find a target in time. Maybe they don't, she said. Maybe they pair off and start making more bloody polyp babies. Marcus turned around and caught her staring at him. Okay. We'll assume the worst. He searched between the rows of plants, pushing the foliage aside with his lancer. Mac? Mac. Bernie took advantage of the brief respite to get her breath back and listened for sounds of movement. You never had a dog when you were a kid, did you? No. Marcus, effortlessly competent in most things, seemed a little put out by failing to master dog training in minutes. So he's not too traumatized to chase polyps. You've seen him in action, she said. He's trained to inflict damage. If something hurts him, it just makes him more aggressive. The distant rumble of a tractor made her look around but she couldn't tell if it was in the field or not. It could have been a farmer completely oblivious of the morning's drama and just going about his business, or someone out on the road, heading to find out what all the helicopters and explosions were about. She picked her way between the rows of oilseed, trying not to trample the crop. Mac! She put her fingers between her lips and whistled. Mac! Come! Marcus started moving again, taking slow, deliberate paces. The polyps hadn't run away before. If they'd learned to stalk their prey. No, it didn't bear thinking about. We don't even know if the bloody stalks are coming up in places where we can't even see them. And nobody knew if this was just an infestation they could live with, or the beginning of the end. It was hard to know how much panic to invest in all this. Bernie could hear Marcus's breathing in her earpiece, getting more shallow and rapid as he moved deeper into the scented yellow sea. She kept him in her peripheral vision just in case the radio went down. The tractor noise was growing louder as if it was heading in their direction, but Bernie still couldn't see it. The dips in the field were deep enough to hide an approaching vehicle. That meant she probably wouldn't spot a bunch of polyps until they were right underneath her. It was like crossing a minefield. She moved her gaze up and down from the horizon to the ground a few meters ahead of her as she walked, looking for movement in the crops. The best she could do was listen for rustling and hope she got a few seconds warning. Suddenly Marcus stopped. Hold it! He aimed his rifle into the oil seed, stepping back out of the crop onto the strip of bare ground at the end of the furrows. The only thing Bernie could hear now was the puttering of the tractor. Then the plants shivered. She aimed automatically. A polyp scuttled out of the oil seed and Marcus opened fire, detonating the thing so close to his boots that he almost lost his balance. Bernie swung around to cover him, expecting more polyps to follow. If there was one, the others wouldn't be far away. We're going to be doing this every frigging day, Marcus said, wiping a gobbet of polyp flesh off his chest plate. That's going to suck up a lot of resources. The tractor noise sounded like it was heading toward them now, but Bernie was too busy listening for polyp movement to worry about it. There was more rustling. She moved into position to face it head on. You don't scare me, you little bastards. I've killed plenty of your mates. Come on. Come and get it. Come and get it for all the gears you've crippled. Marcus spun around. God damn! Bernie almost opened fire but the gray shape that shot out of cover wasn't a polyp. Marcus lowered his rifle and stepped back. It was just Mac, panting and excited. He cowered as if he was expecting a good hiding, but Marcus looked as wary of the dog as the dog did of him. You naughty little bugger. Don't you scare your mum like that again. Bernie grabbed Mac's collar with relief and put the leash on, letting him lead her back into the crops. You don't like dogs much, do you, Marcus? Not a matter of liking or not liking, Marcus said. Habit. You going to tell me? Marcus was a few meters ahead with his back to her now. She saw the slight roll of his head as if he was debating whether to answer or not. 
prison, he said at last. Bernie didn't need him to say any more. He was never going to talk about his four years in the slab, but maybe that was just as well. She had a pretty good imagination when it came to human excesses. She wasn't sure if she wanted to find that the bottom of the barrel went a lot deeper than she thought. The tractor sounded close now. He's coming to find out what the hell we're doing to his crop, she said. I thought they all stayed in touch by radio. Can't expect them to monitor all the channels. Better warn him off before he hits a polyp then. He won't know they're on the loose. Mac was still pulling like a train, following what Bernie hoped was a polyp trail. Marcus jogged toward the crest of the slope to get a better vantage point. He seemed to have forgotten that he could run into a polyp any time, but that was Marcus all over. Once he realized someone was in the shit, that reflex to save the world kicked in and he lost all sense of his own vulnerability. Just like Mac. Head first, defend the pack, bugger the risk. Marcus, slow down a bit, will you? Bernie called. It's okay. I see him. What, the tractor? Marcus! He reached the top of the slope and raised both arms as if he was flagging someone down. Bernie broke into a trot and tried to steer Mac the same way. Hey! Stay in the cab! Marcus was yelling to get the driver's attention. No, stay in the cab! Polyps! Bernie drew level with him and looked down the slope. A small tractor with a disc harrow had come to a halt on a track through the center of the field. Maybe the driver couldn't hear, because he leaned out of the cab and shouted a reply that was lost on the breeze. Marcus motioned him to stay put again, holding both palms up. Stay there, we're coming over. Marcus started jogging down the slope. The tractor driver settled back in his seat and waited. Good. He's got it. Bernie was wondering if the man even knew what a polyp looked like when she saw him look down from the tractor's high cab. He stared at the ground for a moment. Then he jumped up, or at least he stood up as far as he could inside the vehicle's plastic canopy. Max started barking. Polyps! Marcus took off at a sprint. Bernie followed without thinking. She could see the things now, four or five of them clambering up the tires and onto the hood. They're all over the goddamn tractor. The look on the farmer's face said it all. The poor bastard couldn't even run for it. He'd stayed put like he'd been told, and now he was trapped. He screamed and tried to bat off the polyps with his bare hands, and Bernie couldn't do a bloody thing for him. Marcus squeezed off a burst as he ran and took out two polyps, crazing the windshield, but it was too late. The cab lit up with a blast, rocking the tractor on its suspension. The driver stopped screaming. Shit! Bernie ran down the slope. Mac pulled free and raced ahead of her, heading for the remaining polyp. Mac, no! Leave it! Leave! She expected to see him blown to pieces. But he canonied into the polyp at full speed, head down like a charging bull, and sent it tumbling down the track for a couple of meters before it detonated. It took Bernie twenty long seconds to reach the vehicle. Marcus was already on the radio to get in her. Phoenix to KR80, we've got a fatality. 80 here. Mataki's down? Negative. She's okay. It's a civilian. Bernie climbed up on the tractor to check the driver. He was a mess. His legs were so badly shredded she couldn't actually see their outline, and he wasn't breathing but when she touched his shoulder he slumped back and blood spurted over her. Arterial blood, under pressure. Oh fuck. He's still alive. She called. Marcus, give me a hand. Quick. Did you get that, 80? Marcus climbed into the cab from the other side. We need a case vac. Move it. When Bernie saw that much blood then drill kicked in unbidden, an autopilot that didn't care how scared or nauseated she was. It simply took control of her hands because she'd done this too many times before. Upper leg wounds were a bastard to deal with. She had a minute to stop the bleeding, maybe only seconds by now because the man was already unconscious. Marcus pressed his fist hard into the driver's groin to pinch the artery closed, 
but it didn't make much difference. The blood seemed to be coming from everywhere at once. The two of them worked in desperate silence, fighting a losing battle against the pumping blood. I can't stop it, Marcus said at last. Bernie wondered if he saw Carlos every time he dealt with terrible injuries. He's bleeding from too many places. I've seen Gears survive worse. But that was when there'd been field hospitals with proper drugs and the best equipment, and that time was long gone. Bernie was just going through the motions because Drill told her not to stop until it was really, completely over. Marcus still had his fist pressed into the artery when the raven landed. Bernie couldn't feel a pulse. Barbara ran up to them hauling a gurney. I think we've lost him. She looked at Marcus and they seemed to reach a silent agreement to let go. She found she was clutching a bunch of rags heavy with blood. The locals are going to have our guts for garters. Barbara peered into the tractor, then looked away for a second. Just as well. Even Doc Heyman couldn't fix that. He took a breath. Come on, let's move him. I bet he didn't imagine his working day would end like this. Have we got an ID? Not yet. Okay, I'll just give Lieutenant Stroud the location and leave her to do the N.O.K. -okay. Sometimes death was so universally present, so all-pervading, that it didn't need mentioning by name. It was as invisible and taken for granted as oxygen. Bernie only noticed it when it wasn't there. But when it was spoken about, it had two faces, one that was familiar to the point of being casual, the other just embarrassed dread. Today she felt the dread. It would pass. Mac trotted around, nosing through the grass on the track and seeming none the worse for his run-in with the polyp. When Bernie got his attention by snapping her fingers, he looked up at her with a disturbingly human frown. He was a sad-looking dog at the best of times, but now he looked as depressed as she felt. He knew things were going badly wrong. Is he done? Marcus asked, pressing his earpiece with a blood-stained finger. I'll let Hoffman know we're bringing in a body. Bernie picked up Max's leash. He gazed at her expectantly for new orders. Yeah, I think we found them all, she said, slipping him a piece of jerky by way of reward. Her hands were trembling from the effort. The ones from the last stock, anyway. She could never shake the feeling that all this was her fault, or at least the COGs. Vex had escaped the locust invasion, one of a handful of isolated, tiny islands protected by volcanic ridges. Now Jacinto and its refugees had landed on the doorstep unannounced and uninvited, bringing disaster with them. What are we going to do with the tractor? she asked. We can't just leave it covered in all that shit for his family to clean up. It was going to be bad enough when they had to drive the thing again. And they would, she was sure, they didn't have a choice. Sarah had been burned and bombed and poisoned back to a pre-industrial world. There were no new tractors rolling off assembly lines anymore. We've all done it. We've all climbed back in a dill or a pack horse and tried not to notice someone's blood. But not these people. The war's just begun for them. Combat was haunted by small, painful aftermaths that most people never thought about. Marcus caught her staring back at the vehicle and nodded, as if he was mindful of those small things too. Yet again, she saw him as a twenty-year-old gear waiting for extraction on a beach in Austri, kneeling over the remains of Carlos Santiago, ready to take his friend home for the last time. Yeah, Marcus said. We better take care of that. Chapter 2 When are you going to listen to me? You've got four weeks flying time left before you start eating into the fuel reserve that'll guarantee getting back to the mainland. There's no more emulsion. We can't even go foraging around abandoned depots like the old days, and you can't convert aircraft or warships to run on cooking oil. We're stuck on an island in the middle of nowhere. And whether it's this year, or the next, or a century's time, we'll need to leave here one day. Stock Emergence Site, Northern Vex Hoffman wished he'd taken a leak before he left base. Dr. Heyman's grim prediction about his aging prostate was coming true like a curse. But it would have to wait. There were at least three problems ahead of his bladder in the queue, and the most urgent one was coming over the radio right now. Colonel, we've got a dead farmer, said Marcus. 
Hoffman's gut nodded. Polyps. Got an ID? Not yet. Marcus paused. He bled out over Mataki. Try not to yell at her. Hoffman hesitated. Understood, Phoenix. Sometimes it was as if there had never been any feud between them, no punches swung or court-martial, or jail. Marcus was selfless, twice the man his damn father had been. Can you recover the body? That's taken care of. We're heading for Peruin in a few minutes. Okay, I'd better get up there and make some reassuring noises as soon as Prescott's finished his nature trail. Hoffman out. Prescott was still ordering Baird around, getting him to collect samples for some goddamn reason. What did the man expect to do with them? There were no more labs and no more scientists. Hoffman sees the brief lull to slip into the bushes and relieve himself. Yeah, don't yell at Bernie. Be grateful she forgives and forgets. Or forgives anyway. He wasn't sure the locals in Peruin would be that tolerant. They'd want to know what he was going to do to protect them now that the hellish outside world had come to their island. He didn't have any answers. So why are the stalks coming up here? And how? He was zipping up when he heard twigs crack behind him. He turned, expecting to see Prescott, but it was Mel Soraki. Sorry to interrupt your pee break, sir, but there's a real mess in the field over there. Say again, Lieutenant? Dead cattle. The polyps fragged them. It's all barbecue's eyes chunks. Hoffman sighed. Here we go. We're going to be terrassing all over the island keeping a lid on these little shits. Baird's got a theory. Good. I'll take it. Let me go talk to him. Baird always had a theory. He was an engineer, a man who was happier with machines than with people. But in that logical engineer way he could also break most things down to basic principles and come up with insights. Sometimes Hoffman worried that he expected Baird to do the job of entire universities full of experts. But Baird basked in it. Hoffman was happy to pat him on the head for being a clever boy as often as he wanted. Take a look at this. Baird thrust a folded chart under Hoffman's nose. It was a survey map of Vex, heavily penciled over with flight pads Soraki's crew chief had scribbled Mitchell K, return to KR-239 on the margin. This island's volcanic, but there's always a network of fissures. So you get underground rivers or seams of softer rock. Simple answer, the stalk finds a way through a gap from the ocean. All we have to do is stay away from the fissures. Depends where they are. And how far the stalks and the polyps can spread from those points. Which we don't know yet. So we find out. We plot where they come up. I never had you down for an optimist, Baird. I'm not. If I'm wrong, they can be up our asses anytime, anywhere, anyhow. Okay, so we start plotting the emergence sites. Hoffman studied the chart. Vex was about 70 kilometers north to south, only 5,000 square kilometers, but it was a lot of ground to keep an eye on with a small raven fleet and a worsening fuel shortage. If there's a pattern, then we have a containment strategy. Yeah, but remember all those busy little polyp legs. They get around. So we can keep them out, Hoffman said. He dug defensive ditches to trap and kill the recent polyp invasion from the sea. We've done it once. We can do it again. Hoffman pressed his earpiece to call control, gesturing to Soraki to get the raven started. Matheson, we've got a dead civilian. I'm going to be tied up explaining that to Poruin. You better brief Trescu. I don't want him bitching that we don't keep him in the loop. The Garasni probably know already, sir, Matheson said. They monitor our voice traffic. All the more reason to come clean, then. Miran Trescu had played straight with him so far, straight enough, anyway, so he'd play straight in return. Whether Gorisnea regarded itself as part of the happy COG family or hankered after its indie past, they were all in the same shit together now. Tell him I'll talk to him as soon as I get back. Richard Prescott was walking around the field, stopping occasionally to study the stocks. Hoffman didn't know what he was up to, but the man never did anything without a good reason. Every action, every gesture, every word, 
was calculated and controlled, designed to achieve a result that Hoffman couldn't guess at. He resented Prescott for even making him want to guess. Like the goddamn data disk and whatever was on it, it ate at him when he needed to keep his mind on the immediate problem. Let's move, Chairman, he said. We need to get to Peruin before the corpse does. Hearts and minds time. Baird Cole with me. Hoffman ducked under the raven's rotors and settled in his seat, staring out of the crew base so he wasn't tempted to look at Prescott and start festering again. Cole buckled himself in on the opposite bench, effectively putting a wall between the two men. He winked when Hoffman glanced at him. The man was a natural diplomat. Don't worry, I ain't gonna puke on you, sir, he said cheerfully. I emptied my tanks on the ride up here. That's decent of you, Cole. Hoffman gave him a conspiratorial nod and radioed Anya Stroud. She'd be waiting for the raven at Peruin. Lieutenant? Do we have a name yet? We think it's Leon Wellen, sir, it's on his land. Married with two kids. Anya sounded as if she'd taken a deep breath. Louis Gavriel's gone to find his wife. Hoffman wasn't sure why dead family men were somehow more tragic than single ones. He felt worse about those who hadn't left any family to grieve for them. They'd been erased past, present, and future. And after the COG had lost millions of civilians in Tyrus alone, he wondered if he was making too much of a single fatality here. But Perun was a small town, just a few thousand people. Every death hit them hard. They needed reassurance that they weren't a forgotten irrelevance to the newcomers in the south of the island. Their island their farms. We can't make this work without them. Soraki cut into the comms circuit. Sir, eight zeros a few minutes out. And control says the grind lift rig's going to be in position in half an hour. Good. The sooner we know what kind of rock those stocks can get through, the better. Anya was already waiting at the landing area by the harbor when the raven set down pacing an imaginary line in front of the pack horse and swamped by armor that didn't quite fit her. But she was growing into it in other ways. Peruin was her responsibility now. Hoffman had wondered if he'd dumped too much on her by giving her command of the small garrison here. She'd been a desk-bound ops officer until a few short months ago, and that was a tough transition for a woman in her thirties. But she's Helena Stroud's daughter. That's a war-fighting pedigree. I just hope she doesn't have her mother's penchant for suicide missions. Hoffman jumped down from the crew bay and inhaled the scent of wood smoke wafting on the air. It was the morning snakefish catch being processed in the smokehouse down by the slipway. The lambent thread out at sea, leviathans, stalks, even smaller glowies trawled up in nets, had forced the trawler fleet to make the most of shallow water species. The prospect of a few meaty, Smoky fillets distracted Hoffman for a moment before duty crashed in on him again. God damn. How is all this going to impact the food supplies? If stocks were coming ashore, then areas of farmland would have to be off limits. Crisis begot crisis. The farms were already struggling to catch up with the influx of refugees. So add food rationing to the list. Well, we've had plenty of practice at that. Hello, sir. Chairman. Anya glanced past Hoffman to acknowledge Prescott, doing it by the book. I've set up a temporary morgue in one of the fishery stores. It's got refrigeration. Let's hope we don't end up filling it, Prescott said. What's the mood like? Cooperative. They always are. Model COG citizens. Is Louis Gavriel back yet? I'll radio him, sir. Prescott wandered off to corner Baird. For a moment Hoffman wondered if Prescott knew Baird had his disc, and his insistence on coming along for the ride had nothing to do with the stocks at all. That was the problem with a devious son of a bitch like the chairman. You could waste your life trying to second-guess him. Hoffman resisted the temptation and focused on Anya. You'd better draw up an evacuation plan, just in case, he said. I'll get Charles to work out where we can put a few thousand extra people if we need to. Already done, sir, I've had a few spare evenings to kill since the last polyp attack. Anya was the kind of junior officer every CO needed, organized, efficient, loyal, 
uncomplaining, and always two steps ahead of the clusterfuck in question. Hoffman had never known her to have one fallible human lapse of temper or judgment. Sergeant Rossi's organizing lookouts. We're going to be reliant on civilians to raise the alarm. They know the land better than us anyway, Lieutenant. Good plan. She shielded her eyes to look up into the sky, scanning for the inbound raven. How are we going to monitor the whole island, sir? Most of it's uninhabited. We can't. We'll just recon what we can for as long as we've got fuel. God damn. We're relying on farmers and fishermen waving flags and calling us on their walkie-talkies now. Some army. In just fifteen years, the coalition had collapsed from a global superpower with satellite early warning systems to a threadbare city of refugees using hand tools. For a moment it wasn't the fruitless war against grubs and glowies that ground Hoffman's spirit into the dirt, but the thought of rebuilding afterward. Even if they wiped out the Lambent, he never lived to see Sarah get back to normal. It would take generations. Anya turned around and looked southeast. Here it comes, sir. Get in this raven above the trees and circled overhead before landing in a whirlwind of dust and grit. When the rotor slowed to a stop, Marcus emerged with Dom and Barber to unload a body bag strapped to a gurney. Hoffman kept watching that door until he saw Bernie step down with the dog. Hoffman could only stare and heed Marcus's advice. Don't yell at her. She was covered in dried blood. Her pants and cuffs were black with it, and there was a big smear on her forehead as if she'd wiped her hand across it. He knew it wasn't hers, damn, he hoped it wasn't, anyway, but it still made his stomach lurch. He'd lost Margaret because he hadn't stopped her taking a crazy risk. His history repeated itself on a daily basis but this was one thing he knew he couldn't cope with if it happened again. One day, it's going to be Bernie. It'll be her zipped up in one of those bags, and I just won't be able to go on. That better not be your blood, Mitaki. He said it to silence the inner voice. Maybe if he said it often enough, it would never have to happen. Or I'll I'm fine. She certainly didn't look fine. I'm just not Doc Heyman. So what kind of shape is he in? Now Hoffman had to make an effort not to fuss over her. The widow's going to want to take a look. Marcus loaded the gurney into the back of the waiting pack horse. He stared at Hoffman with just the faintest moment of defocus in that unsettling pale blue stare. Bernie wasn't the only one who'd had to pick up the pieces once too often. He's intact from the waist up, Colonel. He said. Better clean him up before she sees him, though. Anya jerked her head in the direction of the town. It was five minutes' walk away at most. I'll drive. I've set up a morgue. Expecting a crowd? Marcus got into the passenger seat as Anya opened the driver's door. Might as well plan for it, she said. The pack horse set off down the track to the harbor road. Dom, Baird, and Cole followed on foot with Prescott. Hoffman hung back with Bernie keeping one eye on Mac while Mac kept one accusing eye on him. The animal belonged to a baron's, Poruin's deputy mayor, but he'd latched on to Bernie to the point of being a pain in the ass, gazing up at her with such besotted devotion that Hoffman felt he was competing with a four-legged rival. Mac was a jealous dog. Hoffman found it painful to realize that he was a jealous man. You've been poisoning that dog's mind against me? Hoffman asked trying hard to jolly things along. Is he okay? Bernie nodded. He's a regular polyp hound. Whatever happened to him when he was missing just made him want to kill more glowies. You better clean up before the cities see you. Hoffman took off his kerchief, unscrewed his water bottle, and soaked the cloth as he walked. Here. Let me do it. Vic, not in front of Baird. Please. He'll only take the piss. God damn it, woman, we're not exactly a secret. He grabbed her arm to bring her to a halt and wiped her face and hands like a grubby kid. There wasn't much he could do about the blood that had soaked into her pants. Just snarl at him and put him in his place. Like you do with me. Okay, I disobeyed your orders. But I had to find the dog. She pulled free of him and walked off. Now I'll do as I'm told and stay on base. 
Well, that's big of you, Mataki. No, that wasn't fair. She just had a man die in her lap. Even for a veteran sergeant, things like that never got any easier. Sorry. I'm just worried that I'll damn well end up burying you. Bernie managed a smile. As long as you don't dump me on the compost heap. I'd prefer to be turned into jerky. Hoffman reached in his pocket to pull out the rabbit's foot she'd given him, taken from an unlucky animal she'd hunted for the pot. And this goddamn thing isn't working. The stew had been pretty good, though. He was slowly getting used to life with a survival expert. Maybe I need all four to change my luck. It's going to take a lot more than luck, Bernie said. Just remember that the people here aren't used to living with monsters under the bed. They might overreact. I'm damned if I can think what constitutes an overreaction at the moment, babe. Hoffman shook his head, suddenly feeling very old. That was happening too often lately. Because this shit just isn't showing any signs of bottoming out. Vex, unspoiled, fertile, picturesque, had waited out the war, cut off from the horror on the mainland since before the global hammer strike. The small population carried on and kept the mothballed naval base ticking over. But they'd never seen a grub, never had to run for their lives, and never had to fear the vibrations under their feet that warned a locust attack was coming. Hoffman decided that if they lobbed bricks at him and Prescott now that the Glowies had invaded then he couldn't really blame them. The harbor was a horseshoe shape, framed by a gravel road that ran down to the slipway. Hoffman could see a small crowd waiting by a pickup truck. A woman in overalls got out of it and stood blocking the packhorse's path, forcing it to slow and stop. Looks like the missus, Bernie said, speeding up as if she was going to intervene. Anya can handle it. They'd almost caught up with Prescott now. The civvies trust her. I promised her mother that I'd look out for her. And you have. That's why she's in command of the garrison now. Back off, Bernie. Prescott reached the pack horse before them, but he had the sense to stand back and let Anya deal with the widow. Hoffman could see Anya talking to her, making calming hand gestures while Marcus blocked the pack horse's tailgate. More locals began coming out of the waterfront workshops and houses to see what was happening. Anya was doing her best in a situation where there could be no right words to sort things out, ever. I want to see him. The woman kept saying. I want to see my husband. She was dry but she had that over-controlled, slightly shaky voice that said she was about to lose it completely. I want to see Leon. I've got a right. She went to open the pack horse's rear door. Anya put a careful hand on her arm. Let's do this inside, Mrs. Wellen, she said quietly. Not out here. No, I want to see him now, the woman snapped. Not laid out in some damned warehouse. It's nothing to you, is it? Nothing. You see it every day. It's just another slab of meat to you. Marcus did one of his slow head turns and faced the onlookers. Okay, time to give Mrs. Wellen some privacy, people. Maybe there were some right words after all. The crowd, about seventy locals now, a single animal with one reaction, seemed to hold a communal breath for a second and then turned away and dispersed in silence. Marcus had an effortless, reasonable authority that made people listen. He put his hand on the door latch. Are you ready, ma'am? Mrs. Wellen nodded. Bernie moved in and helped Marcus pull the body bag out on the tailgate as gently as possible, but it still looked as dignified as hauling a sack of potatoes. It was what the widow wanted, though. Marcus was right. You didn't argue with someone in that state. Ma'am, Bernie said, there's some blood. Only fair to warn you. She looked into the woman's face but didn't get a reaction. You can say stop any time you want. Marcus pulled the zip open. Mrs. Wellen turned her head away and took a few moments to force herself to look. Oh. She put her hands to her mouth. Oh, God. Prescott picked his moment to be statesmanlike. I'm very sorry for your loss, ma'am. We'll do everything we can to— No, it's not him. The woman interrupted. That's not Leon. It's not my husband. Hoffman cringed. 
But he was working on your land, Anya said. Yes, but that's Daniel. Leon's cousin? Where's Leon? Mrs. Wellen was all blank confusion for a second or two. Then she burst into tears, knees sagging as if she was going to collapse. Anya caught her arm and steered her away to a nearby house to sit down on the porch. Hoffman tried to imagine what it felt like to be told a loved one was dead and then find it was another member of the family instead. Relief never really got a look in. Yeah, that went really well, Baird said, sighing. Now we've got to find another housewife to traumatize. Hoffman had had enough of hearts and minds for the day. He still had a field of stocks to examine. Anya, call me back when Gabrielle gets a town meeting set up, he said. The rest of you, with me. Dizzy should have that rig in place by now. They trudged back to the Ravens. Soraki, Gediner, Mitchell and Barber were playing cards in KR-80's crew bay, unfazed in that scene at all way of Raven crews. Soraki looked up as they approached. How are they taking it? Wrong stiff, Baird said. You're just too sentimental. Soraki got to his feet and collected the cards from the rest of the crew. I don't want to make your day plummet downhill any faster, Colonel, but there's another farmer going ballistic. The one whose cows got fragged. I'll talk to him, Prescott said. The colonel's got his hands full right now. Hoffman's reflex reaction was to wonder if it was another maneuver, but a helpful gesture was sometimes just that, nothing more. He's got me. He's made me doubt every damn thing I see and he doesn't have to lift a finger now to do it. Bernie must have seen him twitch, because she gave him a warning nudge in the back. Thanks, Chairman, Hoffman said, deciding he was getting too tangled up in this. I'm not good with farmers. His working relationship with Prescott had hit rock bottom when he'd stolen the data disk, and now it was scraping along in a kind of frosty neutral gear. Prescott knew he had it. He also seemed to know that Hoffman hadn't cracked it yet. Maybe that amused him. Just walk away, Vic, Bernie whispered. She knew him far too well. Okay? Just focus. As Soraki came in to land at the stock's site, Hoffman spotted Dizzy's grindlift Derek making her way down the narrow two-lane approach road. Prescott leaned past Cole and Bernie to get Hoffman's attention. That brown patch around the stocks, he said. What's that? Hoffman turned to look down. Prescott didn't mean the churned soil. The pasture around the stalks looked as if it had been scorched by weed killer. The grass was brown and limp, a pool of dead vegetation that extended out from the stalks by a couple of meters it hadn't been like that when they left. Maybe it's from the polyp spatter, Hoffman said. Prescott shook his head. Then we'd see patches, not a radial pattern. Corporal Mitchell? Let's get some pictures of that. Mitchell took the recon images in silence, and nobody said anything for a while. The raven landed and Soraki had shut down the engines before anyone even moved. Marcus leaned back in his seat and stared out in the direction of the stalks. For once, even Prescott looked visibly troubled. In a world that had lost the science and technology it had taken for granted, Inexplicable things now scared Hoffman more than he was willing to let on. There were no more Adam Phoenixes left to step in and invent a solution. So the stocks kill pasture, Hoffman said. That could be an even bigger problem than the goddamn polyps. Chapter 3 Would Prescott do it? If the Hammer of Dawn could still incinerate every city on the planet, would he target Vex to get rid of the Lambent? He wiped out most of Sarah to try to stop the locust, and I hear he took that decision with Hoffman. Men who can see millions of lives as collateral damage aren't really worried what happens to a handful of farmers. The Jackson Farm, one hour after the stock incursion. It was a damn small gate, just tractor-sized, and Betty was broad in the beam. Something had to give. And it wasn't going to be Betty. Dizzy Wallen slowed his beloved grindlift rig to a crawl and sized up the terrain before bringing her to a halt. A small, miserable-looking guy was sitting on the tailgate of a pickup parked in the field. When Betty's shadow fell across him he glanced up, looking like a depressed weasel. Dizzy opened the side window and leaned out as far as he could. 
he loomed two meters above the man. There was no way to look nice and reassuring while driving Betty. Reckon I'm gonna have to roll right over the fence, sir. The miserable guy stood up with his hands thrust deep in his pockets. Go ahead, he said. It's not like things can get any worse. I'll give you a hand repairing it later. That's nice. His face didn't change. Thanks. Dizzy released the brake and rolled forward. He didn't even feel a bump as Betty crushed the flimsy wooden gate and the hedge to either side of it. Now he was face to face with the first complete stalks he'd seen. Goddamn, those things were big. They didn't look much like the chunks that Dom and Marcus had brought back from a wrecked ship a few weeks ago. He'd heard all the stories about the ones that sank the India Motion Rig, though. Where the hell did they stow all those polyps? He'd served on emulsion tankers. It still twanged a nerve in him. Prescott stood with his back to the stalks, talking to Hoffman and Leonard Perry as if they were all just doing a nice spot of sightseeing at a monument. Bernie stood a few meters away with that scruffy hound of hers on a tight leash. The chairman was wearing what Bernie called his Lord of the Manor rig, rubber boots, oilcloth jacket, and woolly jumper, and Dizzy caught her eye for a moment. She winked at him and did a subtle nod in Prescott's direction. Just look at him. Yeah, folks' breeding always showed on their faces, no matter how much cow dung they had on their boots. Prescott had pedigree. There'd been a time when Dizzy had been sure he'd shoot Prescott if he ever met the asshole. This was the man who told the world it had three days to get to Jacinto before he vaporized the rest of Sarah. This was the man who'd caused the deaths of millions and made Dizzy and his family into stranded. Not Hoffman. I know he was top brass when it happened, but I don't blame that man. No Sir Dizzy found he could stomach Prescott because his girls needed him to. A man really could endure anything for his kids. Hey, Diz! Perry signaled to indicate where he wanted Dizzy to pull up, and walked across to meet him. Feeling adventurous? Dizzy gave him a thumbs up. You point me to the spot, staff, and I'll make a damn big hole in it. Okay, we need to see how far down these stalks go. Perry was clutching a small monitor and a coil of cable in his arms. Whether they have roots. What kind of rock they've come through. That sort of thing. You got it. Let's drill. See if we can uproot one of them first so we can do a test bore underneath. Help me get some chains on the one on the left. Ought to be like pulling up daisies. I wish. Dizzy climbed down out of the cab. The grass beneath him was brown and dead. So the weed killer didn't work, huh, Len? Not guilty. Perry took another look at the dead grass. Maybe we ought to hose down our boots when we're done. I don't like the look of that. Marcus wandered over to them with a bundle of thick twigs tucked under his left arm. He was whittling one to a point with his knife. Just an experiment. He stabbed the twigs into the ground at regular intervals around the edge of the brown patch. Check these markers later and see if it's still spreading. Whatever it is, it's toxic, Perry said. But lots of plants pump out poison that kills other species around them. Walnut trees, for a start. Can't plant clover or tomatoes within twenty meters of them. Fucking lambent walnuts, Marcus muttered. That's all we need. He walked away and stood guard with his lancer cradled in his arms like he was expecting more polyps. Prescott joined him, which was kind of odd. They were never social. They just stood there a meter apart, avoiding looking at each other. You think that piece o' pan elastic's gonna hold, Len? Dizzy asked. Perry winked. You sure that oversized junker of yours can handle that chain? Don't you let Betty hear you say that. She's real sensitive about her weight. I don't know how heavy that stock's going to be. You might need to weld her back together again. Only one way to find out. Hitch her up and see what breaks first. Dizzy trusted Perry's common sense. The man was a logistics corps staff sergeant and that meant he was one of a special breed. His ragbag crew of engineers and tradesmen, cobbled together from the survivors of three support regiments, had kept Jacinto powered, watered, fed, and housed for fifteen years. 
They rebuilt the city every day after the grub attacks and never bitched about it. Well, not often. No, uprooting a few stocks wasn't going to bother Perry. Not one damn bit. And he always treated me right. Yeah, he remembers way back. And so do I. Perry shackled the chains to the rig's winch and Dizzy climbed back up to the cab. Once he shut the door with that satisfying clunk, he was in another world. No goddamn thing could touch him. He sat behind a steering wheel meters off the ground and far from the chaos beneath his wheels, the master of all he surveyed thanks to Betty. He probably wasn't half as safe as he liked to think, but it still made him feel good. Ah, Betty. We've been together a damn long time, too. Ain't gonna damage you if I can help it, sweetheart. He loved this rig. Folks said it was downright unhealthy to love a machine. But she'd never let him down, she'd never lied to him, and she'd saved his ass more than once. That was a lot more than he could say for flesh and blood. It's okay, darling Dot. He patted the dashboard. This might sting a bit, but all you gotta do is pull. Then we can see what's under that grass. You ready? Okay. Easy does it, sweetie. He started the engine. Betty rumbled into life with a steady vibrating pulse as good as a heartbeat. Up here, he wasn't a stranded bum or a drunk. He was a derrick driver, a combat engineer, the man who literally dug you out of the shit. Gears depended on him. Dizzy hadn't seen his life working out like this, but he reckoned nobody was where they planned to be these days. Being alive was the only measure of success worth a rat's ass. He jiggled his shirt pocket to feel the reassuring slop of liquor in his flask and reminded himself to start brewing another batch that evening. Potatoes. Damn, those made some real fine hooch. Dizzy gave Perry a thumbs up and waited for him to get clear. The winch mechanism whined. Then he felt a jolt as the cable took up the slack. Metal groaned. He held his forefinger on the motor control as Betty began dragging the stock out like a weed swiveling on his seat to try to catch a glimpse in the wing mirrors. How we doing, Len? He called. It's starting to give. Perry was looking to one side of the field, getting hand signals from one of his team. He raised his arm and beckoned Dizzy forward. Just a couple of meters, Diz. That's it. Come on. Steady. Dizzy slipped the clutch and Betty crept forward, creaking and rumbling. Things were going fine but then he felt the engine start to struggle. He put his foot down. Betty was starting to churn soil now. He could feel the tires losing purchase. On the dashboard, the winch warning light lit up red. Diz slacken off. Whoa, goddamn. Dizzy didn't drop the revs fast enough and for a second he felt he was treading air. Then there was a crack loud enough to hear over the engine noise, and Betty lurched forward. Something smashed against the rig's tail panel like a hail of bricks. The chain had broken. Hang on, Diz, the stock snapped at the base, Perry yelled. Shut her down. Dizzy scrambled down from the cab to inspect the damage. The stock had broken clean off just below ground level, but most of it was still rooted firmly in the soil. Betty's winch assembly dangled from its mounting, held in place by a couple of bolts. Apart from that she was in one piece. Sorry, honey. He patted her as the others clustered around the stump to examine it. Marcus bent to pick up a fist-sized chunk of stock. The broken surface was gray and honeycombed with holes, a lot like pumice but much harder and heavier. Now that's different. Baird took it off him and turned it over in his palm. The internal structure, I mean. Last one we chopped up was more like a tree trunk. Yeah, my money's on them evolving. Prescott looked at Baird as if he'd discovered gravity or something. Or perhaps it's a mature one. Then why do they look different as soon as they come out of the ground? Prescott nodded as if that made sense somehow. See if you can cut some sections out of it. You want a souvenir paperweight? Baird asked. Damn, he was a rude asshole, even to the chairman. Because that's all it's good for. We don't have any way of analyzing except to look at it under Doc Heyman's microscope. She'll love that. Not. For some reason Prescott didn't give Baird an earful. He didn't look down his nose at him, either. 
There was something going on, something weird, and when Dizzy looked in Hoffman's direction, the colonel was watching the pair of them like an impatient buzzard who thought his dinner was taking too long about dying. You never know, Corporal, Prescott said. Our Garasni friends might have hidden talents when it comes to analytical skills. I'd still like some specimens. And some of the dead grass, too. If you're ready, sir, I'm gonna start drilling, Dizzy said. Give Betty some elbow room. Might be a lot of grit flying around. Betty could drill a vertical shaft wide enough to drop a two-man grind lift. A little bit of granite wouldn't bother her. Dizzy lined up the telescoping drill over the stump, hit the starter, and felt a kick as the bit engaged with the ground. It was like drilling through the Efren bedrock to break into the grub tunnels under Lanone. Poor old Ty. Damn, we lost a lot of good gears that day. Sometimes the past interrupted the present so often that Dizzy wondered if he was getting those traumatic flashbacks that Doc Heyman kept talking about. The drill bit flung out gobs of turf, mud, and stock, then slowed as it went deep and started hitting denser rock. Betty shuddered. All Dizzy could do was watch the depth indicator and wait. Twenty meters. Come on, girl. Betty twitched a couple of times. Now the drill note changed. Whatever was beneath the stalks wasn't solid and the bit was finding voids. Dizzy powered down, hoisted the drill clear, and reversed Betty clear of the shaft. When he clambered down from the cab again, he made sure he brought his rifle with him this time. Perry and Marcus were kneeling to peer down the hole. Betty had sunk a shaft clean through the stalk and the ground next to it, giving Perry a good cross-section to examine. Spot on, Diz, Perry said. Now let's take a shifty at what's down there. Dizzy checked the hole and marveled that he could still be that accurate with a few drinks inside him. He wasn't sure he could have done it sober. Perry plugged the cable into the monitor and lowered into the hole, but Baird did a double take at what was on the business end of the cable. Hey, that's a bot camera, he said none too happy. Have you been stealing my spares? Ah, uh, come on. Keep your wig on. Perry winked at him. We've got fifteen bot cams and one damn bot. How many does that teddy bear substitute of yours need? I've got to keep Jack operational. And I've got to look down holes. But I can drop you down there for a personal inspection if you prefer. Baird humped and sulked. Dizzy edged around so he could see the portable monitor. Yeah, it's a fisher. That fits the survey map. Perry knelt back on his heels. Stocks follow the path of least resistance. Like everyone does. Dizzy kept looking. Bernie's dog suddenly lunged for the hole and she had to hang on to his lead to hold him back. I'm going to defer to Max risk assessment skills, she said, sliding her rifle off her shoulder one-handed. He can hear something. Be careful, Diz. Stones and loose soil trickled down the borehole. Dizzy heard them tinkle on something hard so he stuck his head in the hole just to check if he could see the bottom of the shaft. It looked real weird. I can see water down there. There was a faint shimmer deep down as it caught the light. God damn, I sunk a well. Shame I don't drink that stuff. Perry peered in and frowned. Then he lowered the bot cam again and paid out the cable to near its maximum. Dizzy looked back at the monitor. Shit, that really didn't look good. Now he could see something glittering, and knowing his luck it sure as shit wasn't diamonds. Len, I don't reckon that's water. Dizzy had to carry a lancer like an infantry gear, but reaching for it wasn't second nature. This time he found himself clutching it like a life belt. Len, we got lights. And it ain't miners down there. Everyone reacted at once. The goddamn dog went crazy and nearly knocked Dizzy into the hole. Marcus pitched in and hauled Perry back by his shoulder. Dizzy scrambled upright and took a few steps back just so he could aim down into the shaft, and then polyps boiled out of the hole like cockroaches out of a drain. Everyone was firing. Some of the damn things escaped and went racing across the grass with Mac in hot pursuit. Dom, with me! Marcus yelled pulling a grenade from his belt. Everyone else, give us some room. Marcus, get clear, Diz. Grenade out. 
Marcus slipped the pin and dropped the frag down the hole. The explosion threw a shower of polyps and gravel high into the air, then it all rained back down again. Dom moved in and emptied a couple of clips down into the smoke. Everywhere fell silent except for cawing birds disturbed by the racket. Bernie jogged after Mac but there was a loud echoing crack like a grenade going off and she started running. Hoffman looked like he was getting ready to haul her back, but he caught Marcus giving him a look, that don't do it look, and turned his back on her. Okay, now we know where these things are going to come up, we can avoid them, Hoffman said. That's something. Len, I want a full plot of the island showing where the fissures are, and we make those no-go areas. It'll mean moving anyone living near them. We'll monitor a corridor either side of the fissures daily for stocks. Dizzy kept an eye on Bernie. She was on her way back with Mac on the leash, but he didn't look too good. He was limping this time. He really had a thing about polyps. Dizzy expected him to be scared of them by now, but he just seemed to chase them like they were rabbits with extra legs. Silly little sod, Bernie said rubbing the dog's ears. Mac started licking a singed patch on his leg. I'd better get Heyman to take a look at him. He's been through a lot these last few days. Yeah, and you have, too, so stop chasing after him, Sergeant. Hoffman snapped. Marcus looked embarrassed by the old married spat the two of them were having and took a sudden interest in the dead grass. I need you fighting Lambent, not nursemating that goddamn poodle. If he ends up as ground chuck, it's too frigging bad. Bernie suddenly got a real cold, mean look on her face. Marcus interrupted just at the right time. Anyone want to take a look at the dead area? He tapped his boot against one of the wooden stakes he'd stuck in the ground. They weren't on the edge of the brown patch anymore. Hoffman let out a long breath. God damn it. It's still spreading. We better start measuring this shit properly. Baird sneaked up behind Perry and tried to take the bot cam, but Perry snatched it clear. And then what do we do about it? Baird asked. No idea, Hoffman said. The gears could shoot polyps until Hell built a ski resort, but this creeping shit wasn't going to be that simple to stop. Dizzy decided that he was long overdue for that drink. Disused lavatory block, Vex naval base, New Jacinto, later that day. Baird wished he'd reminded Hoffman that engineering was his forte, not software. The data disk definitely wasn't Prescott's shopping list or vacation snaps. It wasn't going to give up its secrets without a fight. But he couldn't resist the challenge. Hoffman was counting on him. And ah, screw false modesty. He was probably the most technically able guy the COG had left. Sometimes he wondered what had happened to all the real scientists and engineers over the years. He supposed it was inevitable that academics weren't built for survival. But even so, one of the assholes could at least have had the decency to stick around and answer a few questions. So it's down to the likes of me, Perry, and Doc Heyman to fly the flag for rational analysis. Wow, we are so screwed. At least the lavatory now had a makeshift door. Royston Charles would never miss that wooden pallet. Baird kept one eye on it as he ran the decryption program just in case some jerk decided to drop an uninvited and there was a high chance it was going to be Prescott judging by the way the guy had been looking at him today. Prescott wasn't stupid. Who else was Hoffman going to ask to crack the security on the stolen disc? Prescott knew he had it, and was just jerking them around by smiling sweetly and letting them sweat. Of course, Prescott, being a devious shit like all politicians, might have lured Hoffman into breaking open his desk drawer and then done the outrage act just to make sure that Hoffman didn't go looking for something else that was much more interesting. Yeah, that was the chairman all over. He was the sole survivor of a brutal jungle of twenty-four carat backstabbing bastards. Poor old Hoffman was just an honest gear with a bit of gold braid, a colonel trying to do a general's job. No contest. He'll tear you up for ass paper, colonel. But why would he want to put you off the scent unless you were getting too close to something dodgy anyway? While the program was running, Baird rested his boots on his ammo crate desk and tried to imagine what secrets Prescott could possibly think were worth hanging on to at this late stage of the game. 
The COG was deeper in the shit than it had ever been. They'd sunk Jacinto. Okay, they'd drowned the grub army and their snotty bitch of a queen too, but now they were stuck on an island in the middle of nowhere. The Garasni emulsion rig was a pile of rusting steel somewhere on the seabed, and they were running out of fuel fast. The lambent freak show had taken over from the grubs as resident pain in the ass. Now if that didn't mean it was time to fess up and tell everyone the truth, Baird didn't know what was. And anyway, who the hell was left to keep secrets from? What would Prescott think was worth keeping to himself? Maybe the slime ball had just flipped. Perhaps he'd finally lost the plot after years of trying to save the unsavable. Everyone had their breaking point. Do I really believe that? That we're all fucked and there's nothing we can do about it. So why am I sitting in a lavatory like a total moron trying to decode this stuff? Jack the Bot was propped on a crate in the corner with a dust sheet draped across his open inspection plate, the last autonomous robotic drone left in the COG. Baird was determined to keep him running even if it meant ripping out some old lady's pacemaker for parts. Jack was special. He was a prototype with a cloaking system. Everyone bitched about the COG never developing cloaking for gears, but how much use would it have been against a berserker's sense of smell, or a metal detector, or even this frigging glowy contamination? Sweet F.A., that was how much. Baird still wanted it, though. Okay, Jack, he said. If you were the most powerful leader in the world, not that that's saying much these days, what would you hide? Top secret technology? A crate of gold bullion? A stash of chocolate and some interesting Austrian porn? Jack didn't seem to have a view on the matter. With his arms folded back and the sheet draped over him, he looked like a forlorn armored nun at prayer. Baird went back to his decryption. The computer pinged and he sat up to check it. As he swiveled, something snapped under him and sent the plastic lid lurching off to one side. He grabbed the edge of the desk to stop his fall, relieved there was nobody there to see him topple off a frigging toilet, and checked underneath the porcelain rim at the back. One of the rusty bolts holding the lid had sheared off. He rummaged in his toolbox for another one and crouched down to screw it into place. So this is your state-of-the-art facility, said a voice from the doorway. Very minimalist. Baird looked up as Marcus wandered in. This was definitely not routine. Marcus wasn't the gregarious kind and he didn't drop by for chats. The most social thing he did was show up at the sergeant's mess and have a drink, usually on his own and in total silence. Marcus tweaked Jack's dust cloth. So, new low-tech cloaking system? Hey, he'll be as good as new when I'm done with him, Baird said defensively. What do you want fixed now? Nothing. Just seeing if you've had any luck with the disc. It was the first time Marcus had acknowledged that it even existed. As far as Baird knew, Hoffman had told just five people that he had it. Baird, Cole, Marcus, Dom, and Bernie. He wasn't sure if the old man had even told his buddy Michelson about it. So it didn't get mentioned, just in case. Baird wondered how long they could keep a lid on it. The careful silence had lasted about two weeks so far. Sip, Baird said. I tell you, Prescott's pulled out all the stops to protect whatever's on this. No wonder he's so fucking relaxed about Hoffman yoinking it. Baird waited uneasily to see if Marcus was going to say anything else, because the man rationed words like there was only one box of them left in the world. Baird had served with him for eighteen months yet never really had a serious private conversation with him. It was a lot more scary than he expected. He wasn't sure why. If it's that sensitive, Marcus said, why wouldn't he memorize the information instead? Damn, we're talking. We're actually talking. You think it's a decoy, don't you? Marcus shrugged. Wouldn't put it past him. I get the feeling you don't approve. How else are we going to get the information? Beat it out of him? He's still the legitimate head of government. I don't like playing games with him. Baird had expected a pat on the back for being resourceful. He was slightly miffed not to get it, but then Marcus always played it straight, even when he was dealing with utter bastards. You're not, Baird said. 
It's me and Hoffman who'll get it in the neck if anything goes wrong. You only know about it. But I suppose that's just as bad as far as you're concerned. Marcus turned around and leaned on the door frame, looking out into the dusk. Yeah. It's either complexity or volume. What is? The disc. If there's anything on it at all and he isn't just jerking our chain, then it'll either be too much data or it's too complicated to keep in his head. Or both. Marcus grunted. It was the longest conversation Baird had ever had with him, really with him rather than at him. Shit, just tell me he's not going to spill his guts about Anya next. No, this was still Marcus. He probably didn't even make small talk with her. Every word was measured and ground out for a pressing reason. Okay, try another tack, Marcus said. Not what? Why? Why would he need to keep anything to himself now? Baird wasn't sure if Marcus wanted the question answered or if he was just thinking aloud for a change. Because it'll piss us off so much that we'll shoot him, Baird said. Or it'll put something at risk. It's not personal stuff. I can't see the guy giving a damn what we think about his bank deposit box or weird sexual kinks, if he's got any. Yeah. Marcus looked back over his shoulder like something had suddenly occurred to him, tilting his head to check out the toilet bowl. Are the sewers still connected to this block? No idea. Why? You're sitting on an ingress point, Marcus said, and walked off. Baird stood thinking that over for a few moments, and suddenly felt uneasy. But he finished tightening the bolts on the seat and sat down to check the screen. The program had quit again. It made him forget his worries about getting a stock up the ass. Shit, he said. Shit, shit, shit. Now he'd reached the limits of his competence. He'd never hit that wall before and it scared him. He needed someone with better computer skills, but he couldn't think of anyone with that expertise, let alone someone he would trust. Whatever it is. It's not magic. It can be cracked. Everything can be cracked. Baird took his mind off the problem for a while by tinkering with Jack's main servo, hoping a sudden idea would bubble up from his subconscious. But it didn't work. He shut down the computer and tucked the disc inside his shirt. This time he put a padlock on the lavatory door, but that was only to keep that thieving asshole Perry away from his personal stash of spare parts. He rattled the lock and chain just to make sure, and went in search of Hoffman. Looking for Hoffman meant entering Admiralty House, the main admin block. It was all a bit obvious. And Prescott hung out there too. He knows I've got it. He damn well knows. He's just biding his time working out how to make my life a total misery. The easiest excuse to hang around was a visit to CIC. Sooner or later, everyone passed through it. Baird walked into the ops room and found Lieutenant Matheson at his desk listening to the radio net, arms folded on his chest and his eyes shut. Baird thought he was taking a nap, but he gestured to Baird to wait, still with his eyes shut and seemed to be listening to something riveting on his headset. Baird cringed when he saw that the windows on one side of the room were still patched up with boards and plastic sheeting. That exploding leviathan really had done a lot of damage to the base. Yeah, maybe he'd left that detonation a little too late after all. Two sex, Matheson said, opening his eyes. I'm trying to pin down a signal. Baird pulled up a chair to get in Matheson's eyeline. The guy was in a wheelchair because he'd lost his legs to a mine, and Cole kept telling Baird that it was rude to loom over him. Baird couldn't see why it was different from any man sitting on his ass in a regular seat, but there was no point pissing off a linchpin like Matheson. He'd taken over from Anya as the control room boss, and that meant he was a person of tactical importance when it came to asking favors and watching backs. Hoffman? Baird mouthed. Matheson shook his head. So Baird waited. A couple of other gears walked past the open door, Rivera and Lowe, Prescott's personal protection team, and glanced at him as they disappeared down the passage. Eventually Matheson slipped off his headset. Sorry, he said. If you're looking for the colonel, he's gone back to Peruin to address the restless natives. Stranded? 
What? The signal. Matheson shook his head. No idea. I've heard it a few times before. He put the headset on again. I just caught a blip on a weird frequency, that's all. Like a satellite data burst. Sure it's not another hammer satellite on the Fritz? No, it was on the old meteorology sat frequency. And it's the wrong sound. Sats all sound different. You want me to get Hoffman for you? It's okay. Baird didn't want to make it look too urgent and draw attention. I'll catch him later. Baird, can I ask you something? Here we go. The whole damn base knows. Knock yourself out, Lieutenant. You any good at making socket joints? That was a relief. Might be. Okay, yeah? I am. One of the Garasni guys says he's got someone who can make prosthetic legs if he can get the metal components. Poor bastard. Matheson was determined to get back to the front line. Baird couldn't say no. There was a time when he wouldn't have seen it as his problem and not lost a second sleep over it, but not anymore. All he could think of was how Cole, or Bernie, would react if they found out he hadn't done his bit for Matheson. Yeah, Baird said. Can do. I'll go talk to them. Thanks, said Matheson. I'm going to walk again if it kills me. Suddenly he stopped and adjusted his headset, frowning as if he'd heard something that bothered him. Damn, there it goes again. You spend too much time at that desk, Baird said. You need to get out more. That's how I hear things nobody else does. I can spend time wandering around frequencies. Matheson gave him a knowing look. But if you come up with the socket joints, then I'll be able to get out of here. Won't I? For once, Baird felt like the asshole everyone told him he was. There was a difference between being aware that he said crass things, people expected him to, and that horrible involuntary surge in his chest that warned him he'd feel like utter shit whenever he remembered what he'd just said. I'll make you into a champion sprinter, Matheson. He said. Leave it to me. Matheson smiled and went back to the radio net. Now that Baird had taken up the challenge, he had to do it. And it was going to be a lot easier than cracking that disc. His technical morale needed a boost. Rivera and Lowe were lounging around outside as Baird left the building. They gave him an up-and-down look as if they were deciding whether to piss on him. He'd never known them all that well, gears or not but it was the first time he noticed them acting as if he wasn't on the same team. Maybe they thought they were in the fucking Onyx Guard or something. Too grand now, are you? Or maybe Prescott's told you I've got his precious disc. Isn't it time you went back to doing a real job? Baird said, slowing his pace but not stopping. Who's going to throw stones at Prescott now the stranded are gone? Okay, there was always the chance that Hoffman would finally lose it and deck Prescott but most of Jacinto's refugees thought the sun shone out of the chairman's ass. They were still alive against all expectations, and oddly grateful for that. He's the chairman, Rivera said. He and Lowe had stopped mixing with the rest of the grunts. You might want to remember that sometime. Baird had to hand it to Prescott. He'd incinerated most of Sarah with the Hammer of Dawn, killing millions, maybe even billions, and his grand plan to wipe out the grubs in their tunnels had ended with having to sink Jacinto and run for it. He might have been responsible for more dead humans than the locust had. But still the idiots followed him. Would the last chairman have done a better job? Baird would never know. What else could anyone do in a world bombed and burned back to the last century, except find somewhere to hide? For once, Baird knew he didn't have a better plan than that and whatever great ideas and theories he'd come up with over the years, the world had simply stopped making sense to him roughly fifteen years ago, and now it had stopped making sense all over again. And he was starting to remember exactly what E-Day had felt like. Chapter 4 At 1000 hours this morning, the Union of Independent Republics signed a formal surrender to the Coalition of Ordered Governments, and concluded a peace treaty. It is with profound relief that I tell you the pendulum wars are now at an end, and that the COG and the UIR will embark on a program of reconciliation and rebuilding to heal the terrible scars, individual and national, 
that this long, terrible conflict has left upon Sarah. We hope that the state of Gorisnea will come to accept our offer of reconciliation and formally agree to the ceasefire in line with other UR states. Chairman Tomas Daliel's official announcement to the citizens of the COG, six weeks before E-Day, fifteen years earlier, Hanover, Southern Tyrus, six weeks after the end of the Pendulum Wars. It was late morning, but the street-cleaning vehicles were still pushing a tidal wave of ribbons and paper flags along the gutter. Hanover had welcomed home more troops last night, and Hanover knew how to party. Cole glanced out the limo's side window and grinned to himself. That was definitely an item of ladies' underwear hanging from the lamppost that he just passed. But what else were folks going to do at the end of a eighty-year war, except celebrate like crazy for a few weeks? Damn, it was hard to believe the pendulum wars were over, really, finally, definitely over. Cole didn't have to have any more fights with his agent about enlisting. The man didn't understand. Cole felt he had to do his time in the army like every other citizen, and he didn't want to pull that reserved occupation shit any longer. Thrash ball wasn't like mining or farming or crewing freighters. It wasn't essential. Now I ain't gonna get the chance to serve. Might make mama happy, but I still didn't do my duty. The limo slowed to a stop in the heavy traffic and he went back to reading the contract. In half an hour, he'd be in his agent's office, upsetting the man all over again and telling him he wasn't leaving the cougars. This nice contract from the sharks wasn't going to change a thing. It wasn't about the money. This is home. Tried leaving once, didn't like it. Home's worth any amount of money. So did you get to see it, Mr. Cole? The driver asked. Are you going to buy it? Cole looked up and realized the car was still south of Centennial Bridge. Damn, the traffic was slow today. The apartment? Cole leaned forward and pushed the sliding partition fully open. Joseph, Joe, always drove him around town, a real nice guy. It didn't feel right having this dumb glass barrier between them like Cole was from a different world. Hell, I thought it was gonna be simple. Nice apartment, easy for my folks to get around town, close enough for me to keep an eye on them. He checked his watch. He still had plenty of time. Now Dad likes the ocean view, but Mama don't like seagulls. Says they shit on the windows. You ever tried to clean seagull shit off glass? She says it's like needles set in concrete. It's the fish bones. Joseph checked over his shoulder before pulling out into the next lane. To the traffic around him, Cole was just a big silver limo with tinted windows, an anonymous guy with a lot of money and somewhere important to go. But your mom doesn't have to clean her own windows anymore, does she? You don't know my mama. She don't want other folks keeping her house clean. Or me paying for anything. That's mom's for you. Ain't that the truth? The whole wealth and stardom thing still made Cole uneasy. It was something he put up with to play thrash ball, not his reason for playing. The hardest thing to handle was people treating him like he was better than they were. When he reminded them he was a regular guy, just like them, his agent would sigh and tell him not to spoil it for them because they needed someone to look up to. That was the whole point, he said. They could ask Cole to sign a shirt or something and feel elevated by it. The last thing they wanted to hear was that Cole was ordinary, because that took the shine off everything. Elevated. What the hell does that mean, that they're lower than me or something? That just ain't healthy. Cole settled for the thrill of winning and the fun of seeing people excited and happy when the Cougars won. Did life need to be any more complicated than that? No, it didn't. He already had all he wanted and then some. He put the contract back in the envelope. The limo wasn't moving. They were now stuck in a sea of gridlocked cars. Traffic's worse than ever, Joseph said. I bet someone's broken down on the bridge and blocked a lane. People just don't know how to merge in the city. Mind if I put the radio on in case there's a traffic bulletin? Feel free, baby, Cole said. No rush. My agent can wait. It's not like he does it for free. Cole was still thinking about how he'd get his parents to accept the penthouse apartment as a gift. 
He wasn't really listening to the radio. He was staring out the window, struck by how blue the sky was, and wondering why there were no seabirds wheeling over the water. Maybe they'd all been partying too. He could see the pillars of Centennial Bridge. There were always birds perched along the cables like a string of beads, but not today. Then, in the way that words you weren't really listening to suddenly got your attention, he heard someone say evacuate. Holy shit! Joseph leaned forward and turned up the volume. Mr. Cole, did you hear that? Cole leaned forward, straining to hear. I just heard evacuate. Janermit's under attack, they're trying to ship people out. Joseph fiddled with the radio again. What the hell's going on? Janermit. Cole felt suddenly sick. His folks lived there. Who would want to attack Janermit? Man, you telling me the Indies have started their shit again? They're not saying Indies. What are they saying, then? They're saying that. Things are coming out of the ground. Cole happened to look at the cars either side of him and saw the drivers staring down at their dashboards, not taking much notice of the traffic jam. They were glued to their radios, too. He didn't know which station he was listening to. It was just a breathless reporter talking to even more breathless people. It sounded like the guy was on a street somewhere, grabbing people and asking them what they'd seen. It was hard to hear what he was saying over the noise of artillery fire and yelling. So what did you see? They came up out of the ground. They just burst out of holes right through the pavement. Were they armed? What did they look like? They had guns. They were big and scaly. Gray. I've got to go, please, I've got to get home. Cole sat back in his seat, bewildered. Maybe this wasn't the news. Maybe this was some dumbass stunt or a drama trailer, some stupid shit like that. But he knew it wasn't. The live report just cut off mid-sentence, and he was now listening to an announcer in a quiet studio. But that didn't make what she said any more real or help him understand it any better. I'm sorry. We seem to have lost that link. I'll try to recap on this morning's developments. We're getting reports of attacks on cities across Tyrus, attacks by some kind of alien or animal species that's emerged from underground. So far we have no idea of casualties, but eyewitness accounts suggest that the loss of life is substantial. We're getting reports of similar attacks right across Sarah. The chairman's due to make a statement soon but in the meantime police are advising everyone to stay indoors and to keep the roads clear for the army and emergency services. Cole's mind was racing. How close was all this shit to his folks? He had to check they were all right. I gotta get to a phone, Joe, he said, turning to look out of the rear window. The traffic behind was at a standstill as far as he could see. I gotta check on my folks. Fucking aliens? Animals with guns? Joseph was all high-pitched and disbelieving. Sorry, Mr. Cole. But what the hell is this? Before Cole could answer, Joseph looked to his left, seemed to spot something, and hit the gas hard. The car's wheels spun for a second and then it shot out into a gap in the traffic to tear across three lanes. Horns blared angrily. Joseph didn't stop until he was clear of the bridge approach road. He pulled over by a garage and turned to Cole. You wanted to make a call, Mr. Cole. You're the man, Joe, Cole said. He jumped out of the car and headed for the phone booth. When he picked up the handset, all he got was a rhythmic peep-peep-peep with a recorded message telling him the service was unavailable and that he should try again later. Goddamn. He jogged back to the car and bent over to talk to Joseph through the side window. The phone's out. I'm gonna see what I can find out. Mr. Cole, I'd better get you home. Things are going to get crazy and dangerous. Home was the last place Cole planned to go. Take the card, Joe. Go find your family. I gotta get hold of my folks. I gotta work out what's happening. He waved Joseph on to stop him arguing and broke into a jog. There were stores on the next block. One of them would have a phone that might be working or at least a TV or something. He didn't do his own shopping now, but he remembered the store from when he didn't have people running all his errands and trying to organize his life for him. 
he found himself jogging past a line of cars waiting to get onto the bridge. There didn't seem to be many pedestrians walking about, but when he crossed the next intersection he could see why. There was a big crowd at the row of shops up ahead. Everybody had the same idea. They were drawn to anywhere that had a TV or radio. They were spilling out of the coffee shop and packed tight in front of the electrical store. They didn't even take any notice of Cole when he ran up to them. Usually, he'd collect his own crowd in seconds, all jostling for an autograph, but today he stood at the back, towering over them and staring at the rows of TVs lined up in the window. It was like watching a mosaic made from bits of hell. The news had taken over every channel. The TV folk must have gotten the images from a traffic camera or something because they were just grainy black and white pictures, and the time code at the bottom of the screen showed they were an hour old. But they were clear enough for Cole to see things he wouldn't have believed even in a movie. The footage showed a highway that looked like the main road into Janermont, with cars and trucks generally getting on with their business. One moment they were moving along. The next the road ripped up from one end to the other like someone pulling the backbone out of a fish. Vehicles were hurled everywhere. Bodies were thrown from them. For a couple of seconds it looked like an earthquake, weird and unreal, and then things started coming out of a big hole in the pavement. They weren't human, but they had two legs and two arms. And most of them were carrying rifles. Then they used them. They opened up at something out of the range of the camera. Someone ran past the bottom of the frame and fell. Cole couldn't so much as breathe for a few seconds. The footage stopped abruptly and the studio anchor appeared, looking as shocked as Cole felt. At the bottom of the screen, captions kept flashing up names of cities, former indie cities too, not just COG ones, that had been attacked or that had lost all communications. The watching crowd was completely silent. Folks were used to seeing bad shit from the war on TV, but nobody had ever seen anything like this. Eventually someone spoke. They're everywhere. It was a man standing a couple of rows in front of Cole. What in the name of God are they? Yeah, said a woman. And why now, why that the war just ended? What's the government doing? For once, nobody took any notice of Augustus Cole, the Cole train, the Cougar's star player. He was just another shocked, bewildered, scared guy. Oh yeah, he was scared all right, because that was the only sane thing to be, and his world had changed forever. But whatever the government was planning, Cole, scared or not, knew what he had to do. He was going to find his folks and get them somewhere safe. He'd move them into his house, whether they liked it or not. Dumb as it was, he wondered if his agent would still be waiting for him. But the man had to know by now that Sarah was under attack. That contract could wait. But Cole had a feeling none of that shit was going to matter ever again. Mataki Farm, Galangi, South Islands, six weeks after the armistice. On a bad day, Bernie Mataki was sure she could feel the steel pins that held her leg together. Each time she put her boot down on the pickup's clutch, it nagged at her. It wasn't so much a pain as a vague awareness that the leg was different. The civilian doctor had said that it was something like the phantom sensations amputees felt, itching limbs that just weren't there anymore, but he told her she still had her leg and she had to settle for being grateful for that. A lot of gears didn't have that luxury, he said. Like I need to be told that, you soft civvy bastard. What do you know about it? Saw it all. You spent the war delivering babies and examining piles. Bernie drove slowly down the track and stopped to take a look at the finisher calves. That had been Neil's idea in her absence. She preferred rearing beef herself, but he was the one stuck here doing the work while she was away, so she couldn't complain. The dog jumped down from the flatbed as she opened the door, expecting some work. She snapped her fingers at him to turn him back. Not today, Mossy she said. They're settling in. We'll go and move the ewes after lunch, okay? That'll keep you busy. The dog was always pleased to see her, no matter how long she was away. She got the feeling Moss was happier to have her home than Neil was. My fault. He really thought we could make a go of this once I left the army. 
I'm the problem. Not him. The pendulum wars were now over and she would have been demobbed at fifty-five anyway. She knew there would always have been a day when she had to leave the army, if she didn't get herself killed first. It was just the way the shutters came down so suddenly and completely. One day she was elite infantry, a specialist, a platoon sniper, someone with status in a tight-knit clan, and the next moment she wasn't anybody at all. She was wounded, given a medical discharge, and turned out of the regimental family forever. Maybe I could have stayed on in a support job. Maybe I still could. Neil was on the roof messing around with the TV aerial when she got back. She wondered if he'd seen her. She made a point never to startle anyone balanced precariously on a chimney stack, so she waited for him to finish and notice her. Eventually he looked down. Bloody Telly's gone on the blink, he said. Can't get any channels at all. What is it? I dunno. The aerial looks okay. I'll have to phone some overpriced tosser from Noroa to fix it. That's going to take a week. Well, we'll just have to stare balefully at each other across the table instead. That was the problem with living on a small island. If you wanted anything more than the basics, it meant a ferry trip to Noroa. Or we can listen to the radio. You finished then? Bernie peeled off her gloves. Yeah. How do you feel about sheep? I think I'll stick with you, love. Sheep can't cook. Seriously. I think we should cut back on beef and run more sheep. Better price. Easier to manage, too. Neil climbed down the ladder and frowned at his skin knuckles. He sucked them briefly to stop the bleeding. It's your farm, Burn, he said. I'm easy. Yes, it was Bernie's farm. It was also her curse. There were days when she hated it. Not just because hill farming was tough work for two people with only occasional hired labor, but because the place was five hundred hectares of resentment, anger, and guilt. She'd fallen out with her brother over it. She'd also never been sure whether Neil had married her to get a share of it. Well, he'd kept the place from going to ruin while she was deployed, so if he wanted it, he was welcome to it. Right then she'd have traded it all for transport to Ephra half a world away, and a few more years with the regiment. Come on, the war's over. Really over. Not just over for me, over for everybody. I've got to deal with it sooner or later. You want to go to Noroa? Neil asked. Change of scenery. Do some shopping. Cheer you up a bit. That'd take a lobotomy, she said, and went into the house. Neil called after her. I picked up the mail while I was off camp. There's a letter with a lake station postmark. Bernie stood in the narrow flagstone passage, looking into the bright yellow kitchen. She'd been born in this house. This was her childhood home, her family's farm and land. But even after eighteen months back in Civvy Street, she couldn't get used to it again, neither its old familiarity nor its unmilitary scruffiness. Neil, poor sod, had never learned to put anything away. He thought harnesses were okay hanging on coat hooks and that boots didn't have to be wiped on doormats. He's a farmer. Like Dad. Bernie was used to spit and polish and sovereign's regs. The 26th Royal Tyrant Infantry had been her life since she was 18, nearly 27 years service, 20 of them frontline, and she wasn't going to turn back into a civilian that easily. Unless I want to. But I don't. I really don't. I want to feel the way I used to. I want to belong. I want to matter. I want that comradeship again. She hung her oilcloth coat on the hook and ran a finger across the old writing bureau that doubled as a hall table. Dust, not thick enough to write her name in, but enough to make the sergeant in her order that the whole damn hall be scrubbed down, preferably with a toothbrush. She'd have to clean the place or it would nag at her. Neil was okay with dust and washing up left overnight in the bowl, but she wasn't. She sorted through the mail, fee bills, the vet's invoice, her monthly war disability pension, and found the envelope with the lake station postmark. So you've remembered I'm still alive, eh, Mick? Bernie debated whether to open it or not. Blood wasn't thicker than water when it came to money, 
not by a long chalk. Her brother never lost a chance to remind her he'd been robbed of his inheritance when their father died. You want the fucking farm? Have it, mate. And the dust. What does that bloody waster want now? Neil asked, walking up behind her. Tell him to piss off. I'm fed up busting my guts so that he can catch money off you. He paused for breath. Come on. It's time for dinner. Bernie opened the letter anyway, ripping the envelope open with a callous thumb. Lunch. Ooh, la di bloody da. Lunch, then. But it wasn't what she expected. Something fell out onto the flagstones, and she bent to pick it up. It was a photo of a newborn baby trussed up tightly in a pink blanket, looking none too happy about it, and she already knew what was going to be written on the back. It was mixed handwriting. Thought you'd like to know you've got a new great niece. Philippa Jane, three kilos. There was nothing else in the envelope. Bernie studied the picture for a moment, wondering if Mum and Dad would have been angry with her for not rushing over to Noroa to see Mick and make peace. She handed the photo to Neil. He glanced at both sides and wedged it in the frame of the mirror hanging by the door. A grandfather at his age and all. Well, at least that's something he's good at. Breeding. He disappeared into the kitchen, and she caught a delicious whiff of roast poultry as the door swung open. Chicken. Should be done to a turn by now. Come on, you lay the table and I'll carve. Lunch was one of their own chickens with homegrown vegetables. The big wooden table felt solid and comforting beneath her elbows. The food was good in the way that only fresh homegrown stuff could be, and the view from the kitchen window was a peaceful one of a wintry gray sea in the distance. For a moment, she felt that she might eventually learn to appreciate this kind of life again. Neil laid down his knife and fork on the edge of his plate and got up to switch on the radio. He didn't like silence. Ah, uh, bugger it, he said. Listen to that. What's going on today? Maybe they've had a transmitter failure on the mainland. The radio was normally tuned to the Ephra World Service for its weather and shipping forecasts, but all Bernie could hear now was the random crackle of static. Leave it, she said. We can retune it later. Your food's getting cold. Neil sat down again and they went on eating. She hadn't run out of things to say to him so much as forgotten where to begin saying them, so she said nothing. He kept fidgeting in his seat as if he was building up to something. She braced for incoming. Burn, he said at last. I'm trying. I really am. I read all that stuff from the Veterans Association. I know it's a big change for you, but the war's over for everyone now. Yeah. But they didn't suddenly disband the army. I know. Look, I added it all up, he said. I counted all the days we've actually spent here together as man and wife. 1,372. About three years in all. Out of 17. Okay. But I'm home now. Neil slammed down his fork. No, you're not home. You're not home at all. You want to go back to the bloody army. Look, I've gone from a busy regiment to a place where I don't even see the neighbors for weeks at a time. It's hard. Okay. I know I can't really understand what it was like, but I've always been there for you. Just tell me how to handle a wife who wants to be on the front line in a war that isn't there anymore. I didn't know it would take me this long to adjust. Burn. The world's changed. We've got to make this work here. Otherwise what were you fighting for? Bernie wished she knew. Sometimes she asked herself why she'd enlisted. It had to be more than some old bastard of a recruiting sergeant telling her that women made bad snipers. But it was all so long ago that she couldn't remember the feelings that had driven her. I think I wanted to get away from Galangi. I thought Mick would take over the farm. I should have let him. I was fighting for my mates, she said. She had no other words for it. It's hard to feel like I belong here again. As soon as she said it, she realized she told him he wasn't one of her mates and that he'd never understand her world. Shit, that's not fair on him. Sorry, love, she said. That came out all wrong. Neil was a pretty mild bloke. When he lost his temper, 
which wasn't often, he just slammed things around a little. Nothing got smashed, and there was no yelling. He just stopped eating, got up, and scraped what was left of his meal into the compost bin. But she could see he was seething. He spun around. Your mates, he said. Your bloody mates. Where have they been since you got discharged, eh? Do they call? Where's that dickhead you were shagging who left you high and dry? The one who made officer and ran off with the rich lawyer? That's your mates. I'm the one who married you and kept the bloody farm going while you were away. That hurt. Neil knew how to do that, just as she did, with that unerring aim that long married couples always had. She decided to keep her mouth shut because there was no point rehashing all this crap. It was true. But she couldn't explain why he was also wrong, not in a way that wouldn't escalate the recriminations. She was too tired and pissed off for that. And she hadn't thought about Vic Hoffman in a long time. Not as an ex, anyway. I'll fix the radio, she said. Neil did the washing up in silence while she fiddled with the dial and tried to get a clear signal. Reception wasn't good on Galangi at the best of times. That was why the radio was tuned to the EWS. But she couldn't get the South Island station either. It had to be the relay. The chances of the TV and the radio both developing faults at the same time were remote. She switched the set off and shrugged. We're cut off again, she said. I'll test the walkie-talkies. I might pop over and see if Dale's having the same problems. But there was no rush. There was still a fruit pie to finish. She just cut a slice and was transferring it to a plate when the phone rang. Neil put down the dishes and went into the hall to answer it. It struck Bernie that he was as stuck in his role of house husband every bit as much as she was still trying to be Sergeant Mataki. There was a buzz of conversation but she couldn't hear what was being said, only the tone and the long silences. Whatever it was, Neil was upset. When he came back into the kitchen, his face was chalk white and he looked bewildered, as if he'd had very bad news and didn't know what to do next. Oh shit. That's not like him. That was Dale. His voice was shaky. It started again. What has, sweetheart? The war. The bloody war. What? Bernie's immediate thought was that she was thousands of miles from base with no fast way back. She was already calculating when the next ferry could get her to Noroa's military airport when her common sense kicked in and started asking questions. How the hell can that happen? How does Dale know? They've attacked Ephra. And nobody can get a line through to Noroa. Who's they? The Indies? Dale was just a bloke who grew cereals a few clicks south of them. He didn't exactly have a hotline to the chairman. Where's he getting this information? Come on, Neil, wars don't just start up again. He's on the harbor master's frequency. Someone got an emergency broadcast out before the TV went off the air. These things have come up out of the ground. For fuck's sake, what things? Bernie was getting annoyed. She hated it when people couldn't just get to the point and spit it out. Where? Neil swallowed. He was looking right past her, shocked, confused, and running out of words. Everywhere, he said. Every bloody where. Right across Sarah. And these things, they're not human. They're really not human. Emulsion tanker Betancourt Star, somewhere in the southwestern approach to the Saragar Peninsula, one hour later. It was time for a drink. A coffee, mind you. Zero crack sparrow fart was way too early to take strong liquor, even for Dizzy. And he'd given up all that stuff. He really had this time. He walked along the deck picking his way carefully around hatches and cleats in the pre-dawn darkness. When he reached the bows, he took out his hip flask and threw it over the side as far as he could. He almost kissed the flask goodbye, but he wanted this over and done with, and you didn't kiss an enemy. He didn't see where the flask sank. He just heard the splash, and then the tanker swept past and the damn thing was gone forever. That's the last of it, he said aloud. I'm done with you. No more hooch. It had taken him a real long time to reach that stage. 
but he was going home to Lena and the boy, and this time he was going home sober. Back in the galley, he made a couple of mugs of coffee, then climbed the ladder to the bridge, balancing the scalding liquid in one hand. It had always seemed easier when he was drunk. He found the skipper leaning on the radar screen with his arms folded, staring out over the tanker's deck. It didn't take a lot of men to run a modern tanker. The crew rattled around in a ship this size. Dizzy put the mug on the console out of elbow range and joined in the silent staring. Ahead of them, the star's deck stretched nearly 200 meters into unusually flat and calm water. Even the sea had caught a dose of this new piece. Kinda lonely out there, Rob, Dizzy said. The horizon was still a deep violet band speckled with the distant navigation lights of other vessels. He could see the three distinctive green lights on the mast of a mine hunter a few clicks north as she swept one of the main channels into the port. I'm gonna miss convoys. Rob picked up the mug and slurped. Yeah. It's going to take some getting used to. For the first time since he joined the merchant navy, Dizzy couldn't see the familiar neat formation of other cargo vessels and the NCOG destroyer escorts around the star. There were no UR submarines stalking them now. The star could sail safely on her own. It felt strange not to be under constant threat of attack. A man could get used to anything and miss it, even a war. Dizzy took a pull of coffee and wondered how long it would be before he stopped sleeping with his life jacket under his pillow. I was about to say we could get back to normal, Rob said. But peace isn't normal. Not for any of us. It's goddamn abnormal. No torpedoes. No shells. Dizzy said it to convince himself rather than the skipper. We can go any damn where we want, and nobody's gonna try and sink us. Ain't that something? Rob pushed himself back from the console and studied the sweep on the screen. The radar plot was dotted with vessels clustered around a fringe of coastline, the approach to Porta Augury. We're going to be running into mines for the next fifty years, armistice or no armistice, he said, nodding at the view from the bridge. A second mine hunter was crossing from starboard. But yeah, no more torpedoes up the ass, at least. When's your boy being demobbed? Already is, Dizzy said. His unit got back to North Sheriff last week. First thing I'm gonna do when I get home is buy him a beer. If he's old enough to fight, he's old enough to get a man's drink inside him now. Not going to introduce him to your finest special reserve, then? Hell no. If he told Rob he'd given up the sauce, the guy would never believe him. Dizzy had said it too many times before. His mama would strangle me with a dead snake. Rob laughed his head off. Yeah, it's tough being a stepfather. Tell me about it. Richie's a good boy. Dizzy liked to think he'd been a better dad to the kid than the deadbeat who'd fathered him. He tried damned hard. Never been any trouble. But now he's gotta find a job. They don't always teach gears a trade, see? Always room for a trainee engineer in the merch, Diz. You tell him that. Once the star's emulsion was offloaded to the refinery, Dizzy was done for this trip. He checked his watch. They'd be alongside and discharging in an hour or so, and he could hand over to the relief engineer to take the tanker back to New Temperance. Then it would take maybe another hour to get his papers checked and stamped, and all that official bullshit, and he could be on the transcontinental train to Ephra and across the Tyran border by late afternoon. Usually, he'd stop by his favorite bar in Agri for a little liquid refreshment. What was the place called? Hell, all he could remember was the street. It didn't matter. He was never going to visit the place again. I swear. I'm gonna take a stroll around the deck, he said. Oughta be a pretty sunrise. Diz, you sound like a man making a fresh start. Rob verged on being a mind reader sometimes. They knew each other too well. Reckon I am, Rob. The whole world's doing it. The tanker was nearly 220 meters from bow to stern, a big rusty metal maze of a place to walk around and, when a fellow was in need of some quiet time, with lots of little places to waste a few hours. Dizzy leaned on the rail to watch the sun come up. God damn, it was peaceful. 
There was just the background throb of the engines and the quiet rush of water past the bows. Even the gulls weren't up and about yet. Normally, he'd see them wheeling in the gloom before the sun came up, silent white ghosts that sometimes squawked as they loomed out of the darkness and scared the shit out of him. Augury was getting closer, changing into constellations of lights. Dizzy could pick out the towers and storage tanks of the refinery. I'm going home. Yeah. Hope Lena likes the necklace. Costs it's a damn long way to take it back to get a refund. A flash of light caught his eye and he looked up. He could have sworn it was a burst of flame, but he couldn't tell from the faint afterglow if it was the refinery flaring off gas or just the first rays of the sunrise catching something he couldn't see. He went back to contemplating the horizon and tried to remember the name of that damn bar. Cantari? Coronita? It'll come to me. He raised his binoculars and had another look at the refinery, still a few clicks away. A long trail of vapor drifted lazily from one of the cooling towers. As he scanned the coastline, he picked up movement and saw a small port authority boat heading out at high speed. It was the harbor pilot. A big, awkward girl like the star had to be guided into a busy port because some folks didn't seem to understand a tanker couldn't swerve to avoid them. But the pilot was on a different course. Dizzy watched the boat peel away and head up the coastline. It was just routine, something that Dizzy saw every day of his working life. He thought nothing of it until the ship's collision alarm went off at ass-clenching volume, and he almost dropped the binoculars. The siren switched immediately to the muster alarm, two short blasts, repeating, and Dizzy decided that Rob was either jerking his chain or he'd accidentally hit the controls. That was hard to do, though, and Rob wasn't the jerking-around kind. But Dizzy was damned if he could see anything worth alerting all hands for. It wasn't the fire alarm, for sure. God damn it, Rob, you nearly made me shit myself. Dizzy moved toward the center of the deck so he could be seen from the bridge. He gestured to indicate what the hell. There ain't nothing out here. Rob couldn't hear him, of course. But he was gesturing back at Dizzy to come up top, and he didn't look as if he was joking. Something was wrong. Goddamn. Dizzy listened for changes in the engine noise as he made his way back up the deck in a hurry. That was all it could be, an engineering problem. That was shitty timing. He'd be stuck in port fixing it now, and he could kiss goodbye a week of his leave. What the hell is it now? He ran up the exterior metal stairway to the bridge wing and opened the door to find a dozen of the star's crew clustered around the radio. Rob had the mic handset to his mouth, his thumb hovering over the transmit button. His gaze was fixed on the speaker suspended above the helm position. Everyone was listening intently to a crackling transmission, and that was the moment when Dizzy realized the crisis wasn't a leaking valve or anything else he could fix with a wrench. He just caught a few words. Someone behind at the door shoved him impatiently, but he couldn't look over his shoulder. The voice traffic froze him to the spot. I repeat, we're under attack. We're shutting the port. Any vessels alongside, we're getting them out fast as we can. Peachem, roger that, we'll assist. Estimate fifteen minutes. Audacious out. Audacious was an NCOG warship. What the hell's happening? Dizzy asked. They've started it again, the indie fuckers. Dalan, one of the cooks, raked his fingers through his hair. His apron was covered in some kind of brown sauce. We can't dock. Dizzy was crushed. All he could think of was Richie being recalled and how short the peace had been. He should have known it wouldn't last. The war had been going on too long for folks to break the habit. What have they done? he asked. Rob pressed the transmit button. PHM, this is crude tanker Betancourt Star. We picked up your transmission to NCOG. Please advise, over. Harbor pilot to Betancourt Star, we've got a situation here. You're going to have to divert to the military port at Cape Alice, over. Understood. Betancourt star out. Rob slipped back into the cockpit chair. All stop. Let's wait for the pilot. He leaned across the console and switched on the long-wave radio. Okay, 
It'll be on the news. I bet we'll hear more than we'll get from the harbor master. But we can see the refinery from here, Dizzy said. We can see the goddamn town, too. Yeah, but why can't we see anything else? Dalan craned his neck to get a better look. Where's the helicopters? I don't hear any gunfire either. Maybe they just strolled in with rifles, Rob said. But Avery is the best part of a thousand clicks from any Yar border. How did they get here? Rob was getting impatient. I'm not the Indy chief of staff, kid. I don't know how they did it. But they did. Dizzy squeezed out of the packed bridge and made his way down to the deck again, followed by Dalan and one of the other engineers, Wilson. They stood on the port side and stared at Avery's skyline. Eventually, most of the crew who weren't on watch came out on the deck to look. Dizzy hadn't imagined those flames. The city was under attack. An explosion lit up the sky and sent thick clouds rolling high into the air. A heartbeat later, Dizzy heard the distant boom. Well, shit, Wilson said. The assholes must be targeting all the refineries. The crew watched helplessly, saying nothing. The silence was broken by a tinny voice. Dizzy turned to see where the sound was coming from. Dalan was holding a small radio to his ear, listening to the news. Turn it up, buddy, someone said. Dalan obliged. It's a bad signal. Maybe they took out a transmitter too. So the pendulum wars weren't over. The surrender was all a double cross, a goddamn bluff to get the COG to drop its guard. Dizzy felt almost choked by anger and betrayal. You rot in hell, you indie bastards. It was dumb cursing an enemy that didn't even know he was out here, let alone hear him. But what kinds of assholes broke ceasefires like that? Fuck you. We should have finished you all off with the hammer of dawn, not just a couple of goddamn ships. Amen to that, buddy, said Wilson. Dizzy didn't know he had that much venom in him. He didn't even get that mean when he was drunk. He just finally gotten used to the idea that the war was over, and now he had to start all over again. Indies were rotten to the core. That was all there was to it. Maybe it'll all be over again in a couple of days. The chairman won't take this shit lying down. Not now he's got the hammer. They'll win the next and once he fries a few cities like he promised. More explosions ripped along the skyline. Dizzy could definitely see the fierce yellow glow of flames in the refinery now. Dalan retuned the radio and held it closer to his ear. His expression changed. Listen, it's not them, Dalan said. It's not the Indies. It's something else. Wilson turned around. What do you mean, something? The news says they're not human. Whoa, so they're fucking performing seals or something? Dizzy had to repeat it to himself before the words sank in. Ah, uh, goddamn it makes sense, buddy. Come on, what are they, Goris Nayans? Those assholes never accepted the ceasefire. I don't know what the hell they are. And neither does anyone else from the sound of it. But it's not the Indies. Rob leaned out of the bridge door and yelled down at the crew. Get up here, he called. Quick. Daily yells on the radio. When Dizzy followed Wilson onto the bridge, the atmosphere was different, not just tense, but scared into silence, and the merchant navy didn't scare easy. Just about the whole crew was crammed in there now, twenty men, even though they could have listened in their cabins. Dizzy felt they were all clinging together out of fear and disbelief. Everyone had that same loss there. Dizzy perched his backside on the edge of the chart table and listened. The voice of Chairman Dalyell was crystal clear. It was pretty steady, too, considering the news he was breaking to the world. Citizens, we don't know what these creatures are, other than the fact that they're not human. We don't know where they come from. We don't know what they want. But they're tunneling under our cities and emerging to slaughter our people. Our combined forces throughout Sarah have been mobilized to deal with them. I asked you all to remain calm as you have done through so many years of war. Stay in your homes unless ordered to evacuate, and listen for emergency information on all broadcast stations. That, my fellow citizens, is all I can tell you until the situation becomes clearer. 
Nobody said a word for a few moments. Then Wilson broke the silence. This is crazy, he said. It can't be true. It's some exercise. Some shit like that. Dizzy could only think of Lena and Richie back in North Sheriff. What was happening to them? He had to find a way to call them. Where else have these things come up? He asked. Do we know yet? The news said Janermint for sure. It also said all across Sarah. Rob held up the maritime satellite handset. Dizzy could hear the faint voice of a recorded message repeating that the service was temporarily unavailable. Every damn ship out there had probably decided to call in at the same time and overloaded the sat network. Everyone pick one number to call, because we're all going to want to ring someone to see if they're okay when the sat's back in service. It'll probably be the only chance you'll get. It was funny how the body didn't really need any help from the mind to carry on doing what it needed to do. Dizzy, unable to think straight beyond how he was going to get in touch with Lena, found himself putting on his ear defenders and heading for the engine room to check the generators. It was like a reflex. The second engineer, Milos, was already down there, wiping his hands on a rag. Diz, are they aliens or something? Dizzy read his lips. How did they get here? Did they land? I mean, I know everyone's saying they came out of holes in the ground, but how come we've never seen them before? You don't just get a whole new breed of things come out of nowhere like that. Dizzy couldn't think beyond the moment. The creatures were here. His family was somewhere else, without him and probably shit scared, and he had to get to them. He just had to. Canopus. He remembered it now, just when he didn't need to, the name of the bar. It was the Canopus. He wondered if it was on fire burning with the rest of Port Augury as creatures nobody could fight off or explain away destroyed Sarah one city at a time. Chapter 5 They Think We're Paranoid They wonder why we still keep them at arm's length. Five centuries ago, we won and lost an empire of 400 million citizens. During the Pendulum Wars, Gorisnea's population fell from 20 million to 10. After E-Day, it was 2 million. After the COG deployed the Hammer of Dawn, we were reduced to 50,000. Now, after the stranded massacres and the famines and the disease and the cold, there are only 4,000 of us. And they wonder why we always have one eye on the exit. New Jacinto, Vex, the present day, 15 A. E. Miran Trescu tried not to break into a run as he headed for the helicopters. That smacked of desperation, and he refused to look needy in front of the COG. It had been hard enough crawling to the old enemy for help. Now he had to rely on their air assets. But he had no intention of sitting on his backside waiting for crumbs of information from Prescott, or Hoffman. He hoped the assault rifle slung across his back made that clear. The COG troops stood around in small groups, poring over maps. Hoffman was deep in conversation with Marcus Phoenix, Santiago, and the big thrash ball player, Cole. Baird wasn't there, nor were the female gears who occasionally patrolled with them, but this was the core of Delta Squad, and that meant this was a crisis. Trescu was struck by how much Hoffman relied on Delta when he still had a couple of brigades at his disposal, as well as some apparently competent if unlikable majors and an assortment of lieutenants. Yannick said it was a regimental thing. They shared a common tribal bond, that death is head emblem of the 26th Royal Tyran Infantry bearing the motto Unvanquished. Trescu understood tradition and heritage all too well. But we're the vanquished. What do I have to show for throwing my lot in with the COG? We've lost our flagship and our emulsion platform. We're marooned here. And I have to beg for a ride in a COG helicopter. But Gorisnea still existed. His people still survived, after a fashion and that was all that mattered. Tresco slowed down as he approached Hoffman, imagining his father's reaction if he'd lived to see his son finally agree peace terms with the COG. General Edgar Tresco would have backhanded him across the face before disowning him. He'd made his son promise never to surrender. It was a terrible thing to break a promise to a dying man. But it's a different war now, Papa. The old enemy is irrelevant. We're fighting extinction. 
and that is something I shall never bow to. Hoffman stopped talking and turned as Tresca came up to him. He never looked a happy man at the best of times, but today was clearly not one of his better days. The thuggish shaven head and abrupt manner weren't a veneer for some misunderstood poetic soul. Sometimes, though, they seemed to be a shield held up against the terror of failure. I know that feeling, Hoffman. I know what it's like to be afraid that your mistakes could mean the end of your people. Commander, Hoffman grunted. Colonel, Tresca said. Are you flying reconnaissance today? Yes. Then I'd like to join you. Hoffman always responded best to plain language. If I go back to my people with a first-hand report rather than relaying yours, it will be far easier to manage their expectations. They won't swallow my imperialist COG bullshit, you mean? Exactly. Hoffman pointed to one of the ravens without blinking, as if the comment had bounced straight off him. In another world, Tresca decided he might have grown to like the man. KR239. He said. Make yourself comfortable, Commander. The Raven crew chief greeted Tresco at the door with a casual salute and handed him a radio headset. The tab on his armor said Mitchell K, and he looked to be in his early twenties. The pendulum wars were probably only a vague memory from his childhood if he recalled them at all, and that brought home to Tresco how few years separated the seasoned vets like Phoenix from the men they now served with. The word Indy didn't evoke quite the same emotion in the likes of Mitchell as it did in the others. The monsters he'd grown up dreading were locusts, not other humans. And my son. He doesn't remember any other kind of war. Or a Gorisnea with an army and an empire. We're going to wreck you the interior, sir, Mitchell said, fiddling around with a battered camera. He indicated the lens. Don't tell Baird, but I liberated one of the bot video feeds. Won't he realize that when he sees the images? Too late then, sir possessions nine-tenths of the law. The camera had a distinctive logo, the stylized ever-watching eye of the Efren TV station that Tresco had once despised for being a tame propaganda mouthpiece for the COG. Did you liberate that too? There's only bad news these days, Mitchell said. The hacks are much happier now they're doing something productive. Productive? Crops need growing. Homes need building. Mitchell stuck his head out of the bay door and tested the camera's focus. It's not as if there's any real news to cover, is there? The COG hadn't changed much, then. And they had the audacity to call us an oppressive regime. Phoenix and Dom Santiago jumped into the helicopter followed by Hoffman. He sat down facing Tresco and didn't wait for the raven to get airborne before refolding a map and slapping it on Tresco's knees. The two men were a meter apart, no more, but Tresco had to listen on the radio to hear him. Here's the geology. Hoffman ran his forefinger along curving penciled lines on the map, his hands surprisingly well manicured despite a lot of cuts and bruises. Big rifts in the bedrock here, here, and here. Basically, they cut off the northwest of the island, slice through the central uplands, and fork south around here. They're mostly at the center around the volcano. Trescu studied the map. The single north-south fissure on the survey map stopped 40 kilometers north of the naval base. The stalks might not be able to reach the settlement, then. But we don't know how many small fissures and lava tunnels there are. We'll see. Trescu was aware of Phoenix studying him just an occasional passing glance, but whenever Phoenix was looking, Tresca knew he was analyzing. Tresca didn't attempt to carry on the conversation as the helicopter headed north over farmland and into the island's interior. Ravens seemed much noisier than the UIR's chimeras, but perhaps he was just letting the filter of nostalgia deceive him. There were no chimeras left for comparison. Dom didn't meet his eyes. He was staring out of the bay door, his rifle on his lap, but it was hard to tell if his mind was on something else, or if he simply didn't like the company of an indie. Yannick, always gossiping with the unfortunate Donald Matheson, said Dom's brother had been killed in the Pendulum Wars, like Lieutenant Stroud's mother. The years that had passed hadn't healed or erased the pain, but had simply been crossed off in calendars. Tresca understood that too. The radio crackled. 
I'm following the line of the rift now, the pilot said. Can't see anything yet. Beneath them was thick virgin forest. The heart of the island was an extinct volcano. There were probably fascinating creatures down there that had developed in isolation from the rest of Sarah, but they were an uncurious lot, the COG. They must have had a presence here for centuries, and yet they'd left this place untouched and remained satisfied with an existence on the fertile coast and lowlands. And this was where they developed chemical and biological weapons to use against us. Hard to imagine I'm helping them defend it now. Phoenix turned his head suddenly and pressed his finger to his earpiece. Siraki, look due east. Can you see a light patch in the trees? Got it. The raven turned. Come on, Mitchell. Turn over rolling, action. Did I get that in the right order? Mitchell's shoulders shook as if he was laughing. Tresca couldn't hear him, but he saw him say something as he attached his safety line to the rail and braced himself against the frame to steady the camera. The raven dropped to twenty meters above the tree canopy, sending a flock of black and white birds wheeling from the branches. Tresca craned his neck as far as he could to catch a glimpse of whatever Phoenix had spotted. It's okay, it's only a couple of dead trees. Normal ones. Mitchell lowered his camera. Keep going, Mel. Okay, back on course, Siraki said. So what's Professor Baird's theory, then? I do miss his informative yet abrasive commentary, don't you? Ingress via cave systems. Marcus unbuckled and moved to the door gun. Makes sense. We've seen them come up from the seabed. So are they like fungi or something? You know, all the real activity goes on underground and all you see above the ground are the fruiting bodies and the spores. Dom stirred. Wow, it's just like having Baird right here with us. He's got a point, said Phoenix. Siraki sounded amused rather than offended. Yes, chopper pukes have active intellects too, Dom. I still don't see where the polyps fit in, though. One minute they're on leviathans, then they're on stalks. Maybe they're like ants. Phoenix had never seemed the kind for small talk. They get everywhere. What triggers them to detonate? Tresk asked. Do they wander around looking for a victim? Or do they combust anyway? No idea, Dom said. But why do they combust? Why does any organism self-destruct as a matter of routine? I can think of only one thing. Reproduction. Phoenix made a noise that might have been a laugh if he'd given it a chance. God damn. We never asked that. I'm Garasni, Tresca said. We're a very pessimistic people. It saves time. Doesn't take us much further, though. Hoffman adjusted his binoculars. It probably doesn't matter if that's how the lambent spread if the only way we know how to stop them is to blow them up. I think that's known as lose-lose. Tresca had no answer to that. He spent the rest of the flight watching the body language of the gears around him. It was as educational as interrogating them, even if it didn't fill in the detail. Phoenix looked at Hoffman as if he were a distant father he wished he could understand. Hoffman occasionally glanced at Phoenix as if searching for the right moment to say something and never finding it. His interaction with Dom seemed much more relaxed and born of an old familiarity. Hoffman made direct eye contact with him, and when he wanted to get his attention to point out some feature in the landscape, he didn't rely on the radio. He leaned across and tapped his knee. Those two knew each other well. There was genuine affection. Hoffman's set jaw relaxed for a few moments before returning to grim contemplation of whatever haunted him. And there was a strong bond between Phoenix and Dom. Phoenix kept looking at him, just a second's pause in his regular sweep of the cabin, but dwelling on him long enough to show concern. When their eyes met, Dom nodded almost imperceptibly as if to reassure him he was okay. Ah, yes. This is the man who had to put his wife down like a dog. This is the man who searched for her for ten years and found her far too late. But still he goes on. We all refuse to accept the inevitable end. Tresca thought of all the species that had become extinct on Sarah over the eons and wondered if any of them had been convinced that they would survive because they were somehow too special to die. He doubted it. 
Only humans could believe the world couldn't exist if they weren't around to validate it with their presence. God damn it, Hoffman muttered. He pressed his field glasses to his face. Siraki, I don't like what I'm seeing. Forty-five degrees to your port side, range about two clicks. Roger that. The raven loop left. Yeah. I see it now. Tresca turned in his seat to look. In the ocean of green, he could see a dark patch. For a moment he thought it was another variety of stalk and slipped his rifle off his lap, ready to open fire if the branches turned out to be swarming with polyps. But it was clear when the raven got within a few hundred meters that it was a stand of dead trees. These weren't bleached ash gray with age. The trunks were covered in normal bark, but every leaf was brown and withered. Test a theory for me, Phoenix said. See what's in the center of that. I can guess, Soraki said. Come on, Mitchell, it's photo opportunity time. Soraki brought the raven down to fifty meters above the dead area. It was wider than Tresca had first thought, a good hundred meters across. And at the heart of the destruction were a couple of stalks, now just spent husks like some abstract piece of sculpture. Everyone looked down as the raven circled. Tresca caught the expressions, the same tight-lipped realization that wherever the stalks emerged, the vegetation around them died. Hoffman glanced at Marcus as if he wanted confirmation of something that Tresca could only guess at. That's what's going to kill us if the glowies don't get us first, Marcus said. Loss of workable land. Crop shortages. Mitchell, get me a picture with some scale in it. Hoffman marked something on his map. Then we come back and check the spread every twenty-six hours. Mitchell leaned out and ran the camera in short bursts. Maybe we'll work out a formula. Like one stock puts out enough shit to kill however many square meters of land. It was fascinating to watch a communal theory form. Trescu agreed with their unspoken assessment, but he didn't join in. This was an island, and an island that relied wholly on its agriculture. There was nowhere left to import food from. Vex might as well have been the entire world. And this island used to be the COG's biological research center before they decommissioned it. Such elegant irony. They keep forgetting that. We don't. Okay, Siraki, move on. Hoffman sat back and took off his cap to run his hand over his shaven scalp. If we're lucky, the stalks won't spread far beyond the fissures, and the contaminated zones will have a limit. We can work around that. And if we're not lucky? Tresca asked, knowing the answer. He just wanted to hear Hoffman's strategy for survival. Then we might end up teetering on the ledge, Hoffman said and we'll have to decide when to jump. CNB Sovereign, Deepwater Berth, Vex Naval Base, one week later. I hope you brought him up, said Michelson. The captain stood with his back to Hoffman, shuffling irritably through piles of papers on his desk. The day cabin looked like a grenade had hit it. Paper was stacked on every surface and inspection hatches hung open with their wiring looms spilling out like entrails. Hoffman could have sworn his boots squelched as he trod on the rug. The warship, the last raven's nest carrier still operational, was starting to show her age. Spring cleaning, Quinton? Damn leak, Michelson said. They're still trying to track it. You know how leaks are, they can show up a long way from where they started. I'm rescuing my paperwork. Hoffman checked out the big blue leather chair on the far side of the cabin before he risked planting his ass in it. He picked up the sheaf of papers stacked on the cushion before he sat down, and tidied them into a pile on his lap. Beats a leak that starts from the bottom up, I suppose, he said, glancing up at the deckhand for telltale droplets. Ah, uh, Victor, you're getting the hang of the Navy at last. What are you looking for? A list of pendulum war fuel caches. Damn, you keep filing that far back? Hoffman looked through the papers on his lap. They were detailed logs at least on the side he was looking at. When he flipped one over he found the reverse had been used for something else entirely, a penciled diagram of some collision damage. Some of the pages had that velvety texture that came from being repeatedly erased and reused. I never realized how many records you saved, 
We jettisoned decades worth at HQ when we banged out of Jacinto. I saved some rum, too. Help yourself. Under the bridge repeater. But I need that list. Proper rum? Not moonshine? Hoffman ducked down and rummaged in the cubbyhole. He pulled out a five-liter steel canister that could have held anything from acid to fuel. I'll take a rain check. Thought you'd run out of the good stuff. The day we run out of rum is the day NCOG ceases to exist, Victor. Rum? Not to still beat alcohol with caramel, or however Dizzy makes his brew. No disrespect to Private Wallen, but I like my paralyzing agents to have a little subtlety. Ah, uh, got it. Michelson flicked through a doggered manual with a brown cloth cover. There must be some caches nobody's found. Optimist. Not necessarily. When you reduce the population of a planet by 99% in the space of a few years, fuel reserves don't get used. New fuel doesn't get refined either. It's still worth investigating. We don't yet know how Olivar's damned pirate fleet stays fueled, do we? And they're still out there, Victor. We pick up the odd radio transmission. Hoffman shrugged. Good luck to him. If the assholes tried to come back, we can commandeer their vessels and drain the tanks. Royston's been bending my ear about the rate we're using fuel. And mine. But I need to keep my birds in the air right now. You diverted all the way down here to say that? No, I just wanted a word with you in private before the meeting. Hoffman wanted to clear his yardarm, as Michelson was fond of saying, before he got down to discussing encroaching stocks or fuel crises. He hadn't told Michelson that he'd stolen Prescott's encrypted data. It wasn't that he didn't trust him, he did. But he was an old friend, an ally, and a decent man didn't burden his friends with information that would compromise them. And how would I feel if he'd had the disc and didn't tell me? Hoffman would have felt betrayed. So he had to level with Michelson. If he didn't, he was as bad as Prescott, withholding information from his own people when it might actually make a difference. If we even knew what the hell it was. He put the pile of papers on the nearest dry surface. The cabin smelled of disinfectant and damp wool. Every sound including his heartbeat became unnaturally magnified. Quinton, you know I told you there's something you'd be better off not knowing? Oh dear. Michelson raised his finger for silence and dogged the door shut. Go ahead. I'm all grown up now. I can take it. I've got a data disc that troubles me. Michelson raised an eyebrow. He put his hand flat on the steel door as if he was monitoring vibrations. Maybe he was. What's on it? No goddamn idea. I've got Baird trying to decrypt it. I stole it. Good grief. From Prescott? So much for my discretion. That's quite an inspired guess. Michelson shrugged. Well, who else is likely to be clinging to classified information when we're going to hell in a handbasket? He's done it before. Do you think he knows it's missing yet? Hoffman sometimes had out-of-body moments when he could see and hear himself as a stranger might. The stranger who studied him at that moment found it faintly ludicrous that a veteran gear whose decisions had shaped an entire war could be reduced to playing stupid motherfucking games with the head of state, while the world was circling the drain. Oh, he knows I took it. Maybe Prescott wanted him to take it. No, this was getting too layered and complicated. He could hear Bernie scolding him for wasting energy on endless what-ifs. We had harsh words about it. Michelson, still leaning on the door, blinked a few times as if he was busy thinking. It's chaff, he said flatly. A diversionary tactic. You think he'd keep anything that sensitive on a disc? Yeah, I've had that discussion with Baird. But even Prescott can't retain high volumes of complicated data in his brain. He can wind you up like a clockwork toy, Victor. It's a decoy. But what would he try to divert me from? Hoffman wasn't offended by the observation. Prescott was manipulative. That was part of the job description for a politician, and Hoffman knew his own buttons were obvious and easy to press. Yeah, but he's still got to deal with me. 
I'm damned if I can think of anything a sane person would need to conceal at this stage of the game. Sane, Michelson said. That raises a question we haven't really factored into the equation yet. God damn, don't even start me thinking that he might be mentally unfit for office. Where the hell would that leave us? Without a deputy to replace him, or a court system to challenge his fitness. Hoffman didn't like where this was going. There was an inevitability to it. The last thing he'd ever thought would go wrong was Prescott's mind. No, the crafty bastard wasn't crazy. This was business as usual for him. He'd held back crucial information so many times before that it was a reliable sign of normality for Prescott. Look, if I see him talking to any trees, Hoffman said, I promise I'll take him out back and shoot him myself. Out of kindness. Michelson pocketed the radio handbook. You'll let me know if I can do anything on the encryption front, won't you? You got anything better than Baird? On software? Alas, no, but the offer stands. Who else knows about this? Delta Squad. Bernie. Naturally. But I haven't told Ani yet. Does she need to know? I've never kept anything from her. I need my inner circle. Okay. Put on your loyal face and let's go see the boss fella. Bernie had taken to calling Hoffman, Michelson and Tresca the triumvirate, as if they were a power block of some kind. She had a point, because that was how things were starting to shake out. They met Prescott a couple of times a week in Admiralty House for a sitrep, sometimes with civilian representatives present, sometimes not. Today was a not day. Hoffman had never been a meetings kind of man, but these sessions mattered. It was more than a chance to pool information and plan. It was an opportunity to sniff the pheromones and work out who was up to what and Prescott had to look him in the eye. He had to sit across the table from Hoffman knowing that his most senior officer had his precious disc and was working on cracking it. And don't think I'm not looking at every other damn thing you're doing, asshole. When Hoffman opened the door, Prescott was studying some charts pinned on the wall, a pencil in one hand. Trescu, arms folded across his chest, sat at the far end of the table watching him in silence, as if he was working out the best angle for a headshot. At least there wasn't much chance of him ganging up with the chairman. But then Tresca always looked like an utter bastard. It was the combination of the immaculately trimmed black beard and that dark, dead, intense stare that did it. And the fact that he blew a prisoner's brains out in front of me. That as well. But at least you know where you stand with him. Soraki just dropped off the latest aerial recon images, gentlemen, Prescott said, not looking away from the wall. The chart was a map of Vex peppered with flag pins. He marked something on it. Main item on today's agenda, the contaminated zones are still spreading. So far, we appear to have lost 50 hectares of crops and pasture. Worst scenario plan, please. Tresca looked at Hoffman and nodded toward the other end of the table. The reconnaissance images were fanned out in a sequence. Hoffman and Michelson sat down to leaf through them. Royston's already got that in hand, Hoffman said. He's our end-of-the-world guy. Where is he, by the way? Prescott still didn't look at Hoffman. He's gone to revise his worst-case scenario. Up or down? Charles normally told Hoffman everything. Is this about fuel? Well, the less fuel we have the more creative we'll need to be about where to relocate. Ah, screw him. I'll ask Charles myself. Hoffman dropped the subject and noted the time between images. He was looking down almost vertically on the suddenly familiar crown of a stalk with a patch spreading out from its trunk like a shadow. The dead area wasn't uniform, more a ragged ink blot in most shots, but he could still see that the zones were expanding more slowly as the hours and days went on. Maybe it'll stop. Maybe things can improve. The math would take me hours. Michelson said. So, broad brush strokes. 5,000 square kilometers of island, mostly virgin forest or mountain, and we can't see much of what's going on in there. We live on the cultivated margins and depend wholly on what we can grow and graze. How many stalks is it going to take to destroy enough arable land to starve us out? 
That was about the size of it. Nobody mentioned polyps. They had suddenly become a temporary problem compared to what the stocks could do in the longer term. Polyps could be detonated. The toxin, or whatever it was, couldn't. Hoffman took a breath. We still can't tell if there's a limit to how far these things can extend beyond the fissures. The gamble is how long we wait before we start relocating people. All I'm seeing, Prescott said, still not meeting Hoffman's eyes, is that there's a fissure running more or less east-west and cutting off Peruin from the rest of Vex. Are we going to wake up to a stock hedge across the north of the island? We have an evacuation plan in place, Chairman. I don't want to implement it until we have to. We've got some serious work to do before we shift three or four thousand people down here. Is your Hammer of Dawn satellite network still working? Tresk asked. All of it, I mean. Answering a question like that from a UIR officer would once have been unthinkable. XUIR, Hoffman reminded himself. He's one of us now. We had a hell of a job even hitting that Leviathan with it, Hoffman said. The sats are starting to fail. And we can't incinerate stocks every time they pop up. I wasn't thinking of its destructive capacity. Tresca got up and walked over to the chart as if Prescott wasn't even there. Can it relay images? I understood it could. Prescott didn't move out of his way. Oh, did you? That's the weather sat system, Michelson said. It's almost inoperable. The long-range comms network will go down next. If you could acquire images from low orbit, you wouldn't need your ravens to fly reconnaissance. Tresca took his knife from his belt, then stepped aside to open the sash window. He started sharpening his pencil, sending shavings floating away on the breeze. But I imagine you've already considered that. Hoffman hadn't, because the weather sats weren't that good to start with. The resolution was fine for big weather systems. Anything as small as a stock on the ground was beyond them. We'll look into it, he said. Trescu inspected the tip of his pencil and sat down again. When do you plan to start rationing? Fuel or food? Michelson asked. Either. Both. Prescott was tossing a pin in his palm while he studied the map. Then he looked Hoffman in the eye for the first time since he'd walked in, and pressed the pin slowly into the board with his thumb. Food's effectively controlled by central distribution anyway, he said. People don't have grocery stores to plunder. We're old hands at calculating how many calories any given human needs to survive, aren't we, Colonel? We're pretty good at stretching emulsion supplies, too, but that doesn't mean we'll never run out. I've got the latest minimum figures, if anyone's interested. Michelson opened his notebook. The chief engineer's drawn up his best estimate of how much of each fuel we need to set aside to guarantee getting the fleet back to the mainland. Trescu tilted his head. A one-way trip? Yes. Using the minimum number of hulls required to move the existing population. Not cruise-level comfort, and no margin for error. This is the last resort scenario. The window was still open. Hoffman could hear the puttering sound of a distant outboard and the rhythmic whoosh and thud of waves hitting the granite cliff beneath the naval base. There were no centaurs rumbling along the roads, no distant pounding of artillery shells, no city noises at all. This time, though, the quietness wasn't blissfully peaceful, but a reminder of how impossibly distant from the mainland this island was. We always plan to resettle the mainland one day, Prescott said. Let's not paint this as the start of a panicky retreat, shall we? The intention to return has been public from day one. He gathered up the images and put them in a battered folder. By the way, I want squads to gather samples from each stock site, especially if there's anything unusual. Twenty meter tall instant trees and killer crabs not unusual enough, Chairman? Michelson said. I mean anything that shows change. Prescott flapped one hand vaguely. It wasn't a gesture he used often. Different features on the stocks. Other life forms that are affected. We were getting quite a lambent menagerie trawled up in the fishing nets, remember? Now, any other business? Did we decide anything? Tresca asked irritably. Very well, I'll see you all later. Prescott swept out. 
As he opened the door, Hoffman caught sight of his personal protection gears, Rivera and Lowe, waiting outside. They vanished down the stairs with him. What was it Baird called them? The Onyx Guard Rejects. It was acidly cruel, as Baird usually was, but they did behave more like the security elite these days than regular gears. The Onyx Guard was long gone, though like so many other units. Tresca sat staring at the open door for a few moments. What is he afraid of? He asked. It was a good question. Hoffman got up to leave. Never seen him afraid of anything. Not even when he was face to face with a grub. In any other man, that'd make me admire him. That man is afraid. Trescu stood up and pointed in the direction of the stairs with the pencil. Can't you see it? We're all investing in brown underwear now, Miran. Michelson said. Miran? So they were that chummy. Maybe the chairman's finally got the picture too. Hoffman jumped to one conclusion. It was about the disc. Tresca had some kind of radar for detecting weakness in others, much like Prescott's, and Hoffman was inclined to trust it. If Tresca said the man was rattled, then maybe Hoffman was getting too close to something. He almost, almost started telling Trescu about the disc. Old habit from another war shut him up before he parted his lips. I'm going to crunch some fuel numbers with Royston, he said, and left Trescu with Michelson. Garasni Camp, New Jacinto, 15A. Trescu paused on the edge of the camp and scanned the rows of tents. It was just as well that the warm season was coming, and Vex had a mild climate anyway. At least he didn't have to worry about losing more people to hypothermia like last winter. But that was little comfort when he considered that he could take in what was left of the entire Gorisnean nation with one slow glance across a refugee camp. This was all they had, tents, the possessions they could carry, and the few animals and vehicles they could load onto ships for the voyage. They'd arrived on Vex with an emulsion platform still operating out at sea, but now they didn't even have that. They were stranded. The word alone almost choked him. As in marooned. Not as in filthy savages. Never that. Irony was inventively sadistic. The Garasni now had less to their names than those gangs of stranded vermin. Tresca's instinct for survival, a communal thing, not his individual welfare, insisted he never stop thinking about how far Gorisnea had fallen in the world order of Sarah since his great-grandfather's day. It was all that kept him from going under. We were an empire. This should never have happened. He walked on. He made a point of having lunch with his wife and son every day, however brief that meal might be. Three rows into the tent village, New wooden huts had already sprung up to replace those burned down when the polyps had swarmed through the naval base. A couple of men, Georgie and Emenu, were nailing oilcloth onto the roof of one of the huts and paused to acknowledge him. A small tabby cat lay curled in the doorway, basking in the sun. I know my entire nation by name. Every last man, woman, and child. Even that damn cat. That's something only a dying people can manage. How's it going, sir? Georgie called. We heard the raven pilots on the radio. The stocks are poisoning more farmland. I wouldn't worry too much yet. Tresca called back. It was hard to keep anything quiet in a community this size and he'd given up trying. He wasn't sure he even wanted any secrets these days, and he didn't care if Hoffman knew his comms were monitored. He knew Hoffman monitored his. Chairman Prescott has a map on his wall with pins stuck in it. So everything is under control, thanks to the might of the COG's little pins. Shouldn't we be thinking about our own evacuation plan? The stocks are a long way from here. And where do you plan to run? Vex is still safer than the mainland. We won't have enough fuel to leave. I promised the COG that we would join them if they protected us. Tresca said. And I should be planning to save my own people, not drowning hand in hand with the COG. Until they break their word, that's the way it stays. He looked down at the cat. And you, Saska, stay clear of Sergeant Mataki. She's on the prowl for fur linings. Tresca continued his walk through the camp, 
taking the long route home so that he was seen. It mattered. It was how he maintained command. There were many here who thought he was a traitor for agreeing a formal peace with the old enemy, let alone joining the COG and allowing them access to the emulsion, men like I and Kunarisai. Just muttering. Just idle noise. None of them had made a move against him. None of them had the balls to dare. He was a Trescu, for God's sake. His father had defeated superior COG forces at Branascu, and his grandfather had driven them back from the border. He had pedigree. Goris Nea had never signed the surrender because it had never been defeated, however weak it had become over the centuries, and that was because men of Tresca lineage had been in command. I handed over our fuel and our future to Prescott and Hoffman. But they're not the enemy. They're not the ones killing us now. When he reached his own tent, nothing fancy, nothing better than his people had, he could see that Alina had company. Stefan Graydon, a man at a loose end now that his emulsion platform had been destroyed, and Theodore Marisk, Tresca's senior warrant officer, just Theo to just about everyone, were sitting outside passing a smoke back and forth between them. They got up slowly as if they were stiff from sitting down too long. Your missus booted us out, commander. Teo said. We have to smoke outside now, she says. Good for her. Tresca took the roll-up out of Teo's hand and ground it under his heel. Filthy habit. And a dangerous one in a flammable environment. Remind me to ban it. Come on, let's eat. Elena gave him a wink as he ducked into a tent fragrant with the aroma of lamb and garlic. It was amazing what a smart woman could cook on a camping stove. Pyotr, ten years old and already a good shot, was cleaning his rifle in the corner with a frown of intense concentration. So is this a command meeting or lunch? Elena asked pointedly. Tresca walked up behind her and kissed the top of her head. Because lunch gets you fed and a meeting doesn't. And don't try sweet-talking me. I wouldn't dare, beloved. Can the boys stay? They've been waiting to see me. Hungry work waiting. Okay. But you'll have to fill yourselves up on bread. I only made enough for three servings. They can have mine, Pyotr said. I don't mind. No, you've got a lot of growing to do. Tresca pulled the chair back from the table and motioned to his son to sit down. The meeting would take place with the boy there, joining in if he had something to say, not conducted over his head as if he were incapable of understanding what faced his people. It was essential that he learned what it took to hold a nation together. The duty might well fall to him one day. So eat everything your mother puts in front of you. Understand? Yes, Dad. Good. Tresca reached for the bread basket and tossed a couple of knot-shaped rolls to Teo and Stefan. Now, what's so important that it can't wait until after lunch? Weird shit, Commander, Stefan said, using the tyrant phrase. We were testing the engines in a Mireille Enka and we picked up a stray transmission. It broke in on the old maritime control frequency. What was it? I don't know. It was a data burst. Like satellite noise, you know? Not a scrambled COG channel? I know what their scrambled channels sound like. This wasn't it. And they're not bothering to encrypt now anyway. Tresca's first thought was that Hoffman was testing the hammer of Dawn Uplink. He could simply ask the man, of course, and he was pretty sure he'd get a straight answer. Well, they did admit the hammer net was failing. Perhaps he thinks the hammer generally is too touchy a subject. At least that means he doesn't want to alienate us. Dad, are they going to bomb us again? Pyotr asked. History was a live beast for Gerasny. Pyotr hadn't even been born when the COG had launched the Hammer of Dawn strike, let alone the Pendulum Wars. Elena gave Tresco a weary look, passed around the bowl of lamb casserole, and said nothing. He knew she disapproved. She didn't want her son taught to hate strangers. He had to find a good reason of his own, she said. I don't want him to have one. Because then it'll be too late. And maybe the COG won't kill us deliberately. Maybe they'll just make another lethal mistake. I have to be able to trust their competence. Don't worry, they don't have any more bombs, Tresca said. 
Only the hammer. And if they used it on us. He looked at Alina. It would be out of carelessness. Like they vaporize their own people to save them. So that's all right. Isn't it? You're doing that tight voice, Daddy. The one where it's a joke but it isn't actually funny. I'm sorry, Piotr. There was nothing like a perceptive child to put a man in his place. You're old enough to understand this. It's too early to completely trust the COG without question after so many years of war, and they seem to feel the same about us. We have to earn one another's trust. But they killed everyone. They burned all the cities. They burned their own, too. I know that's hard to understand. Tresca tried to be neutral to appease Alina. But the locusts were so dangerous that the COG thought it was worth doing anything to try to stop them. But they didn't burn Jacinto. Piotr seemed to be following the logic pretty competently. And the Lambent are even worse, everyone says. So, why don't they use the hammer again? It doesn't work properly now. Trescu began to worry that Piotr was storing up a few nightmares for later. He had to distract him. And Hoffman's okay. He wouldn't do it again. His wife died when the COG burned its cities, you see. Teo cocked his head. Where did you hear that? Yannick, Tresca said. He chats with Lieutenant Matheson. Not much hard intel, but lots of interesting gossip. So what do we do about the data burst? Teo asked. Tresca went on eating. Nothing. And I don't want everyone thinking we're about to be incinerated, Teo, be sensible. Tell me if it happens again. But leave me to raise the matter with Hoffman. Piotr fished a chunk of leg bone out of his casserole and peered into the hole. He loved the marrow. It was his special treat and Alina made sure he always got it now that meat was back on the menu. Trescu watched him scrape it out with the tip of his knife, frowning with concentration, and spread it on a crust. Vex could have been a pleasant, well-fed exile. But it wasn't Gorisnea, and he had to remember that. Dad, am I allowed to speak to the cogs? Piotr asked. He took a child's delight in using the word. It brushed close to a Gerasni profanity. Is it true they eat cats? Stefan chuckled. Only the sniper woman with the dog. Have you seen her boots? Tabby fur. They've got a real thrash ball star, Piotr, Elena said, shooting Stefan her narrow-eyed shut-up look. Maybe it's better if you talk to him. Everybody loved thrash ball. Piotr's face lit up. Can I, Dad? Please? I'll see what I can do, Tresca said, winking. He cleared his plate and got up, beckoning to Teo to follow him. Sorry to run, Elena, but we have to check a few things. Once they were at a safe distance from the tent, Stefan lit up another messily rolled cheroot. He looked sheepish when Tresca glared at him, but he lit it anyway. Ah, uh, I couldn't smoke on the rig, Commander, he said. Don't be too hard on me. Very well, enjoy it while you can. Tresca checked his watch, the gold one his father had given him. It had been his grandfather's, too. Both men would have had a fallback plan ready to roll out even with their most trusted allies. They would have expected no less of him. I want the contingency plan. I want to know how much fuel we could lay our hands on and how many people we could evacuate to the nearest land if we reach a point where we think the COG is unwise to stay here. Teo gave him a thumbs-up gesture and slapped Stefan on the back, making him cough up smoke. Even if the plan was never put into action, just knowing it was there would reassure people. But I like the cog's tail, Stefan said, wiping his mouth on the back of his hand. You weren't an emerald spar when the polyps attacked. You didn't see how the gears fought to save us. Not the drilling platform. Us. I was there, Tresca said. And you're right. They risked their lives for us. But this isn't about friendship or gratitude. It's about being prepared. Stefan gave him a wary look. You wouldn't return the favor? You wouldn't go to their aid if they needed us? Tresca felt his scalp tighten a little. He felt suddenly dishonorable. He was doing his sworn duty, putting the defense of the Garasni nation first, 
but the thought that he might abandon Gears to their fate after fighting alongside them suddenly stuck in his throat. The psychological bonds forged in combat didn't take much notice of flags, borders, or promises made to dying fathers. That came as a surprise to him. We'll have to keep them out of trouble then, Tresca said. However justified his prejudices were, the world wasn't a clear-cut place. Just so they don't drag us down with them. Of course, sir, Teo said. Very wise. Chapter 6 My father warned me that a politician couldn't be a hero until he was dead and history put him in context. I have no ambition to be a hero, but I would like to be understood one day. Our job is the necessary dirty work that nobody else wants. Hoffman would understand that. A soldier's job is much the same. But would Marcus Phoenix believe my reasons for acting as I did? And does it matter as long as Saran survived to have the luxury of debating whether I was a coward or a traitor? Part of me thinks it does. This is why politicians write memoirs. It's our plea in mitigation. Chairman Richard Prescott, son of former Chairman David Prescott, from his unpublished memoirs, KR 239, on patrol over North Vex. My mom used to do this, Soraki said. Dom had his gaze fixed on the landscape beneath scanning the woods for trees that didn't belong there. What, she strafed armored columns? Marcus watched from the other door. It was oddly quiet without Baird and Cole. Even Mitchell, manning the door gun, hadn't said much that morning. I mean on long car journeys, Soraki said. Count the red trucks. Or cows. Or twin-timeter high invasive life forms. Dom recalled doing much the same with his kids. Benny and Sylvie. His breath jammed in his throat for a second. What keeps you cheerful, Lieutenant? Okay, I'll shut up. No, I mean it. I've never seen you in a shitty mood. Ever. There was a sudden silence, or at least the radio conversation stalled. It was turning into one of those accidentally serious conversations that Dom tried to avoid in case he found himself talking about Maria or the kids and making everyone squirm. He caught himself thinking about them a lot less now. He wasn't sure if that meant he was successfully shutting out the pain, or just coming to terms with his loss. Acceptance. Maybe you do get there in the end somehow, just like the bereavement counselor said. I just program myself, Soraki said at last. What? Go through the physical motions often enough and the feeling becomes real. It's a feedback thing. I read it somewhere. Force a smile often enough and eventually your brain registers happy. Signal in becomes signal out. This was the point at which Baird would have bitched about crackpot pseudoscience and popped the bubble of a promising discussion. Dom glanced across the crew cabin and caught Marcus's eye. For a moment, he seemed distracted from the job in hand and looked as if he was listening intently for the next tip. Everybody wanted to know how to make the pain go away, even Marcus. I'll try it, Dom said. Gittiner's switch got stuck the other way, I think. Yeah, is she all right? She's not herself lately. Fatigue, I reckon. Can't talk yourself out of that. By the time Dom looked around, Marcus was focused on the terrain again. They hadn't clocked any new stocks today. Dom caught himself falling into a familiar bargaining loop. If he suppressed any hopeful thoughts that the stocks might be thinning out, then he wouldn't have to face the plummeting disappointment when they popped up again. Like all persistent things, though, trying to unthink them just made them impossible to shut out. He understood all too well now why Dizzy relied on alcohol. It was a tool. It was no different from Soraki's feedback trick, just tougher on the liver and less respectable in a society that prided itself on stoic discipline and clean living. Contact, Marcus said. Port side, range about 500 meters. Just above the top of the trees. Soraki turned the raven. Oh. Yes. Nice healthy crop. Dom had to lean out of the crew bay to see the stalks. Twisted charcoal gray branches poked above the tops of the trees. There was still plenty of green foliage around them, so these had only just erupted. He caught a strong whiff of fuel on the air. 
Shit, have you serviced this bird recently, Saratki? He asked. Smells like you're leaking juice. Pre-flight checks. We do them, Dom. It still stinks. The raven was about a hundred meters from the stalks now. Dom couldn't see any movement, but that didn't mean there weren't any polyps. Don't waste ammo, Marcus said. Shoot them if they're a direct threat, but we can't pick them all off every damn time. Is there anything we're not running out of? Marcus grunted. Yeah. We've got hydroelectricity. Great, we can run this bird on batteries then, Suraki said. I'm going in to get a closer look. Mitchell? Time to get snapping. Prescott wants to see every poxy freckle on these things. Yeah, shame he hasn't got a PhD in biology, Dom said. Why the sudden interest? Is he a stock spotter now or something? No idea. Desperation, maybe. The raven tracked slowly along the line of the stalks. Dom studied his map, hand-drawn by Matheson, and it looked like the stalks were behaving as expected. They were following the fissure, pushing up through the softer bedrock and soil that filled the gap in the granite. Whoa, hold position for a moment, Mel, Mitchell said. I've got to line up the images with the grids. Any particular height, your majesty? No, I can adjust for that, thanks. Oh, good. Marcus gripped the safety rail above his head and leaned out of the door as far as he could. It looked so risky that Dom was about to step across and grab him, or at least snap a line on his belt. He was staring at something. His whole body suddenly tensed. Soraki, come around again. Whatever he'd spotted had rattled him. That wasn't like Marcus at all. There's something on the ground. How many legs? Not a glowy. I just saw a flash when the downdraft hit the leaves. A flash of what? You want to winch down? I don't recommend that. Dom cut in. Land somewhere sensible and we'll track back on foot. He said. Mitchell's got a fix on it, right? I saw a reflection. Marcus said. And there's no watercourse on the map. Ponds come and go without ever being mapped. Mitchell said. One of the thrills of navigating visually. Oh, I loved exploring ponds when I was a kid. Soraki was in full nostalgia mode today. Frog spawn. Diving beetles. Dragonflies. Haven't seen any of them for years, though. Everything's disappearing. I'm glad Baird's not here. Mitchell murmured. The raven looped away and headed for the nearest open ground. Dom knew he had to be Marcus's common sense when it came to personal safety. It was Marcus's only routine lapse of sanity. He was as rational and smart as his father, but when he ran into a risk, he had to be the first one to take it. Dom had worked out over the years that it wasn't the dumb ignorance of underestimating danger, or even that it can happen to me cockiness he saw in the youngest gears, but a compulsion to save, to rescue, to put himself in harm's way for others. Sacrificial. That's the word. Sacrifices appease. Who's he appeasing now? Plenty of things could make a kid grow up into a man who needed to be the one who took care of everyone else. Fear of losing them, guilt at having lost them, or even to make up for not being looked after himself. Dom watched Marcus's jaw twitching as he waited for Soraki to fly low enough for him to jump out. Maybe it was all three. What's so important about water? Dom asked. The one thing we've got plenty of here is rivers. Liquid, Marcus said. Reflections off liquid. He jumped down through the whirling storm of dust and leaves and ran clear of the rotors. Dom was still chewing on the word liquid as the raven lifted and left them standing in the clearing. They had two hundred meters to walk to find the target. The stench of fuel was still overwhelming. Now that Dom was used to clean country air, he noticed the background urban smells that his nose had learned to ignore in the city. Everything in the army had reeked of emulsion or lube oil, and so had Jacinto. He's got a leaking fuel line, for sure. Dom was annoyed that Soraki wasn't taking his warning seriously. I tell you, we're not getting back in that death trap until I've checked it myself. Liquid, Marcus said again. Come on. What? 
Dom could see the tops of the stalks anyway. He didn't need the compass. If this is a quiz, you win. Marcus strode ahead through the undergrowth. Dom followed, scanning from side to side for polyps. He wouldn't be able to hear them rustling in the bushes with the noise that Marcus was making. It was only when he noticed that the fuel smell was stronger than ever that realization dawned on him. Marcus, are we talking about emulsion? Is that it? Goddamn emulsion? Marcus glanced over his shoulder. He was as near to pleased as Dom had seen him in a long time, pleased for Marcus, anyway. The frown had vanished for a while. Yeah, and how was it first discovered? He asked, oozing out of the ground, pulling on the surface. Yeah, exactly. Dom wasn't too breathless about the prospect of a new fuel supply to keep his mind on the forest around him. He looked for damage to tree trunks and charred vegetation, straining to tune into the background clicks and rustles. Polyps would be hard to spot with all this cover. They could be up your ass before you knew it. Now I know why Bernie prefers to patrol with a dog. Marcus was fifty meters away from him by now, zigzagging from one side of their path to the other with his eyes on the ground. Remember that stuff's combustible. Dom called. Did you hear me, Marcus? Combustible. That was what made emulsion such a valuable fuel. It didn't need much refining and it released a lot of energy. If push came to shove, the crude could even be pumped straight into a vehicle as long as you didn't mind replacing the cylinder heads five times a year. Dom tried not to get his hopes up. How do I know all that? Dom remembered with another pang of loss that caught him off guard. His dad had told him. Eduardo Santiago had been a mechanic. He taught Dom how to strip down an engine before he was ten. Dom had forgotten most of it, but he hadn't forgotten how much he cherished those weekends spent tinkering with Rex in the workshop with his father and his brother Carlos, while his mother kept fetching trays of snacks. We were happy. It was easy to be happy. God. What I wouldn't give for one more hour with them all. Marcus? Dom couldn't see him. Shit. He was gone. Hey, Marcus? Marcus! Where the hell are you? He whipped around but all he could see was a palisade of tree trunks. His stomach nodded. He pressed his earpiece to try the radio, pulse pounding and his mouth suddenly dry. Marcus, come in. Something moved. Marcus suddenly rose from the undergrowth, as if he'd stood up from a squat. He had his arms at his sides, Lancer slung across his shoulder, and his head was tilted back as if he was looking up at the sky. But his eyes were shut. He didn't move a muscle. Dom wasn't sure what he was doing but he decided not to interrupt. Eventually Marcus opened his eyes and turned to look at Dom. He did that little triumphant nod that he reserved for special occasions. Emulsion. He pointed down at his boots. Dom could only see him from knees up. The stalks are growing through a pool of goddamn emulsion. Soraki, did you get that? No frogs. Emulsion. Soraki's whoop over the radio nearly deafened Dom. Fuck the frogs, Marcus. Fill her up. Yes, he definitely got it. Vex Naval Base, New Jacinto. Gossip spread fast in a community like the Naval Base. It was a strange creature known as Buzz, and on a good day it could overtake radio comms faster than a greased weasel. Baird realized today was a good day when Royston Shaw caught him rummaging through the waste metal skip behind the workshops again and didn't threaten to shoot him. It was an act of unashamed theft of precious recyclables, but for once Charles just laughed his ass off. Baird straightened up indignantly and peered at Charles over the skip's side. It's from Matheson. He blurted out his excuse before Charles could open his mouth. Nobody would dare bust him for helping a gear in a wheelchair. Me and some Garasni guys. We're making prosthetic legs for him. We need some metal blocks to machine. You know, I really ought to put down rat poison for you, Charles said. He was a big, cheerful guy who'd somehow stayed that way despite years of doing a job that was all about misery, death, and shortages. Maybe you had to be unhealthily optimistic to be an emergency manager. 
Go on, take it and sod off. You're worse than the stranded. And I'm going to change the lock on the gate this time. Gee, thanks. You're all heart. Beat it before I spread a rumor that you're not a completely selfish dick. Shao grinned. You heard then? You monitor the comms net. I know you do. What? Charles' grin spread further. Emulsion. Yeah, we're going to run out soon, and you want me to convert the ravens to run on Dizzy's moonshine. Or coal. I'm all over it. Really, I am. No, Phoenix found some. Baird's first thought was that the locals at Poruin had been hoarding a few hundred liters in a cowsheet, but then he decided it had to be something the stranded had left behind. Those assholes had caches of stuff laid up everywhere. But every little helped. Wow, so we can run sovereign for a few hundred meters. Baird stuffed his belt pouches full of scrap and started to clamber out of the skip. That's just terrific. Baird, you're out of the loop. Phoenix landed slap bang in an emulsion field. Perry's on his way up there with the indie rig guys to check it out. Baird paused with one knee on the steel ledge. No, that couldn't be right. Vex didn't have emulsion reserves. The geological survey didn't say anything about emulsion. The naval base had been built in the days of sailing ships, long before emulsion had even been discovered, so it wasn't as if the place was chosen because it had its own supply. And once everyone started using the stuff, the COG would have searched damned hard for a local source rather than ship it by tanker halfway across Sarah. He hoped nobody remembered his confident prediction that there was no fuel to drill for here. Barbara would never let him forget it. Okay. There had to be an explanation for this. Baird's world just wasn't that randomly lucky. The natural progression of things in life was to get worse, and the last fifteen years were living proof. I know Marcus is Mr. Perfect and everything he touches shits candy, but how the hell did he happen to find emulsion in the middle of nowhere? Stock patrol, said Charles. The stuff's oozing up all around the damn stocks. Whoa, I heard the S word there. A theory was crystallizing. What are the odds of that? Look, I don't care if the stuff has to be pumped out of Prescott's ass. We're going to extract as much as we can and be thankful. Charles disappeared into the workshops, whistling happily as if a new source of fuel made everything all right. Well, it meant they could fly more sorties, watch the stalks popping up everywhere, and maybe set fire to some more polyps. They'd have a stockpile to leave the island if they needed to. But it didn't change much else as far as Baird was concerned. He remembered what the world they fled looked like. It wasn't worth going back any time soon. He scrambled out of the skip and set off for his workshop to unload his haul, jangling and rattling as he walked. He'd take it over to Yannick the disemboweler after he finished his recon duty. It was handy to have something else to keep him occupied when he needed a break from that frigging computer screen telling him decryption failed or folder contains NO data. It contained data, all right. He could see that much. Cole, waiting at the helicopter pad, looked him up and down as he approached. Hey baby, you been rootin' in the trash again? Baird looked down at his armor. Why? You're covered in all kinds of shit. Yeah, I needed some parts. He mimed a hinge action with his wrist. Matheson. That's a real nice thing to do, Cole said, climbing into the raven. Barber stuck his head out of the cockpit door and nodded at them. And we got juice again. You heard what Marcus found? Yeah, I heard. You ain't exactly thrilled, are ya? I hide my giddy excitement well, don't I? The raven lifted off. Baird belted himself in and Barbara leaned over him, smirking. Emulsion, Barbara said slowly. Yeah, he remembered all right. And he was never going to shut up about it. What was it you said? If there was emulsion here, you'd devote your life to charitable work, if it was okay with the tooth fairy. Yeah, you did say that. You so did. Well, he's doing something kind for Matheson, Cole said. Don't that count? Baird heard Gedina laughing over the radio. That meant she'd hit the transmit button just to let him hear how hilarious she thought it was. She wasn't the laughing kind, 
so that hurt. Glad I could inject some happiness into your empty life, Major, Baird said. Now I hate to be a killjoy. No, you don't, she said. You fucking love it. It's your mission in life. But I've got a theory. Oh God. Here we go again. Yeah, I've said it before. The Glowies seemed to be attracted by emulsion. They ended up at the drilling platform, and they ended up here. Both places are so far off the chart that it can't be a coincidence. Oh, and the boats. They found teensy-weensy boats in the middle of a frigging big empty ocean. Maybe the emulsions bubbled up to the surface because the stocks opened a channel, Barbara said. And the boats the glowies blew up weren't all running on emulsion. Yeah, yeah? Look, I never said I had all the answers. But it's still too much of a pattern. Get in or interrupted. I just want fuel. I don't care if I've got to arm wrestle polyps personally to get it. As long as we can keep an eye on those things, we can survive. And the brown patches? It's not like a dog pissing on your lawn. They're killing the crops. Am I the only one who stayed conscious in math class or something? Cole swiveled in his seat so that the wind was in his face. He was probably going to throw up, but he always had the sense to check the slipstream first. Seems a bit premature to even be thinking about running away yet. It's a big island. We ain't seen that many stocks so far. I'm up for going home. Gittiner said it in a weird confessional kind of way. I really am. But there was no home left. Jacinto, the proper one, not this shack city, was just an interesting reef now, submerged by fifty meters of ocean. Well, that killed conversation stone dead. It was a bit of a shock. Baird hadn't realized that Gittiner felt that bad about life. Come on, folks. Cole stepped in to try to jolly them up. Watch me puke bomb the next swarm of polyps. Hey, anyone interested in setting up a thrash ball session for the kids? Like we did back in Port Farrell, remember? Yeah, and I froze my nuts off, Barbara muttered. Okay, I'm in. Nothing too violent, though. That's more like it. Cole gave Baird a don't start it look, eyebrows raised and chin down. So are we doing Peruin again today, ma'am? We'll do a sweep of the Fisher Zone, and then I'll land and pick up some admin stuff from Anya. Getting her sounded back to normal again after that gut spill about going home. Then we'll swing back via the existing stocks at the farm and grab some more images. Unless anyone wants to do a foot patrol, Baird. I can see just fine from here, thanks, Major. Baird had made up his mind. The Glowies probably followed the emulsion. It didn't account for everything, but it did explain why they were here. But why now? Why didn't they show up in emulsion fields before? Every day was like E-Day now. Everyone had asked the same questions about the grubs. But there was never an answer about where the locust had come from. The question was forgotten in the end, because an answer didn't seem to have much bearing on staying alive. Baird propped his lancer on his knee and kept his eyes on the countryside below. And what frigging use were our scientists? No damn answers. Well, none of the assholes were around now. At least there was some poetic justice in that. He watched the tops of the trees blur beneath him and felt discreetly for Prescott's data disc under his chest plate. What kind of encryption do the Indies use? No, that was one favor he couldn't ask Yannick. He shook off the idea and kept his mind on the trees. The fisher ran for forty kilometers roughly east-west to the south of the town, a five-kilometer corridor mostly covered by woodland. Gittiner took the raven up the northern edge to the northeast coast, and then looped back toward Poruin. They were about ten kilometers east of the town when Barber spotted something. Heads up, Gil, he said. Bear 045. Stock? Brown. A lot of brown. Can't see any stalks yet. Okay, let's take a look. Some trees had naturally copper foliage, but not these. Baird knew they were dead as soon as the raven came within fifty meters of them. Gittiner circled in a big arc while Barber took photographs. I don't see any stalks, Cole said. Baird reached for the field glasses. 
There were no telltale twisted gray branches protruding through the leaves below. The dense foliage looked like a carpet of bark chippings, and there wasn't a hint of anything green in the small gaps that gave a glimpse of the woodland floor. Maybe it's short stalks, Barbara said. That would mean they've changed again. That'll get Prescott excited. Baird lowered the glasses. Yeah, that's what worries me. You want us to take a look on the ground? Cole asked. We can rope down. Baird was up for that. Come on, Barbara, give me the camera. We'll grab some images. I'm going to hover, Gedina said. No messing around. You have a look and come straight back, okay? You care really, don't you? Just do it, Baird. Cole swung out on the winch and vanished beneath a mat of dead foliage. Baird watched his head disappear before following him. The branches snagged his pants and he held his breath, half expecting something unseen to sink its fangs into his leg, but his boots hit the ground. He was still in one piece, standing next to Cole in the deep shade. Woods were full of sound and movement. Baird wasn't the outdoor type, but he knew that much, if only from hanging around with Bernie. They were quiet places, they weren't silent. This one was. It was completely dead. There wasn't anything green and alive anywhere, not on the bushes, not on the ground, not in the trees. There was no birdsong, and there were no insects. Baird was surprised just how obvious that complete absence of life now seemed to him. He did a slow 360 turn, scanning the ranks of tree trunks to look for stalks. They should have been visible, a different color, a distinctly different shape, but there was nothing. Man, Cole whispered, I'm gonna have nightmares about this one day. It's all fucking dead. Yeah. What the hell's killed it if there's no stalks? Damned if I know. Cole pressed his earpiece. Eight zero. this is Cole. We're gonna grab a few pictures for the album. Kinda hard to describe, ma'am. There was a crackling pause. Then Gedina's voice came over the radio. What's down there? Nothing, Cole said. Absolutely goddamn nothing. Puruin, Northern Vex. There were fresh flowers on the town's war memorial a small bunch of something yellow, and cultivated that Bernie couldn't name. The blooms reminded her of pea flowers. But these weren't edible and they weren't medicinal. If a plant wasn't in her bushcraft database, it didn't make an impression on her. Old age. Or too long on the farm. Or no soul left. Never mind. She paused out of respect as she passed the modest granite pillar, and noted that the flowers were tied with the same handmade ribbon as the dried-out wreath that had been placed there some weeks ago. It was navy blue with a narrow scarlet stripe, the colors of the Duke of Tallinn's regiment. That was who she'd come to see. She had some fences to mend. Mac trotted ahead of her. This time he didn't race off in search of familiar places or will barons, so he seemed to have made his own choice about which human was going to get custody of him. He paused to pee up a dry stone wall and waited for her to catch up. The bar, she said. Go on. Pub drinkies. Mac looked as if he nodded in agreement, then headed toward Poruin's main bar. Will had trained him well. It was just a single-story wooden house like the rest of the homes, and Bernie was sure there were other informal places where the locals gathered for social liver destruction, but the bar, did it even have a name? was one of the four main places where people tended to congregate to gossip. If they weren't in the bar, then the next place to try was the town hall, or the green outside, or the small crescent of cobbled road at the top of the harbor. The six Tallinn veterans were in the bar as she expected, playing cards by the window. The youngest was in his late seventies, but they could still handle firearms. They'd even done their bit in defending the town from the last polyp invasion. But Bernie wished she hadn't made them fight alongside the Gorasni. The Duke of Tallinn's regiment had the worst possible memories of Gorasnea. Frederick Benton, still effectively the NCO after all these years, looked up as she came in. They acknowledged her as if she hadn't yelled at them about duty when they objected to serving with Indies who'd beaten and worked their mates to death in the last war. Anyone drinking? she said. 
Mac flopped onto the rush mat in front of the empty fireplace and stretched out as if he was a regular. I'll get them in. Benton laid down his cards. We haven't seen you around for a while, Sergeant. How are you? Contrite. She went behind the bar and poured the beer herself. The woman who ran the place was out, so patrons were expected to help themselves and leave payment. The coins and fragile, dog-eared banknotes in a wooden tray under the counter were just barter tokens for odd jobs, clothing, or preserves. Bernie paid with a bag of brass screws. Baird wouldn't miss them. We haven't had a chance to talk since the Leviathan came ashore. I thought it was time I showed my face. How's the lad with the leg injury? Oh, he's improving, thanks. Benton meant Anton Silber. A polyp had detonated under him during the battle and shredded him from the left knee down. Doc Heyman saved his leg. Natural healing. She just glares at bacteria until they commit suicide. It got a laugh and the old men took their beer. There didn't seem to be any hard feelings. This is by way of apology, she said. I'm sorry I made you fight alongside the Garasni. I've got no right to lecture you about duty. I'll never know what you went through in their prison camps. Benton contemplated the foam on his beer. The man sitting next to him, Chalky, reached out and patted her hand. You got us to fight, Sarge, and we all survived, he said. And you were right. It's not like you're some civilian talking through your ass about forgiveness and how we ought to put history behind us. It was your war, too. Is it true what you did to those stranded? Benton asked. He looked down as if he was embarrassed to ask a woman that kind of question. The stranded were loathed and feared and vexed, so dispensing very rough justice had made Bernie into something of a celebrity here. Did you really chop off there? Bernie nodded. Yeah. And I shoved them down their throats. But I couldn't tell if they bled to death or choked. She waited for the reaction. She wasn't ashamed, not in the least, but she wasn't sure if they'd already heard all the grisly detail. Judging by their expressions, they hadn't. There are some scores you've got to settle before you can move on with your life. We never settled ours, Chalky said. I know. I'm sorry. The colonel told us to think of the India emulsion as war reparation. Now we haven't even got that. Bernie had to ask. How are you going to handle it if we need to move everyone south to the base? Can we keep away from them? Yes. They generally stick to their own camp. Then we'll stick to ours, too, Benton said, if it comes to that. Bernie joined in their card game and kept them topped up with beer for a while, reminding herself that she was only twenty years or so behind them, and this was how the younger gears saw her, old, full of wild stories they'd never hear but not completely useless yet. She treated the old boys as she hoped the youngsters would treat her. But she couldn't sit here all day, even though her joints told her she was due a nice long rest. She'd give it a couple of hours and then find Anya. Life felt like a round of honoring old promises. She had her duty to veterans, and her duty to the dead, to Major Helena Stroud, her old CO, in particular. The Major had planned to prepare her daughter for a frontline role but she got herself killed too soon, so now it fell to Bernie to make sure Anya didn't die too young like her mother had. I promise, Major. Anya's shaping up fine. I really wish you could see her now. Bernie had just laid down a disastrous hand when her radio buzzed. It was Anya. Purun control to Mataki, come in. Bernie pressed her earpiece. Mataki here, ma'am. Go ahead. Bernie, have you heard? We've found emulsion. Say again, ma'am? Emulsion. I've only got sketchy details at the moment. They're waiting for the Garasni rig team to assess it. The old boys couldn't hear the other side of the conversation. Glad to hear they're being useful, ma'am. She said, not quite taking it all in. I'm on my way to the signal's office. Five minutes. Mataki out. She stood up. Max snapped to attention from an apparently dead sleep. You'll have to excuse me. Looks like we've found an emulsion supply. I'm going to check in with Lieutenant Stroud. Benton raised his beer glass. 
Well, that'll please the chairman, but how does it change things? He asked. The stalks and the polyps are still here. The land's still dying off. Bernie had to agree. But it's probably better to be in this shit with fuel than without it. At least we've got the option of making a run for it. Where are you going to run? You only ended up here as a last resort. We'll think of somewhere. She said. Even if it's bloody Galangi. Bernie drained her beer and shook the old boy's hands before washing up the glass behind the bar. It was very much a make-yourself-at-home place. Galangi. Would the island still be okay? Would any of her neighbors still be there? She thought that over as she made her way up the path to the signal's office. Anya was outside with Drew Rossi, poring over a map spread on the hood of the packhorse. Would you believe it? Rossi said. He tapped the map. Great timing. A damn lake of juice right here. Bernie could hear a raven engine droning somewhere in the distance. She peered at the map over Anya's shoulder. Were we drilling for it? Hoffman never said a word. It was a lucky accident. Marcus fell over it. How lucky? Anya didn't look as pleased as Rossi. He found more stalks. Then he found the emulsion they were standing in. That kind of lucky. Well, we just pump it out then, Bernie said. The raven noise was getting louder. It was coming into land. Once the stalks are up and we've cleared out the polyps, they're dead, and KR80 to Puruin, we've got a situation twenty clicks east of you. It was Gettiner. Raven pilots never seemed to break a sweat, but there was definitely a hint of tension in her voice. Stand by to transmit recon images back to VNB. She's in a hell of a hurry, Rossi said. Landing here only saves her fifteen or twenty minutes tops. The helicopter swept overhead, low enough for Bernie to see the scuffs and repairs to its underside before it dipped out of sight behind the houses. Gittiner wasn't heading for the usual landing area a kilometer away, either. Anya refolded the map. Okay, let's go see what the problem is. They didn't wait. Running to meet the raven didn't make things happen any faster, but somehow standing there while the crew rushed to find them felt wrong. They jogged down the alley between the houses and intercepted Barber and Cole running toward them. Barber had the recon camera clutched under his arm. Mac loped around, tail thrashing as if he expected a chase. Ma'am, we've got a contaminated zone without stocks, Barber said. Just dead land. I don't know what help the images are going to be, but I'm transmitting them back to base anyway. But it's still centered on the fissures, isn't it? Anya said. Looks like it. But if this stuff is happening randomly, then we've got another new problem. Rossi shook his head slowly. It never rains, but it fucks. When are we going to get a break? Nobody had an answer, least of all Bernie, although she realized she must have thought one was possible to even bother carrying on. Barbara rushed into the signal's office with Anya. Cole hung back with Baird and put his hand on Bernie's shoulder. Boomer lady, you never seen anything like this, he said. It's all dead. Everything. No polyps. No stocks. Just dead. So how the hell are we supposed to track it if we can't see the stocks? It's a small island until you try to patrol every square meter, Rossi said. Then it's big. Cole shook his head. Patrolling ain't gonna stop this. You want to take a look for yourself? Bernie didn't think she had any more answers than Cole did, but she wanted to see it anyway. Then Anya came back out of the signal's office in a hurry. Prescott wants soil samples. She said. Let's go check this out. What's wrong with that tosser? Bernie stopped herself. Voicing dissent wasn't good for morale. Sorry, ma'am. But we don't have the technology or the experts to analyze this stuff anymore. Never mind me. Baird said. Yeah, okay, Blondie, you work miracles. But you've said it yourself, you're not a biologist. Anyway, why is he so obsessed with samples? Anya shrugged. Well, there's Doc Heyman, I suppose. She's a doctor, Rossi said. A scab lifter. She's not a biologist either. Okay, so we all know what we can't do. 
Anya suddenly snapped into officer mode. Now let's concentrate on what we can do. Rossi, plot the contaminated zones on the map and work out who we need to evacuate first if it keeps expanding at the same rate. I'm going back with Gediner to take a look. Come on, Bernie. Bring the dog. He's our radar. The raven seemed to reach the edge of the dead area far too soon. Bernie could see the dead treetops from a couple of kilometers away and that brought it home just how close it was to the town. She looked at Baird for a reaction, but he had his goggles pulled down over his eyes. I hate a threat I can't shoot. She said. Cole murmured. Amen, baby. I miss those ugly grub motherfuckers. Gittiner sat down on the edge of the woodland and Barbara showed Anya the compass bearing to walk into the contaminated area. Bernie picked her way through straggly thorn bushes, springy and alive when she tested them with her boot, and into the cover of the trees. The silence really was striking, like nothing she'd ever experienced before. Max sniffed the air but stopped short of rooting around in the leaves like he usually did. He looked up at her with an accusing gaze that asked why the hell she'd brought him here. Clumps of wildflowers with strap-like leaves and long stalks of mauve flowers nodded in the dappled sunlight. Then, as if someone had sprayed weed killer around, the woodland floor became a carpet of brown vegetation with a clear boundary between the live growth and the dead stuff. Bernie looked up at the branches. The trees looked dead too. Tell me this isn't anything to do with the shit we used to develop here. Baird muttered. I mean, this was Toxin Town. Chemical and Biological Weapons Research. We keep conveniently forgetting that. We'd have seen something before now, Anya said. That was all twenty years ago, at the very least. Cole wandered back to Baird's side. There was no cracking of dry, dead twigs underfoot. The dieback had been sudden and nothing had dried out yet. Goddamn. I'm going to ask Prescott to his face. Baird seemed more pissed off than usual. Asshole. Maybe that's his precious secret. I mean, suddenly he's extra interested in this shit. What secret? Anya asked. Baird winced. Anya didn't know about the disc then. Well, it was Hoffman's decision to decide who he told, Bernie thought, but he could at least have warned her he hadn't told Anya. He's always got one, Bernie said. You're going to have to tell her, Vic. Just when we think he's told us everything, something else crops up. Like those sire things Marcus found at New Hope. She walked up behind Baird out of Anya's field of vision and shoved him hard in the back with her elbow. Shut your trap, Blondie. He jerked his head around and glared at her. Okay, I'm sorry. He whispered. It sipped. Okay? The further they walked into the woods the more profoundly dead the place looked. And there were still no signs of stalks or polyps. Eventually they walked back to the edge of the dead area and stood staring at it for a few moments. The line between dead and alive was unnaturally stark. Bernie stood on the precise edge of the brown foliage like a kid stepping on cracks and paving to see the sky fall in. She scraped it with the tip of her lancer's chainsaw. Max stuck right by her legs so close that she almost tripped over him. He really didn't want to explore, and that was a worrying sign. He'd hunt polyps that could blow him apart, but he didn't like what he could sense now. She rubbed his ear with her free hand. No worms. No beetles. Nothing. Disturbing the leaf mold under trees usually turned up all kinds of small crawling things. No flies either. Anya bent down to scoop some of the soil and dead leaves into a plastic bag. I don't know how much more of this stuff he wants. What's he doing with it? Oh, it's probably for his nature table, Baird said. He's had a breakdown. Or he wants us to think he has. Crafty asshole. Bernie glanced down at the ground just to see if there was anything else worth retrieving, and that was when it struck her. She was standing inside the dead area a good fifteen meters or so inside it. See, there's the scrape in the ground I just made. It's really moving, she said. Blondie, look how far it's spread since we've been here. Look. Look. 
Baird did a good impression of a surly teenager reluctantly forcing himself to look at something that couldn't possibly be of interest to him. You sure? Yes. That's a meter a minute, more or less. Anya came over to look. She actually measured it with her boot, marking out heel-to-toe from the scrape to the edge. Then we'd better hope it slows down. She looked past Bernie in defocus for a few moments, lips moving silently as if she was working something out. Because unless my math is wrong, it'll be south of Puruin in about fifteen days. Bernie rarely felt helpless about anything. There was always something that could be done, said, built, found, destroyed, or shot to improve the situation. Gears were trained to be self-reliant and tenacious, and self-reliant, tenacious people tended to become and remain gears. But she felt helpless now. When she looked at Baird, the ultimate I-can't-fix-it kind of bloke, she could see it in his face, too. She could wage war on grubs. But it was hard to think of what damage could be inflicted on a brown patch spreading under your feet. She didn't even know what this enemy was. You remember the first weeks after E-Day, Granny? Baird asked. E-Day seemed to be preoccupying everyone lately. Total clusterfuck. Chaos. But we got the idea pretty fast. He was trying to be upbeat in his own way. Bernie's E-Day memories were of being cut off from civilization, desperate to pick up a rifle and deal with the bastards, but not knowing where to start. Yeah. That was pretty much the way she felt right now. Chapter 7 Just Go Get home any way you can. I don't know if this ship's going to be commandeered, confined to port, or sent back to sea. It's chaos out there. Rob Arden, skipper of emulsion tanker Betancourt Star, to his crew, after the emergence of the Locust Horde on E-Day, New Sheriff, Tyrus, three days after E-Day, fifteen years earlier. The trains weren't running, the phone lines were down, and almost all civilian air traffic had been grounded. Dizzy hitched a ride from the docks on a chemical tanker going to Andius, and counted himself lucky. Those ugly gray things that had burst out of the ground three days ago were spreading further across Sarah. And the chaos was spreading right along with them. The traffic was mostly trucks, police cruisers and ambulances. And the army was everywhere. Dizzy had never seen so many military vehicles. APCs and troop transports streamed past in convoys and he craned his neck, half expecting to see Richie, but he knew that was a slim chance. Where are all the cars? He asked. Everyone's been told to stay put and leave the roads clear for essential traffic. The tanker driver was listening to the radio, now a constant stream of confused casualty figures and official warnings about roads being closed and cities being off-limits. That's all the northbound routes closed. They're turning freight off at the next exit. Gonna have to drop you off, buddy. Dizzy clutched his canvas hold all, stomach knotted as he strained to catch reports of what was happening in other towns. The name he was dreading was Matino Junction. But the reports were talking about cities across the whole damn world, in Austria, Pels, and Vasker, not just in Tyrus. He didn't want to know about them. He needed to hear what was happening back home. The reporter had started calling the invaders locusts. Whatever these things were, they were coming up out of the ground and just killing everyone in their path. They weren't taking prisoners and they didn't seem to be heading for anywhere in particular. They didn't seem to have a plan. The driver turned up the volume at the mention of Janermint. And casualties there are estimated at a hundred thousand so far. We're getting reports of fresh fighting around Nordeska. Dizzy stared out of the window. Things didn't look normal, but he couldn't see any of the burnout buildings, bomb craters, or the other signs of war that he was expecting. What are they? How did they get here? What do they want? What did we ever do to them to deserve this? APCs and tanks lined the side of the road and the bridge across the highway. Gears anonymous in full-face helmets for the most part, were marshalling traffic while a few cops looked on. They're picking off the cities one by one, the driver said quietly. But they haven't reached Ephra yet. When that happens, we won't even have the news to rely on. Dizzy's stomach was rumbling from two days of missed meals, but what he wanted most was a drink. 
His hip flask was somewhere on the seabed off Augury. You've heard anything about Matino Junction? He asked. My wife and boy are there. Yeah, you said. I can't get a call through. I can't raise the neighbors. I can't get through to the government emergency line. I ain't seen a news broadcast for two days, and the radio's just streaming out useless shit. Yeah, I know we got trouble, and I know we got a lot of folks dead and missing, but goddamn, how can a town just not matter like that? The driver made a small noise as if he was going to say something but decided it wasn't a good idea. He stared ahead at the tail of the truck in front for a while. There's just too many places been hit, he said at last. I'm trying to get home too. Up ahead, orange lights flashed on the gantry over the highway. A warning was picked out in white lights, road closed, diversion and next exit. A roadblock of armored vehicles was spread across all six lanes. The tanker driver slowed and followed the truck in front of him down the ramp. They were crawling through a residential area now, and heading west, away from Matino. Eventually the traffic ground to a halt. Dizzy was fifteen kilometers from home and going in the wrong direction. But fifteen clicks wasn't far. He could walk that in a few hours if he had to. Mind dropping me off at the fuel station? Dizzy asked. I'm gonna take my chances. Might find out more if I move through the towns. If that's what you want, buddy, but you're gonna get stopped at a checkpoint before then. Good luck. The fuel station was closed when Dizzy jumped down from the cab. He peered in the window, hoping to buy something to eat and try the phone again, but there was only a single security light on and no sign of anyone inside. When he walked back across the forecourt, he saw the hand-scrawled sign taped to the pump next to the exit. Close for fuel. Cog official permit holders only. Dizzy decided to try further down the road. He could hear the distant rumble of vehicles from the highway, but nothing else seemed to be moving. From time to time he'd look up at a window and see a worried face staring out. Maybe it was worth knocking on the nearest door and asking to use the phone but he didn't know just how spooked folks were and how they'd react. All the rules he was used to had vanished. This wasn't the regular war and he was in central Tyrus now, a place where people didn't expect to wake up and find the enemy in their front yard the pendulum wars had mostly been fought well away from the COG heartland. Lena, you'd have the sense to stay put, wouldn't you? You'd listen to the chairman on the radio and do what you were told. And Richie would, Richie would have gone straight back to his unit, whether he'd been recalled or not. Any gear would. The thought of Lena on her own in the middle of all this shit terrified Dizzy and left his stomach churning. Maybe the locust things ain't reached Matino yet. Don't panic. Just keep walking. Up ahead he could see a man nailing boards over his windows like there was a storm coming. From what Dizzy had heard over the last fifty-two hours, it didn't seem like a few wooden planks would stop one of these locust assholes. They'd just come up through the floor. He started walking faster, trying not to break into a run. Hey, can you help me? He called. Anyone who saw him would know that he was Merchant Navy from his kit bag and his seaman's gray duffel coat. I'm trying to get to Matino. The man paused in mid-swing and looked around. It's cut off, he said. They tried to evacuate everybody. What do you mean, tried? It was on the TV news. They shipped the survivors out. God damn it. God damn it. Where? Hey, I wasn't taking notes. All we know is what's on the news. The government can't find its ass with an atlas right now. If anything brought Dizzy crashing to the ground, it was hearing that. The COG was organized. The COG always had things under control. The guys in charge had been fighting a war for decades, so they knew what they were doing. They weren't phased by attacks or any of that shit. But they were now. He could see it all around him. Tyrus was paralyzed. Nothing was working. I gotta get home, he said, knowing full well that this guy couldn't help. He just felt better for saying it reminding himself what he had to do to stop himself panicking. Where did they take the survivors? Sorry, I don't know. Look, these things could come up anywhere, 
You shouldn't be wandering around. The man banged another nail into place and looked down at Dizzy. You're welcome to come in if you want. Thanks, but I need to get to my family. Dizzy carried on walking. He'd crossed the next main road before he realized that he should have asked the man for something to eat. He was too upset to feel hungry, but he knew he was going to feel like shit before too long if he didn't eat something. And something to drink. Water. Yeah, just for once, goddamn water. He'd forgotten about everything else except getting home. He hadn't even stopped to take a leak for thirteen hours. That made him realize how dehydrated he was. And that ain't smart. Won't be able to think straight if I don't get some fluids in me. Even the realization that one of these locust things could bust up out of the ground beneath him didn't matter, because the biggest fear tying his guts in knots was losing Lena and Richie. He walked as fast as he could, still fighting the urge to start running no matter how much his legs insisted. He knew he couldn't run that distance. He had to pace himself. And it wasn't the slope of the road making his heart pound it was sheer animal panic. He had to keep his head. God damn it, ain't there even a patrol out here? How can everyone just run and hide like that? He spotted a public phone box and tried dialing the usual numbers again. Home, the Fiorellis next door, and then the COG Casualty Information Bureau. His fingers moved automatically after so many tries. Each time he dialed, he got the same single continuous tone interrupted by a message that the exchanges were down. Well, the bureau's still gotta be in one piece. It's a Jacinto number. So that means Lena and Richie are okay too. Part of him knew that reasoning didn't make any sense at all and that he was just bargaining with himself. He could hear the low booming of artillery fire a long way off. By the time he reached the top of the hill, the sound was louder and he was looking at low gray cloud that somehow didn't seem right on such a sunny day. It was smoke. He could tell because the clouds had tails that led down to the ground. A jungle of towers jutted out of the haze. It looked like hell even at this distance, with fresh palls of smoke billowing up through the layer that had already settled over the place like a shroud. That was Matino Junction. Down there, that was his home. It was his last fragile link with Lena and Richie. He thought he was going to puke with fear, but there was nothing inside to fetch up, and it left him nursing a terrible burning pain just under his ribs. He heard someone say, Oh God! And then he realized it was him. Get a grip. Do something. Just get in there and find out where they've gone. Dizzy started to jog down the road. He just couldn't hold himself back now. He heard an engine, a bus, maybe, or even a utility vehicle, but he couldn't tell where it was coming from and he didn't plan to stop. If he kept going, he'd reach the intersection with the eastbound highway and he'd be on the final leg to Matino. Damn, I'm not even making sense to myself. But what am I going to do, turn around and go back? Where do I go if I don't check out the town? How the hell am I gonna find Lena and Richie? A horn honked behind him. That was enough to snap him out of the whirling panic and make him look around. An army pack horse and COG polar camo, all black, white, and gray patches, was bearing down on him. It was a strange paint job to see in Tyrus. The brass must have drafted in everything with wheels that they could lay their hands on. The pack horse drew level with Dizzy and a gear stuck his head out of the side window. Hey, sir, where the hell are you going? We've got a movement restriction in place. Turn back. Damn it, they could see the town, couldn't they? Where the hell did they think he was going? I gotta get to Matino Junction. I don't know what's happened to my family. My boy's a gear, see? He was home on leave. I ain't heard from my old lady either. The gear put his hand to the side of his helmet for a second or two as if he was listening to his radio. What's his name and unit? Private Richie Wallen, 25 Sheriff Cav. My name's Dizzy Wallen. Pretty well every COG citizen had a military connection of some kind, so Dizzy didn't expect any special treatment. He just thought these guys might know something. I gotta get home. I think you'd better forget that, sailor. The pack horse stopped just ahead of him, and the gear got out. 
Any civvies who made it got shipped down to Corin. We still got guys in Matino fighting the grubs. Grubs. Dizzy hadn't heard the name before. So that was what they were calling these locust things. How do I find out? How do I find out if they're there? Come on, get in. No, I gotta go look for my family. Dizzy, is it okay if I call you Dizzy? Look, Dizzy, even if you make it into Matino without getting your head blown off, what are you going to do? The gear took his arm. Find the house? What if they're not there? What if the house isn't there? The hospital's been burned out, so they're not going to be there, either. You might as well come back to Andius and sign in at the refugee center. If there's any information, they'll be the first to have it. There was a man inside that full-face helmet, a guy probably a lot like Richie, but it was hard to listen to someone when you couldn't look him in the eye. Dizzy went to shrug him off, but the gear still had hold of his arm. His grip said he wasn't joking. Sir, you've got to come with us. Dizzy must have been in worse shape than he thought. Not only did he do as he was told, but when he managed to climb into the back of the pack horse, which was a lot harder than he expected, someone handed him a bottle of Record Breaker soda. There was a picture of that thrash bald by Cole on the label. A couple of young gears were sitting on the bench seats, helmets on their laps, and from the expressions on their faces Dizzy guessed that he looked pretty bad. He was dehydrated, starving, and he hadn't slept in days. He knew that. But he wasn't hurt or dead, so it was no excuse, and that made him feel guilty. They'll find them, one of the lads said. But it's pretty fucking chaotic right now, sir. Dizzy had to admit that the sugary soda tasted better than any hooch. He could actually feel it flooding his body, a kind of slow warm relief spreading through him from the stomach out. One of the gears passed him a candy bar. They were good boys, just like Richie. He could hear the buzz and crackle of their radios as the gear who'd stopped him chatted to control. Eventually the guy turned around and leaned over the back of the passenger seat. It took him a few seconds to speak. Dizzy knew what he was going to say and he felt his face go numb, like someone had opened a door and let in a freezing wind. I'm sorry, said the gear. Richie Wallen. They've logged his COG tag. It was real hard to lose a COG tag when it was under your armor. Someone had taken it off Richie's body. The world was falling apart, and Dizzy was starting to crumble with it. He couldn't manage a reply, not yet. It wasn't real. It couldn't be. Shit, said one of the guys in the back. How are we ever going to stop these things? Dizzy sat in silence as they drove to the refugee reception center in Andius. It was a big modern sports center packed to bursting with confused, scared people just like him, and staff who couldn't tell him anything. The place smelled of sweat and vomit. Kids were crying. He waited four hours to be recorded and tagged, then fell asleep on the tiled floor with his kit bag for a pillow long before they could find him somewhere to bed down. Someone shook him awake. For those first blissful, blank seconds, none of this had ever happened, and he wasn't sure if he was back on board Betancourt Star. Then his memory kicked in and he remembered where he was and why he was here. A uniformed police auxiliary who looked like she hadn't slept for a month turned over the tag on his jacket and checked his name. Mr. Wallen? she said. I'm sorry. I'm afraid we've found your wife. Cougar Stadium, Hanover, five days after E-Day. Cole had never had much trouble making up his mind about anything. Today wasn't going to be any different. He sat in the director's box high in the stands, watching the seats below. They were already starting to fill up. He should have gone down to the dressing room to make his peace with the rest of the team first but he couldn't face that yet. He'd see them later. Five years. That's all. Didn't know where I'd be today. Don't know where I'm gonna be five years from now. He had no idea why anyone wanted to come and watch a thrash ball game when the world was going to ratchet, but maybe that was the whole point. You carried on as normal for as long as you could, living life as fully as you could, or else the assholes trying to kill you had already won without lifting a finger because you'd already done the dying for them. I should have gone out and played one last time. 
Hell, I'll be back one day. When I've settled some scores. Suddenly he could smell that wonderful match-day stadium smell, all fried onions and smoky meat and cinnamon. Someone had opened the doors. He turned around. Mr. Cole? It was Gaynor, the boss's assistant. He always sent her to do the awkward personal stuff. We didn't expect to see you back yet. She took a little breath. I'm really sorry about your parents. Cole tried to find something to say that wouldn't make her feel any worse or start him off again. There's a lot of people grieving now, he said. Gonna be a lot more before this is over. Is the boss man here yet? Yes, Mr. Mortensen's on his way up. Did he say if my agent called him? Gaynor frowned a little. He didn't mention it. Okay. Cole hoped Mortensen had been given some warning, but if he hadn't, it was too bad. It wasn't going to change a thing. Thanks, Gaynor. You've been real kind. You always have. She gave him a puzzled look, half smiled, and shut the glass door behind her. He turned back to the stadium and tried to take in as much detail as he could so he'd always remember it. There were the snack vendors loading their trays, the groundsmen doing last-minute stuff to the pitch, and fans already in the touchline seats chatting or reading newspapers. Life went on. But the atmosphere had changed. He could feel it. Better make sure I keep my shit together. Gotta give them the full cold train act today, baby. Eventually he heard Mortensen coming up the steps two at a time. The manager's playing days were long over, but he liked to prove to himself that he hadn't gone to seed yet. Cole looked him in the eye as he walked in. Hey, good to see you back, son. Mortensen dragged up a chair and sat down next to him. Don't feel you've got to rush back to playing, though. Give yourself time. How are you feeling? Cole decided to cut to the chase. He couldn't bear dragging this out any longer than he had to, and there was no easy way to work up to the bad news. Better out than in. Boss, I ain't coming back, Cole said. I've enlisted. Mortensen just stared at him for a while and didn't say anything. He didn't seem angry. He just looked like he didn't understand and was waiting for Cole to go on and explain. Did you hear me, boss? Cole tapped his knee. I'm joining the army. I'm gonna be a gear. Past my medical and everything. I'm waiting for my papers. Mortensen was still staring into his face, blinking. Cole decided to wait for it all to sink in. Maybe he shouldn't have just dumped it on the guy like that. But he couldn't explain the situation any better if he took all day doing it. No, no, you can't, Mortensen said at last. He wasn't so much shaking his head as moving it slowly from side to side. Are you crazy? Cole, do you know what you're doing? Yeah. I can't sit on my ass while those things are killing us. It's real simple. I love playing ball, but it's a game, and what's out there ain't. He almost expected an argument about letting the side down and breaching his contract and all that shit that didn't actually matter when there were already millions of dead in cities all over Sarah. Hanover hadn't been hit yet. It hadn't even seen refugees pouring into town, like the cities to the north had. But Mortensen's eyes filled with tears instead. It was a hell of a shock. Cole felt terrible for upsetting him. A smack in the mouth would have been easier to take. Cole, you understand what you are? Yeah. I think so. No, you don't. You're a phenomenon. You've only been playing pro for five years and you've broken all the records. There's a statue of you out front. There's maybe half a dozen players in the league who ever got that recognition, and that was after they retired. Yeah, I've already had it all and I've still got a whole career in front of me. For a moment, Cole felt a pang of something awful that he didn't even have a name for. It almost stopped him breathing. If he looked at it for one more second, he'd see what it was and start to regret things that hadn't even happened yet. So he just shut it out. I'm lucky. I know I am. But there's a war on. Yeah, but the government's letting us carry on. They could have shut all the stadiums on safety grounds, and God knows they need the space for refugees, but they're letting us carry on as long we can for morale. 
To keep people going. To help them stick together. Look, it's done, boss. It's gonna happen. I'm sorry. Fuck it, Cole. Mortensen snapped. It's not about being a great player. You're someone people believe in. Yeah, thrash ball's only a game, but it makes people feel good. We need that right now. Cole could have done all this shit by phone, talked to the media, and just slipped out the back door to boot camp. It wouldn't have hurt half as much. But he knew the influence he had on folks. And the fans who paid his wages deserved an explanation. Yeah, boss, he said at last. That's why I want to go out there and tell them myself. Will you let me do that? Before the game starts? Mortensen got to his feet and wandered around the box. It took him a few minutes to settle himself, but then he finally picked up the phone. Cole didn't want to listen. He was focused on the stadium now, on the crowd that was filling the seats and waiting for the whistle. They knew he wasn't in the lineup today and they knew why. Walking out there was still going to be hard. Am I gonna be any use as a gear? Well, at least nobody's left to fret about me. Mama would have gone nuts. Dad would have had the news on all day. Mortensen put the phone down. The chairman's gone eight shit. He's going to have the press office all over us. He gestured to the door. I'll deal with him. You get out there ten minutes before the whistle and do what you need to do. Thanks, boss. I'm sorry it had to be like this. Mortensen pinched the tip of his nose for a moment, blinking. You're going to come back when it's over. Yeah? Because you are going to come back. You know it. My agent and my lawyer are gonna be on my ass until I do. I can do this. I can get out there and face him. And I can pick up a rifle and fight, once someone tells me how the hell to use it. Cole forced a big grin. Shit, I'm more afraid of the sponsors than the grubs, baby. Getting onto the pitch meant a long walk down the back stairs and cutting through one of the fire exits. Mortensen walked down to the touchline with him, still shaking his head as if he was arguing with himself. Go on, he said. Cole could hear the stadium announcer introducing him. They're listening. The crowd always started the cold train chant when they saw him but when he stepped onto the pitch this time there was just polite applause. Everyone knew his folks had been killed. Maybe they weren't going to be shocked to hear what he had to say. Whatever that's gonna be. Cole didn't know what he was going to say until he took the public address mic in one hand and the applause stopped. For once, it wasn't a capacity crowd. He wondered if the missing fans were just staying away or if they were among the dead. It put him off his stride for a moment. He tried to focus again. I'm gonna keep this short, people. I came to say goodbye. See, I just enlisted. I'm a gear now. He paused for the reaction. He didn't know what he expected them to do, but he didn't expect what he got, which was a murmur that went around the stadium like one big gasp. His cold train act kicked in automatically whether he wanted it to or not. We're in big trouble and the coal train's gotta go kick some grub ass. Yeah, that's right. We all gotta do our bit and fight these things, cause they ain't gonna listen to reason. Are you gonna enlist? Are ya? Are you gonna help me put em back down the hole they came from? Nobody said a word for a couple of seconds. I ain't hearing you, folks. I said, are you gonna help me? Finally some guys in the front row seats to his right started yelling. Yeah, Cole Train. We're with you. Are ya? And are we gonna win? Yeah. I said, are we gonna win? Yeah. The yelling and cheering picked up, one section at a time. It was weird. It wasn't a bunch of beer-fueled crazies making a noise for the hell of it. The only way he could describe it was that they meant it. Then it began. The crowd started chanting the way they did at every game. Cold train. Cold train. Cold train. And getting faster and faster until it sounded like a speeding locomotive. He couldn't make himself heard now. It felt like the right point to walk away. If he stayed a second longer, he'd burst out crying, and that wasn't going to inspire anybody. His folks had been real proud the first time they saw a game. 
They didn't care if he scored or not. They were just proud. I ain't even started missing him yet. Hurts so much I can't feel things right. It felt like a damn long walk back to the exit. He saw the news cameraman heading his way from the touchline and decided to duck out until he got his shit together again. Hell, the press people could fend that off for a while. It'd keep him busy. He had nothing more to say anyway. Mortensen covered him as he broke into a jog and vanished into the tunnel behind the security barrier. Are you staying for the game, Cole? He asked. I've got the car out front for you. It'll wait. Tell the guys I'll stop by in the morning when it's all calmed down some. You make sure you do. Promise. Cole just wanted to get out as fast as he could, even though he knew he couldn't, wouldn't, change his mind. There was no way he could carry on playing as long as those grub motherfuckers were still out there. The lobby was almost deserted except for the folks at the concession counters. They smiled at him and he waved back, but they probably hadn't heard what he'd just done, so he didn't need to get involved in any depressing conversations and goodbyes. He swung open the main doors and paused by the statue outside. He always joked about it, but it made him squirm to see himself up there larger than life, and he was pretty large to start with. No, it wasn't him. It was something else with the same name, something people wanted to believe in, but it wasn't the Augustus Cole that was him. There was no point looking back. Take care of the place for me here, he said to the statue, and got into the waiting car. Galangi, South Islands, one week after E-Day. What are you doing? Neil asked. The house smelled of bacon and burned toast. Your breakfast's getting cold. Bernie straightened up and tested the rucksack for weight. Getting ready for recall. They'll be mobilizing everyone. Oh, for God's sake. Are you serious? She pointed to the rifles laid out on the bench in the back room. She had her own long shot perfectly legal, COG Army surplus, and the indie sniper rifle that Major Stroud had looted for her personally. If the COG wanted that back, they could come and try taking it. Yes, she was serious. Neil's shoulders sagged. The governor told us to stay put and conserve supplies. Don't be so bloody stupid woman. Just watch the news, she said. The TV transmitter was working again and now even the most remote South Islands could see what was happening to the rest of Sarah. They're going to need every gear who can hold a rifle. Burn, get real. You're forty-eight. Forty-seven. I could have served frontline until fifty-five. And I'm fit enough to work a farm, but not fight? So you're just going to hop on the bus and head for the front. Don't take the piss. Bernie knew how the row would go. It's about duty. You already did that. It's time to worry about us, Burn. Yeah, but you're going to want some other gear to put his duty first and save our arses when those grubs show up down here, aren't you? Grubs tunnel. How are they going to tunnel to the islands? They'd have to dig under the seabed. And there's an abyssal trench between us and Noro that's deeper than the height of Mount Chin. Neil grabbed his drover's coat off the hook in the hallway. But maybe they've got bloody yachts. Eh. From what she'd seen of the locust on the news, they were smart enough to operate a ship. If they have, then I'm not waiting for them to get here. You know what? I've got to give the wieners their lungworm shots. Neil gestured with a big veterinary hypodermic that looked like a cock gun. The gadget made injecting cattle a one-man job, another reminder of how long he'd run the farm single-handed while she was away. They still need looking after, and they don't stop for grubs. He slammed the door behind him. Moss started barking as the utility's engine coughed into life and roared away. Neil would come back in a couple of hours as if nothing had happened, like he always did, so Bernie went to see what he'd left for breakfast and assembled it into a bacon sandwich. There were no garrisons anywhere near Galangi. Who was going to pull troops back from the mainland cities to defend a speck on the map with 1,500 inhabitants on the opposite side of the world? Galangi was going to have to look after itself. Well, most of us have rifles. That's more than the average civvy in Tyrus has got. She went to switch on the radio but stopped herself. 
hanging on every news bulletin was just making things worse. Not strangers. My mates. My bloody regiment. This was a global crisis, and as long as she was capable of fighting, she had a duty. But she couldn't do a thing about it unless she could get to Jacinto, and all flights from Noroa to the mainland, once a month at the best of times, had been grounded. Her daily phone call to 26 RTI headquarters got the recorded message from the phone company about suspension of service again. While she dialed, she noted that the paint on the wall was peeling and added it to the mental list of things to sort out. Repair the fence, paint the hall, kill the grubs. The recorded message repeated. Sod it. I can't sit around waiting for permission. Let's do some resource investigation. Bernie grabbed her coat and went to get the quad bike out of the barn, wondering if she could persuade Dale to sell her a couple of horses for when the fuel ran out. The islands depended on imported emulsion. When she checked the gauge on the storage tank it showed three-quarters full, and that was the way it was going to stay. She rummaged in the tool locker for a padlock. Nobody on Galangi locked their houses or outbuildings. It was an old-fashioned islander society based on handshakes and knowing every bloody cough and spit about your neighbor's business, but this invasion wasn't predictable and orderly like the pendulum wars. She had a feeling that people would change. She padlocked the fuel store and set off for the town. The route was a couple of kilometers over open country before the track joined the paved road down to the coast, and it was fifteen clicks before she saw another human being. Jim Kilicano had a dairy herd and traded cheese, milk, and the occasional duck for mataki steak and mutton. He waved at her from his tractor as he hauled feed across the field, not looking particularly worried about grubs or anything else. She waved back and carried on. This was why people liked the remote end of the South Islands. It was another world. Nora occasionally got tourists who were willing to spend weeks getting there to see the wild coasts, and breathe crystal clear air. They didn't visit Galangi often though. Maybe it had something to do with the island's only town being called Port Slaughterhouse. It didn't look as bad as it sounded. It was just a place where they slaughtered export livestock before shipping the frozen carcasses to Noroa. Nobody could accuse the white settlers who colonized the islands of being coy. Bernie rounded the last headland and saw the ferry still alongside at the jetty where it had been for four days. She parked the bike outside the post office and walked up to the fuel station. One of its two pumps was already draped with a sign saying sorry and no light grade. How's tricks, Dan? The owner was bent over an outboard motor, ratcheting away with a socket spanner. Heard anything from government house? I'm only the council delegate, he said, not looking up. We're just below the postman on the governor's priority list. No fuel rationing yet, then. Well, the ferry office on Noroa says there's a tanker due in a few days. It left port before the grubs invaded. So when we see how much fuel we get after Noroa's had its share, then we'll know if we're being rationed, won't we? When's the ferry heading out again? When the fuel gets to Noroa, so we know it can get back. It was a 400-kilometer trip. Bernie found herself wondering whether a fishing vessel might be heading that way. But that could mean getting stuck on Nora for weeks, and she couldn't face turning up on Mick's doorstep right now. Can I use your radio, Dan? I need to call Government House. Bloody phone's down. He straightened up and gestured out back. Yeah, but the Governor's staff are getting really shitty if you use the emergency channel. I've had worse than snotty clerks. Tell them you're a war hero. It made her cringe. He never let her forget that medal for asphalt fields, and she knew from the way he said it, no matter how genuinely or kindly, that he didn't know what drove her. Don't take the piss, she said, or I won't vote for you next time. She walked through to the back of the workshop and picked up the radio mic. Galangi Protectorate to GHN, over. It was only when she heard the crackle of someone starting to respond that she realized just how pathetic she was going to sound. A middle-aged farmer's wife with a dodgy leg and rusting sniper skills. GP to G Chen, over. GH Noroa here, go ahead. My name's Mataki. Okay, she was going to lie. 
Nobody was going to care about discharge technicalities when every country on the mainland was being invaded. I'm a reserve gear. I need to rejoin my unit in Jacinto, and I can't make contact. Is there any way I can reach a garrison? Bernie braced for an earful and had already worked out just where she'd tell this penpusher to shove his next comment. But all she got was a long pause, the sound of someone putting their hand over the mic, and then a strangely relieved and different voice. Mataki, this is the duty incident controller, Constable Thomas. You haven't had recall orders, have you? No, of course not. Well, that was true. How are they going to contact me? Then stay put. We need you where you are. The copper went off mic for a few seconds. Look, we didn't know we had any gears on Galangi. We're not going to get any help from Ephra if the locusts attack. None of the islands will. We're on our own. Can you organize a militia? Part of her brain nodded and said that was exactly what she should do and where she'd be most use. The other part whimpered that she wanted to be with her old mates in 26 RTI again, and this wasn't quite what she'd had in mind. But it's my bloody duty. And that's what I want to do, isn't it? Yes, I was an infantry sergeant. It was automatic. The man didn't seem to notice the past tense. No, no, I want to get to Jacinto. I don't want to organize a bunch of civvies. I can do that. Most of the adults here are competent with shotguns. Right, now we know you're there, we'll want you to stay in contact, okay? We'll need a list of contact numbers and radio call signs. Bernie was suddenly aware of Dan standing in the open doorway. She shut her eyes, cringing at the glimpse into her own selfish subconscious. Will do, she said. Thanks. Mataki out. She put the handset back in the cradle, crushed. Dan wiped his hands on an oily rag and shook his head ruefully. Bugger me, he said. This is all getting a bit serious, isn't it? You'll have to call a meeting. No, no, no. This isn't going to stop the grubs. I need to get back to the regiment. Give me a day to work out how I'm going to do this. And placate your old man. He slapped her on the shoulder. Good on you, girl. Count me in. Bernie picked up some groceries from the food store next door and put her money on the counter, still numb. Is money going to mean anything now? The bags of sugar and flour she just bought would probably become currency pretty soon. We're going to be cut off for a long time. Would she end up holding back grub attacks, or keeping order among her own neighbors when essentials started running really short? Well, serves me right. Where have you been? Neil asked when she opened the front door. We didn't need any groceries. I've been talking to Government House. There was no point pissing around and making excuses. They want me to set up a local militia. We're not going to get any help from the mainland if the shit hits the fan. He looked at her for a while, head slightly on one side. Moss came bounding down the hall and thudded into her legs, tail wagging furiously. Shit, I really thought you'd gone until I saw your long shot was still here. Neil let out a breath and took the groceries from her one-handed, pulling her to him for a hug as if she'd just come back from the front. Moss jumped up for a pat on the head too. You never make it to Ephra, love. I know how bad you feel, but we need you here. Don't we, Mossy? You're the only gear in town. So I am. She said, wondering how much worse she would have felt leaving the poor sod on his own again and maybe never coming back. He'd always been there. He might have bitched and griped about it, but she could count on him. Just like old times. Chapter 8 We don't have tents for an extra 3,000 people. Until we've built more accommodation, we'll have to do what we did in Jacinto. Everyone has to share their space. Take a lodger. I think we should brace for some social friction. Emulsion site, 18 kilometers south of Puruin, present day, 15 A. Jackpot, said Staff Sergeant Perry. Now all we have to do is pump this stuff out. The forest floor was dotted with bright pools of glowing emulsion. Dom looked around at the dense screen of dead trees and equally dead stalks. You going to put a road through here? Nothing fancy. Perry picked his way between the luminous puddles. 
This is a job for Betty. Once she's flat in the trees, we can lay some trackway and get a rig set up. Stefan? What do you think? The Dar Garasni rig workers looked unusually excited. Stefan Graydon kept shaking a small glob of emulsion in a glass jar and peering at it as it ran down the sides. Boris Kujin nodded approvingly and gave Perry a thumbs up. It didn't strike Dom as very scientific, but this was the best anyone could do these days. Equipment had broken down, worn out, been destroyed, or had just been left behind because it couldn't be moved when they abandoned the cities one by one. None of it could be replaced. It's like being back in the Silver Age. Printing by hand. Distilling fuel in boilers. Making ammunition with lead shot. And it's just going to get worse. That made the Garasni who'd run the Emerald Spar platform the world experts in emulsion technology. Dom respected their guts, but he wanted to see bespectacled guys in lab coats again. It's very liquid, Stefan said, shaking the jar like a cocktail bartender. Not much refining needed. Very good. Very volatile. Great. Dom looked down at his armor and noted that he was spattered with the stuff. The ground felt like a swamp under his boots. Just great. He backed off a few meters and went to stand with Marcus, who was engrossed in a three-way radio conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I get it, Baird. Marcus listened with his eyes shut and a frown of intense concentration. Colonel, did you hear all that? Okay. Baird? Just stay with it. Hoffman's talking to Rossi. Phoenix out. What's Baird bitching about now? Dom asked. They found a contaminated zone east of Puru and with no visible stalks. It's spreading fast. Hoffman wants the farms in its path evacuated and cleared of food supplies. Saving cabbages. Yeah, that's what I signed up for. It made sense, but it didn't thrill Dom. Okay. Perry must have heard the conversation. How fast? They're watching it happen. Marcus said. Baird says it could get close to Peruin in fifteen days. Shit, does this thing have any pattern at all? Well, it's still following the geological fissures. That's damn awkward timing, Marcus. We better hope it runs out of steam before then. Poor bastard. Perry and his sappers were spread pretty thinly at the best of times, even with the majority of gears tasked on construction and food distribution. Dom gave him a sympathetic pat on the back. At least we'll have the fuel to move everyone, staff, he said. We've got to recover whatever supplies and materials we can. That's the time-consuming bit. Perry beckoned to one of his construction people, a slight woman who didn't look much like a bricklayer. Rina, see if you can commandeer some tractors to haul the lumber away. Dizzy can be here and clearing a path inside an hour. I hope he's sober. Rena said. It's his day off. No, much better if he's drunk. Stefan held the jar at arm's length and walked away from the contaminated area to a clearing fifty meters away. He placed the jar carefully on the ground and jogged back. Much better. Everybody stay clear. Welcome to chemistry class. He slipped his rifle off his shoulder and took a shot at the jar. It went up like a mortar. Everyone flinched except Marcus, who stared at the smoke and dying flames around it with a look that said he was waiting for the punchline. See? Stefan spread his arms. You need a good drink before you drive into emulsion seepage like this. A man's drink. Possibly the last that will ever touch your lips. Sorotki's voice broke in on the radio net. Dom had forgotten about the waiting raven for a moment. Good show he said. Fill her up. Marcus, you want to finish the recon? Perry paced out distances and scribbled notes on a scrap of cardboard. Prescott's wetting his boxers about this. He wants a sample. Can you take one back to base with you? I think I liked him better when he didn't give a shit, Dom said. Yeah, we'll do it as a kissogram. Hand it over. It was just another glass jar with a screw top and if the stuff hadn't been faintly luminous it could easily have passed for a urine sample from someone with a hell of a lot of health problems. 
Dom shook it gingerly and held it up to the light as he and Marcus walked back to the raven. That's a goddamn incendiary device, Marcus grunted. I know. Just looking. Why is Prescott interested in this? Maybe he doesn't trust the Garasni. It's probably mutual. Dom climbed into the raven and sat with the jar cradled in both hands. Well, there's always that retired chemistry teacher to take a look at it, for all the good that'll do. Mitchell held out his hand for the jar as the raven lifted clear. He did the shake it and watch thing too. Dom, you should go see Doc Heyman about this, pronto. I thought it was yours, Kev. Ha. Huh. Yeah, that'll teach me to drink the local brew. Soraki cut in. I'm going to check out the whole length of this fisher. He sounded even more cheerful than usual. There might be some more seepage along it. Mitchell settled down by the open door and tucked one edge of his folded map into the leg pocket on his pants, pencil in one hand. If this was normal, Sarah, you'd be a rich man now, Marcus. A fuel tycoon. Money's overrated. Marcus said. It never bought me what I needed. It was as near as Marcus ever got to a personal revelation. Dom had stopped thinking of him as the rich kid a long time ago. Money hadn't done much for Cole and Baird either, but nobody ever seemed to gripe about it. There was a lot to be said for shared hardship. The sweep back and forth along the fissure took half an hour, but they couldn't see any more pools of emulsion. Well, perhaps I was being optimistic, Soraki said. Damned if I can work out what the connection is, though. Leviathans with polyps. Stocks with polyps. Stocks without polyps. Stocks with dead patch. Dead patch without stocks. Stocks with emulsion, Marcus added. The dead brown patch extended about five clicks northeast. Dumb watched Mitchell penciling the new boundaries on his chart. Okay, we have a pattern, Mitchell said, holding up the battered map. All the contaminations in the top third of the island. Nothing south of this line here. Dom shrugged. That's assuming we've spotted everything. And we haven't even scratched the surface of whatever's in the center of the island. Got to go with the best information you've got at the time, Dom. Marcus seemed to have his mind on something else. Dom could tell. Marcus didn't move his head but his gaze shifted back and forth between what was beneath the raven and a point on the metal deck. Soraki looped back west to overfly the new dead area near Poruin. Dom reached across and prodded Marcus. What's up? Dom had learned to lip-read pretty well after years in noisy helicopters. Marcus just mouthed one word, disc. Dom nodded and said nothing. All Prescott's little bombshells, all the details he let drop when he felt like it probably ate at Marcus on a personal level. There had been a time when his father had worked closely with Prescott. Marcus came from the decision-making classes. But his father had never told him much about the Hammer of Dawn until the thing was finally tested on the UR fleet. Dom still couldn't imagine how a father could keep anything that big from his son, even if he thought it was the kindest thing to do. Well, Mitchell said, that's getting a lot closer than I thought. Beneath them, a wide brown strip of dead trees pointed toward Poruin in the distance, like a ragged highway under construction. Mitchell pulled out the camera and started recording again. Soratki took the raven down lower and circled above the western boundary of the contamination. Well, the sooner we move everyone to New Jacinto, the easier it's going to be to keep an eye on them, he said. Round them up and move them out. Mitchell laughed. You've been hanging out with Mataki and her sheepdog too long. Soraki turned west on his usual loop over Poruin before returning to base. Marcus nudged Dom and held out his hand for the emulsion sample. He stared at it as if he'd never seen the stuff before. You think he's going to mix it with gunpowder and set fire to it, like they did in the old days? Dom asked. Because that's about the only analysis he can do now. Prescott? Yeah. Maybe. Marcus was getting worried about all this, because Dom rarely heard him speculate, regardless of what was going on in his head. I can usually work out what he's up to. But not this time. Maybe he's finally panicking. 
wouldn't be good for people to see the chairman lose his shit. Hey, we function without him pretty well. Where's the strategy coming from? Hoffman, Michelson, and Charles. Not him. Everybody needs a figurehead, Marcus said, handing back the jar. If only to have an ass to kick. Dumb had to admit that Prescott was good at holding people together. He'd never realized just what a messy job that was until he saw civilians with every reason to squabble suddenly not squabbling. The Garasni were getting docile and the Perun locals had gone from a certain amount of resentment of the Jacinto newcomers to accepting that everyone's fate was linked. The army had well-honed methods for doing that and the structure to enforce it, but not cities. Even in the COG, they still had to be more persuaded to do the sensible thing than ordered. Yeah, Dom said. I'm not sure what the COG would look like now without him. Vex Naval Base, Vehicle Compound. Dad, can we come along? Marilyn asked. Please? We haven't been out of the camp for weeks. Dizzy climbed up to Betty's cab and balanced on the step with one hand on the open door. Ain't nothing much to see out there except trees, sweetie. I'll be back in a few hours. Teresa pitched in to back up her sister. They were twins, fourteen going on forty like all teenage girls, and Dizzy found that trying to be mom as well as dad to his daughters was stretching his parenting skills these days. They needed a woman's guiding hand. They were good girls, no trouble at all, but having to spend so much time without their dad had made them clingy. They were scared to let him out of their sight now. Sam's going, Teresa said pointedly. Dizzy stood his ground, trying to let common sense wrestle his guilt into submission. Sam's a gear, and she's right in shotgun. Sam wandered up behind the twins with her lancer and revved the chainsaw for a second. When you can handle one of these, you can go off camp. You don't want to run into Glowies without one. She ambled around to the other side of Betty and swung up onto the step in one movement. She made it look easy. Here's the deal. You go help out in the school, and I'll give you firearms lessons. I'll check with Mrs. Lillin, mind. Teresa nudged Marilyn. Okay, Sam. See you later, Dad. Dizzy didn't dare argue. Yeah, every kid needed to learn about rifles in this world, and Sam was the right one to teach them. He waited for the twins to walk away and slammed the driver's door shut. Sam settled into the passenger seat and rested the lancer on the open window. She patted his arm. Diz, we're so busy staying alive that we've got kids now who can barely read and write. If your girls teach the little kids, everyone gets something out of it, right? I ain't complaining. You got away with them. They look up to you. Teenagers, see? I look like a rebel to them. Goddamn, Dizzy said, starting the engine. I always thought I was doing the right thing. Bringing up two kids on your own is tough enough without doing it outside the wire. She didn't use the word stranded, but it wouldn't have offended him. It was what he used to be. Maybe he still was. You did fine, Diz. They're good kids. Dizzy drove out of the compound and took the perimeter road to the main gates. He'd been driving this rig for six years, the price of keeping his kids fed. Operation Lifeboat. Lifeboat for who, God damn it? Wasn't for the good of our health, Chairman, was it? It was an honest job and he took pride in it. But he still wondered if the girls would have been happier if he'd stayed stranded and been a full-time dad. Marilyn probably wouldn't have survived, though. Maybe he'd have been dead by now, too. I left my girls alone with strangers for weeks at a time. He said. That ain't right. Diz, the lifeboat camp was organized. Sam always went out of her way to make him feel better. Qualified people, taking care of everyone's kids. Not exactly strangers. How else were you going to feed them properly and get medical treatment? She adjusted the wing mirror as Betty rumbled north. My mother raised me alone, too. So did Anya's mother. We didn't turn out so bad. Ah, uh, maybe this is cause I got girls, Dizzy said. They're that age, you know? They're going to be dating soon, and that's when it all goes to ratchet. I dunno where the hell to start. Jacinto's a small community now. It's not like they're alone in the big city. 
You know what's funny? What? We ain't worrying about grubs or glowies being the dangers, either of us. We're worrying about other humans. Sam checked the charge on her lancer. Oh, I think we'd better start worrying about the glowies again, then. They can ruin your entire day. Dizzy was nowhere near the fisher zones yet, not that he was worried about polyps. Betty had shoveled them up like rubble when they attacked the naval base. Hell, she could even roll right over mines. Just a few weeks ago she'd been sweeping the main road with a chain flail, detonating devices planted by the stranded gangs. She could take a hell of a pounding and keep right on going. He felt safe in her. So you're just going to drive in and knock the trees down with a scoop, Sam said. That's the plan. Open up a gap so we can roll out some trackway and the tankers can get in to pump off the juice. I hope it's a big deposit. Or whatever you call it. Funny that the stalks came up through it. Maybe they're the way it got to the surface. Baird's bound to have a theory on that. We never did get that picture of him on his throne. Sam burst out laughing. It's still on my to-do list. I want it framed and hung in the mess. It was a nice day and Dizzy decided to enjoy the drive. He'd learned to live in the moment, not because he was happy to find himself alive for one more day like some of the folks he knew, but because he'd found a way to unplug himself from his memories. He didn't look back because it hurt too much. He just looked forward. That meant his girl's futures. You read in the map? Dizzy asked. I don't want to uproot the wrong wood. Keep going. Sam said. I'll tell you when to turn off the road. God damn, I'm gonna piss off another farmer by churning up his fields, ain't I? Stick to the edge of the field wherever you can. Sam checked the map against her compass. Can't rely on the satellite positioning anymore, but you're never alone with basic field craft. Okay, another 800 meters, then go right. Dizzy glanced at the dials on Betty's dashboard, calculating the distance then dropped a gear to approach the turnoff. Hang on to your hat. Betty lurched off the road, bouncing a little as her sheer weight ironed out the bumps in the grass. He picked up the radio handset. Len, we're heading your way. You got all your folks clear? The channel clicked. We can hear you coming, Dizzy. You knock them down and we'll clear them away. Bear left, Sam said. Okay, I'm heading for that hill. Stay on this course. She sighed. I feel bad about this. Felling healthy trees, I mean. Just shut your eyes and don't look, sweetie. Dizzy said. It ain't like we're gonna waste the wood, after all. Well, it's all going to end up dead anyway from whatever toxin those stalks crap out everywhere. Dizzy checked his bearings with Perry. The forest was a wall of trunks with a thick dark roof of leaves. Nothing complicated or delicate. This was what Betty was built for, drilling, dragging, digging, and generally creating paths through battlefields in any plane or direction. Dizzy slowed and slipped the clutch. Okay, Diz, whenever you're ready, Perry said. Go for it. Dizzy hooped. Hoo-hoo. Brace for impact, Sam. Betty rumbled into the first rank of trees and a slight shudder ran through her chassis. The noise of creaking wood rose up the scale. Then the trunks fell in slow motion, crashing onto the undergrowth and sending up clouds of leaves, insects, and twigs. When Dizzy reversed to take another run at it, he could see the ragged root balls exposed to the air, still shivering. I'm gonna keep going until I can't drive forward anymore, Dizzy said. Then I'll back off while they drag the trunks clear. You mind that you don't get bogged down? Sam said. We don't know what's under the soil. There could be pockets of emulsion. Voids. Whatever. Betty's too big to fall down a hole. Sam had her elbow resting on top of the open side window. She's not too big to get stuck, though, and who's going to tow her out? Dizzy moved in again, using the scoop as a battering ram. There was a satisfying creak and crunch, followed by two more trees collapsing in front of him. Then something thudded onto the top of Betty's cab. Keep your arm inside, Sam. Dizzy backed up a few meters. Gonna be a few branches, Fallon Dot. He glanced at her. 
She was holding her lancer upright, two-handed, watching behind Betty in the wing mirror. Okay, Diz. Thud. Another branch hit the cab roof, but he wasn't sure where it had come from. Maybe it had just been caught up in the roof rails and slipped down. Sam looked up at the cab's head lining. Diz. What? She leaned forward to take a closer look in the wing mirror. Oh shit, here we go. She said. Polyps. She reached for the handle to close the window, but dark gray legs scrabbled over the edge of the glass. That was all Dizzy saw before Sam shoved the lancer out the window and opened fire. A loud bang made his ears ring and warm. Sticky fluid splashed over his arm. Sam wound up the window as fast as she could. They're all over the rig, she said. Back up and try to shake them off. Or I'll have to get out and shoot the bloody things before they find a way in. We're okay. Betty's built like a tank. They can't even put a dent in her. Dizzy could hear polyps scuttling all over the roof, legs tapping on the metal. Had he left a ventilation scuttle open? He couldn't remember. He got on the radio. Len? We got polyps all over us. You better look out. Polyps were bad enough on their own. But polyps on the loose with flammable emulsion everywhere were much, much worse. We don't see them, Perry said. Where are they coming from? Sam pressed her face to the windshield to look up as far as she could. She flinched as a couple of polyps thudded onto the hood right in front of her, scrabbling at the glass. The damn things were now swarming all over Betty, prodding and poking to find a way in. Can't sit here all day until they get bored, Diz, she said. Either I get out and pop them all, or we get Perry to do it. With all this juice around? Sam, it's getting real lethal out there. So let's back away and find somewhere safer to do it. They'll detonate anyway. Dizzy looked ahead, trying to work out where the things were coming from. It was only then that he saw the spots of greenish-yellow light in the dark canopy of leaves, right up in the branches, and they sure as shit weren't carnival illuminations. The polyps were sitting up the trees like goddamn vultures. Holy shit! He grabbed the radio handset from the dash. Len, they can climb! Up in the trees! They're right above you. Okay, everyone clear the area, Perry said. Everyone, get clear of the emulsion. Now. Sam started scooping ammo out of the dash and stuffing it in every available space in her pouches. Change of plan, Diz, she said. Come on, I've got to get out of here and give the engineers some cover. You damn well stay put. He snapped. You ain't going outside, Sam. Here? There was suddenly a lot of chatter on the radio circuit. Perry was calling Marcus. Perry to Phoenix, we've got polyps at the emulsion site. We could do with some backup over. Diz, this is my job. Sam said, reaching for the door handle. I'm not Marilyn, okay? I'm a bloody gear. Dizzy hit the internal door lock on the dash and started backing up as fast as he could. Yeah, but you ain't fireproof. Sit tight. A cascade of polyps tumbled off the roof and landed in a heap on Betty's scoop. Some of them detonated, spattering gunk everywhere, and now he couldn't see through the windshield. He changed gear and lurched forward a few meters to try to shake the things off, then slammed Betty into reverse again and put his foot hard down. She wasn't moving like he expected her to. Some of her wheels were spinning in wet ground. Phoenix to Perry on our way. Marcus said. Forget the emulsion. Get out of there. There, we got the big boys coming to help out. Dizzy wasn't thinking too mathematically but it would be at least eight to ten minutes before Soraki reached them. Just gotta get these assholes off Betty before they mess up her paint job. Diz, if that emulsion ignites. Betty was a big, heavy, tin box with a lot of places for polyps to cling to. Dizzy pressed his face to the side window to try to see what Betty's wheels were bogged down in, because he was sure the ground had been solid when he drove in. He hit the gas again. Yellowish pearly liquid spattered the glass. Now he knew what Betty was stuck in. Sam, I don't want to scare you none, but there's another shitload of emulsion right under us. 
Sam stared straight ahead at trees full of polyps biding their time. Then she twisted around in her seat and peered at the mesh that separated the cab from the compartment behind. Hear that? Dizzy could. It was a kind of tapping, scratching sound, like a cat trying to get out of a garbage can. I don't want to scare you either, Sam said. But I think those little bastards have found a way into Betty. KR-239, inbound for the emulsion field. Marcus leaned out of the crew bay and pressed his earpiece. Len, have you cleared everybody out yet? No, Perry said. The grind lift rig stuck in a seep and Dizzy and Sam are pinned down by polyps. Take a look. Nearly at your position. Sorotki was flying low and flat out. Dom watched the tops of the trees streak by way too close beneath him. I suppose strafing's out of the question. Yeah, unless you want deep-fried Dizzy. The emulsion's going to go up like a blast furnace if it ignites. Betty's built like a centaur's big sister, but she's not fireproof. Okay, Marcus said. You drop us and we go in on the ground. That still doesn't solve our glowy problem, Mitchell said. We'll need to throw them a decoy of some kind. Dom moved from side to side in the center of the crew bay to try to keep both flanks in view as best he could. On his left, he caught a quick glimpse of the emulsion pools. A few seconds later, he looked right and saw the trail of churn turf leading to the trees. Got him. Mitchell pointed. Mel, loop around right and follow the tire tracks. Oh shit. Visual on Betty, your port side, Mel. Not looking good. As the raven banked, Dom could see Betty was sitting in what looked like a marsh of emulsion, but that wasn't her biggest problem. She was covered with polyps. They were clustered on every flat surface and even hanging on the side rails. Their lights looked more yellow now. These damn things changed every time he saw them. Either we get them off, or we get Betty out. Marcus swung back inside the crew bay and pulled a couple of foam extinguishers off the bulkhead. Dom, grab one of these. The units were ten years past their expiration date and designed for small onboard fires. Dom raised an eyebrow. That's a bit optimistic, Marcus. Remember what Ty used to say. Dom hadn't thought about Ty Kaliso in a while. We must be creative. He always said that when he grabbed the nearest and strangest tool to use as a weapon. It hadn't saved the poor bastard from the grubs, though. Dom took one of the extinguishers and wondered if polyps would explode if he sprayed them. Okay. I'll improvise. The raven was so close to the treetops below that Dom could see movement in the branches. Those assholes are up in the trees, Marcus. But they couldn't climb a few weeks ago. Marcus hefted the fire extinguisher. So they're a quick study. I'll note it for the chairman. Ready to rope down? Soraki asked. I've got a better idea, Marcus said. Drop to a meter or so and we'll jump. If we take a long run at them, it might draw them off. Dom wasn't sure if Soraki had heard what he said about the polyps and the trees and tried to interrupt. The next second, something large and gray with a lot of legs landed with a thud in the crew bay and Dom's brain didn't even pause to find a word for it. Whoa! He booted the polyp over the side, and it exploded in midair like a grenade cooking off. Debris peppered the raven and rattled across the deck. Shit, Soraki, did you frigging hear me? They're right beneath us. Nice dropkick, Mitchell said. Sorry, Dom, did I miss that? Soraki might have been oblivious of the close call or just at normal chill level for a raven pilot. Okay, stand by, 40 meters, 20, 10, okay, go. Dom jumped out a heartbeat behind Marcus and steadied himself for a moment. The ground felt firm, but he could smell emulsion again. Sixty or seventy meters ahead, Betty stood looking like she was tiled with polyps. What's that noise? He heard the muffled buzz of a chainsaw, then a really loud bang, as if a tin can had blown up on a bonfire. Betty shook. A couple of polyps lost their footing and plopped to the ground, but didn't blow up. Shit, that's coming from the rig. Marcus started running toward Betty, finger pressed to his earpiece. Diz? What's happening in there? Ah, that was Sam. Dizzy sounded shaky. 
But at least he was alive. We got polyps in Betty's drill housing. Sam's crawled through to the back to hold them off. God damn, Dizzy, you're setting off explosions inside the fucking rig? Marcus's voice suddenly got the polyps' attention and they started to move. Are you out of your goddamn mind? Marcus speeded up but Dom grabbed his arm to slow him. They had to let the polyps come to them, or Betty was going to be engulfed in flames. The creatures turned like a wave and jumped off the vehicle, scuttling through the puddle of emulsion to rush at Marcus and Dom. Dom let them get clear of the emulsion before he opened up with his lancer and detonated the first wave. Marcus sidestepped three of the things and shot them as they overshot their target. Dozens, Dom said. Shit dozens. It was all he could manage. There was just no time to think when polyps attacked in a wave. It was just bang, 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 trying to pick them off from second to second before they got close enough to take your legs off. His focus became a tunnel again. Marcus kept firing, falling back a meter at a time to lure the polyps further away, but Dom could hear yelling on the far side of Betty. It was the Garasni. Little shits! Garyaski! Over here! Stefan and Eugene tried to draw off the rest of the polyps. Yeah, Pashenki, you come and get some. Dom glanced up for a second to see more polyps dropping out of the trees like bunches of ugly gray fruit. At the same time, Betty shuddered and something exploded, but he couldn't tell if one was connected to the other. The Garasni guys were yelling, further away now. Explosions lit up the forest. Dom kept firing and reloading. It was chaos blinding and smoke-filled, and right then it was all he could do to pick off the polyps and try to keep Marcus in sight. It was only when he drew breath to reload again that he spotted Perry and his engineers taking potshots at stray polyps too. But nobody could keep shooting things that detonated without igniting some of the emulsion vapor. The trees were now on fire. A huge explosion lifted Betty a meter off the ground before she crashed back down on her suspension. Marcus, typical, goddamn typical, just broke off from the polyps and sprinted through them. Dom froze in horror for a moment as Marcus Canoni threw the things, kicking one clear then treading right on another to leap up on Betty's mudguard and rip the driver's door open. Dom charged after him. It was pure instinct. Smoke and flame rolled from underneath Betty, but he knew he had to be right there with Marcus. Dizzy! Get out! Marcus hauled Dizzy bodily from the cab. Dumb half caught him and the two of them staggered backward. Sam! Sam! Marcus vanished into the cab and Dom had no choice but to drag Dizzy clear and then try to go back. Before he could climb back up the vehicle, Perry and his crew appeared to fend off the next wave of polyps. No sane man turned his back on a charging mass like that. But Dom had reached the point where they'd become part of the background noise and his bigger fear was what would happen to Marcus. Dom scrabbled halfway into the cab. The bulkhead panel behind the seats was hanging open and he could hear loud hissing sounds. He was about to squeeze through the gap when Sam, her face blackened and smeared, burst out through it like a cork from a bottle. Ah, shit, come on out! Marcus yelled. Out now! Dom stepped back blindly to crash hard to the ground and Sam fell on top, winding him. By the time he got to his feet, he could see Marcus hosing down the interior of the cab with the fire extinguisher. Someone slapped Dom hard across the back. His legs almost buckled. Dom, we get them, eh? Now we save the crude. It was Eugen. He led Dom and Sam away. Get your ravens. Get them to drop soil or else we lose all this. You understand? Perry! Perry, call your ravens in! I'm on it! Perry yelled. They're coming. Just get clear, will you? Marcus dropped down from Betty's cab and it was only then that Dom realized he was gripping Sam's arm. He let go, embarrassed. You okay, Sam? My eyebrows didn't make it. You chainsawed polyps inside the goddamn rig? No, I shot them. I chainsawed holes in the bulkhead to get a clear shot into the rear compartment before they got to us. Sam looked shaken. Flames were licking the trees behind her. Confined space. 
remember? We'd have been dead otherwise. Dom realized he was scolding Sam because he wanted to yell at Marcus. Okay. I'm sorry. Look, go and wait with Izzy and we'll case vac you. He saw Marcus walk away, finger pressed to his ear, and broke off. Give me a minute. Dom walked up behind Marcus and waited for him to finish on the radio. Fear for his welfare had dissolved into the usual shaky anger, just like scolding a kid who'd run into the path of traffic. You're going to get yourself fucking killed, Marcus. He said. What's up with you? Couldn't let them cook. Marcus said, matter of fact. And we need that rig. Don't you ever stop and think before you get into a burning vehicle? No. And neither would you. Marcus rolled his head as if his neck was stiff. It was his get-off-my-case gesture. Nobody died. Baird or Perry can fix Betty. Now all we have to do is stop the emulsion field. Ah, God damn it! A snowstorm of grit hit them seconds before they heard the raven pass overhead. It swept on over the trees and hovered a hundred meters in to drop a load of soil on the burning emulsion. Dom could hear more helicopters approaching. 239 here. Sorotki's voice popped in Dom's ear. If you two want a ride back to VMB, move it. Dizzy's a bit char-grilled. He really needs to see Doc Heyman. Okay. Marcus looked around, dusting dirt off his armor one-handed. We'll need a hand hauling Betty out. She'll have to wait. That's a two-bird job. Sam didn't say a word on the flight back. Dom took a first aid pack and wiped her face. She didn't even protest. She just looked him in the eye and managed a smile, and there was something in it that unnerved him. He caught Marcus looking their way and giving him that go on look. No, this isn't going anywhere. It can't. If things had been different, if his whole life had been different, he would have jumped at that chance. But he'd never feel that way again after Maria, and if he did, shit he'd never be able to live with himself for giving into it. It wasn't about betraying Maria's memory. She'd have told him so. It was about knowing he didn't deserve to be happy again when he couldn't save his kids, and when the only way he could save his wife in the end was to shoot her. Sacrifice was clean and easy. Surviving your loved ones wasn't. Dom tried not to meet Sam's eyes and carried on cleaning her up. Dizzy took a swig from his hip flask and held it out to Sam. She took a mouthful and coughed her guts up. I feel better already, she said hoarsely. Thanks. But she wasn't looking at Dizzy. Dumb slammed shut that door in his mind and made sure he would never let it open again. Chapter 9 Citrep Hashtag 18A Extent of Contaminated Zones and Stock Ingress at 0001G0115 Current Western Boundary of CZ, 16 kilometers approximate from Puruin. Rate of spread, 15 centimeters approximate per minute as measured at 2345B3815 to 2445B3815. Spread has slowed but appears irregular in shape and rate. Forecast, if the rate of spread continues, two farms west of Purun will fall within the CZ within eight days, and Purun itself will be cut off with only coastal sea access. Action, four-hour monitoring to continue. Evacuation contingency team to remain on one-hour alert. Vex Naval Base, New Jacinto. Two days later, Gale, 15A. Colonel? Colonel! Hoffman carried on walking across the parade ground while he tried to place that voice. It took four more strides before the name clicked in his head. Ingram. Keir Ingram. Whatever the man wanted, it was guaranteed to make Hoffman late for his meeting with Prescott. He was one of the civilian neighborhood representatives from Old Jacinto, a real civvy, not civilian support staff, who were very nearly gears. Regular civvies were a species that Hoffman rarely had much contact with these days. And he's been waiting for me. There's no way he'd run into me here and now by accident. Hoffman stopped and turned. What can I do for you, Mr. Ingram? Is it true that you're moving everyone out of Pulruin? Maybe. Hoffman didn't ask why Ingram was bothered about it because he didn't want to hear the answer, not right now. The decision hasn't been made yet. 
Is there ever going to be any consultation with us on this? Ingram did routine, necessary things like organizing his neighbors for cleaning duties and kitchen rosters. Hoffman didn't think of him as a troublemaker. He was a thin, balding, schoolmasterly kind of guy in his fifties who looked as mild as he was. Jacinto civilians had lived under siege for so many years that they developed an almost military sense of a chain of command and an ability to suck it up. But hearing Ingram talk about consultation in a tight, scared voice unsettled Hoffman at a primal level. What's to consult about? Hoffman asked. It's my duty to protect them, and it's easier for me to do that if I've got all the civilians in one area. This camp's bursting at the seams already, Ingram said. We're still trying to catch up with rebuilding the houses the last polyp attack burned down. Eighty percent of families are still living in tents or barracks. I know that, Mr. Ingram. Hoffman checked his watch to prepare for making his escape. The gesture alone was usually enough to shut anyone up. But Peruns are people and they keep us fed. We'll make room. Ingram's jaw sagged a little, disappointed. I asked you instead of the chairman because I thought you wouldn't give me a mealy-mouthed answer. Ingram didn't want mealy-mouthed, and he didn't get it. Dealing with emergencies didn't require a goddamn referendum every time. It never had. Hoffman saw no reason for things to be any different on Vex. If you want to talk about representation, that's above my pay grade. He turned to make it clear that he was moving on. Look, you're a councilman and you talk direct to the head of state. How much more representation do you want? More than this, Ingram said, looking more crestfallen than offended. But thank you for your candor, Colonel. Hoffman carried on to Admiralty House. Michelson stood on the steps outside the main doors, sipping from a white tin mug and chatting with Charles and Tresca. It still disturbed Hoffman to see a COG uniform and a UR1 side by side without close quarters combat being involved. Some reflexes never went away. Ah, the natives are restless, Michelson said, raising his mug like a toast. Did you park in his space, Victor? He just wants a frigging vote on where we put displaced persons. I hinted we'd do things the Garasini way. Trust you didn't blink. I'm glad you've seen sense. I told you they'd get pissy about it sooner or later. Charles said. Thank God we're not trying to do this at minus twenty degrees. Michelson tipped the slops from his mug under the short hedge beside the doors. It was the first time Hoffman had noticed that the bushes were dotted with white blossom. He could actually smell them now, a sweetly spicy scent like cloves. Prescott hasn't shown up yet, Michelson said. Does anyone have any bad news they don't want to share with him? Me, Charles said. I know he doesn't want to hear this, but I went ahead and did a dispersal scenario plan as in the circumstances under which we'd have a better survival rate if we broke up into smaller groups. Hoffman didn't like it any more than Prescott would, but he wanted to hear. Why? Why did I do it, or why is it better? Both. Well, if we can't reach the mainland, we'll have to island hop, and there's nowhere big enough to take thousands of refugees. We've thrashed this out before. The more widely people are spread— the less able I am to defend them. I'm looking at the stranded and learning lessons, Charles said. Assholes or not, an awful lot of them have survived without any of our infrastructure, troop numbers, or weapons. Tresca reached out and picked a sprig of scented blossoms from the bush. Speaking as a small community, I can tell you that it makes you either invisible nor more resilient. He stripped the leaves with his thumbnail and tucked the sprig into his buttonhole which is why we asked to join you. I'm not advocating we do it, Charles said. But I'm obliged to investigate every option. We might need to rethink the big city model we've been clinging to all these years. Hoffman didn't want to say it in front of Trescu, but dispersal would mean the end of the COG. Either it was one community with structure and purpose, or it was nothing. Trescu knew that anyway. Gorisnea was in the same position. Damn it, I'm going to see where Prescott's gotten to. Hoffman pressed his earpiece to summon Lowe and Rivera. They'd be with the chairman, wherever he was. 
They did damn all else now except provide his close protection. God only knew from what. Hoffman to Rivera over. He waited. Hoffman to Lowe over. There was no response. Prescott didn't carry a radio, so that option was out. Michelson held the doors open and gestured like a butler. Let's see if we can bumble along somehow until the Divine Presence decides to grace us, he said. After you, gentlemen. On the way in, they passed the open doors of CIC. Matheson looked up from his desk and craned his neck. Colonel, may I talk to you when you've finished your meeting? I'm free now, Lieutenant. Matheson's gaze flickered past Hoffman. He was a tactful lad. This obviously wasn't meant for other ears. Oh, later will do, sir, thanks. In the meeting room, Tresca spread his maps and lists out on the table. We can accommodate five to six hundred extra people, he said, not looking up. If you can find that many in Poruin who don't want to shoot us on sight, that is. Charles was still all smiles, Mr. Nice Guy. Don't worry, we'll remember not to put the tall and vets with you. Hoffman was surprised that Tresca even offered. The Garasni still kept to themselves. It was time for a conciliatory gesture. I appreciate the work your rig team's doing at the emulsion site, Hoffman said. Dirty, dangerous job. If we need emulsion, then it must be done. So when will we have some usable fuel? Michelson asked. Tresca penciled some cross-hatching on his map to the east of the Garasni camp. Three days. Slow, but there'll be a steady supply for as long as we can enter the dead zones. Once your grind lift rig is repaired, we can install more derricks. The sound of boots on the stairs distracted them. Prescott was talking to someone, probably Rivera, and Hoffman caught the word Heyman. Prescott must have been wearing the doctor's patience thin. Hoffman could imagine the old battleaxe's reaction when the chairman showed up asking her to find out why the grass had died. My apologies, gentlemen. Prescott closed the door behind him and joined in the ritual of staring at the maps. I'm afraid Dr. Heyman can tell us nothing about the site samples and the weather satellites unable to give us images of the island, as we expected. I'd hope to have something more concrete for you. Oh, as long as you're here, Chairman, that's all that matters. Michelson said sweetly. Prescott's jaw tightened, but he slipped straight back behind the mask of reassuring, unflappable omniscience again. Something other than Michelson was getting to him. Things were bad, but no worse than they'd been many times before over the years. So where are we this morning? He asked. Good news, bad news? Hoffman stood the latest sitrep across the table to him even though he was damn sure Prescott must have seen it already. Bad news, still touch and go on Poruin. Good news, Wallen's grindlift rig will be back in action tomorrow, and the drilling team estimates they'll be extracting up to 10,000 liters of crude a day when they begin pumping, which we will be conserving until the storage reserve is 50% above minimum and every vessel is full to capacity. Charles said, smiling in that avuncular way that said he'd chop their goddamn fingers off if they so much as siphoned off a teaspoon of it. After which, we will still economize. So we have options again. Prescott's mouth was making positive sounds, but he'd definitely lost some of that polished smugness. We can move. We can monitor. We can, to some extent, manufacture. Our most pressing short-term problem is still housing and food production. So, no need to evacuate the town yet? I'm going to ask for volunteers to relocate, Hoffman said. Then when we need to move them, if we need to, we won't have as many to ship out in a hurry. Hoffman's ifs and maybes were starting to creep back in again. He knew he was kidding himself. Prescott still seemed distracted by the reports on the table and poured through them, not even looking up. Excellent idea. Anything else, gentlemen? For once there was an extra item, the political kind that Prescott could toss and gore for hours. It might keep him occupied. Hoffman shoved it into the arena and stepped back. Yes, chairman, he said. We have some disgruntled civilians griping about not being consulted. Keir Ingram waylaid me to bend my ear about it. He's keen to start local elections again. 
Prescott said, completely unabashed. I'm aware. He brings it up once a year, regular as clockwork. Good, then I can leave the civil unrest and coup suppression to you. Job done. His problem. Adjourned? Adjourned, Prescott said. Good day, gentlemen. He vanished again with Rivera and Lo Hoffman had no idea what he did when he wasn't in his office, but he'd never been the kind of man to want to chew the fat over a coffee even when coffee still existed. There were just very few private diversions on Vex, and no gentlemen's clubs in which to do dodgy deals over port. As long as he's not in my face, fine. I don't care where he goes. Charles steered Trescu away to discuss the emulsion situation. It was a handy moment for Hoffman to peel off to CIC and find out what Matheson wanted. Wait for me, Quinton, will you? Hoffman said. I've just got to see what the kid wants. Donald Matheson was sitting at his desk, headset in place and fidgeting with a gadget Hoffman couldn't recognize, opening and closing it one-handed like someone absent-mindedly clicking a pen. Everything okay, son? Hoffman asked. Matheson jerked out of his trance. Something's bothering me, sir. He put the gadget down and beckoned. I recorded it this time. Do you want to listen? Listen to what? A radio signal. A data burst. Matheson pushed back his wheelchair and grabbed a headset from a desk nearby. Listen to this. He plugged in the headset and indicated the button to press. Hoffman shut his eyes one hand cupped over his right ear, and listened. It was just electronic noise, two or three seconds at most, like any satellite transmitting or receiving data. It repeated a few times. I looped the recording so you could get a better idea of it, Matheson said. It's just one burst. Mind if we share this with Captain Michelson? Hoffman asked. Matheson half shrugged. Hoffman stepped into the hall. Quinton? Something you might want to hear. Hoffman handed the headset to Michelson and watched his face while he listened with a deepening frown. How the hell did you catch it? Hoffman asked. It's just a couple of seconds. It got too regular, Matheson said. The gadget on his desk caught Hoffman's eye and he realized it was a metal ball joint. It's always the same time, not every day, but when it happens you can set your watch by it. No idea what the data is. That'll be decoded by the receiving station. One of our former stranded visitors pinging pirate friends, Michelson asked. A trifle high-tech for them, though. I don't think so, sir. Matheson tapped the receiver on his desk as if it would make sense to them. I'll show you my calculations if you like, but the transmission source is probably on Vex. Michelson picked up the metal socket joint from the desk and bent it back and forth. Is this Baird's handiwork? Yes, sir, Matheson said. He's working on prosthetic legs with some of the Garasni guys. Splendid. Michelson smiled. Could that burst be an uplink to the Metsat? Possibly, sir. No idea why anyone would want to do that, though. You said it got regular. Hoffman realized he was almost whispering. When did it start? I've been picking it up on and off for six weeks. But it's become more frequent. Just log it, Hoffman said. No, six weeks didn't fit known satellite activity at all. Thanks, Lieutenant. Good work. The long walk across the parade ground gave Hoffman and Michelson a chance to talk unheard. If it's been going on for some weeks, then it's not Prescott uplinking to the weather sat without telling Matheson. Hoffman said. Who made the transmission for him, anyway, and who's got the kit to do it? Damn, I should have asked, but if I look paranoid he knows he's got me. It's not who's calling that intrigues me so much as who they're calling. Michelson looked up at the sky rather than out to sea. It was a reflex when it came to satellites. Who else is still out there? If it's not stranded, and not us, then it's got to be the Garasni. I'd be mightily pissed off if Tresca's precious frigate was still lurking somewhere. Nezark's gone. We found her wreck, remember? Yeah, you're right. Hoffman shook his head. But it wouldn't be the first time the Garasni have gone off and done their own thing. 
Look, you're very buddy-buddy with Trescu. Any ideas? Ah, the Fellowship of the Sea, Michelson said. I think he's worried about Prescott. You know, I do detect the first whiff of desperation about the chairman. All that busy work, trying to analyze the Lambent. Hoffman's strategic vision was condensing into a modest plan to make it through the next week in one piece. If Prescott was starting to feel out of his depth, that was worrying. Anything that could rattle that man's sense of divine omnipotence was serious shit. Hoffman found himself hoping that the asshole really was just cracking up like a normal man after all. The alternative was too terrible to contemplate. Yeah, he said. Go sweet-talk your nautical buddy sometime, Quinton. We need to know. Garasni Camp, New Jacinto. There was an art to being the alpha male, and Tresco had learned it at his father's knee. He forgot he'd even had to acquire the skill. But there were times lately when it became a conscious thing, something he had to concentrate on using because what he was asking himself and his people to do was so unnatural, so ungorisnean. As he walked down the main track through the camp, he made sure he was seen at least once a day, he spotted a knot of people gathered around one of the water standpipes. There was nothing unusual about that. People had to collect water, and when people paused, they gossiped. But his instincts were still those of a fighting man. He got that whiff of trouble, the signs that the gears called combat indicators, normal things that were now not quite normal and he knew the mood of his community like he knew Elena's. There was no point sidestepping it. Boyles had to be lanced. He squared his shoulders and headed for the gathering at a steady pace. They all nodded at him politely as he approached. Where are we going to put all these extra people, Commander? One of the women asked. It's temporary, Tresca said. And the choice is either taking them into your homes or erecting more shelters. But if we have emulsion, the woman asked, Why don't we just go home now? Why stay now that the stocks are invading the island? It was the old debate. Better to fight and die in Gorisnea than live an uncertain existence as refugees, especially with an old enemy's charity. The decision to come to Vex hadn't been universally popular. Trescu hadn't exactly taken a vote on it because we stand a better chance of surviving with the COG than without them. Tresca's father had always told him never to explain his orders, but this wasn't the battlefield. We would have lost Emerald Spa with or without the COG. Now we have fuel and food again. It's not my first choice either, but the threat we face now has changed and we can't take it on alone. This isn't like the Locust or the Gareas stranded, believe me. He carried on walking looking for the next sullen group of citizens to challenge to defy him. The camp was like a miniature city, with neighborhoods that supported him and others that were less enamored of his policy. But there was no open revolt. They had the right to carp, but they didn't have the right to threaten the precarious existence of the Garasni people. Combat Indicators Ha! The COG did love its jargon. He found himself strolling now, chewing over the last encounter with Prescott. Something was very wrong there. Something about the man had shifted focus. There were issues that seemed to concern him more than the stock incursions. He wants samples of this contamination. We all know what this base used to be. Am I getting naive? Trescu was a naval officer who'd had to become a soldier because his country needed him to be one. He could see that the path ahead of him was suddenly empty. No children playing, no women hanging out washing between the tents, no men hammering planks in the endless repair of the camp. It was unusual, and on the mainland that almost always meant something bad was about to happen. I'm in my own territory. This is insane. But he was in a part of the camp that wouldn't have elected him if they'd had a vote, which they didn't. He kept walking, expecting to be intercepted by an angry delegation. Then a loud crack rang out, and the ground five meters in front of him threw up a plume of dust. It was a long second before he realized it was a rifle round. Some bastard was shooting at him. It was the most obvious thing in the world, a sound that would have sent him diving for cover out of pure reflex if he'd been anywhere else but this camp. 
but he was so stunned that he just paused where he stood for a moment. He didn't even look up to see where the shot had come from, and the shooter meant to miss. Any Garasny with a rifle was a marksman by necessity. So this is a show of some kind. Well, I can put on a show, too. Tresca carried on walking, hating himself for feeling slightly shaken. Nobody would dare assassinate him, not with Tail or Yannick always ready to settle the score and nowhere to hide from them. By now, he could hear the buzz of voices rising around the camp and the sound of people running to see what was happening. Crack. A second round struck the path at a shallow angle, once again a safe five or six meters ahead of him. This time there were shouts and cries as people ducked. One more shot, just one more, and he would stop and do something educational about it. He had an audience now. He had to show his people what happened to those who tried his patience. He had a pretty good idea who it was anyway. Get down! A woman yelled. Commander! Are you crazy? Tresca carried on, not changing his path or his pace. There would be a third shot, he knew. Where were they coming from? It wasn't from the naval base walls behind him, and there were only a few structures inside the camp with enough height to allow a sniper shot like that, the bathroom blocks. There was one to his right. Commander, what the fuck are you doing? That was Yannick Loss. Trescu could hear him running down the path after him. Get down! What if he's drunk and hits you by accident? Crack. The third round struck a little further ahead of Tresca than the last. Now it was time to stop and turn around, deliberate, expressionless, to make it clear that he was angry rather than in fear of his life. He could see the water tanks of the bathroom block set on a wooden platform above the rows of shower stalls. He set off for it at a steady pace, fists balled. Everyone had come out of their tents now. If there was anyone taking a shower then it would be unfortunate, but he had an example to set. He ran up the rickety maintenance stairway to the top of the structure and drew his pistol. Ayanka Narisai was standing there with his rifle broken under one arm, completely relaxed, looking like he needed a smack in the face to teach him a lesson. Well, Commander, Narisai said. What are you going to do about it? Get your COG friends to spank me? Tresca glanced over the side at the gathering crowd to make sure what he did next would be seen. Narisai had to learn, but so did everyone else. He walked up to the man, pistol still in one hand, and punched him hard in the face. It hurt. He hoped the pain didn't show. It probably hurt Narisai a lot more, though because he fell against the safety rail and took a few moments getting up. Tresca holstered his pistol and grabbed him by the collar before he could regain his balance. He had the crowd's full attention now. That's right, save your strength to beat your own people. Narisai hissed through a mouthful of blood. Not our enemies. Shut your mouth, Gareas. It was a struggle to shift a man of Narisai's weight. But Tresca forced him over the rail head first with a tight hold on his belt, keeping him off balance so that there was a real chance of letting him fall. He took out his pistol again and tapped it against Narisai's temple. You know why I don't kill you, Ayanku? Do you? Tresca shook the man and almost let him fall. Because I can't afford to lose a single Garasni citizen. Not even a turd like you. Do you hear me? I'd love to blow your brains out for pure amusement, but we need all the breeding stock we can get. You're a fucking traitor. Narisai's voice was just a strangled grunt, but he wasn't giving in. Now we're pumping emulsion for those COG bastards and they're handing a few cans of fuel back to us like charity. Your father, don't you dare use my father's name, you worthless shit. Tresca let him slip a little further. That's dumb. He didn't need Narisai to remind him how he'd betrayed his father's dying wish. He'd have cut your throat as soon as look at you. Yes, I let you live. I let you whine. I do that because if this community splits into factions, we'll all die. But if you piss me off one more time, I'll kill you and give your wife to Yannick. Understand? Narisai squirmed around to face him. Yeah, why don't you bend over and take it up the ass from the COG again? That's all you're good for. That did it. 
Tresca almost pulled the trigger. But that was something he would only ever do when he was in full control of himself. He was seething, and killing in a fit of pique wasn't the image he needed to project. He hit Narisai hard across the face with the pistol. Then he turned to the crowd below, all watching in wide-eyed silence. That goes for all of you. I will not tolerate anarchy. Trescu raised his voice without actually shouting, an art that took some learning. We're fighting for our existence, and we have a common enemy with the COG. We need to do deals. Honorable death is all very fine, but the other word for that is losing. We have to survive. He left Narisai on the platform between the water tanks and didn't look back to see if he'd managed to wipe the sneer off the bastard's face. The important thing now was to walk down the stairs and go about his business as if insects like Narisai were a mere annoyance, never a threat. Garasni respected disdainful strength. But Edgar Tresca would have told his son he was soft, and had shown his weakness by not executing Narisai on the spot. Different times, Papa. But maybe, one day. Yannick and Teo were loitering nearby, waiting for him. He didn't need looking after, whatever they thought. He could have killed you, sir, Yannick said. You should gut him to encourage the others. Want me to do it? I meant what I said. Trescu straightened his collar again. He didn't want to look as if he'd been in a bar brawl. Not one more Garasni dies while I'm in command. Not even him. And he wouldn't have killed me. He only gains if he humiliates me. Teo didn't seem convinced. People are getting very touchy about the fuel, sir. We'll get our share. Tresca said. I trust Hoffman. It was Prescott he didn't trust. He wondered for a moment if the COG leader would even think of backhanding his querulous councilman to put him in his place. He doubted it. But the man had pressed a button and wiped out every major city outside Ephra, even his own countrymen. The personal thresholds of acceptable violence were curious things. Do you trust old misery guts even if that radio signal is still going? Teo asked. That was what the COG sailors called Hoffman albeit with some respect. We picked it up again. Tresca realized that he didn't want to think Hoffman was capable of serious deceit. He wasn't sure if that was pride in his ability to read people or just that he had some regard for the colonel and didn't want to be disappointed. But who would they be contacting? He said. The Stranded? There's nobody else out there. Sir, I've spent too many years eavesdropping on COG radio traffic. This is different. Very well. I'll see what I can find out from Michelson. Tresca's radio bleeped. He pulled his earpiece from his jacket pocket. Trescu, go ahead. Everything all right, Commander? It was Hoffman. Couldn't help hearing some small arms fire. Just a little internal politics, Tresca said. No casualties. Thank you for your concern, but everything is under control. Hoffman paused for a breath as if he wasn't expecting that answer. God damn it, don't get yourself killed. He snarled. I don't have time to build a new understanding with your replacement. Trescu decided he hadn't read Hoffman wrong at all. In a situation like this, it was a comfort. Nor do I, Colonel, he said. Nor do I. Peruan Northern Vex, three days later. Well, there goes our tidy plan. Rossi squinted into the sun, then checked something scribbled on his notepad. It slowed down. Then it speeded up. Now it slowed again. Dom adjusted his binoculars. He could now see the relentless march of dead trees from the headland. I'm going to plan for the worst. So will the old man. I still say it's going to miss the town, Rossi said. But it's going to cut it off from the rest of the island. Come on. It's just dead vegetation. Not a mountain range. Shit, what if they don't volunteer to leave? Rossi slapped him on the back. Dom, they know the score. They can stay if they want, but we can't promise to defend them. Their call. Dom wasn't sure that civvies under pressure could actually make that decision. That was what gears were for, to decide how big the risk was and take it for them, however painful, for their own good. 
He'd watch shocked, scared civvies stream out of burning cities carrying fancy drapes but no water bottles or blankets. They needed to be told what to do. But would I have been any different? How can I say what really matters to someone? The short, spongy turf felt like carpet under Dom's boots and the sea air was so clean he could taste it at the back of his throat. A black and white COG standard billowed in the breeze and fell back against the flagpole in a lazy rhythm. This was the way the world should have been, not broken and crowded and filthy like Jacinto had been in its final years. This would still have happened if we hadn't come to Vex. Wouldn't it? These folks wouldn't stand a chance without us. He'd keep telling himself that. He didn't buy Baird's theory that the Glowies followed the emulsion trail. The Stranded said they'd seen stalks on the mainland, so the things were spreading everywhere. Rossi overtook him and walked into town with the air of a man who belonged here now and enjoyed it. His platoon was garrisoned in town and seemed perfectly happy to stay. So who are you seeing? Dom asked, keeping a careful eye on the reactions of the locals. When Delta arrived, everyone knew they weren't on a day trip to buy postcards. Because you've got that look, Drew. Ah, the mats on our side up here. Rossi winked. More women than men. They love a uniform. Dom found he could talk about other people's relationships now without becoming paralyzed by agonizing memories. Rossi's girlfriend had been killed in a grub attack five or six years ago so he was proof that life could go on eventually if he wanted it to. Dom almost asked him how he managed it, if something had kicked him out of it, or if he'd forced himself to move on, or if he just reached the stage where his need for someone was harder to endure than remembering what he'd lost. But he didn't know Rossi well enough for that. You be careful of those jealous local lads, Dom said. Remember they know how to castrate cattle. He passed one of the small shops on the harbor road, not so much a store as a place where people bartered their surplus produce. The woman who'd once reminded him so much of Maria was outside stacking red plastic milk crates so old that they turned to powdery white on the edges. But she didn't look like Maria at all. He had no idea why he'd ever thought she did. She nodded at him, and he nodded back. I've got your cheese, sergeant, she said to Rossi. Hang on a minute. She disappeared into the shop and came out with a parcel wrapped in very old, creased brown paper. Rossi accepted it with a big grin. Why, thank you, Mrs. Dawes. Services rendered? Dumb asked when she was out of earshot. That's a lot of cheese. I just fixed the store's generator, that's all. Rossi said. Her old man's built like a brick shithouse, and a bad-tempered brick shithouse at that. They're just clearing their stores. Dom knew most folks here wouldn't be as relaxed as Mrs. Dawes about being asked to abandon their homes on a maybe. Outside the town hall, Marcus and Anya stood by a pack horse at the side of the road, talking to a group of townspeople. They looked cornered. Marcus was a hard man to corner. Can't say I blame them, Rossi said. What if they evacuate and the brown stuff doesn't get here? And who do you think they'll expect to save them if it does? They didn't ask us to come here, Dom. Yeah, Rossi was going native. It happened. There was no chance of Marcus doing that. He could play the diplomat on the strength of his reputation for plain speaking and common sense, but he never looked comfortable about it. Dom could see his distinctive black durag above the heads of the crowd. Nobody's going to force you. He was saying, we're just here to help you move out if you want to go. No, we just can't live in tents. One of the older women began walking away in evident disgust. We just can't. We'll take our chances here, thanks. Dom and Rossi ambled over and tried to look helpful and non-threatening. There's plenty of room down south, Miriam, Rossi said to the woman. He seemed to know her pretty well. Len Perry thinks we can dismantle a lot of the buildings and move them. They're just wooden frames, right? And how long is that going to take? She asked. If you've got enough time to do that, then why ask us to evacuate? Anya looked as if she'd been up all night, a little gray under the eyes. Like I said, we're not going to force you. But we just don't know what this contamination is going to do next. Well, okay. 
Miriam started walking away too. I'm staying put. That damn stuff might even reach the naval base before it touches us. The impromptu meeting seemed to break up fast once a couple of people walked away. Anya watched them disperse with weary resignation, hands on hips and her lancer slung across her back as if it had always been there. Maybe it was Dom's imagination, but she seemed to be putting on some muscle. I remember Anya when she was this tiny little thing who wouldn't say boo to a goose. Now look at her. You can't save everybody, Dom said. The CZs slowed down again. They don't believe us. Well, four hundred people have said they want out, so I've got to get some trucks loaded. Anya strode away. She was even walking differently these days. Maybe it was the effect of wearing heavy armor. Marcus opened the pack horse's door. Come on, Dom, time to sweet-talk the farmers. There were a couple of farms in the path of the CZ, a small chicken unit, and a beef herd. Dom stared out the window, comforting himself with the idea that there was still an awful lot of island that was stock-free. As the pack horse headed inland, Dom picked up the odor of manure. The countryside didn't always smell fresh and invigorating. Where are we going to put the cattle? he asked. Jondi's farm, for the time being. Poor bastard. I wish we'd got the stranded assholes who did that to him. Yeah. Rotten way to go. Marcus turned off the gravel road and cut down a narrow strip of bare ground along the edge of a field. Now let's see if this one's decided to leave. Edler. Seb Edler and his son, Howell. They bounced down the rutted track and through a gate that opened onto a farmyard full of outbuildings and machinery. Vegetable beds striped with tidy green rows like bristles on a brush stretched off to one side. A couple of guys were standing by the tail ramp of a cattle truck that didn't look as if it had moved in fifty years, trying to persuade a vast white pile of muscle with monstrous horns to walk up the slope. We should have brought Bernie, Dom said. Marcus grunted. It was rueful rather than amused. Her special skills are in demand. Yeah, like the engineers. Nobody needs soldiering. Don't tempt fate. Marcus stopped the pack horse a cautious distance from the truck. Maybe he didn't like the look of those horns either. I don't think we're going to be out of a job any time soon. The older man left the other to handle the loading and waded through the long grass toward the pack horse. So you're leaving then, Seb? Marcus said, stepping out of the cab. The farmer shook his head. For a moment Dom thought he'd changed his mind about going. I've spent thirty years building this herd, he said. I can't lose these animals now. Look at em. Quality. Unique breed. Do you need any help? They're pretty skittish today. God knows what they can sense out there. Can you cover the gate? Marcus shrugged. How hard can it be? They weigh up to a thousand kilos. That's how hard. There were a lot of cattle milling around now, all cows. Damn, they must have been pretty well the same weight as the pack horse. Some were lining up like impatient shoppers waiting for a store to open while others ambled around, ignoring a couple of dogs watching them from a safe distance. One cow began wandering toward Marcus as if she wanted a word with him. I really miss berserkers he muttered, walking slowly across the cow's path. Bernie said to move in just forward of their shoulders and they'll turn away. Yeah, she also told me to stroke them under the chin, but she must have left something out. Marcus took a cautious step toward the cow, following Bernie's instructions, and the animal veered off just like she said it would. It ended up doing a U-turn. It was weirdly magical to see that stuff work. Awesome. Dom said, caught up in the moment and forgetting just why they were doing this. Damn, who'd have thought it? Then the cow threw up her head, wheeled around to Dom's right, and broke into an ungainly canter. The two guys loading the truck stopped. The other cows started backing away. Damn, what's got into them now? Seb managed to dodge a cow as she changed her mind about climbing the ramp and shaved past him. Whatever that stuff is, they can smell it. Dom looked down at his boots. It was an instinct, just like the cows. He did it before he even noticed what had grabbed his attention. 
It was a horribly familiar sensation from a world that was now an ocean away. The cattle scattered. Oh God! I can feel it. Marcus! Marcus was looking down too. Every gear did it. Everyone who'd spent years with grubs tunneling beneath them and bursting out of the ground was hypersensitive about vibrations. It was the first warning anyone got. Sometimes it ended up being their last. Everybody take it easy. Marcus checked his rifle and cast around. Feel it? Yeah, said Seb. The two dogs started barking their heads off. What is that, a tremor? Marcus got on the radio. Phoenix to all call signs, we're getting tremors five kilometers southeast of Purun. Nothing visible yet. Click. Someone responded. On our way to check it out, Marcus. It was Siraki. Eight minutes. Stroud to Phoenix, we're getting it here too. We're going to do a search, Marcus said. Too big for stocks. It feels like a quake. A cow went careering past Dom, but he forgot about being trampled by a ton of beef because the vibrations underneath him were a lot scarier. He aimed his lancer, looking down for ground deformation just as he'd done back on the mainland when he was trying to work out where an e-hole would rip the pavement apart and spew out grubs. No grubs here. There can't be. But there is a dead volcano. Things had been going from bad to worse so an eruption wouldn't have surprised him that much. He forced himself to look up. It was such a powerful instinct now that he didn't trust the ground and it was all he could do to keep his eyes on the horizon. Even Marcus kept checking out the ground as he looked around for the source of the vibrations. They were getting stronger. It was going on for a hell of a long time for a minor quake. Seb, get ready to run, Marcus called. We'll worry about the herd later. Dom couldn't see a damn thing happening. The cattle were still charging around in a panic on the far side of the field, and the dogs were barking furiously. The vibration was building into a definite rolling shudder, like an engine misfire. Then Marcus just said, Trees! Dom looked across the pasture at the woodland on the edge, about three hundred meters away. The trees were swaying wildly. It looked like they were being battered by a gale but it was just a breezy day. He started running. Polyps could climb now, the little assholes. They had to be in the trees. The mismatched scale of it didn't make sense, but he just saw trouble coming and tried to close the gap. The ground started shuddering. Marcus overtook him. Dom, what the hell do you, oh shit! Dom's legs kept going but his brain was already trying to slam on the brakes. He could see it but it was too much to take in. The trees were pitching forward. They toppled over like an uprooted picket fence, root balls flinging soil into the air catapult style, and behind them, Rossi was wrong. It was a goddamn mountain range. And it wasn't polyps shaking the branches. A row of stalks ripped up through the ground from one edge of Dom's horizon to the other, a dense forest of gray, twisted trunks taller than ever before. The landscape changed before his eyes in a matter of seconds. Now that's a fucking problem, Marcus said. Chapter 10 Of course we have a nickname for you too. We call you cogs, like you call yourselves. Why waste time inventing new words when the old one is good? There is a Garasni word that sounds very similar, but it is probably better you don't learn what it is. Yes, cogs, was a very good nickname. Raven KR239 Southeast of Puruin, Vex, present day, 15 A.E. Phoenix to all call signs. We've got stocks. About twenty, twenty-five at least. Baird leaned as far as he dared out of the crew bay, but he still couldn't see anything. The curve of the wooded hill meant his line of sight was the north coast of Vex. And that looked just fine. Then the raven skimmed over the crest of the hill and it was pretty clear that everything was definitely as unfine as it could get. Man, just look at those motherfuckers. Cole sounded stunned. Baird, it's okay to piss your pants. Hell, I'll join you. An avenue of stalks now stretched right across the landscape. Trees lay at all angles around them like a tornado had zipped along in a near straight line and torn them out by the roots. Baird scanned the line of trunks and his gut nodded. 
Even from this height, he could see the movement in the grass. Why is it all the big ugly assholes that turn glowy? Cole asked. I mean, why ain't we seen glowy mice? Glowy butterflies? Maybe that's what polyps were. Mitchell said. Count the legs. Baird snorted. Oh, good to see you're buying my mutagenic lambency theory. If I knew what that meant, I'd only offer you a tenner for it. Come on, Mitchell. Cannon up. It's Papa Polyp time. Sorotki reached the avenue of stalks and turned along their length at maximum speed. 239 to Phoenix. I see the stalks. Where are you? The radio was overwhelmed for a moment with the chatter of Lancer fire. 200 meters the north side. Line up with the farm gate. The raven looped again. Okay, we've got you. I just need to separate you from the psycho crabs. Baird clipped two safety lines to his belt. Better drop me and cold down there. They're way too close for you to get clear shots. You can't outrun polyps, Baird. Look, I held the things off on a frigging submarine. Here we go again. My hero. I found them first. Me. We'll name them after you. Okay, if lambency is an infection that causes mutations, one minute you're a nice, normal, psychotic leviathan, the next you're a piece of seagoing ordnance that's lit up like All Father's Day. So if we could work out what these things started life as, we could Corporal Baird. Yes, Lieutenant Sorotki? Shut the fuck up and shoot. Baird squeezed off another clip as the raven banked. When the horizon leveled again, he could see Marcus and Dom almost back to back, holding off what looked for a moment like an angry, gray-green, crescent-shaped hedge. Baird saw Marcus put his hand to his earpiece, firing one-handed. A line of explosions fountained up from the mass of polyps. Soraki held the raven at a hover directly above the seething wave pouring away from the stalks while Cole and Mitchell laid down fire from both doors. 239, we can't stop them all, Marcus said. They're spreading out into the field. Where are the other birds? Soraki asked. 239 to 8015, what's your ETA? 80 here, 2 minutes, Mel. 15 here, I have a visual on you. That was some pilot called Kenyon. Baird knew he didn't get out often, and there was probably a good reason for that. I want to test my new polyp surprise. Oh, the flamethrower. Mitchell nodded and squeezed his trigger enthusiastically. Yeah, that's going to make you lots of friends in the farming community. Burn some grass or lose some inbred yokels, Kenyon said. Wow, he was all charm, that one. I'm easy. Okay, let's make some space for Marcus and Dom to get clear before we start toasting anything. Soraki headed for open ground just behind Marcus and brought the raven down low enough for Cole and Baird to jump out. Get them away from those things and then get clear. Baird didn't need telling twice. He checked the potential escape routes as soon as his boots hit the ground. He didn't want an Embry star. He just wanted his full complement of unperforated and unburned body parts at the end of the day. But Cole raced for the polyps with a degree of enthusiasm that Baird could only describe as worrying. That was Cole all over. He dealt with every bit of crap that life threw at him by running full tilt at it and knocking it over before it got the chance to bite him in the ass. Who? Cole started picking off polyps trying to flank him on the right, spraying short bursts. The ear-splitting noise was like a chaotic artillery battle, sporadic bangs that occasionally turned into chains of firecrackers when an exploding polyp set some others off. Remember that plastic bubble stuff you could pop for fun? Hell, these assholes are way better. Yeah, let's market them. Baird felt that familiar chill flood his guts as the polyps started coming at him a bit faster than he could take them out. They were gaining ground. Two broke away and forced him to turn his back on the others to aim at them. Like skeet shooting. Shit, when are these things going to stick to a plan? I tell you, they're getting smart. Yeah, come on, Kenyon. Cole sounded like he was having fun. Baird suspected he wasn't but probably thought he had to keep everyone's morale up. Save us some ammo. For a moment, the polyps looked as if they were thinning out. Baird got ready to sprint for it, 
but then another fresh wave boiled out of the churned soil around the stalks and headed his way. They were too smart now to rush in a nice orderly carpet. They swerved, jinked, and generally made it damn hard for him to target them. The assholes were definitely learning. They weren't going to get lured into traps and ambushes anymore. Baird found himself running further than he'd realized to chase one down, and suddenly three more were behind him. Oh God, I'm going to die. Outsmarted by a frigging crab. He whirled around. The difference between popping them and getting fragged by them was a matter of seconds. He caught a flash in the corner of his eye as he aimed and a polyp exploded close enough to splatter him. He recovered in time to let the other two have the full clip, then turned to see that it was Dom who'd saved his ass. Dom just did an angry, two-fingered look where you're going gesture. Fire! he yelled. The raven was so close overhead that it was hard to even hear him over the radio. Goddamn fire! You know, I never thought of doing that. Dom yelled again. Fire! Shift your ass, Baird. Look, dickwad, I... Baird turned again and found he was looking southeast into an advancing wall of flame. Oh, that fire! Kenyon's raven had finally shown up, advancing in a leisurely parallel line along the path of the stalks with its flamethrower. The closer it got, the louder the roaring and popping grew. Trees ignited. The stalks were enveloped in smoke and flame, and more polyps made a run for it. Kenyon peeled off to roast a bunch of them making a dash across the adjoining field. Baird couldn't see any polyps in front of him now. He's going to set the whole thing alight, Dom said. The jet of flame licked down from the raven's door and billowed across the field. Explosions in the grass went off like flashbulbs at a movie premiere. Baird bent over with his hands braced on his knees to catch his breath, wondering how long it would be before they ran out of ammo chasing every last frigging polyp, then realized he could hear someone yelling behind him. Marcus was trying to calm the guy down. It looked like the farmer whose land was being turned to charcoal. It's okay, Seb, Marcus kept saying. It won't spread. It's too damp. It's my damn wheat, Seb sobbed. I've lost my bull. Now you're torching my wheat. For God's sake, you're doing more damage than the polyps. So it wasn't grass. Baird added it to his list of interesting rural facts. Sep turned around, throwing up his arms in frustration, and called his dogs. They didn't come. He walked toward the trees on his left, and stood there whistling and yelling their names. Kenyon's voice came over the radio. I think we got them all, Phoenix. I'm heading back to VNB. Yeah, you got him all right, Marcus said. He went after Seb. Okay, let's carry on and clear the farm. But Seb wasn't going to leave until he had all his cattle. Baird could hear the argument going on. But there's six of them still out there, including one of the bulls. And the cows are in calf. Seb went to walk into the woods, but Marcus caught his arm. And my dogs. They went after them. You're going into a contaminated zone. Marcus was all calm reason. The dogs will come back. We'll find the cattle. But you've got to leave now. You've just seen how risky it is. You lose crops and animals, you starve. Seb said. Do you get it? We keep you fed, and it's not easy. Marcus dropped his voice a little. I'll get Mataki to bring them back. She was a beef farmer. Let's leave it to her. Baird gave Dom an impatient look and held out his wrist to indicate the watch. Tell Farmer Giles to write off Daisy as barbecue. It's deductible. He's got a point, Dom said. No farms, no food. Seb walked away toward the farmhouse, shaking his head. The flames in the wheat were dying down but it was still a hell of a mess out there. The pall of smoke must have been visible from Purun. I thought it was grass, Baird said. It looked like grass. Wheat. Marcus looked northwest in the direction of Puruan and pressed his earpiece. Ask Mataki to teach you crop recognition. Colonel? Phoenix here. Have you had a sit rep from Soraki? Marcus got that defocused look as if he was waiting for a response. 
He grunted a few times, looked down at his boots, and nodded. Okay. We'll finish up here. Phoenix out. What did he say? Dom asked. Compulsory evacuation. Marcus said, walking off. He's decided to clear Peruin whether they like it or not. Twenty kilometers south of Peruin, northern Vex. Isabel Heyman gazed out of the pack horse's side window in silence, and that bothered Hoffman more than having her in full vitriolic flood. In the past few weeks she'd only spoken to him when she absolutely had to. He knew why. She didn't forgive. She blamed Hoffman for letting Tresca shoot a wounded stranded prisoner in her hospital. He couldn't really argue with that, but he wasn't going to apologize. What he didn't know was why she'd asked to come to Poruin with him. But he needed to mend some fences with her, and he was ready to eat some humble pie if that was what it took. The last senior yard doctor left in the COG was a lot more used to him than the chairman. They'd be in Poruin soon. He couldn't stand it any longer. Did you have something to say to me, doctor? Because you haven't come along for the pleasure of my company. It was odd to see Heyman without her white lab coat. It was her armor, her uniform, her statement to the world. Without it she'd dissolved into a frail, wispy-haired, elderly woman until she opened her mouth. You got that right? Heyman was pushing eighty, the former chief of ER at Jacinto's main teaching hospital and her snarling exterior didn't veneer a grandmotherly heart of gold. She was an angry bitch to the core. I was hoping for a private discussion. Can't get much more private than this. You want to unburden yourself, doctor? I want to know what the hell's going on. Why Prescott keeps bringing me his garden waste to analyze. Did you find anything? Well, it isn't going to respond to antibiotics or bed rest, that's for sure. Heyman let out a long hoarse sigh and searched in her pocket for something. It was going to be her damn cheroots. He knew it. Everyone thinks I'm omniscient. I'm an emergency physician. She parked the unlit smoke in the corner of her mouth. Not a veterinarian, and you can remind your lady friend about that. Or a fortune teller. Or a damn microbiologist. Or an analytical chemist. Or whatever the hell Prescott thinks the word doctor means. Does he know anything about scientists? Maybe he's forgotten what they look like. We lost all the grown-up ones. That's damned careless. There was no harm showing dissent in front of Heyman. Any respect for authority was weak-mindedness as far as she was concerned. Yeah. Isn't it? She patted her pockets as if she was now looking for matches. Hoffman didn't volunteer to find a light for her. It was just dead leaf mold, soil, and emulsion, she said. The stalks were interesting structures under magnification. A little like bone, but neither plant nor animal. Is that possible? She looked at him as if he was an idiot. Fungi fall into that gray area. Nearer to animal, in fact. So you're not just a simple scab lifter. That's just high school science, colonel and my microbiology lab is a 50-year-old microscope from the School of Dentistry. I didn't have a fancy education, doctor. It shows. She was still rummaging in her pockets. Anyway, I gave him the damn microscope in the end and told him to do it himself. He's got as good a chance of making sense of it as I have. So what do you want from me? Not my scientific opinion, obviously. Tell me what you're holding back. About the Lambent? Not a goddamn thing. He almost mentioned the disc. Damn, he was trying to justify himself to her. Let's just say it's a contentious issue between me and His Highness. Cut the bullshit. Is it one of the biological weapons programs they used to have here? Hoffman hadn't put those two elements together before. Now he wondered why. He got that feeling, the tight scalp, dry mouth, that he'd had when Prescott had declassified the New Hope facility, and he still didn't know exactly what biological reasons the COG had gotten up to there. You sat on that, you fucker. Now I bet you're sitting on this. Is that what's on your goddamn disc? Is this one of our own bioweapons that we let loose on the grubs and it's come back to bite us in the ass? But something wasn't quite right. 
The grubs had been driven out of their tunnels by the lambent. That was why they came to the surface. It had seemed like an interesting detail when Delta Squad had discovered it in the locust records stored in their tunnels, but now it was a worrying anomaly. If the lambent were the result of a COG bioweapon, then it predated E-Day. And that meant someone knew they were down there, and that the locusts were coming. Dear God Almighty, Hoffman said to himself, and this island was his choice of location. Not ours. You really are just a simple grunt, aren't you, Hoffman? He grappled with the thought that his own government, the flag he'd served all his life, might be responsible. But it wouldn't have been the first time that the COG had unleashed a weapon of mass destruction against an enemy and killed its own people instead. No, I did. I killed millions. I turned the hammer of Dawn command keys with Prescott and Bardry. For what? For this? If he knows what it is, he's hiding it well, Hoffman said, wondering why the Lamben had now dwindled in his mind to a monster less efficient than himself. Maybe that's not an answer. He might know what it is, but not how to fix it. He'd know. But then you'd know if it had been deployed against the grubs. You used to be director of special forces. Don't bank on it. Hoffman was rerunning old conversations and searching for clues he'd missed at the time. He couldn't pin it down, but if this was the COG's doing, there was something that didn't make sense. He's still keeping stuff from me. I don't know any more than you do, and you can believe that or not as you see fit. Oh, I believe you, she said. You wouldn't let your gears go through this if you knew something. No, not now. I kept my mouth shut once. Never again. She went quiet. She seemed to have found her matches. It took her three attempts to light the cheroot, and Hoffman was about to ask her not to smoke in his damn pack horse when he saw that her hands were shaking. He let her blow out a stream of pungent smoke and said nothing. When you get old, Colonel, really old, my kind of old, you'll find yourself looking at the way the world is going she said at last, and you comfort yourself with the thought that you'll be dead before any of the shit hits the fan. But I won't be, damn it. I think I'll still be here. Hoffman could now see the smoke from the stock fire on the skyline. It looked no more menacing than burning crop stubble. Well, we do what we can. I've got to face a few thousand people who don't want to leave their homes. Your biggest problem is going to be famine regardless of whether this thing is a pathogen that can cross the species barrier or not. The food chain's fragile. Well, we've got lambent grubs. Lambent leviathans. Lambent eels. Doesn't necessarily follow that it'll show up in anything else. Worry about the vegetables first. Ever feel like you're pissing in the wind, Doc? Every fucking day. Heyman let out another long breath of smoke, filling the vehicle and I still hold you responsible for letting that savage Tresca murder one of my patients. I can live with that, doctor. They'd reached a brutal kind of truce, an agreement to dislike but trust one another. Hoffman drove on in silence. The pack horse passed a stand of dead stalks and Heyman swiveled in her seat to stare. Hell of a day out, she said. As Hoffman drove down the approach road to Peruin, he could already see some people loading up vehicles outside their houses. A lot of the locals didn't have transport, not even push bikes. They relied on the farm trucks and utility vehicles if they wanted to venture out of town, something they hadn't needed to do in a long time. It was going to take COG vehicles to evacuate them all. He slowed the pack horse to acknowledge a middle-aged couple cramming tools into the back of a pickup. There was a name painted on the driver's door. Faded and flaking now but still legible. J.H. Tillo, plumber. It might have just been someone else's truck. Hoffman stopped and leaned out. Are you a plumber, sir? The man looked startled, as if he hadn't seen the pack horse coming. I am. Report to Staff Sergeant Perry at the naval base. Ask for him when you get to the vehicle checkpoint. What about my? Perry looks after his civvies, so you'll get accommodation in the barracks. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Hoffman drove off. It was interesting how people who weren't used to following orders usually did what they were told if they were scared enough. 
He caught Heyman staring at him. What did I do wrong now? He asked. I didn't shoot him. No, you'd leave that to Trescu. Anvil Gate became the here and now again. I've shot civilians. Just like you've switched off life support machines, I'll bet. Everybody justifies their actions. He wasn't sure if that had shut her up or if she'd just gone back to ignoring him. He found himself fuming and not sure of who he was angry with, but it was probably Prescott. Bioweapons. You bastard. Just tell me. We fucking fried Sarah together, and you think I can't be trusted to know about this? He had to find Baird and let him know. Or maybe he'd just go and punch it out of Prescott this time, or just punch him for the hell of it. The pall of smoke that was drifting toward the town had definitely focused everyone's attention. Hoffman got as far as the town hall and had to park the pack horse. Townspeople were standing in the road outside and spilling onto the green, clustered around the war memorial, and he could see Anya and Rossi in the middle of the crowd. He rated the tension level at pissed off and scared but not dangerous. Even so, he made a show of escorting Heyman into the center of the mob to keep everyone calm. These were the kind of folks who wouldn't start a ruck if a frail old lady was there. You cowardly asshole! She hissed. You're using me as a human shield. Diplomacy, document shut up and look sweet. Hoffman steered her into the crowd and the focus started shifting to her. Mind your backs, people, medic coming through. Anyone suffering ill effects from that goddamn smoke? Anya gave him a raised eyebrow that spoke volumes. Sir, we'll be ready to start moving vulnerable individuals in a couple of hours along with the sector closest to the CZ. I'm just explaining to the neighborhood delegates how we're going to prioritize moving supplies and personal possessions. Two hours isn't enough, one of the men said. Then we'll come back for the baggage later, Hoffman said, as per Lieutenant Stroud's contingency plan. Was that in there? He wasn't sure. But Anya knew what she was doing, and he wasn't about to second-guess her in front of civvies. Lives first. Food next. Pianos last. That's the way we do things. Go home and start packing according to that priority list. Heyman spoke up. And if anyone thinks they've got health issues, get yourselves into the town hall and I'll take a look at you now. Hoffman had no idea why she did that, to save face or help break up the crowd or because it really needed doing. He didn't care. The crowd began to disperse. Rossi did his gentleman act and escorted her toward the town hall. They're just cascading the information, sir, Anya said. It's the easiest way to communicate with a couple of thousand people. We don't have accommodation ready at the other end yet. If any want to hang around, Charles going to be grateful for the breathing space. Have we got the time? I'm still thinking in terms of a couple of weeks to complete this. Where's Delta? With Lewis talking to the fisherman. Better show my face. Hoffman said. Anya's honest efficiency just added to his guilt about not telling her about the disc. It'll be good to have you back at VNB, anyway, Lieutenant. Might even cheer Phoenix up a bit. Anya looked down for a moment, charmingly embarrassed. I miss the place and the company. Hoffman had to weave between obstacles, crates, dogs, kids, tractors on the road down to the harbor. He could see the cluster of gears on the slipway with the mayor, Louis Gavriel, and Will Barons, his deputy. There was some animated conversation going on with the trawler crews, some still on board their boats, with their arms folded. As he parked the vehicle, Hoffman caught a glimpse of Baird's blonde scrubby hair on deck of Trilliant, as he tinkered with one of the trawler winches, clearly not taking part in the social stuff. How are we doing, gentlemen? Hoffman asked, strolling up to the edge of the quay wall. It was a two-meter drop to the boats on this tide. I'd hoped it wouldn't come to this. The trawler men were regulars at the naval base. They were used to having warship escorts and gears on board for protection, and they knew better than anybody what the Lambert could do. Fishing boats had been sunk and crews killed. But there was a kid in his twenties standing outside the wheelhouse of a beam trawler. Hoffman caught the tail end of the conversation. It's my boat, the kid said. 
My dad left it to me. I can do what the hell I like with it. Marcus sounded calm but the set of his shoulders said otherwise. Yeah, but how far are you going to get? It's better than waiting here for those things to come and kill us. Come on, Simon, Gabrielle said. You won't even reach the nearest island. You owe the community. You can't take the boat when we need it so badly. Simon stabbed his forefinger at Gabrielle. This isn't goddamn Mgotsi. What's mine is mine, not the state's. Don't give me any of that collectivist bullshit. I'm going. I'll take my chances. Hoffman moved in almost without thinking. Losing a fishing boat took food out of everyone's mouth, but letting Simon leave meant others might follow. Fish was going to be key to their survival if the land was poisoned. I've been here before. I know how far I'll go. He strode up to the harbor wall and took his lancer off his shoulder. I respect your ownership, son. He didn't take aim, but just unslinging his weapon made the threat for him. But right now we can't afford to lose an asset like that. And you won't survive out there. Simon looked up at him as if he was just some old bastard making idle threats. He obviously hadn't heard any of the gossip. You reckon? The stranded seemed to manage okay. For a moment, Hoffman thought it was just a protest, a natural reaction to fear and upheaval and the sheer damn unfairness of it all. The lad would calm down, take a few passengers and supplies on board, and head south to the naval base. But then Simon ducked into the wheelhouse and started the motor. The trawler puffed exhaust out of its stack and Simon came back onto the deck to reach for the line. Marcus just stood with his arms folded and gave Hoffman a wary glance. You don't want to do that, Simon. You stay and die if you want to, Sergeant. Hoffman was aware of the rest of the trawler men watching, and knew he had a few seconds to make his point, or let the whole damn thing fall apart. It was a moment of absolute clarity. His authority here was just an afterthought. He aimed. Simon looked back over his shoulder at Hoffman as he slipped the line and coiled the rope down onto the deck. Go ahead he said. So Hoffman fired. He put a single shot through the boat's radar housing as all the civvies ducked. Simon took a few steps back and almost went over the side. Hoffman could see everything around him in sharp focus, including Marcus moving toward him fast, and this time he aimed squarely at the kid. Simon, if I've got to shoot one guy to save a few extra lives, I'll do it, Hoffman said. Is that me? Is that me talking? God damn it, so it is. You're not going anywhere. Dom? Get on that trawler and make sure it ends up in the naval base. Now. You can lower your weapon, Colonel, Marcus said. He looked as if he was going to step in the way. He gets the idea. Dom scrambled down the ladder from the harbor wall and dropped onto the trawler's deck. The clarity of the moment suddenly evaporated and Hoffman realized Gavriel and Barons were staring at him as if he was a stranger. But he didn't back off until he could see Dom in the wheelhouse with his hand on the controls. Simon leaned on the rails and found his voice again, but it was breathless and indignant now. You were going to shoot me, you bastard! He yelled. You were, weren't you? Only as a last resort. Hoffman slung his rifle realizing that he hadn't changed at all, and that he still defaulted to black and white unemotional necessity in a crisis. He kept going, even though he wanted to apologize to Gabrielle and especially to Marcus, who was looking at him as if he'd made a big mistake in ever forgiving him. Baird, take a look at the radar and make sure I didn't hit anything critical. It wasn't a good time to explain himself to Gabrielle, so he walked away. Marcus followed him for a few paces. Colonel, you want to leave this to us? Don't worry, Phoenix, Hoffman said. I only needed to do that once. Everyone's going to behave from now on. Fishermen have got to put to sea. What are we going to do if they decide not to come back, send a gunboat after them? We'll have gears embarked with them again, Hoffman said. We're still under martial law. Those trawlers will return to port for as long as we have people to feed at gunpoint if need be. He kept walking and didn't turn around, 
to avoid having to decide if that look on Marcus's face was disappointment. He made his peace with the man and the only thing he regretted was that the painfully repaired relationship might now be damaged again. At least I didn't lecture him on his duty. But sometimes you've got to do some shitty things to save people from themselves. Or stop them from fucking things up for everyone else. He climbed into the pack horse and headed back down the road, feeling sick and shaky. Dr. Heyman was waiting for him outside the town hall, looking irritated with life. He got out to help her into the passenger seat. Did I hear a shot? she asked. Peruin was very quiet. Sound carried a long way. What happened? History repeated itself. Hoffman said. It does that a lot. He wondered how he'd ever coped when he didn't have Bernie to unburden himself to. He didn't like himself much right then, even if he wouldn't have done things any differently. Maybe that was how Prescott saw himself. Not a good guy, but a necessary evil. So who's going to ask Prescott if we created the Lambent problem ourselves? Heyman asked. Hoffman couldn't get Marcus's expression out of his mind. That'd be me, he said. Beam trawler thrift, and root for Vex naval base. Dom rested his hand on the trawler's wheel, keeping a wary eye on the coastline off the port side. It wasn't the prospect of stocks or leviathans that worried him most. It was running aground. You sort of look as if you know what you're doing, Simon said. But then again you don't. I'm trained on rigid inflatables. Dom almost turned the wheel over to him, but wasn't sure he wouldn't veer off into deeper waters to make his point. Commando. Oh, really? Yeah. I've docked to R.I.B. in the cargo bay of a sea raven, at full throttle and under fire. I can handle this rust bucket. And if I prang this, Chief Stoker Baird here can repair it with a piece of chewing gum. Haven't seen gum for years, Baird said wistfully, leaning against the door frame. He was picking the innards out of something electronic that Dom couldn't identify. I'll just apply a thick layer of my awesomeness. Simon had a look on his face that said no amount of humor and chumminess was going to smooth things over. Dom considered the prospect of armed enforcers embarked in every trawler and didn't like it much. That old sod wouldn't really have shot me, would he? Simon asked, still sounding worried. Baird nodded. Sure he would. He's done it before. You're just winding me up. Seriously, Dom said. He decided not to use the Hammer of Dawn as an example. He wasn't sure if everyone in Poruin realized Hoffman was partly responsible for that or not. He's the guy who held Anvil Gate. He shot civvies for stealing food. You think he's going to just speak harshly if you guys decide to piss around? For a moment Dom wasn't sure if he was making a point or wondering aloud how far his boss would actually go. He now knew how far he would go himself and that had changed everything. But he's not a psycho. You just don't realize how bad things are. I do. That's why I don't want to sit here like bait. Simon went outside and leaned on the port side rail, staring down into the water. Baird moved into the space he'd vacated and fired up the radar screen again. We should get them to train gears to operate trawlers, he said. Just in case we have to ground them all. Shut up, Baird. Just saying. Ooh, look. The radar's all better. Baird does it again. You can thank me later. Look, can you actually park this thing when we get into harbor? Yes. He leaned over to tap the commando knife strapped to his calf. He'd been so proud of that when he passed his course. He'd shown it to Maria. You know what this means, Baird? It means that despite not being a fucking rocket scientist like you, I can manage to stumble along and do quite difficult stuff. Baird was about to retaliate but something interrupted him. Dom saw him shove his finger in his ear to receive a radio message. So, it's private. Baird made a noncommittal noise in his throat. Well, if it's homebrew, then let me ask my respected colleague here for his input. He turned to Dom. Hey, Dom, you and Marcus rummaged through the vaults, didn't you? You mean the underground storage? The archives. Yeah. 
when we were gathering flammable stuff to burn in the polyp traps. Tell me you didn't burn any records. No, we didn't get around to it. Baird pressed his earpiece again. Might be worth a look, Colonel. Dom gave him a look as he signed off. What will? Baird tapped his chest plate and winked. He meant the data disk. What's that got to do with the archive store? Doc Heyman thinks the Glowies might be one of our bright ideas from the days when this was Toxin Town. Baird whispered. Dom had heard that before. He didn't buy it. Well, if it is, they wouldn't have left the formula in the files, would they? And if it was the antidote, he'd use it, wouldn't he? No, but the more we know, the more we have to shake down Prescott with. This is the chairman we're talking about. He could look you in the eye and tell you your name wasn't Baird and you'd believe him. And who's we? The only one who's going to have the balls to shake Prescott down is Hoffman. Naya, Naya, Naya. Baird mimicked Dom in a whiny voice. Okay, if you've got a better idea, I'm all ears. The trawler was coming up on the southwest headland now. Dom steered extra wide because the coastline had changed from the old chart he was relying on. It had taken a hammer strike to stop the last Lambert Leviathan attack and the detonation had caused a massive landslide. Whatever had collapsed into the sea was sitting there waiting to put a hole in the hull. Simon stuck his head through the door. You want to hand over to a competent seaman, buddy? Someone who can use the fishing sonar? Yeah, go ahead, Dom said, conceding defeat. The guy wasn't going to make a run for it now. When Thrift puttered into the naval base and came alongside in the small ship's basin, he actually seemed to relax. Dom suspected it was the big, solid walls and the reassuring shadow of the old gun emplacements that made it clear the place was heavily defended. Perun was just wooden cottages that a few polyps could burn down all on their own. The massive stone column with its cog and anchor naval emblem loomed over the base and reminded everyone that the COG was still in business and capable of looking after itself. Or at least it felt that way. Dumb tried not to think about the reality because it wouldn't help him get through the day. You still got people living on the ships? Simon asked. Dom turned to see what he was looking at. A bunch of civilians was leaning on the rails of a freighter one of the ragtag fleet of NCUG and civilian vessels that had fled from the mainland. Laundry fluttered from cables strung along the upper works. Yeah, Dom said. We've got some way to go before we've built homes for everyone. The polyps burned down a whole section of tents last time they got ashore, too. I'll live on thrift, then. Simon gave Dom a look. You can disable her engines if you don't trust me but I'm buggered if I'm going to sleep ten strangers to a room in some dorm. Yeah, but it's still safer here, Dom said. If we thought we stood a better chance somewhere else, we'd go. The small ship's basin was pretty crowded and maneuvering thrift was probably a little more than Dom's rusty seamanship skills could handle. Simon seemed to be picky about berths. Dom would have tied up in the next available gap but Simon took one look at the vessel alongside and grunted before moving on. It was a small Garasni patrol boat. Didn't you like the color? Baird asked. No, Simon said. My granddad never came home from the POW camp at Ramasku. Baird did his annoyed snort and went out onto the deck. Dom followed him. Terrific, Baird said. Vex is the fucking island that time forgot and the Garasni are the least likely bunch we could ever run into, but somehow we managed to end up here with them and a bunch of locals with a grudge against them. Are we cursed or what? The pendulum wars went on for three generations, at least. Lots of time for the whole world to work up some serious grievances. I bet he'll still fuel up with their emulsion. Whoa, when did you get to be an indie lover? Your war, Dom. Not mine. It just came out. But at least Baird had the decency to look guilty about it. Sorry. I enlisted after the armistice. It isn't personal for me, you know? Simon rapped on the wheelhouse glass and gestured to them to move so he could see where he was steering. He'd found a berth next to an NCOG mine hunter. Dom stuck his head around the wheelhouse door. You happy now? Sergeant Mataki told us we wouldn't have to mix with the Garasni. 
Simon grumbled. He came out and threw a line over a bollard on the jetty. Seems we can't avoid the assholes. Yeah, well, she was being optimistic. You think the glowies are the worst thing that can happen to us, do you? All I can see is the government we've been loyal to commandeering our property and cozying up to a bunch of war criminals who murdered our troops just so it can get its hands on their emulsion. Dom tried hard to put himself in Simon's position. He'd never even seen a grub in the flesh, and so far the glowies had been a sporadic terror that had had less impact on his town than the stranded raiders. The bigger issue, the one that still hung over this community, was from another war. But he was right. The COG had muscled in and treated it as its right to take over Vex, and Gorisnea had a long history of atrocities. Maybe Simon just needed to have the shit scared out of him by more Lambent to put things in perspective. Whatever, Dom said. Look, you better go sign in at the reception office and get your ration card sorted out or you won't get fed here. Very generous. Simon secured the line and climbed ashore. I'll remember that when I unload my next catch. He stalked off down the jetty. The rest of the trawlers were starting to arrive, but most of those used the naval base anyway and already had a designated berth. When Dom looked across the water at the parallel jetty, he realized there was a bunch of Garasni leaning on the rail of a Mireille Anka, just staring at the cabaret. Sound carried over water really well. Dom recognized one of them. He wasn't a sailor. He was about Hoffman's age, a huge guy with a lot of scars, but he wasn't wearing the remnants of his army captain's uniform today. He just nodded at Dom and went on staring. Is that who I think it is? Baird whispered. One of the guys who got you and Marcus out of that stranded ambush. You're okay, Baird. The Garasni love you. It's me who had a run-in with him. Dom couldn't remember his name. It was something like Zaska or Sasku. But he did remember the guy had been held in the Liran prison camp in the last war, and what the COG had done to him. Dom had made the mistake of telling him what a bunch of murdering shithouses Garasni were before he found that out. It was getting harder to look the guy in the eye each time he saw him, but that was thankfully rare now. Okay. Both sides did terrible things. That's war. That's what humans do to one another, even the ones that are nice people if you put them in a normal situation. How do I even start to explain that to the Peruan guys? How do I make myself feel it, and not just accept it's true? Why do they keep saving our asses? Dom asked. Baird knew them better than anybody. Do you and Yannick ever talk about it? Baird shrugged. I think they like having the moral high ground. They know we think they're thugs. They think they're superior because they had an empire when we were dobing our walls with horseshit for plaster. It's all about dignity. They seem pretty united. No whiny assholes. Ah, uh, they have, but not in public, Baird said. Tresca smacks the guys upside the head and tells them de Goris Nayan people do not whine like children. He did a pretty good Garasni accent except he sounded more like Yannick than Trescu. He hates them looking unruly. Lacks discipline. Dom marveled, not only because Baird seemed to be chummy with a bunch of despised indies, but that he made new friends at all outside the squad. Dom thought the only person that Baird could relate to on a daily basis was Cole. But then Cole was the most tolerant guy in the world. Even the endlessly patient Bernie had punched Baird out. Every time Dom started liking the Garasni a little bit, he reminded himself that they shot unarmed stranded prisoners. They dumped the bodies of stranded they'd shot in the widow's laps, even nice happy Yannick, a real charmer with a great sense of humor. It was an ongoing feud that had started when stranded gangs committed their own atrocities in Garasni villages. Garasni didn't forget any more than the tall and vets did. The same bit of him said that the Garasni were just guys who'd seen their families and neighbors slaughtered by stranded gangs and were settling scores, just as he was sure he would have done. The less logical bit of him said they were Indies, and Indies were all the same, and that Carlos would have been alive today if the UIR hadn't started the Pendulum Wars. He was pretty sure they had. You do make some weird friends, he said. It's not about who smiles at you. 
Baird said. It's about who gets you out of the shit every time. You're not really used to this whole concept of friendship, are you? I know who I give a shit about. How the hell did you ever get pally with a nice guy like Cole? Baird smirked to himself and started tinkering with Thrift's winch mechanism. He pulled me out of some shit. He said, Chapter 11 Where are we going to put all these people when we don't know where the next attack will be? How are we going to house, feed, and clothe them when we're losing whole cities and the infrastructure around them? We're already splitting into two societies, those who've lost everything, and those desperate not to become like them. Natalia Vreland, Minister for Social Welfare, Coalition of Ordered Governments, shortly after E-Day, Kossily Barracks, 4th Ephralite Infantry, Central Tyrus, one month after E-Day, fifteen years earlier. Cole knew the sound of a private fight when he heard one, and he could hear one now. It was the lack of yelling and cussing that gave it away. Someone was getting the hell beaten out of them in one of the washrooms. All he could hear was the occasional metallic sound of a lightweight door being slammed against a wall a few times and some muffled grunts and thwacks, so someone was settling a grievance and didn't want an audience. Most folks would have walked by, but Cole wasn't most people. He stopped and opened the door. Yeah, it was a fight, all right. He couldn't see it at first, not until he walked to the end of the partition wall inside the locker room and peered around it. A guy in fatigues was waiting outside a lavatory stall, catching his breath, and Cole caught a glimpse of another gear in the open doorway, just a boot stepping back like the man was leaning over something. There had to be a third guy in there getting the worst of it. There was. He burst out of the stall, blonde scrubby hair, soaking wet, and head-butted his attacker. He looked a hell of a lot more battered than the other two, but he didn't seem to know he was outnumbered. As he fell against the locker and his opponent started kicking him, he grabbed the guy's ankle, Cole gave him points for that, and brought his other fist up hard between the man's legs. The guy fell. They were both tangled on the floor now, gouging and punching. It was time to do something before the third guy joined in again. Hell, it wasn't Cole's fight, but those odds weren't sporting. Yo, gentlemen! Cole positioned himself squarely in the entrance, completely blocking it. That always worked. It demonstrated just how damn big he was and that there was no way past him. And he never had to prove he was as strong as he looked. You wanna reconvene outside? I gotta take a dump and I like my peace and quiet. The two guys dishing it out whipped around. The blonde guy taking the pounding sees the lull to lash out and punch one of them in the mouth. Cole stepped forward to haul the other one away by his collar in a single pull, and almost got a smack in the eye for his trouble until the guy looked him in the face. Yeah, they recognized him. Being the Cole train had some shock value. Cole still had hold of the guy's collar. Mind if I do my business now, baby? Whether they'd run out of steam or just didn't like the odds, they all stopped. The one who'd been doing the kicking dusted himself down and jabbed a warning finger in the blonde guy's direction. Don't think it's the last of this, you prick, he said. I'll see you again later. The blonde guy sneered. Damn, he just didn't know when to give in and shut up. Yeah, asshole. That's what your mother always says to me after I pay her. Whoa, gentlemen, enough, okay. Cole did his best to loom menacingly, arms at his side and fists not quite bald. Ain't you all got some urgent embroidery to do? The two guys shot him a glance and walked off. Cole didn't know who they were, not with so many new gears showing up at boot camp every day, and he hadn't looked at their name tabs. But he could read the name on the blonde guy's fatigues. Baird D. S. Baird braced his hands on one of the basins and leaned over to spit out some blood. His hair was soaking wet. Cole could see some white bits in it that looked a lot like bathroom tissue. You okay? Cole asked. Damn, did they shove your head down the toilet? No, I always wash my frigging hair that way. Baird mumbled. He spat again. Haven't you got a crap to take? Maybe it was too much to expect a thank you. Boy, Baird looked a mess. They could at least have flushed the John first. So what started all that? My dad. 
Seems he handed out a sentence they didn't like. Well, that, and maybe something I said. Your dad's a judge? A magistrate. Was. He's dead. Baird looked up at the mirror over the basin and his shoulders sagged. He didn't seem cut up about his dad at all, so maybe it wasn't recent. Shit. I'm going to be on a charge again when old Iron Ball sees this. You got a real way with charming people, then. Hey, is it my fault I'm an asshole magnet? Baird paused as if he realized that wasn't the smartest thing to say. You're Augustus Cole, aren't you? Cole tapped his name tap. That's what it says on the can, baby. I'm a Sharks fan myself. Well, I'll consider this missionary work, then, cause you ignorant heathens don't know no better. Cole decided he'd done his good deed for the day. You take care of yourself, Baird. Yeah. Baird turned on a faucet. I intend to. Cole went on his way. Folks were pretty strung out and guys got into scraps for a lot less reason than someone's dad pissing them off, so the incident was overtaken by harsh reality. He'd had a month's basic training, just a month, and he was deploying for real in two days. Part of him couldn't wait to get out and start killing grubs, but part of him had never taken a life before, any kind of life, and he wasn't sure how he'd feel about it. I'm gonna be able to pull the trigger, ain't I? They're grubs. They asked for it. It ought to be easy. As he passed the row of phone booths by the mess hall, he had an urge to call home. Everyone else seemed to be doing just that. There were long lines at each phone, with gears checking their watches and looking pissed off with whoever was making the call at the time. God damn. There ain't no home to call now. Cole just kept on doing it. It was like he kept forgetting what had happened and had to go through the bad news all over again. Sometimes he really felt that if he picked up that phone and dialed, his mama would answer. He wanted it to stop. His folks were gone. He knew that, but he didn't feel it yet, and maybe he never would. Now he understood why some people said it was a good idea to see the open casket and get the idea straight in your head. But he hadn't been able to do that. Grubs didn't leave much to look at. So I won't have any trouble pulling that trigger. Will I? He didn't see Baird around again until a few days later when his company deployed to Kinnerlake for real. The guy was standing on the far side of the airfield, and the only reason Cole spotted him was that damn blonde hair. He was swinging his helmet idly in one hand by its chinstrap like it was a grocery basket, looking unimpressed with the world while the rest of the gears waiting for transport, all identical and anonymous in their helmets, stood huddled in groups. Baird was conspicuously on his own. Cole guessed from the way he was standing that he didn't actually want to be but drew the line at walking over to join anyone. Sergeant Iredell, iron balls to most gears, at least when his back was turned, strode past Baird, said something short and sharp, and Baird put his helmet on like a sulky schoolboy. As soon as the sergeant was out of sight, Baird took it off again and replaced it with his goggles. Damn, poor old Baird. Wants to have a war with every asshole he meets. Life don't need to be that hard. It was easy being the coal train. Cole never needed to think twice about anything. He just opened up the throttle and did everything at full speed. Thrash ball was easy, making friends with folks was easy and living each day as it came was easy. When he ambled up to the rest of his company, they all stopped whatever they were doing. Hey, Cole Train! You ready for the big day? Cole! Where's your limo? Cole spread his arms. I ain't looking forward to the helicopter ride, baby. Who's got my designer sick bag? Everybody knew he got airsick now. Nobody jeered at him for it. If anything, they seemed to find it endearing. He glanced over his shoulder at Baird, still standing at a distance, and looking sorry for himself. Someone had to make the first move. Hey, Baird? Cole called. You waiting for your company or something? Alonzo, one of the combat medics, nudged Cole. You know that asshole? Yeah. Kinda. He's just been dumped on us from Bravo Company. Real obnoxious little shit. Oh, he's okay. Asshole or not, Baird was about to face grubs for the first time, 
and if nobody was looking out for him then he wouldn't be around tomorrow to do it again. He deserved a chance. Baird, we gonna have the pleasure of your company for this day trip or not? Baird rolled his head a little and came over to join Cole, doing his best to look reluctant. Well, that doubles the IQ of this squad, I suppose. Cole didn't take the bait. That was the secret, he reckoned, to let Baird cuss himself out and then see if there was anything real he had to say for himself. The regiment's ravens were configured to take six gears and two door gunners. It was just a matter of standing next to Baird and making sure the loadmaster didn't mind a change in her list. You're messing up my tidy chalk, cold train, she said, checking him off on her clipboard. But because it's you. And put your bucket on, okay? Cole put his helmet on and tightened the chin strap. Thank you, ma'am. Baird buckled the next to him and stared out of the open door, still helmetless, and the raven lifted. It turned toward Kinnerlake with a stomach-churning roll. Cole lasted another five minutes before he had to take his helmet off and grab the safety line to puke. Alonzo leaned across and tapped his knee. You ought to take meds for that. Makes me drowsy, Cole said. Better out than in, man. This was the first time that Cole had flown over a live combat area. Nothing on the TV news or in training had really prepared him for what he could see through breaks in the smoke as the squadron of ravens approached Kinnerlake. It looked like the news footage, but that was just movies. This was real, now, happening. There were huge smoking craters in the ground below, and whole blocks of houses ground to rubble. A fractured gas pipe was shooting flames into the air. He could smell burning, and somehow that changed everything. If I get this wrong, I ain't just gonna lose a game. I'm gonna die. The rush of adrenaline that had been a thrill before a thrash ball match had turned into something that almost paralyzed him. His heartbeat felt out of control. He was staring down a narrow tunnel. The weirdest thing was that the blood in his legs felt like it had frozen solid. I'm scared. I'm really scared. Cole had never been physically terrified before, not even as a kid. He had to get a grip. He took deep breaths and pressed the heels of his hands against his eyes for a few seconds. Way back, some coach had told him it did some shit to the nerves and calmed the guy down. The coach also swore blind that a winning streak was down to his goddamn lucky socks, so it might have been some psych-up bullshit, but Cole suddenly felt a whole lot better. Whoa, I'm back he said to himself. Yeah. Baird kept fiddling with his bayonet. I think I'm just going to piss my pants, if that's okay with you. Now Cole could see individual gears down there. They were formed up by a line of tanks and APCs across a plaza in the center of what had once been Kinnerlake's main shopping mall. In a few minutes, that would be him. For real. He'd be that little dark gray toy down there on the ground. I ain't gonna lose. I can't lose. The radio crackled as the raven descended behind the line of APCs. Okay, people. We've still got grubs down there. Remember, they can come up anywhere. Come on, let's get this over with. Baird said to himself. Hope you're happy now, bitch. Cole couldn't work out who the bitch was and now wasn't the time to find out. Baird sure did have some issues going on there. But Cole forgot that and also everything he'd learned the minute his boots touched the ground. He didn't see where the rest of his company landed. He could only focus on what he could feel underneath him, the pavement shuddering beneath his boots. He'd come from Hanover. The grubs hadn't reached the city yet. It was like nothing else he'd ever experienced. Grubs. That's them down there, for real. I can feel them. Oh shit. Eho! Someone yelled. Stand to. The pavement started buckling a hundred meters ahead. The tank guns swiveled, waiting for the road surface to crack and give them a target. Then another bulge started forming in the road, and another, and another. Multiples! It wasn't like thrash ball at all. It wasn't easy and it wasn't natural. It felt weird and slow motion. The tank nearest to coal fired, sending smoke and chunks of debris raining down on the roadway. The line of gears broke, and Cole didn't have any time left to think or worry. Something took over and it wasn't training, 
or at least not the training he'd had in the last month. As soon as he saw movement in the clearing smoke, he charged at it without thinking. A couple of grubs were clambering out of another emergence hole in the middle of the street. They had two arms and two legs, but that was about all they had in common with people. They were real big ugly assholes with gray scaly skin, weird pale eyes and mouths like a knife slash lined with shark's teeth. They ain't human. They ain't even animals. And they killed my folks. So you can die, you motherfuckers. Cole should have been using short, controlled bursts, but he just hosed them as he ran and couldn't stop. Any worries he'd had about not being able to pull the trigger were forgotten. So was the fact that firefights were going on all around him. Something was driving him like a clockwork toy. He didn't know what it was, but it sure made sense to do what it wanted and keep firing. The grubs fell back down the hole. He still had his finger tied on the trigger, but the rifle had stopped. Shit. Reload. Yeah, reload. As he reached for another clip, more ugly gray heads popped out of the hole and he saw the dull glint of metal. Goddamn. Cole managed to ram the clip home, but when he looked up to aim he found he was staring down a barrel with the ugliest bastard in the world behind it. The grub's head exploded in a plume of blood. Then he squeezed the trigger. So how the hell had he hit the thing? But the rounds were striking grubs where he wasn't aiming. It was only when the things lay scattered across the road and he could hear his own ragged breathing that he realized someone was behind him. Someone else had been firing at the grubs too. Move it, they're coming up in the mall, Baird said. He was white as a sheet and really shaky, but there was nothing wrong with his aim. So that was who opened up on the grubs while he was fumbling the reload. Shit, Cole, are you afraid of anything? Look, those things aren't rushing up to get your autograph. Kill the assholes at a nice safe distance, okay? Thanks, Baird, Cole said. Could have been a real short game for me. Baird didn't seem to know how to take gratitude. Yeah. Whatever. I need you around for the next time someone tries to flush my head. The new drive inside Cole had kicked up a notch. He still didn't feel in control of it, but he was okay with that for the time being, and he knew that all he wanted to do right then was to carry on and kill more grubs. That was all he needed. He started jogging toward the mall, aware of other gears around him for the first time in what seemed like forever. It was probably just minutes. Baird trotted alongside him, grumbling to himself like some cranky old lady. These fuckers ruined my life. Maybe he was joking. I'm going to make them pay for that. Yeah, let's go pop some more of those bitches, Cole said. You and me, I think we're gonna get good at this game. Hey, I'm just following you out of curiosity. Sure you are. Seriously. Don't you get afraid of anything? Cole knew Baird needed something reassuring right then, something he could believe in. And Cole was good at that, even if it meant lying just a little bit. Hell no, I'm the cold train. He whacked Baird playfully across the back. Stick with me, baby, cause I never lose. I'll do that, Baird said, following him into a mall full of grubs. I've got nothing better to do. Halvo Bay, southwestern border of Tyrus, three months after E-Day. Dizzy had done this a dozen times in a dozen cities now, but it still didn't get any easier. He jumped down off the truck with his shovel and pickaxe and waited for orders while a thin, miserable drizzle of rain started to fall. All he could hear was the sea in the distance and the rumble of truck engines idling. The dead city had nothing to say for itself, and neither did anyone else except the gear in charge of the burial detachment. Okay, I don't want to see anyone without gloves or masks. He was an engineer, a corporal called Perry and listen for the whistle. Two hours on, fifteen minutes off. Get to it, people. Halvo was mostly rubble. A week ago, it had still been a fancy seaside resort. Now the grubs had trashed it, the survivors had been evacuated, and it was time to clear the bodies and try to stop disease from spreading. Dizzy put on his rubber gloves. The white fabric mask didn't fit tight over his beard, but if he caught some shit, and died then he didn't much care either way. 
Everything and everyone he cared about was gone, his wife, his stepson, and even the shipping line he'd worked for. He didn't know if any of his old shipmates were still alive, but the odds weren't good. And I ain't alone. Look at those flags. Someone had already worked through the rubble with sniffer dogs and stuck small red flags in the ruins to mark where there were bodies to clear. They'd run out of the thin metal poles at one point, and the red flags were knotted around bits of wood. And then the flags had run out as well, and there were just branches or long jagged splinters from planks with red paint daubed on them. In the distance, Dizzy could hear the search team still moving through the city center. There was the weird tinkling sound of bricks and tiles sliding, and an occasional bark from one of the dogs. He looked up. He couldn't see them. We can't keep up with this. One of the firefighters was standing close enough for Dizzy to hear. We're going to have to start bulldozing and burning. Dizzy turned around, angry. Well, I'm willing to keep at it. Okay, buddy. The firefighter had probably lost family or friends, too and Dizzy felt bad for snapping at him. No problem. You carry on. The guy was right. It was a lot of time and effort wasted when the living needed their help a lot more. But torching the place still didn't feel like the decent thing to do. Dizzy put on his mask and trudged down the path that had been cleared between the collapsed buildings, an area marked on his street plan as a road with pavement cafes and shops for the folks who used to come here on vacation. An emergence hole had punched up through it. If he marked the plan with whatever he found and where he found it, then there was more chance of working out what had happened in the final moments, although there were so many of those that he got the feeling the government would stop bothering pretty soon. Searching for ID was the thing he hated most. He could pretend the bodies weren't people at all until he put a name to them. The recovery team today was a mix of city employees and refugee conscripts. He looked around the faces and found there weren't many he recognized from the last time. It wasn't the kind of work that drafted folks stuck with. God damn it, if he could stomach it, why couldn't they? He pulled down his mask. Hey, Chuck! A guy he'd gotten to know in the last couple of weeks turned around holding a pickaxe. You seen that fella from Ilima? Gray? No, he shot through. Chuck prodded around in his pile of rubble. Said he'd take his chances in the mountains. Crazy, if you asked me. The grubs could come up any damn where. At least we got army protection here. How many refugees would still be here tomorrow? Every day, more folks vanished from the cities and camps and headed for the wilds. Dizzy had thought about it, but he decided that he probably wasn't that desperate to survive. He put the idea out of his head again and started lifting chunks of masonry. Rubber gloves didn't last long handling razor-edged brick and broken glass, and he wished he still had those leather riggers gloves he'd had on board ship, but they were long gone now along with the star. The next obstacle in his way was a concrete slab with half a shop sign still attached to it. It was too heavy to shift on his own. He waved Chuck over in silence, and they lifted together. Chuck grimaced at what they'd uncovered. God damn. You know, I think that was probably a better way to go. Dizzy saw it a lot. The grubs didn't get to slaughter everyone personally. Some people were killed when buildings collapsed, like these poor folks had been. He was looking at something that didn't much resemble human beings, something hit so hard and so fast by the falling debris that all that was left was a pinkish mass, stained clothing, and hair. There wasn't really anything left to recover for burial. Amen. Chuck said. Now how are you gonna identify that? Dizzy took what comfort he could from a quick end and hoped that was how Lena and Richie had gone. I'll find something. He rooted around in the debris for half an hour before he found a purse, but it might not have belonged to whoever he'd found. How many people kept their ID on them every second of the day? The charred card had half a number on it, but he couldn't read the name. So he marked what he had on the street plan put the card in a plastic bag, and carried on. That was as lucky as he got that morning. The other bodies were in a state to be moved and bagged, and when he got a chance to dip out of sight for a moment, he switched himself off with a few gulps from the small screw-top bottle he always carried with him these days. 
The only reason he'd ever had for staying sober was Lena and Richie. The whistle went. It was time for the mandatory break. He walked back to the assembly area and went through the ritual of lining up at the mobile control vehicle to wash his hands and face in a bowl of antiseptic before going to the field canteen for a mug of coffee and a snack. Corporal Perry came over and sat down beside him with his coffee. They kind of knew each other by now, or at least as much as a gear and a refugee ever could. You're a volunteer, aren't you? Perry said. Don't get that many, not from the refugees. I was merch, Dizzy said. Emulsion tankers. That's not really an answer. Okay, maybe I didn't do enough to find my own family. So if I find someone else's like someone found mine, then I reckon I'm even with the world. That was part of it. But it was an explanation he'd come up with after he'd been thinking about it for weeks. What was the word? Rationalization. He wasn't sure why he'd decided to do all this although he worried that there was some crazy idea at the back of his head that if he kept looking, he'd find Lena and Richie even though he knew damn well they were already dead and that they couldn't possibly have been in the places he'd been sent to anyway. Punishing myself? Maybe. Making myself look at death and accept that they ain't coming back? Yeah, maybe that too. One thing he knew was that the work was so backbreaking and exhausting that he fell asleep as soon as his head touched the pillow, and he didn't remember his dreams. It didn't let him think. In fact, it had taught him how to switch off because he couldn't avoid seeing those terrible damn things all day. He had to find a way of bringing down a big transparent shutter to stop himself from going crazy. It did what the hooch did, except it was free and a lot easier to get hold of. You could join the army, Dizzy, Perry said. You gonna tell me a man my age should be on the front line and not hanging out with the old folks and medical rejects? No. Perry shrugged and handed him half a sandwich. You could be an engineer again. I just fix big marine engines. Can you drive heavy goods vehicles? Probably. Well then. I need to do this. Okay, buddy. I understand. Perry patted him on the shoulder and got up. Nobody's going to draft you as an engineer all the time you're willing to do this. Dizzy finished his coffee and went back into the rubble. The effort was killing him, and that was what he wanted. Eventually the fatigue and the occasional slug of liquor ate up the hours and left no space for thinking. He was beginning to get that head spinning, sick feeling, might have been the booze, might have been exhaustion, when he started hearing things. Metal groaned. He knew that by now. When he lifted the weight off pipes and girders, some of them would make real scary sounds. He was surrounded by the dead. His brain made up shit to fill in the gaps, and he tried hard not to listen to it. That's not a voice. Dizzy carried on hauling bricks and window frames away from a cluster of red flags. His boots crunched on glass. Damn, there it is again. He could definitely hear something moving and making noises. It wasn't rats. The next thought that went through his head almost made him crap himself. Grubs. Sometimes they came back after they'd finished trashing a place. They weren't heading anywhere in particular, just popping up and killing humans wherever they could. Dizzy took a few steps back from the rubble. There was a big dark space down there. He could hear rock moving, like something was scrabbling to get out. Oh God. There were always a few combat gears around. Dizzy pulled off his mask and took a lungful of air, stumbling backward, but before he could yell a warning he heard a voice. Help me! It was faint, but it wasn't a grub, and he wasn't imagining it. It was a woman's voice. Somebody help me! Get me out! Everybody, quiet! Dizzy yelled. Quiet, God damn it! Hey, ma'am, where are you? The voice drifted up from the hole. In the basement. Who's that? It's Dizzy, he said, which was dumb because that wouldn't have made any damn sense to a stranger. He started pulling at the rubble with an energy he hadn't known in a long time. We got a live one. Someone give me a hand. Suddenly everyone seemed to converge on him. Firefighters, gears, the whole damn team. 
one of the firefighters dropped to his knees and peered down into the hole. Yeah, we got a void under this slab, he said, kneeling back on his heels. He called to his buddy. Jerome, get a hydraulic prop over here. Come on, move it. The firefighter lay flat and managed to get his arm into the gap to use his flashlight. Dizzy hung around, determined to stay until they got the woman out. I can see some movement, the firefighter said. Can you hear me, sweetheart? Can you move? What's your name? The voice was faint, but she was definitely conscious and knew what was happening. Rosalind. My name's Rosalind. Are you hurt? No. I'm hungry. You got water down there? Lots of it. The pipes burst. Do you know how long you've been buried? No. Couple of days? A week, sweetheart. You take it easy. We'll get you out. I locked myself in the storeroom. I couldn't get back up the stairs. She paused. Dizzy, are the grubs gone? Poor woman. She probably thought he was a gear. He knelt down and stuck his head next to the hole, ecstatically happy for no good reason. Part of him was thinking that if she could survive a grub attack then there was hope for others, but he knew damn well it was a trick his mind played on him. Nobody was going to find his family alive. They'd been found, all right, and they were dead. They're all gone, sweetie, he said. It's safe to come out. It took five firefighters and a hydraulic lift to pry open a wide enough gap for one of them to reach in and haul Rosalind out. The damnedest thing was that she could walk. She put her hand to her eyes to shut out the light, and she was a little unsteady. But she got to her feet, and she walked. There was no paramedic around because nobody was expecting to find survivors. Perry went to check her out, but she was too busy looking around at what was left of Halvo. Oh God! She was maybe thirty or so, wearing a navy blue skirt and white blouse that might have been part of a work uniform. The street plan said the building had been a bank, so maybe she was a clerk there. And she wasn't wearing a wedding band. Dizzy began to build a picture of who Rosalind might have been if her life hadn't been wrecked just like his had. Oh God! It's all gone! Are they dead? Are they all dead? She said it to Dizzy. She didn't ask anyone else. So he answered her as best he could. Yeah, they're all gone, he said. But don't you worry none. We'll take care of you. He paused. I'll take care of you. Galangi, South Islands, six months after E-Day. Bernie had fallen into the habit of watching the TV as soon as she'd finished for the day and not moving until close down at midnight. It was all news now. There were endless reruns of old movies on the other channel, but Sarah was shrinking a city at a time, and all the TV companies had shrunk along with it until all their resources seemed to be spent on news. The broadcasts were now coming direct from Kaya, the biggest island in the southern chain. She curled up on the sofa with moss flopped across her lap and didn't dare take her eyes off the screen. Neil appeared in the doorway. He changed into his best pants and decent shoes. I'm going down the pub, he said. And for God's sake stop watching that, Burn. You can't do a damn thing about it. He didn't ask her to go with him. He'd finally given up trying a couple of months ago, and he didn't ask about 26 RTI, not that she saw much news about them lately. Somehow she thought she was slacking if she didn't keep her eyes open and live through this second by second, even at a distance. It was like falling asleep on guard duty. It was unforgivable. She'd be letting down her mates. There's a TV down the pub, she said, not taking her eyes off the screen. You won't get away from it. Okay. His coat rustled as he zipped it up. I might be really late. Don't wait up. As the door closed, she wondered why even the end of the bloody world couldn't bring some people together. The problem with living apart from Neil for most of their married life was that they were now discovering what it was like to be married for real, 26 hours a day, and Neil didn't appear to like that any more than she did. Naval marriage. That's what they say, isn't it? Terrific until the old man comes home from sea for good, 
and you've got to get used to this stranger in your house when you've been used to running the whole show on your own. Except the stranger's me. Watching the endless misery on the screen stopped her feeling too sorry for herself. Every city looked the same. Every capital city was a similar pile of smoking rubble with few landmarks. Refugees all had that terrible stare. And all the gears looked the same, which made it harder than ever not to worry about the mates she'd left behind. She was doing her bit just like G.H. Noroa had asked her, though. She'd organized a militia, not that anyone seemed to treat it with the same urgency as keeping their farms running. She'd even acquired a radio transmitter. There wasn't much more she could do now. Despite her best intentions, she nodded off into a light doze. The studio discussion about how long Sarah could hold out, and what Chairman Daliel could do about it droned on in the background. It was only when the tone of the voices changed that she woke with a start and knocked her empty cup onto the floor. Now ending this broadcast because we've been told to evacuate the studios. We don't have many details, but it seems we have. Yes, we now have confirmation that there's been a locust incursion just north of Autrin. That's ten kilometers away. Astonishingly, the news reader just kept going as if it was a traffic report. Bernie's heart was now hammering so hard she could feel it in her ears. I'll repeat that locust forces have reached Kaya. I'm sorry, but we now have to stop broadcasting. The studio vanished abruptly and was replaced by a loud continuous tone in the emergency broadcast caption telling viewers to stay put, tune to their nearest radio station, and listen for instructions. Oh God! Here it comes. Here it bloody well comes. Bernie found she was clutching moss. He looked up into her face, baffled, ears laid back. The grubs were finally here. Kaya was more than two thousand kilometers away, but that now felt like next door. She could have picked up the walkie-talkie and called Neil, but if he was in the pub he'd know anyway. Suddenly she needed to be with people, yes, with Neil, and she jumped up to grab her coat. Under stress, she defaulted to drill. It never failed her. When the shit hit the fan, that training had to kick in regardless, and she found herself checking her weapons and revving up the quad bike. Most of the ride into town was lost in a haze of what she'd have to do to track the advance of the grubs, but she managed to walk into the pub with some semblance of calm. The bar was crowded and absolutely silent except for a crackling radio. The TV behind the bar was still on still showing that emergency caption telling everyone to stay indoors and listen for instructions. There was no point running if you didn't know where to run to. Dan was leaning on the bar, frowning. He hardly turned his head but he'd obviously seen her come in. Well, who's next, Bernie? He said quietly. How long before they get here? Maybe never. She couldn't see Neil. Where is he? He said he'd be here. Dan looked straight at her this time and didn't need to ask who she meant. He's somewhere else, I think. It took a couple of seconds to sink in. Actually, it took a bit longer than that. It was hard to process that many surprises in one night. She felt her scalp tighten and a wave of nausea rose in her throat. I'm sorry, love, Dan said. I didn't know if you knew or not. This somewhere else, has she got a fucking name? Dan looked stricken in the way of all people who realized they'd said one word too many. Bernie, I'm sorry I forget it. Fuck you, Neil. Fuck you. The world was going to hell one city at a time, and she didn't have time for this shit, and all men were the bloody same in the end. I'm going to call Ji Chen and see what the situation is. Meantime, we activate the lookout roster, okay? Because we don't know enough about those things to work out where they'll come up next. Bernie, I said forget it, Dan. First things first. Look out roster. Bernie turned around and left, trying not to meet the eyes of any of her neighbors in case they had that look that told her she really was the last to know about her old man's bit on the side. She couldn't cope with defending a community where nobody she knew had the balls to be straight with her. Deliberate ignorance was the only way she'd get through this. She rode back home, totally numb, and tried to radio G.H. Noroa. The receiving station was busy. 
so she passed the time moving her clothes into the spare room and making up the bed. Fuck you, Neil. But the world was ending. The grubs were getting closer by the day. She had to get her priorities straight. Maybe Neil came in late, or maybe he didn't come back that night at all. But he was in the kitchen making breakfast when she got up the next morning, and he didn't try to explain or make excuses. He just looked at her. You want me to move out? he asked at last. Dan had probably warned him. I'll still work the farm. You do whatever you bloody want, Bernie said. The urge to just pack her grip and ask one of the trawler skippers to drop her on Nora was close to overwhelming. She'd find a way back to Ephra if it killed her. Do you realize what's happening out there? I do. He put a pile of bacon sandwiches in front of her, always his peace offering. It was probably just habit now, but if he was trying to placate her, it wasn't going to work. But there's nowhere we can run and nothing we can do about it. Except get on with living until it finds us. Neil moved out later that day. In the days that followed, it didn't feel as bad as she thought it would. Moss seemed to miss him more than she did, and lay down in the hall staring at the door until he worked out that Dad wasn't coming back each evening. Neil kept his word and turned up for work every day. But she found it hard being in that house alone, and she almost called Mick one night to say he could have his bloody inheritance. She didn't. She could only do this one step at a time. Three weeks after Kaya had stopped broadcasting, Galangi was blind and almost alone, just like her. The loss of visual contact with the rest of Sarah was new and terrifying. If there was any of her pioneering colonial ancestors' blood left in her veins, it was hiding behind the sofa and praying for the monsters not to notice it. The indigenous warrior side of her bloodline wasn't doing so well either. She parked the utility vehicle on the headland facing west, turned on the radio, and spread her map over the steering wheel. She'd been through this process a hundred times in the last few weeks, staring at that bloody sheet of paper as if it would change the future. Kaya was close to the shallow island chain branching north, so the grubs didn't have to dig much deeper to reach it. But they still hadn't breached the deep trenches or volcanic granite. The things probably just tunneled under the short stretches of shallow sea between the smaller islands. Bernie used her thumb to measure the relative distances to reassure herself, again, that they would have a much tougher job reaching Galangi. She traced the ocean contour lines with her fingernail checking the depth of the trench between Port Slaughterhouse and the rest of the chain a few times to make sure. Yes, it could swallow the highest mountain ranges on Sarah. But have the bastards got ships? Sooner or later, she'd have to find out. She fiddled with the radio tuner and strained to catch words in the crackle of static. So, back on patrol again. She'd make her daily call to G.H. Noro in an hour. Not that they had much more information than she did. They depended on the comms networks based on Kaya as well. Maybe I'll see if I can get hold of Mick after all. But not yet. She leaned back in the seat and accepted she was just wasting fuel patrolling the coastline. If the grubs came, the chances of seeing them in time to do anything about it was close to zero. She'd done all she could do, crunch numbers worked out that there weren't enough ships and boats to evacuate the island in one go, and realized that there was nowhere to move 1,500 people except Noroa, and by the time Galangi was in trouble, then Noroa would already be charcoal. There was one more thing she tried not to think about. If armored divisions on the mainland couldn't stop grubs, then a few shotguns and pitchforks weren't going to save Galangi. But what else can I do? Give up? The sun glittered on the water. She'd have to face up to that too. Sooner or later the ferry would stop running and she'd need to get to Noroa, which meant climbing in a boat and heading out into open sea, a prospect she really didn't relish. It's just like driving a pickup. It's the noise that suddenly jerked her out of her thoughts was one she hadn't heard since she was a kid. It was the air horn on the old lifeboat station. It wasn't the alarm signal she was expecting a maroon, but nobody hit that thing for fun. She was already heading downhill to the gravel coast road by the time her walkie-talkie buzzed into life. It was Dan Barrett. Bernie, where the hell are you? 
She grabbed the walkie-talkie from the dashboard. Okay, I'm heading for town. I heard it. It's a bloody boat, he said. It's heading for the port. What kind of boat? She was used to people who stuck to RT procedure and could accurately describe what they were seeing. He could have meant anything from a warship to a fishing smack. Big gray one with guns? Little white one? A yacht? Yeah. Sorry. Gabby was trawling whitefish when he spotted them. On my way. Have they got a radio? Radar? If they have, they're not using it. On the way into town, she found herself wargaming some awful scenarios. What if this was the start of some huge exodus from other islands? One thing she knew all too well from the last war was how fast disease could spread when bombed cities lost sanitation and the dead went unburied. After that, lawlessness set in. She never wanted to see that kind of thing again. By the time she reached the port, there was a small crowd on the jetty with Dan at the center of it. Bernie fished out the binoculars from the back of the utility and took a look for herself. It was a big flashy motor yacht, a real gin palace, and it was following Gabby's puttering trawler with an escort of seabirds. She took her long shot from the cab and checked the chamber before slinging it over her shoulder. Dan gave her an odd look. What? she asked. You bloody scare me sometimes, Bernie. The trawler came alongside and tied up. The yacht took its time mooring at the end of the jetty. Come on, try and look welcoming. They walked down the wooden pier, knowing that what was coming couldn't be good news. Gabby jumped ashore from the trawler and stopped them. They've come from Kaya, he said. His name's Gareth. An accountant. He never takes it outside the marina usually, he says. And he hasn't got a bloody clue how to read a chart. It's a miracle they got this far. Gareth had a straggly beard and an expression that said he couldn't go on much longer. He didn't step off the yacht. He just stood there, clinging to a rail. A woman and a couple of terrified-looking kids huddled together on the foredeck. This isn't Noroa, is it? Gareth said. Galangi, Dan said. You missed it by a long chalk, if that was where you were heading. Bernie tried to be diplomatic. What was it like when you left? They trashed Autrin and Jasper, Gareth said. Everybody was evacuated north by the army, but nowhere safe from those things. Bernie was aware of Dan staring hard at her, as if she was going to say the wrong thing. But she had to know. Anyone else trying to make it down here? Gareth shook his head. No idea. We just got out and didn't look back. The army didn't stand a chance. I saw them. I saw them from my office window. These huge things like spiders burst out of the ground and just rolled right over the armored vehicles. They can't save us, we had to save ourselves. Dan put his hand on her shoulder. She thought he was going to say something reassuring about dead gears. But he didn't. It's okay, Bernie, he said. We're not going to be overrun with refugees. But it wasn't okay. It just confirmed what she dreaded. The COG army, the community she put her faith in, was collapsing. Somewhere far to the north, people she trusted with her life, in a way that she trusted nobody else, were almost certainly dead or wounded. Come on, Gareth, Dan said, holding out his hand to the bewildered weekend Yadi who'd somehow managed not to drown his family. If that amateur could do it, Bernie thought she didn't have an excuse left. Make yourselves at home. You're stranded here now, mate. Stranded. Chapter 12 All food supplies will be managed centrally while we establish new crop production areas. Residents of New Jacinto are already used to this system, but we know this will be unfamiliar and even alarming for the Purin community. We ask you to cooperate and hand over all stores to COG Emergency Management to ensure fair distribution of food and to deter hoarding or profiteering. The same has been asked of the Garasni Enclave, so everyone is being treated equally. Notice to Peruan Town Council from Royston Charles, Head of Emergency Management, New Jacinto, 15 AE, present day, emulsion drilling site, 18 kilometers south of Peruan, one week into the Peruan evacuation, Gale, 
15a. The rhythmic donkey braying of a rusty hinge carried a long way in the dead, silent woodland. Tresca parked the pickup at the end of the trackway and looked at Yannick. You coming or not? I need to keep an ear on the radio, sir. Yannick said, one hand on the dashboard as if the receiver was going to make a run for it. The ghost. He's been transmitting on and off this morning. Tresca stepped down from the cab. Not knowing if the data burst source was the COG or the seagoing stranded gangs was starting to eat at him, because he was now sitting on a commodity that was definitely worth killing for, an apparently limitless supply of fuel. He had no idea how many stranded were holed up elsewhere on Sarah, but if they had somehow all managed to unite, then they probably outnumbered the COG. It was an unhappy prospect. The stranded had their own scores to settle, and they were patient. He followed the sound of the emulsion pumps, pausing to check the spread of the contamination on either side of the trackway. It looked as if it was slowing down. The engineers had hammered colored pegs into the ground every twenty-six hours to mark its progress, and the pattern of threads strung between the pegs now looked like the contour lines of a steep hill, closer together, as they radiated further from the center of the site. There was a time when Tresca might have thought that was a hopeful sign. But he knew this was just a temporary reprieve, buying time to extract as much emulsion as they could. If I have to do the unthinkable, then I have to make my first move now. This is going to take preparation. I can't move the entire camp on a whim. A row of primitive derricks was pumping crude emulsion into tanks. If the workers hadn't been wearing lightweight summer clothing, it could have been any small-scale emulsion facility in the cold north of Gorasnea. Tresca walked between the derricks, nodding acknowledgement at the Gorasni workers. A squad of gears and a few COG staff from Royston Charles' office were wandering around the site too. Everybody seemed to be quite chummy, as Michelson liked to call it. Well, Papa, you wouldn't have believed it possible anyway. You can take it up with me in the next life. Good morning, Commander. Stefan sweated over a wrench, trying to loosen a nut on one of the pumps. He said it in Tyran rather than Gorisnean, a rather diplomatic act. There was nothing quite like hearing foreigners muttering in their heathen languages to make the COG suspect they were up to no good. Just like the good old days. Emulsion everywhere. It's a very rich field. A pleasant change to have some good news. What brings you here? Checking I'm not smoking near hazardous materials? Ah, I like to deliver my congratulations in person. Trescu didn't trust the radio for anything remotely sensitive these days. Is everyone well? No ill effects? I've been soaked in emulsion all my working life. Stefan said. Brush my teeth in it, you might say. A little more isn't going to make matters any worse. If it makes them worse at all. One of the nodding derricks was irritatingly noisy and set Tresca's teeth on edge. Are you going to oil that hinge? Oh, that's a bearing. It's fine. He winked at Trescu. We'll all be just fine. The sound of full tanks is a wonderful medicine. We won't go short if you see what I mean. For a moment, Tresca didn't get it. Then he looked where Stefan was looking, and realized it was something to do with the tangled nest of flexible piping feeding into the storage tanks. So he'd found a way of diverting some of the emulsion for their own cash. Tresca couldn't work out how, but that didn't matter. He didn't like being that underhanded but there was no guarantee that Prescott would be reasonable about sharing fuel if the Garasny fleet decided to leave on its own, even if he depended on Tresca's team to extract and process the emulsion. But there was plenty to go around. Nobody would suffer if Stefan put a little aside for a rainy day. And it's Prescott I'm dealing with. I'm not betraying Hoffman's trust. There's no need to feel dishonorable about this. He did, but that was soft sentimentality. Hoffman and Michelson were pretty decent men, all things considered, but the policy decisions were Prescott's, including the Hammer of Dawn. Tresco walked back to the pickup with the confident authority that his father had taught him to feign even when he was terrified, wondering where they would go next if they had to abandon Vex without the COG. He had no idea. He didn't know what state the mainland was in, 
these stalks could take over an area in days, and he had no way of finding out fast. The COG controlled the air assets. It was a long flight back and that required a raven with extra fuel tanks. Which, in my case, I do not have. It was a damned shame that he couldn't exploit the seafaring stranded, but the scum couldn't be trusted for honest information anyway. He would have to find out for himself. Using Zephyr for coastal reconnaissance was a possibility, but even a submarine was a slow option, and everyone would notice eventually that she was missing. Hoffman has to be thinking along the same lines. I should simply ask him. He's not a fool, and he won't waste time in a pissing contest. When Trescu opened the driver's door, Yannick was cradling the portable radio in his lap. He didn't look up. A wire dangled from his ear and led to a jack plug in the radio. Tresca leaned his folded arms on the roof of the pickup and waited. Yannick gave it a few more minutes and then unplugged. Nothing at the moment, he said. But he'll start again soon. Trescu started the pickup and set off across country to rejoin the paved road. It has to be a reaction to what's going on here. But we know that. The range indicates the transmitter is local. So? It's the COG. If it wasn't, Hoffman would try to find out if he knew anything about it. Not if he thinks it's us. Well, that would make him very unhappy. Tresca reached the paved road and began pulling out when a blaring truck horn made him slam on the brakes. Damn it, that was embarrassing. He just wasn't used to so many vehicles on this road. The evacuation of Purin was still in progress, an endless shuttle of small vehicles moving people, possessions, stores, food, and animals. It looked like the evacuations on the mainland after a day. I don't want an ironic death, sir, Yannick said. Nobody should survive two wars to die in a car crash because their boss didn't yield at a junction. Point taken. When do we welcome our first COG guests? Maybe never. Nobody's taken up our offer of hospitality yet. So what do we do next? I think I might need to negotiate. With Prescott. With Hoffman and Michelson. This is about transport. I want to see if they'll defy the chairman if it's the pragmatic option. Bit risky, sir. If the worst happens, Yannick, we know how to get out fast and we now have some fuel to do so. Change your mind on standing with the COG? No. Just recognizing that none of us can possibly predict how bad the situation might get. Good luck with getting out of the harbor, then. Michelson's blockaded us before, remember? Ah, he's a sensible man. They have their emulsion now, and they can work out how to extract it without us, so why would they want to keep us here against our will? Because we're good company and we do the dirty work that the COG's too squeamish to tackle? I think they'll learn to shoot stranded without us, Yannick. Trescu kept an eye on the fields and woods to either side, working out where the north-south fissure would lie relative to the road. The approach road to the naval base and its surrounding shanty town was clogged with refugee traffic. Trescu could see armadillo APCs and farm vehicles pulling off and parking on the grass while gears tried to marshal the traffic. The line spilled back out of the main gates. The entrance to the Garasni camp was the other side of the jam. So much for COG efficiency. Trescu wondered how the COG had ever managed to evacuate Jacinto when they sank it. They'd had just hours. Clearing Poruin, a fraction of Jacinto's population, was taking weeks. They're losing their touch. But there was nothing he could do to bypass the jam. He used the idle time to work out how to confront Hoffman about oddly clandestine radio transmissions while begging him for a ride to the mainland in a raven at the same time. He didn't have the leverage of an emulsion platform now, but then he probably never had. Once he'd placed his nation's fate in the hands of a much larger force, they could have taken what they wanted. He had no idea why they hadn't. They did seem to believe their word being their bond, at least most of the time. You can see the locals never had to run from grubs. Yannick pointed out pickups in the vehicle tailback, heavily laden with furniture and ornaments. So much useless stuff. No sense of priority. Tresca glanced up at the side of a flatbed truck that had pulled off to the edge. 
he found himself looking into the face of an elderly man with that trident badge on his lapel, the Duke of Tallinn's regiment. The man didn't so much look at him with loathing as with indifference. Tresca had seen the veterans only once when the first Karasni refugees landed at the naval base. Perun was an even more foreign country than the Jacinto shanties. Careful, Yannick murmured. I've been spat at more than once. That won't kill you. It's still disturbing. You're too sensitive. Tresca looked at his watch. What the hell's going on up there? He jumped down from the pickup and started walking along the line of vehicles, catching a lumpful of exhaust. Damn, couldn't these wasteful idiots even switch off their engines? He could feel eyes on him as he made his way to the head of the line and the source of the delay. It turned out to be inside the naval base gates. A couple of gears were arguing with a man driving a covered truck. It struck Tresca as one of those peculiar COG weaknesses. The island was being invaded and here they were, letting some civilian debate about his damned non-existent rights. It wasn't going to change a thing. He strode up to the gears and intervened. What's the problem? He demanded. Get this line moving. I'm not going to give up my food. The Peruan civilian jerked his thumb over his shoulder to indicate something in the back of the vehicle. I damn well worked for that. We've already shared the town stores. I'm not giving up my larder as well. The gears didn't look like green recruits, so they should have known how to deal with this by now. Tresca had had enough. He wrenched open the door and pulled the driver out by his collar. The man pitched sideways and fell out, prompting murmurs and ahs from civilians watching the confrontation. One of the gears, a man in his forties, put his hand out as if to stop him. Whoa, sir, there's no need. Tresco hauled the driver to his feet and slammed him against the side of the truck. I am part of the COG now, yes? I am an officer of the COG, then. The average gear, even Baird, seemed to think he was an army officer, not a naval one, but it didn't matter. He still had the authority they'd accidentally given him. He turned it on the civilian. You, you will do as you are told. We all face a crisis. There is no me. Only us. Who the hell do you think you are? The man yelled. You can't treat me like this. You're not even a gear. You're a fucking indie. The man didn't matter, so Tresca didn't bother to backhand him. One of the gears put his hand on Tresca's shoulder. Sir, don't. If you can't deal with this, I will. Tresca shoved the protesting man aside and climbed into the cab to start the engine. I shall park this in the compound, and then it will be unloaded. Do we understand? Suddenly it wasn't about being kept waiting but about teaching these people that they had to obey orders for the common good, and that there was no luxury of discussion about it. He could hear the commotion around him, but it was sullen muttering, nothing more. See? Someone has to do it. They're soft. All of them. This community needs strength. He drove into the base, looking for trucks being unloaded by gears, and parked the vehicle at the first likely spot. Here. He gestured to one of the engineers. Ironically, he knew more of them by sight than he did the combat troops. No doubt an angry civilian will stop by later to protest about his rights. Feel free to shoot him. Right you are, sir, the engineer said unmoved. I'll mention that at my court-martial. The line was moving much faster now. Tresca dodged past the steady flow of vehicles looking for Yannick who, he was sure, would have the sense to take the pickup and wait for him at the entrance to the Garasni camp. He was about fifty meters from the gate on the far side of the parade ground when he saw Marcus Phoenix bearing down on him from the right, looking even more grim than he usually did. He was too busy watching Phoenix to pay attention to what was happening on his left until movement caught his eye and a something smacked hard into his face. His ears rang, blood stung his lips. He didn't fall, but he couldn't see much for a few seconds. His fist balled instinctively as someone grabbed his wrist so hard that it hurt. You don't want to do that, Phoenix said. Trescu tried to clear his head. A punch in the face like that was enough to disorient anyone. When he recovered enough to look around, 
he realized he'd been punched by a very old man, one of the Talon vets. People were starting to gather around them in that flashpoint kind of way. Okay, we stop this now. Everybody beat it. Phoenix had hold of Tresca's elbow and was trying to steer him away, one hand held out as if to fend off the old man. We've all got enough to deal with. You too, sir. Phoenix wasn't talking to Tresca. He was addressing the veteran. The old man, skin transparent and spotted with age, nursed his hand while Tresca just stared at him, surprised at the weight he put behind that punch. He looked as if it had taken every scrap of strength he still had left. Very sensible, Phoenix. Thank you. Hitting frail old men is bad for diplomacy right now. I've waited forty-five years to do that, the old man said. I just wanted to pay back one of you bastards before I died. And I hope you rot in hell. Then he turned on Phoenix. And you, Sergeant, your damn father should have finished them all off with that hammer of his when he had the chance. There was nothing to be said at that moment that wouldn't have made matters much worse. Someone stepped forward to lead the veteran away. Phoenix's gaze flickered for a moment, and he looked taken aback. So some things did get under his skin, things about his father. Adam Phoenix was a war criminal the creator of a weapon of mass destruction that had forced the UIR to surrender in the Pendulum Wars and was used again to sacrifice the rest of Sarah to save the COG heartland. Trescu was careful not to blame a son for his father's sins. Welcome to the Monsters Club, Trescu said. It's very exclusive. Do me a favor, Commander. Phoenix had managed to thin out a busy area in moments. Suddenly there was nobody within ten meters of them. People are cranky at the moment. Leave us to handle the wayward ones. I have enough cranky ones of my own to occupy me, Sergeant, Tresca said, wiping blood from his top lip. And you don't have to atone for your father any more than I need to atone for mine. Although he would think I was the one in need of forgiveness for breaking a deathbed promise. Phoenix gave him a strange look, not the resentment he expected but a searching expression as if Tresco had come up with an answer that he'd been seeking for a long time. Yeah, I know neither side had the moral high ground, Phoenix said. And we all fail our fathers. And if you and your comrades hadn't captured the hammer technology from the UR at Asfo, would we have used it on the COG eventually? Almost certainly. Then did you enable your father's crime? This is the problem with justifying outrage. It can't be done. Causality falls apart, and we're back to our tribalism and excuses. I certainly failed mine, Tresca said, wondering what nerve he'd managed to hit. But his life's mission was to preserve the Garasni people, and I can't be inflexible about how we achieve that. Phoenix just met his eyes and nodded. The moment of revelation had vanished, and he just looked tired and frayed. Glad we've got our priorities straight, he said, and walked away. Tresco's instinct was to head back to his own camp. But he could go anywhere on Vex, and anywhere within this naval base. It was time to visit Zephyr and see how maintenance of the submarine was going. And check what they've picked up on the radio. Then he'd ask Victor Hoffman a few questions. Subterranean storage area, Vex naval base. God damn it, Hoffman said. We got through two wars without turning into a rabble but asked some asshole to hand over their pickles and suddenly we're brawling like drunks. Marcus walked down the tunnel ahead of Hoffman, switching on lights as he went. Old fluorescent strips and even older incandescent bulbs speckled with dead insects flickered into life. It probably popped the pressure valve with the vets. That's something. How did Tresca take it? The pickles or the vet? The vet, Marcus paused for a couple of beats, as if he was trying to pick the right word. Calmly, he said. The underground tunnels were usually silent, but Hoffman could hear echoing voices. Charles had taken over some of the storage areas for accommodation. Hoffman was surprised that anyone was willing to sleep down here, but perhaps it seemed safe to the folks from Porun. The dread of tunnels and being underground was a legacy of fighting grubs, and that was something they'd never had to face. Tresco's full of surprises, Hoffman said. 
Marcus made a grunt that might have been agreement. Okay, it's down here. Turn left. Just as well we didn't burn this stuff. You've got Dom to thank for that. Hoffman never expected to have a normal conversation again with Marcus after the fall of Ephra. What did you say to a man you sent for court-martial, and then abandoned to die in a prison overrun by grubs? Yet somehow they managed to grunt their way through a long-drawn-out apology of sorts over the last couple of years, and now things seemed to be back to the level of mutual respect he'd had with Marcus before the fall of Ephra. He refused my orders. He punched me out. Damn it, I could have forgiven the punch, but I couldn't overlook the rest. Could I? We lost Ephra. He went to rescue his useless know-it-all father instead. His father died anyway. Hoffman didn't have to be a mind reader to know that Marcus was still beating himself up about it. Maybe he's got no room left to nurture a grudge against me. Yeah, we're both drowning in guilt. And I still say his father wasn't worth it. Hoffman wished he hadn't said as much to Marcus, though. He'd earned that punch. He made an attempt to keep the ragged conversation going. You think I'm barking up the wrong tree, Phoenix? If you'd seen what we saw at New Hope, Marcus said, you wouldn't ask me that. Like all the COG naval bases Hoffman had ever seen, Vex was built on top of an underground labyrinth of storerooms, shelters, armories, magazines, fuel tanks, and machinery spaces. It reminded him of a tree, as much of it below ground as above. And most of it looked exactly the same as the next bit if you didn't keep an eye on the rust-speckled metal signs at the intersection of each passage. But Marcus seemed to know exactly where he was in the maze. He turned left and kept walking to the end of the tunnel. A pair of panel doors reflected the dim light. Some light reading, he said, turning the handle. As the door swung open, Hoffman found himself in a vaulted storeroom lined with wooden shelves and crammed with box folders. If all the boxes were full, there had to be hundreds of thousands of documents in here. He fought down a moment of daunted panic, how many months to read this stuff, and reminded himself that the COG was tidy and methodical. The records would be in some kind of order. They're arranged by year, Marcus said. Which doesn't help much. Hoffman checked the files nearest to him. The date was three centuries ago. Well, I can narrow things down to the last thirty years of the Pendulum Wars, I suppose. You realize they wouldn't file this shit under T for top secret. This is the only COG archive left on Sarah. I'm just looking for a clue to other clues. Even a single name might shake Prescott down. That's what Baird said. Dream on. Hoffman expected Marcus to leave him to it, but he took a box and started examining its contents. Prescott's like Trescu. Immune to the scheming of us lesser mortals. Lesser mortals, my ass. The Phoenix Mansion probably had a library bigger than this archive. But Marcus had none of the habits of old money and privilege. You're happy being a grunt, aren't you? Yeah. I was happy being a grunt too. Marcus looked up from the folders as if Hoffman was thinking aloud. There were definitely weird experimental programs. Like at New Hope. The Sires. But how do you get from that to stalks and polyps? That luminous vapor in the locust tunnels was moving around on its own. I don't believe in ghosts. But the only thing big enough to be worth keeping secret is a man-made biohazard. Hoffman said. Why would he be so interested in getting specimens otherwise? Marcus shook his head. He doesn't give a shit what we think. Whatever it is, he wants to find a way to stop it but he isn't letting us in on his plans. The worst thing about trying to second-guess a devious asshole like Prescott was tying yourself in increasingly tight knots. Maybe it didn't matter a damn what was on that disc, so what if it had a formula for getting rid of grubs, or lambent, or heartburn? There were no labs left to make the stuff. Defeatist. No, just coming to my fucking senses after all these years. Marcus rustled paper and held out a large bound book to Hoffman. It smelled of old leather and mold. Might as well show you this before it hikes your blood pressure. No, he never told me what he did here. But he wasn't a biologist. 
Hoffman had to squint to see the page in the dim light. It was an old visitor security log. And there was Adam Phoenix's handwriting, signed in to see some army major long before E-Day. I know, Hoffman said. Louis Gavriel said he met him here way back, remember? It's okay. Poor bastard. Marcus sounded apologetic, as if he was saying that whatever else his dad had done, he wasn't responsible for the unwholesome biowarfare shit the COG had worked on. He was a physicist. He designed bombs, delivery systems, the kind of weapons Hoffman thought of as clean and honest. He wasn't a monster, Marcus said quietly. It was an odd word to use, not like Marcus at all. Just blinkered. Hoffman had reached the age where he felt he had to say what was on his mind there, and then, in case he died before he got his next chance. Look, let's knock this on the head once and for all, he said. Your dad built the Hammer of Dawn, and Prescott, Bard Rye, and me, we fired it. I don't know if mass slaughter is morally worse than killing one poor asshole with a bayonet, but either way, stop apologizing for him. We're still using the goddamn thing to defend ourselves. Marcus just blinked slowly and did that slight tilt of the head that Hoffman always interpreted as disbelief. Yeah. So we are. Hoffman went back to sorting through the folders on the shelves, not even sure what he was looking for. But if there was anything on that disc that could have saved Vex, Prescott would have been making use of it already. The sanctimonious bastard thought he'd been put on Sarah to save humanity, and deluded or not, that narrowed down his motives just blinkered. Hoffman had to concentrate on the immediate threat. He knew it all slotted together. He just couldn't work out how. The piles of check boxes grew painfully slowly. He must have been working in complete silence for an hour or so before Marcus said something. This might be the last archive of any kind left on Sarah, he said. Hoffman could imagine Adam Phoenix fretting about that too. The stranded can't all be illiterate assholes. Hoffman went on scanning each folder, flicking through the papers, and wondering just how many engineering reports a naval base needed to file. Someone stashed a library away somewhere. Eventually Hoffman lost track of the time. He didn't check his watch until he heard footsteps and glanced up at Marcus. Well, they didn't have to make excuses to anyone for being down here. If people weren't wondering if the base's shady history had anything to do with what was happening outside, then they didn't have much imagination. Prescott? Yeah, walk right in. Let's have a chat. Hoffman stared at the doors. They opened slowly. But it was only Anya. She looked embarrassed. Doing your own filing now, sir? Desperation, Lieutenant. He wondered if Marcus had even hinted about the existence of the disc in his quiet moments with her. Even if he had, it was still time for Hoffman to come clean and tell her himself. Is there a problem? No, I just wanted to give you a sitrep on the evacuation. We've moved everyone. There's just livestock and food stores left to relocate. Oh, and Seb Edler's still missing his prize bull and a few cows. Mataki's volunteered to retrieve them. Good work, Anya. Now he had to tell her. Look, we're down here for a reason. Do you want to be burdened with information that might make it hard to look the chairman in the eye, or remain in happy ignorance? He watched Anya shoot Marcus a cautious glance as if for a nod, but he couldn't tell if Marcus responded. She fixed Hoffman with that look of complete trust that was somehow harder to take than steely disapproval. She was utterly loyal to him. She deserved better. I function better when I've got all the facts, sir, she said. Okay. I stole an encrypted data disk from Prescott's desk a few weeks ago, and he knows I did it. But until he deigns to tell me what the hell's on it, I'm just playing guessing games. Hoffman took a breath and waited for her to look hurt. There was nothing he hadn't confided in that poor girl over the years except this. I'm sorry, Anya but she just picked up a folder and fanned through it. Maybe Marcus had told her after all. So what are you looking for? No damn idea. Maybe something that ties the stocks in with the research that used to go on here. Oh. God. Really? She took that very well, 
all things considered. I'd better help you, then. It was another of those out-of-body moments when Hoffman saw how he might look and sound, and shuddered. I'm off my damn head. And now he'd have to tell Sam. Where would it end? Did it even matter now? Did it matter if every asshole on Vex knew? A voice in his earpiece distracted him from a promising-looking report on the installation of the base's computer system. Control to Hoffman. Go ahead, Matheson. Sir, message from Corporal Mitchell. He's finished the image analysis. He says all the CZs except the latest one south of Puruan have shown no expansion for two days, and he felt you'd want to know right away. Good timing, Matheson. Please, please, please let it all be over. Or at least let it be doing what we expect it to. I needed some good news. Tell him I'll stand him a beer. Sir, one more thing. If you're passing CIC, I'd like a word. Hoffman could guess what that meant. On my way. Marcus and Anya both stopped and looked up. What good news, sir? The CZs look like they've stopped spreading. Well, the oldest ones anyway. I've got to go to CIC for a while. Don't feel obliged to finish this tonight. Anya smiled. There was enough paperwork to keep them busy for weeks. Maybe she thought he was being gracious and leaving to give her some private time with Marcus after she'd been stuck at Peruin for so long. And he never told her about the disc? He never told his girlfriend? Dear God. Just like his dad never told him anything about the hammer. What a family. Hoffman climbed the last flight of stairs to ground level and found the naval base heaving with civilians who still hadn't worked out where they were supposed to be. It was early evening, an unexpectedly vivid sunset emerging from beneath the day's heavy cloud. Tresca stood outside the main doors of Admiralty House with Michelson. They were chatting like old chums. Getting cozy, Hoffman said. The extra bodies, I mean. Michelson did his diplomat act. All trawlers present and correct, Victor. Life goes on, and I've taken delivery of a rather fine batch of smoked snakefish if you're interested. We're moving the smoking sheds down here, I hope. It's a priority. Trescu was sporting a cut on the bridge of his nose and a hint of a black eye on the left side. He was a fastidious man and Hoffman had expected him to seem uncomfortable with his wounds, but it only made him look harder and less open to reason. Anything you want to share with me, Colonel? he asked. Hoffman wasn't sure if Michelson had said anything, but he couldn't see any harm in leveling with Trescu. If he hadn't been asking himself the same questions, he would pick up the buzz sooner or later. I'm reduced to playing long shots, he said. Seeing as this place used to be BCD, I'm going through the archive store to see if lambency might be one of our own little errors. Trescu did his O'Reilly tilt of the head. Even if it is, there's apparently nothing the chairman can do to stop it, judging by his behavior. I'd still feel better knowing. Hoffman could have told him about the disc now. He really could have. For the first time, he felt that this wasn't just a former enemy that he had a grudging respect for, but an ally, or as much an ally as a man could be after nearly two million of his people had been incinerated by the COG's weapons of mass destruction. I'll let you know if I find anything. Hoffman went into the building and stopped off at CIC. Matheson gave him an anxious look and held out a sheet of paper. There was a battered jar of pickles of some kind on Matheson's desk, lots of unidentifiable layers swimming in a dark liquid. It might have been cabbage. Hoffman suspected it was another kindness from Yannick. The Goris Nan had really taken a shine to the young lieutenant. Our data burst friend's been busy overnight, Matheson said. The paper was a meticulously written list of times, signal strength, and duration. Different times, but the activity's definitely picking up. Oh, and Sergeant Mataki dropped by looking for you. I think you're in the doghouse, but not in the pat on the head way that Mac is. Yeah, it's hard to compete with someone who drools and rolls on his back every time he sees her. He wondered if a tidbit for the dog and some of Michelson's rum reserve for Bernie might save his ass, whatever it was he'd done or failed to do. Okay, Lieutenant, I'd better do some penance later. Thanks for the radio records. 
Hoffman checked his watch. The idea that there might be more Garasni forces lurking out there didn't bother him half as much as he thought it would. It almost comforted him. Being the small, tattered remnant of a global civilization was a lonely and depressing thing. And if the plague that was finally killing both the COG and the Grubs was of their own stupid making, he didn't feel quite as bad about that as he did about a random piece of fatally bad luck. It was a perverse reaction, he knew. He just had enough of mysteries and secrets. Barracks, Vex Naval Base, 0600 next morning. The screaming worked its way slowly through to Dom's brain. He was vaguely aware of it for what might have been a second or an hour, then it became insistent, and started shaking him furiously. Consciousness crashed down on him like a collapsing wall, and he struggled to sit up. It was the emergency siren. Dom, you in a coma or something? Come on, get up. Marcus was still shaking his shoulder, a looming dark shape. Boots clattered down the hall outside. We've got a leviathan. Where? Just outside the five-click limit. Come on. Dom scrambled for his clothes and armor. Shit, how could he sleep through that damn siren? It was a terrible wailing noise, up and down the scale, probably picked by psychologists as the sound most likely to make humans crap their pants and run for cover. Marcus waited impatiently as Dom struggled into his boots. Lambent or regular ones? Dom mumbled. Can't tell yet. Marcus grabbed Dom's ammo belt and shoved it at him. Let's bet on the worst. They headed for their stand to position on top of the naval base walls. Cole was already there with a rocket launcher, patting it like a much-loved pet. No Baird? Dom asked. He's been drafted for hammer duties. Cole chuckled to himself. Hang on to your valuables, baby. You know he can't even piss straight. Yeah, everyone's fed up redrawing maps each time he blows up a chunk of coastline. It's the hammer. It's fucked. Gotta believe him. Marcus grunted and sided up. It was a shut up and focus gesture. A lancer couldn't hit anything at five kilometers. If anyone's still interested in the Leviathan, Clement picked it up on the hydrophones. Maybe it's coming to look for its buddies. Dom took the hint and looked up at the raven circling over the water. He hoped it wasn't 80 and 239. Those two birds spent way too many hours in the air. Some animals have long memories. Then it'll remember that we've killed three of the assholes. We can make that four if it needs a reminder. Clement was out of torpedoes and limping along with temporary repairs after her last run-in with a leviathan. But in the dockyard below, every warship with a gun, big guns, deck-mounted machine guns, even the explosive harpoon that Michelson had scammed off a pirate for a few cans of processed meat, had its weapons facing seaward. The old defensive cannons set on the fort-like walls of the base were trained southeast now. But none of that stopped the Leviathan last time. Did it? Gears were spread out along the walls and in every defensive position on the docks and jetties. Dom couldn't see the Leviathan until a sudden plume of white foam caught his eye and a tentacle crashed down into the water. It was hard to tell how big the thing was, but any Leviathan was bad news. A relatively small one had crippled Fenmont and let hundreds of polyps loose ashore. They had to be kept far out to sea, preferably by blowing the shit out of them. Anya came jogging along the wall. We're going to try using the hammer before it gets any closer, she said. But there could be more than one out there, so everybody stay sharp. Has Garcia pinged another one? Marcus asked. Maybe. There's something else out there, but it might just be a regular whale. Or another submarine. No, Zephyr's close inshore, and Garcia knows her position. Anya looked along the walls in both directions, then headed for the steps. I'm going to give Baird a hand. If the hammer fails, then it's back to old-fashioned ballistics. Why don't the Glowies go pick on the mainland? Cole asked. What are we doing that's pissing them off so much? Maybe the Leviathan wasn't picking on them at all, just wandering by. But nobody in their right mind could pass up a chance to kill it. Dom watched a marlin, 
one of the old rigid inflatables from his commando days, zip away from the docks and head out southeast trailing a wake of foam. He trained his binoculars. Place your bets, Marcus said. Garasni. Man, I ain't afraid of a healthy risk, but those guys got a death wish. Cole shook his head. It's like they're always trying to prove they're crazier and tougher than us. It's not Garasni, Dom said. He could see the crew now, C.P.O. Muller and Commander Fine. It's the Navy. Alister Fine and Frank Muller. He'd forgotten all about Commander Fine. Everybody seemed to. The poor asshole had kept what little was left of NCOG running for years until Michelson was recalled, and then he just vanished back into the invisible task of keeping ships supplied and fueled. It wasn't much of a reward. They don't need that close a look at the thing, do they? Dom asked. Marcus didn't look happy. Maybe they're going to use a hand laser for targeting. They should have asked us. Dom was horrified to see the marlin swing wide and circle the leviathan, coming dangerously close to getting slapped by a tentacle before heading back to the dockside. It was hard to get the scale of the animal, but Dom had seen enough of them by now to work it out. It was too easy to see the tentacles, five, ten meters long, and think that was the head end, and that it was all arms and almost no body, like a squid. But it wasn't. It had a long, scaly, snake-like body several times longer than the tentacles. The vast fang maw could crunch through steel plate. And if it was lambent as well, then it wasn't just a big, dangerous bastard. It was a big, dangerous, highly explosive bastard as well, capable of generating enough energy to collapse cliffs and blow holes in bedrock. The infestation of polyps those things usually carried seemed to pale into insignificance. Fine's voice came over the radio. Control to all call signs, we have confirmation, it's lambent. Stand by for hammer deployment in thirty seconds. If it had been a regular leviathan, it was just something to be avoided instead of wasting ordnance on blowing it up. Now Anya and Baird, more Anya than Baird, Dom hoped, were going to detonate it out at sea like a stray mine. The leviathan was still on the surface its undulating back breaking the waves as its huge fanged head lifted every few meters like someone doing the breaststroke. Stick your head between your ugly legs, Cole said. Fifteen seconds. And kiss your ugly ass. Ten seconds. Goodbye, motherfucker. Firing. A beam of brilliant white light stabbed out of the sky and hit the water. But it struck twenty meters wide. The leviathan plunged beneath the surface and vanished for a few moments before popping up again, now on a different course. Dum watched it for a few seconds before he worked out that it was heading straight for the base. Control here, stand by, going again, Matheson said. Dom held his breath. That better be you this time, Anya. Fifteen. Ten. Firing. The beam hit the water even further off target. The Leviathan picked up speed, trailing foam like a powerboat. Control to all call signs, hammer is now offline. Oh, terrific, Dom said. What the hell happened? Marcus braced his elbow on the wall to side up. We've lost too many targeting sats. Can't aim the damn thing. Fine. Cole shouldered the long spear. I can aim this baby. Shit, least we're doing this in daylight for a change. The ancient cannon mounted on the walls could still hit a target, too. Dom decided there was a lot to be said for old tech. One started firing its ranging shots, striking short of the leviathan and working toward it with a slow rhythmic pom-pom-pom noise. Everyone waited for the explosion. The RD guys didn't have a lot of time before the leviathan moved inside their minimum range, and they didn't have an infinite supply of ordnance. One shell landed close enough to send a column of water crashing onto the thing, but it kept going. It didn't even slow down when the ravens passed over, well out of tentacle reach, and strafed it. And then it dived. The asshole's getting smart, Marcus said. Okay, Cole, you stay up here. Dom with me. As Dom ran after Marcus, he could hear the confusion on the radio. Nobody could follow the thing visually now. Not even the Ravens, but Garcia, Clement C.O., 
had sonar and was calling ranges. 2,000 meters, bearing off gun emplacement, Red 30. The gun battery lobbed another shell and raised a plume of water, but Garcia confirmed the worst. 1,500 meters, holding its course. Dom and Marcus running along the edge of the dock now, trying to work out where the Leviathan was going to surface. But Matheson had already plotted its course for them. Control to all call signs, it's going for the oiling jetty. Everyone get clear. I said get clear. Oh shit. Dom broke into a sprint. The Leviathan was going to smash into the fuel tanks. It was a giant pissed-off torpedo about to hit tens of thousands of liters of emulsion. It'll take out the whole jetty. Marcus sprinted ahead of him. And half the ducks. We've got to hold that asshole off somehow. Six hundred meters, said Garcia. Nobody listened to Matheson's sensible advice to get out of the blast area, least of all Dom and Marcus. They reached the pier opposite the jetty and aimed their lancers across the water waiting for something to target. If the thing surfaced just once, if it got close enough to the surface for someone to see the movement and open fire to distract it, anything at all, a small R.I.B. suddenly roared around the end of the jetty in a cloud of spray, bouncing along the surface. The boat did a spectacular turn about 300 meters out and Dom waited for it to capsize but one of the two-man crew heaved something into the water and the boat zipped clear. A few seconds later a booming explosion threw a column of spray into the air. The Leviathan surfaced fifty meters off the pier and reared out of the water, bellowing. Depth charge, Marcus said, and opened fire. Now it's pissed off. The Leviathan was going crazy. The explosion must have burst its eardrums or something, if it had any. It thrashed around, smashing splinters out of the wooden pillars jutting from the water, mouth gaping wide. Yes, eardrums. Ouch. Dom kept firing at the thing's head, watching the rounds do nothing more than send small puffs of spray into the air, but Marcus took a grenade off his belt and hefted it, ready to throw. The R.I.B. zipped around again, but closer. It was Yannick and Theodore. What are you waiting for, C.O.G.? Yannick yelled. Do it! Delicate job, Marcus muttered unfazed. He lobbed the grenade into the Leviathan's wide-open maw. The mouth snapped shut. It knew it had swallowed something. Now run! Did you set the delay? Thirty seconds. The Leviathan started panicking. It slapped down onto the water like a breaching whale. It might have been flailing randomly or it might have decided Yannick and Theodore were responsible for its pain, but either way it went after them and they shot off ahead of it at full throttle. Then it dived again. The R.I.B. looped back into the harbor. By now, other gears had come running from across the docks to see if there was anything left to shoot. Fuck. Dom watched the water, helpless. Seconds passed. The frag should have blown by now. Shit, if it's coming under the jetty again, we're screwed. Hump. The explosion was nearly a hundred meters away but it lifted the R.I.B. clear of the water. Dom lost sight of the boat for a second or two as the sea rained down on the dock and drenched him. When everything settled, Dom could see Yannick and Theodore in the R.I.B., equally soaked and bailing out with a scoop. Bits of Leviathan started floating to the surface along with a spreading carpet of stunned fish. Marcus shook his head, getting his breath again. There's risk-taking, he said. And then there's clinically insane. Like you wouldn't have done that. Depth charges. The idea seemed to fascinate Marcus. He stared at the bobbing raft of fish around the R.I.B. with a distracted frown. Ought to be easy to make some of those. They obviously can. Yannick stood up unsteadily in the boat, looking like a drowned but optimistic rat. Theodore was now trying to rake in some of the fish floating helplessly on the surface. Well, food was food. Nobody forgot that starvation was a real possibility now. Bah, you are all girls. Whole army of you equals two poor Garasni peasants. Yannick taunted the watching gears but it was all delivered with a big grin. That was a nice drop ball goal with the frag, Phoenix. Is girls game, yes? Yeah, Marcus said. 
I was the ladies' champion. Bernie and Sam jogged up to take a look. Everyone was suddenly at that giggly relief stage that followed intense and bowel-loosening terror. Yannick and Theodore were serious about not letting the stunned fish go to waste, though. Theodore had found a net and was filling the R.I.B. to the gunnels as if nothing had happened. Looks dead to me, Sam said. Nice job, Marcus. With a little help from the psychiatric ward. This is just how Garasni go fishing, Dechaska, Yannick said, leering at her from the boat. But the Leviathan got in the way. You great big Jesse. Sam had thought a bit toward Yannick. He shot stranded on sight and Dom didn't even want to know how he acquired his nickname, but it took some effort to dislike him. Look at the state of you. You pissed your pants. Ah, uh, this is just uncontrollable excitement at seeing you, my vision of loveliness. Wanker. Yannick laughed his head off, a bit too happy. Maybe he wasn't that relaxed about nearly getting spattered around the dock after all. A chunk of leviathan with a couple of tentacles still attached drifted like a raft toward the jetty on the current with a few polyps huddled on it, survivors from a shipwreck. Bernie aimed her long shot. She wasn't laughing now. And you lot can fuck right off. Her first shot hit one square in the mouth and detonated it. The watching Garasni applauded. But it couldn't have had much juice in it because it didn't take the others with it and just blew off one of the tentacles before sinking. Ah, sod it. Bernie reloaded the single cartridge and sighed it up. Okay. I'm channeling Blondie now. Bang. The polyps blew up with the usual fountain of spray. Gears cheered. For a moment, everyone was hysterically happy just to have all their limbs and not find themselves staring at a fireball engulfing the docks. Dom found he came down to earth faster these days. When he reassured himself he wasn't dead, he remembered who already was and who might be this time tomorrow. There were stalks slowly encroaching on the island and killing the crops. And there'd be other leviathans, and many, many more polyps. The number of attacks was increasing. Sam caught his arm gently, cupping his elbow. Come and have breakfast in the mess, she whispered in his ear way too close for comfort. You've got to see the tattoo I did for Rossi. Dom turned and found Bernie looking his way. She was watching with that all-seeing, all-knowing expression that sergeants always had. Weird buggers, aren't they? Bernie said. Ah, uh, she wasn't thinking about Sam at all. There's nobody I'd rather rely on than a Garasni, except a Pasanga. They'll put their lives on the line for you and laugh their arses off about it. But then I think about what they did to our boys in the war, and I just can't square it. Bernie shrugged and walked off, suddenly distracted by Theodore yelling something to her about salting the fish. Dom submitted to Sam and let her shepherd him toward the mess. I made sure I can make it more respectable later, she said, giggling. Rossi's tattoo, I mean. He had too much of Dizzy's potato hooch. Bernie was right. There were people you liked a hell of a lot and for all the right reasons, but something inside said that it was all wrong somehow. It didn't mean you could make yourself stop liking them. But you couldn't forget what the barriers were either. Yeah, we all need something to numb the pain, Dom said. Wrong world, wrong time. And wrong me. At least for a while. Chapter 13 Everybody Says They Want Answers No, they don't. Most people just want reassurance that the world is the way they already think it is. Genuine revelation, the knowledge that changes minds upsets them. And they'll hate you for doing it. Garasni Camp, New Jacinto. No, that won't lock out when he puts his weight on it. Baird said, peering at the lathe. Are you sure you know what you're doing? Sandrew went on grinding the metal pin and didn't say a word. The workshop was full of fascinating things. Scented with unfamiliar lube oils and chemicals that the COG had probably banned on toxicity grounds years ago. Yannick laughed. Blondie Baird, how many Garasni do you see on crutches or in wheelchairs? None, but that's probably because you kill and eat your wounded, right? That just made Yannick laugh louder. Even Sandrew managed a grin, the surly asshole. Baird wasn't used to getting laughs for his best lines and he rather liked it. 
This will work, Sandrew said slowly, handing him the joint. I did this in hospitals. I made legs. Your friend will need sticks maybe, but he will stand up again. Only one knee joint missing. Much easier than both knees missing. I show you why if you piss me off again. Baird found himself about to point out that Matheson wasn't actually his friend, but it sounded pathetically needy. He examined the finished joint. It wasn't a state-of-the-art modern prosthetic unit with electronics, but it was beautifully made and it wouldn't need a team of experts to maintain it. Okay, he'll think it's awesome. Now, what was the magic word? Thanks, Sandrew. Ha, we like to show Cogs our technical superiority. Now we have to make casts. This is a slow job, Corporal. Yannick wandered over to the doorway and seemed to be watching something outside. Baird kept an eye on him. Yannick was part of Tresca's personal entourage, and that meant he wasn't to be trifled with. In a community where everyone seemed to be a psychopath, that was some reputation. These guys didn't pull their punches. Ah, uh, some excitement out there, Yannick said, ambling outside. Let's see what's happening. Baird craned his neck to see where he was heading. The dirt roads between the tents were dead straight, so Baird had a clear view all the way to one of the communal areas that housed the latrines and water pumps, the equivalent of a town square in a place like this. There were an awful lot of people gathering out there. Yannick started walking faster. Then he broke into a jog. Shit. I better call in. Baird switched his radio on as discreetly as he could. He usually kept the channel open even when he was off-duty, but he didn't fancy receiving a sensitive message on the subject of disks and data when he was surrounded by Garasni. He liked them, but he wasn't stupid. Baird to Phoenix, he said quietly. Baird here, over. Go ahead, Baird. I'm in the Garasni camp, getting Matheson's legs made. Suck on that, Marcus. See, I can be a good guy too. Is there some shit going on? I can see signs of collectively bunched panties here. I mean, it might be a coup or a lynching or some domestic garasni entertainment like that, but I thought I'd check in just in case. No idea, but Hoffman and Michelson went into a huddle with Charles a couple of hours ago, and they haven't come out yet. Leviathan aftermath? No Tresca? We'll find out soon enough. Sandrew looked up at Baird over spectacles that had been repaired with very delicate wirework. Problem? Everybody's getting edgy about the attacks. Sandrew let out a long sigh. Yes, we're fucked, he said placidly, and went back to the lathe. Pity. It's nice here. Baird had to walk through the communal area to get back to the main gates. Idle curiosity made him want to find out what had sparked the gathering he could see ahead of him. But the Garasni would be doing what any civilians did at a time like this, asking questions nobody had any answers to. Damn, he'd seen this so many times back on the mainland. It couldn't be any worse than the panic over the hammer strike, that was for sure. He didn't know why he suddenly remembered that after all the shit had happened in the intervening years. But it was so vivid right then that he could smell the soot in the air and wished it would go away. He hovered on the edge of the crowd for a moment. It was a mixed bunch of a couple of hundred, men and women of all ages but no kids, and they were scared. That much he could work out. His entire command of the Garasni language consisted of yes, no, shithouse, fuck off, and a few numbers. If the meeting was a debate about identity and alienation in a post-apocalyptic world, then he was screwed. And he could hear a familiar voice, although he couldn't see where it was coming from until he sidled up to Yannick. Then he saw Tresca standing on the flatbed of a junker to make himself heard. He was laying down the law. Baird didn't understand a word of it, but Tresca was one of those guys who looked as if he was reigning in a terrible temper, twitching jaw muscles and arms held carefully at his sides as if to hint that only superior aristocratic willpower stopped him from strangling his audience barehanded. It looked a lot more scary than red-faced cursing. What is it? Baird whispered. They want a ship, Yannick said sourly. They want to leave. I bet the boss just loves the idea. Ungrateful bastards. 
After all he's done for us. We'd all be dead without him. Yannick looked like he was working up to a contemptuous spit. Or worse, stranded. Watching Tresco was hypnotic. The shouts and arguments in the crowd were reaching a crescendo, and then Tresco snapped and punched his fist into his palm. He repeated something over and over, hitting his palm each time, and finally Baird recognized enough of the words to understand. Numbers. Tresco was repeating a number. Four thousand. Four thousand. Combined with a sweeping gesture, it was suddenly obvious. He was reminding them there were just four thousand Garasni left, and that splitting up would finish them. So you don't have some secret navy out there then? Baird whispered. Yannick frowned. What? The weird radio transmissions. That's not you then. Yannick managed to look away from the crowd. And it's not you? Shit, no. Baird wished he'd kept his big mouth shut. God, what was he thinking? Hoffman would kill him. But it was too late now. We thought it was you. Oh, so we really trust each other. Great. Well, that's still a frigging mystery then. Baird grabbed the chance to get out before he sank any deeper in the shit. And if your guys are losing it, ours are probably descending into cannibalism right about now. I'd better go sweep up the debris. Baird hurried off, chastened by seeing the Garasni having internal spats. They always look solid and unflappable, so couldn't give a shit. He was a bit disappointed to realize they were as fucked up and scared as anyone else. He checked inside his armor to make sure the data disk was still there, like he did twenty times a day, and walked through the main gates. Well, if Hoffman yelled at him for mentioning the data bursts, he could always defend himself with what he'd found out. It wasn't the Garasni transmitting them. He'd hold that nugget up in front of him like a riot shield. He caught up with Cole on the walls and they leaned on the brickwork, watching the activity on the parade ground. A few weeks ago, it had been a model of military order, an open space despite the number of civilians who still had to live inside the base while the engineers built more housing. Now it looked like a Silver Era village, complete with farm animals, machinery that should have been in a museum, and eye-wateringly bad smells. There just weren't that many places left to put 3,000 extra people, especially when everyone else had been pulled back inside the existing camp perimeters. Shit, is that a goat? Baird asked, pointing. Cole followed his finger. No, that's just a freaky sheep. Some of them have horns, too. Goats are skinny and got them crazy-looking eyes. Yeah, like that redhead who dishes up in the mess. Hey, since when did you become Farmer Giles? Baby, we're slipping back in time every time we lose a piece of machinery. A guy's gotta know his sheep from his goats these days. This place is turning into a frigging zoo. Baird decided he'd rely on Bernie for all this frontiersman shit. I even found one of them scratching around near my workshop. It's just a few chickens, Cole said, and some dogs. Animals are real good early warning systems for stocks. I meant the civilians said Baird. They always knew their place in Jacinto. They're even getting pissy in the Garasni camp. And old Tresca the Terrible ain't smacked em around? Not yet. There's a bunch of them that want to take a ship and make a run for it. Gonna be plenty more where they came from. It's move to another island, or head home. Me, I call that frying pan or fire. Some of those pirate guys live at sea. Yeah, like you'd enjoy that. Didn't say I would. Just speculatin dot. Baird's radio interrupted the discussion. Briefing from Hoffman in his old office, fifteen minutes. Marcus said. Must be a select gathering. Baird said. It's not a big room. We're going to recon the mainland. It had to be done, sooner or later. It was just the timing. Baird and Cole headed for Admiralty House, weaving between tractors. The place looked like a paramilitary county fair. Well, that's really going to stoke the rumor mill, Baird said. It's no big deal. Cole took it placidly like he always did. We gotta know what's out there now. When they reached the office, Hoffman was already there with Michelson, Charles, Marcus, Dom, and Gettiner. Gettiner? 
They must have performed surgery to get her out of that frigging cockpit, let alone lure her to an actual meeting. Everyone was crammed in, leaning against filing cabinets or standing with arms tightly folded. Hoffman wasn't a big office kind of guy and seemed to feel safer in small spaces. The room smelled of barley coffee and floor polish. I hear there's some trouble in the Garasini camp, Hoffman said. There was no sign of Prescott. Someone else taking pot shots at Trescu? No, he's trying to hold his happy campers together. Brazen it out. Don't act guilty. I don't speak the language, but a bunch of them want to leave Vex, and he's telling them it'll finish the Garasni as a nation. Hoffman gave him a dubious look. For a man who doesn't speak the language, you pick up a lot. Well, Tresca's body language is pretty vivid, Baird said. He'd save the news about the data burst until Charles was out of the way, but maybe he knew anyway. Anyway, Yannick translated for me. We're going to recon a coastal strip from Corin to the north, Hoffman said. We've got enough fuel now, and we might get as far as Jacinto. We've got to start assessing what's out there or we can't make informed decisions about staying here. Who's we? Does Prescott know? Of course he does, Michelson said. With the long-range fuel tanks, we'll have space for five in the Raven. We've got to have Royston on board, and I think we need Tresco for diplomatic reasons as much as anything, so I'll take a back seat. That leaves you, Victor, and two gears for security. Volunteers? Hoffman said. Prescott isn't coming. Should we read anything into that? Marcus asked. He said he'd only be going out of curiosity, and that it was more important to send personnel who could assess the situation professionally. Baird found a space on the edge of the desk to perch his ass. As in, the raven might not make it back. It'll be back. Gediner said flatly. He's just making sense again. Okay, me and Dom. Marcus said. Baird and Cole can help the captain here look after Prescott's richly varied needs. He's got Lowe and Rivera for that, Baird said. So you can keep an eye on them too, said Marcus. Done. Hoffman looked pointedly at Charles. Anything else you want done, Royston, now's the time to shout. Charles shrugged. We could do with Perry along, but we can save him for the follow-up recon. Maybe sail to the mainland and fly the Raven off deck next time. It'll give us a better range. Okay, tomorrow morning, people, 0800 on the landing pad. Hoffman stood back to let Charles and Michelson squeeze out of the room. He tapped Baird on the arm when they'd gone. I'm going to go see Tresca now. What's the mood like over there? It's just some asshole called Narisai whining. Nothing Tresca can't slap down. Baird said. Now's the time. Do it. And, well, you know that data burst shit? The Garasni thought it was us. I told them we thought it was them. Baird blurted it out and braced for one of Hoffman's incandescent rages. So it's stranded, or else the polyps have worked out how to use a radio dial despite the lack of thumbs. He's going to shoot me. Disc or no disc. I'm dead. So very, very dead. Surprisingly, Hoffman didn't ignite. He just looked a little more battered and tired. Well, at least that's one thing less to worry about. But we still don't know who it is. Cole said. It's not Trescu. Hoffman said. And that means we've still got an ally who's playing straight with us. Baird took the data disc out of his armor, relieved at escaping Hoffman's wrath. Maybe it's time we let him have a go at this. He knows just about everything else that we do. When the time's right, Hoffman said. And the priority is having a contingency plan. King Raven KR-80, and route for the mainland, next morning. You think we're going to keep this quiet? Dom asked. Once people find out we're flying recons, they'll think we're preparing to ship out. So we tell them, Hoffman said. And we tell them we'll be doing it on a regular basis because that was the plan. Prescott's adamant about that. He can be most persuasive. Tresca murmured. He was wearing one of those old-fashioned UR radio headsets, bulky things compared to the COG models. The more open you are, 
the less people mistrust you, even if you're stealing their wallets. Hoffman sat opposite Dom, arms folded, jammed up against Royston Charles. Tresca gazed out of the other door, while Marcus sat listening to the radio net with his hand to his ear. Barbara was behind the door gun, messing around with the camera in his lap. From time to time he went and sat up front in the cockpit with Gediner. It wasn't exactly a high-spirited office outing. Marcus leaned back in his seat. Okay, we've lost the signal. We're definitely out of radio range. We can't rely on the global sats staying operational much longer. Better not get into difficulties then, Tresca said. Or let Baird use the hammer again. Get in her cut in on the radio, probably because she was fed up hearing them bitch, Dom decided. Okay, here's the latest fuel calculation. We've got enough to cover a 50-kilometer coastal strip to just north of Jacinto. Depending on the conditions we might get further inland, but I'm not taking any chances. If we see anything worth a closer look, we come back with a ship and fly a raven off it. Okay? Understood. Hoffman picked up his lancer and hugged it as if he had plans for it. I'm not expecting to find a beach resort and make a down payment. We're just assessing the degree of stock infestation for now. Tresca took a small monocular from his belt pouch. It was a satin polished black tube with intricate gold work at each end, very old, probably the same era as that antique wristwatch he always wore. Dom doubted it was a fashion thing or even the only device he had, because he could simply have used a detached rifle scope. No, this stuff was his father's, or maybe his grandfather's, a comforting link with a happier past. Dom understood that all too well. He put his hand to his collar and felt for his COG tag, intertwined with Maria's necklace. Little cherished things like that made the difference in a world that was becoming more terrifying and alien by the day. If and when we leave Vex, Tresca said, I intend to resettle Gorisnea, even if it means living on board Perak in Branaska Harbor. I don't think we've got enough fuel to check it out, Commander, Gedina said. Not on this trip, anyway. I know. Tresk appeared through the monocular again. I'm simply saying it to ensure that I do it. Marcus got up and went to stand at the door gun. Nobody spoke. Dom looked at Hoffman and caught his eye. Hoffman shrugged. And the gate, he said suddenly. And the gad. I ought to give it its proper name. Get in her huffed. Colonel, that's way out of range and you know it. I'm just saying that if I return to the mainland, I'd like to go back there one day. If this had been a bunch of ordinary guys talking over a beer about moving house, it would have been idle conversation. But this was two men who'd decide the fate of the last organized human society on Sarah. Dom felt his stomach not they were hard men who'd spent their entire adult lives in combat, and here they were talking nostalgically as if they were now looking for the best place to lay down and die and Tresco was roughly Dom's age. But if he thinks it's the end game, he's right, isn't he? Because we're running out of everything. Time. Resources. Land. People. Hope. Hoffman gazed up at the deckhead. He was still chewing it all over. See, I can defend Anvigat, stocks or no fucking stocks, he said, almost to himself. We could hold that place against any goddamn thing. That was more like it. That was the Hoffman Dom knew and believed in. Dom decided not to point out that stocks could probably punch up through the fort as easily as they had on Vex. Not a lot of room in there, though, sir, he said. Five or six thousand people at most, Sam says. Not big enough for us. Yeah. Intimate. But with a water supply and hydroelectricity, and a damned good view, nearly 360 degrees. Hoffman turned in his seat and stared out onto the sea below again. But you're right. We need to find somewhere big enough to house a city. I keep telling you, Charles said wearily. We won't find anywhere with the kind of infrastructure we need. That's why we ended up on Vex. We ended up on Vex because it was warmer and Prescott suggested it, Hoffman said. We could try Port Farrell again if infrastructure is all we need, but it isn't. 
It's about being able to respond to threats. Hoffman rubbed his forehead and said nothing. It seemed to be an argument they'd had before. Nobody had any easy options, and Dom didn't need Charles' qualifications to work it out. If there was anywhere habitable within easy reach left on the mainland, then Stranded would have found it. And if they'd found it, they'd either already stripped it of every usable plank of wood and scrap of metal, or they'd taken over the place. Nobody was in the mood for more fighting even if they'd had unlimited ammo. We've rebuilt once, Marcus said. Dom wasn't sure what had prompted him to say that. Maybe it was a thought from a conversation in his head that had just spilled out. So we can do it again. They still had a few hours before they hit the coast, so Dom shut his eyes and dozed. He'd spent two wars desperate for sleep, dreaming of a day when he could just ignore Reveille or switch off the alarm, and now he had his chance. It was surprisingly easy to sleep in a helicopter. The vibration was blissfully numbing and after a while the engine just became white noise. He didn't surface until someone shook him, Trescu, of all people, and he woke with a start. Barbara gestured down and pointed out of the bay door. Dom leaned over to look, expecting to see the coastline of southern Tyrus. He could see a coast, all right, but he could also see what looked like a mangrove delta stretching for kilometers. It wasn't made up of trees. It was a forest of stalks. Oh God, he said. The stranded weren't kidding. They're here too. It's just the shallows, Barbara said. They're the first we've seen. There was nothing out in deeper water. Dom almost pointed out that Barbara had only covered a narrow strip in a vast ocean, so for all they knew the stalks were springing up like bristles everywhere else. But that was the kind of parade pissing that Bear did. Dom kept his mouth shut. We're coming up on Corin, Gedina said. Barbara left the gun to grab recon images. But when I say we turn back, we turn back, okay, Colonel? I'm not taking risks with fuel if we don't have radio contact with base. I'll man the gun, Marcus said. I'm more worried about stranded taking pot shots. Last time we saw Corin, they had a goddamn army. That's my kind of thinking, Phoenix. They won't have forgotten how much they love us. The stalks thinned out as they got closer to the city, but when Gediner dropped lower, Dom could see some poking up through the buildings. The ravens circled over the center of town, but there were no signs of life at all. This used to be a really busy place. Gedina said. Thousands of stranded. Well, it's not busy now. Charles said. Stranded keep moving. It's how they've survived this long. Sarah looked like a wasteland, but over the years Dom had become attuned to the small detail that said a place was inhabited, smoke, attempts to tend crops, even seabirds that hung around looking for garbage left by messy humans. The bigger settlements like Corin had sentries and observation posts you could see from the air. But there was nothing like that down there now. Marcus unfolded a chart. Okay, Major. Go east along the coastal highway. Look for the athletics track. There were certain places that Stranded preferred. Every gear knew they liked reservoirs, river estuaries, high outcrops or tall buildings that could be defended, and sports stadiums. Stadiums were ready-made forts. Okay, Gedina said. I see it. And everybody keep an eye open for ground fire. Dom rested his lancer on his knee as the raven descended. All that was left of the stadium was a skeleton of girders, but the lower half of the walls were intact enough to make the place defensible. Gideoner circled cautiously as Dom kept an eye out for signs of habitation. There was nothing inside but a few ramshackle huts that were too dilapidated to be in use. Over there, Hoffman said wearily. Stocks. Two of them. Gideoner skimmed close alongside. The stocks looked long dead. Dom strained to see any signs of the pods on the trunks, but there was no way of telling what had been a blister and what was just gnarling now that they were just gray husks. Hey, what's the one thing we haven't seen here yet? Barbara asked. Marcus nodded. Dead zones. Yeah, but we haven't covered any grasslands so far, Dom said. That's next on the tour. Gediner turned north. 
Reservoir at Hatton, Marcus? Yeah. I'd be surprised if the Stranded abandoned that. It's like being the first explorers, Barbara said. We've got no idea what's down there now. Well, except we've got accurate maps. We know the geography and the shape of the coastline. Except Jacinto Bay. Marcus studied his chart. I think we made that a lot bigger. Nobody asked the obvious. Were they going to take a look at Jacinto's submerged crater? Dom hadn't thought much about it since they'd escaped the flood, but now the prospect of having to look at it again seemed unbearable. Maria was down there in the tunnel somewhere with the drowned grubs and the gears who died fighting them. I couldn't even bury her. I couldn't even take her back to Mercy and let her rest alongside her folks. Maybe I can at least take her necklace back there one day. Absolutely not, Gedina said. They'd all been together so long that they all knew what the others were thinking. I'm not diverting to Jacinto unless the colonel's got a really pressing reason to see it. Hoffman shifted in his seat. Don't think I have, Major. Not yet, anyway. Dom counted eleven stocks on the way to Hatton, all of them in built-up areas. On the way out of town, the concrete gave way to woodland and big gardens so overgrown that it was hard to make out the boundary fences. Stock, Barbara called. The raven passed over a park. The metal structure of a kid's climbing frame and a bandstand were still visible poking above the ocean of unmown grass like icebergs, but the wooden planks had been stripped off. Let's take a look. Well, most of the grass is still alive. Get in her headed for the stock. As the raven passed directly above it, Dom could see a pool of bare soil stretching for about twenty meters around it. Oh, yeah, that's a dead zone. But at least we know it stops eventually. Actually, we don't, because we can't tell how recent that is. Barbara said. Colonel, how do you feel about trying to raise some stranded on the radio? Hoffman glanced at Tresca, but he didn't twitch at the mention of the word. Hoffman nodded. It's got to be done, Corporal. But let's see if we can eyeball any first. The reservoir was visible for kilometers, a lovely lake from a distance. But the closer they got, the more they could pick out the shabby detail of a shantytown around its man-made shoreline. Smoke curled up from the rooftops. They were stranded here, all right. Well, they can't miss a raven, and we're the only guys flying these days, Gedina said. You want me to flash them, Colonel, just to show manners? They usually hog the old emergency frequencies. Grit your teeth and be charming, Major. Charm offensive acquiring target. Stranded encampment, this is COGKR80. The big black noisy thing heading your way, over. Dom listened for the response, watching Marcus's reaction, completely blank, all emotion locked down, and then Hoffman's, which was a kind of glum resignation. There was a long delay. Gittiner circled and tried again. This is KR802, this is the reservoir, COG. We heard you. It was a woman's voice. You've been out of town a while. What do you want? Water? Cause we got plenty of that if you want to trade. Hoffman cut in. We want information. Who's that? This is Colonel Victor Hoffman. Who? we got the brass coming to inspect us. Damn, we might even clear the dead dogs off the carpet for you. What's in it for us, COG? Fuel. Get in her snap back at Hoffman on the Raven's internal circuit. No, we haven't, Colonel. A five-liter can won't kill us. Shit, sir. Hoffman ignored her protest. Reservoir, we're planning to land. You tell us what you know about the state of the mainland, and I'll give you fuel. Deal? Mainland? That's us, right? Sounds like you ran a long way away when you skipped town. I said deal? Why not? Just stay back from the houses, okay? Barber patted the door gun. You bet, he muttered. The raven set down a cautious distance from the edge of the shanty and everyone checked their weapon. Even Shaw was carrying a pistol this time. Marcus and Hoffman got out first and Dom decided to stick close to Trescu in case the temptation to slot a few more despised stranded got the better of him. A small crowd of armed stranded, mainly men, gathered to block their way into the camp. 
The prodigals have come home, then. A woman aged about forty stepped forward, all tight braided red hair and beads. When Dom looked more closely, he could see the beads were actually wedding bands, steel nuts, and coins, small barter currency. Either you're nursing a delusion that it's safe to come home, or you're in the shit. She got that right on both counts. It's dumb. Most of the stranded leaders Dom had come across in the later years of his search for Maria were women, at least in the larger camps. They seemed better at holding a big community together than the male stranded. He suspected it was less about the maternal wisdom thing than the fact they were more ruthless. Marcus took a casual step forward next to Hoffman, cradling his lancer, but said nothing. Just checking how far the stalks have got, ma'am, Hoffman said. Have there been any polyp attacks? Some. She looked Marcus over, then Dom, and then Trescu. He didn't seem to provoke a reaction in her, but then maybe Gorisnea didn't mean much down here. The bad news is we're seeing him more often. The good news is that we haven't seen a grub since the end of last summer, thank God. Why do you give a damn? You crapped your pants and ran away last year, didn't you? We hear you sank Jacinto. That's why you haven't seen any grubs, Marcus said, polite but pissed off. We drowned them when they tried to tunnel under the city. My, my, the COG's finally done something for us. Where did you go, then? The Serrano Ocean. Hoffman had obviously decided there was no harm telling them. The stranded grapevine worked so well that they probably heard it from the pirates anyway. There are islands out there. Very nice. Look, we're just trying to establish the extent of the stocks and if anywhere's habitable. The woman laughed. Why, are you thinking of coming back? One day, yes. Goddamn. You're serious. What happened to Corin? Same as all the city camps. Stocks. There's something those things like about cities. You're talking on the radio to a camp one day, and the next it's gone. Garenholt? Not a word for months. How about further afield, Bonburg? No. Avery was broadcasting up to three weeks ago, though. Hoffman took a breath. How about Anvil Gate? Or Branasca? You're into the history books now, Colonel. Nobody went near Anvil Gate, ever. Too many kill crazy savages up there in the hills. And too damn far. She paused. And Branascu never heard of it. Dom wasn't sure if that was a relief to Hoffman or not. Trescu didn't say a word. He just stood there completely motionless, staring straight into the camp, not even blinking much. No, these folks didn't know what a Garasni was, which was just as well. Are there any big camps other than yours? You're racking up your fuel bill, soldier. Are there? Not many. The woman stared past him at the raven. Dom turned slowly to see what she was looking at. Gittiner was now on the door gun and Barber was hauling a couple of ten-liter fuel cans out of the raven. You want my advice? The woman asked. Stay on your island. We've survived everything so far, your hammer of dawn, the grubs, the glowies, by being small. So everyone called them glowies. Dom decided that was proof they were in contact with the seagoing gangs. We've got just enough people to keep a tribe going, but not too many when we need to move fast. So if you come back here and try to set up a big-ass city again, you're just going to be a sitting target for the stocks and the glowies with all the legs, and whatever else is coming. She lowered her voice. Cause it is coming. Now give me my fuel and run on back to your nice little island. Hoffman seemed to give in pretty fast, almost as if he wanted to get out, and something had made up his mind that this was a waste of time. He touched his cap politely. Much obliged, ma'am. Here's your fuel. High-grade emulsion. Yeah, there's a river of the stuff at Descano Hill now. She said if you don't mind the glowies. But she walked up and took the cans like bags of groceries when Barbara put them down. Dom was impressed by a woman who could lift two heavy cans that easily. Only the toughest lasted long as stranded. Dom moved off cautiously, hoping that Gettiner was as good a shot as Barbara while they had their backs to the stranded. But nobody put around between their shoulder blades. 
They piled back into the raven and lifted off. Glowies in emulsion again, Marcus said, looking down at the reservoir dwindling beneath them. You know what Baird would say. What do you think, Royston? Hoffman asked. You know what I think, Charles said. That woman nailed it. Stranded survive because they're small, mobile, hard-to-hit targets. Low resource use, low profile. What are you saying? That moving a whole population out here is going to be a lot harder than relocating to Vex was. Yeah. I know. We won't find an empty city capable of housing thousands ready for us to move into anyway. We could look at resettling Port Farrell, but that would mean preparing the place before we shifted the whole population, and that would take gears and resources away from Vex for months. Yeah, but we can't split up into groups of a few thousand, Marcus said. People are used to a city with organization and specialist defense. They'd have a tough time fending for themselves. Defending a chain of villages would overstretch us. Hoffman looked at Charles, then Trescu. These were the guys who were going to make the call. It looked to Dom like they'd had this argument a lot in the last few weeks. Then we have to find a way of staying put, Hoffman said. Because we can't split up and maintain any semblance of a goddamn society. Tresca just nodded. As the raven tracked north, Dom could see more stalks and land and some shattered cities that almost looked as if they'd been impaled on them. The reality was dawning. They could either stay on Vex and hope the stalks held off, or they could become like those desperate little camps struggling to eke out an existence here. Dom was suddenly scared that they were all talking themselves into it. Fuck that, sir, he said. If we come back we'll end up like the Stranded, so what's it all been for? We could have done that years ago. We needn't have fought to defend anywhere. We could have just run and stayed out of the grub's way. Maybe a lot more folks would still be alive now. I know, Dom. Hoffman took off his cap and rubbed his scalp one-handed. You think I don't lie awake at night wondering if I balls the whole thing up and wasted lives? Sorry, sir, yeah. Just frustrated. The last thing Dom wanted was to make Hoffman feel bad about things that had never been under his control in the first place. He leaned across and patted the old bastard's knee. If it was a choice between the COG and losing the last few people he cared about, the COG could go screw itself. Colonel Hoffman's quarters, Vex Naval Base, Gale, 15 A.E. Mac was drinking from the toilet bowl again. Bernie watched him lapping for a while and decided it wouldn't do him any harm as long as Hoffman didn't catch him doing it. Where's your table manners? She rubbed his ears when he came up for air. Yeah, you're taking advantage of your old mum, aren't you? You're not an invalid anymore. Buck up, soldier. He looked at her with pitifully sad brown eyes, but then that was how Deerhound Crosses always looked. It got him a handful of rabbit jerky every time. He chewed it as if he was humoring her and trotted across the room to flop onto Hoffman's bed, as if his long legs had finally given way under him. I know the feeling, sweetie, she said. Come on, you can't sleep there. You know Vic goes ballistic. Especially when he's had a bad week. Mac just stretched out the full length of the mattress and shut his eyes. Bernie went back to the mirror over the wash basin and carried on braiding her hair into rows but she was so engrossed in the fiddly job of tying them off that she didn't hear Hoffman coming this time, not until he let rip at Mac. He stood in the doorway like he was doing an unannounced kit inspection. Come on, off. He snapped his fingers at Mac, but the dog just opened one eye and decided he didn't really mean it. Frigging dog hairs all over the place. Bernie, can't you keep this animal off the furniture? He's convalescing. My ass. I could get over a heart bypass faster. What are you doing? Plating my hair. Keeps it tidy. Not a problem I have to wrestle with. Hoffman reached across the basin to inspect his personal bar of soap, a precious commodity in a world without shops. Taken for granted groceries had become handmade luxuries. Goddamn. There's dog hairs all over this. Sorry. And you've been using my razor again. Yeah. Sorry, love. It wasn't really about the razor. 
He'd been ranting ever since he came back from the mainland. He didn't normally hold anything back from her, so she was getting worried. Do you want to talk about it? He picked the dog hairs off the soap with just a little too much concentration. What hair? I gave up that stuff a long time ago. Come on, Vic. We've both been through a lot worse than this. There's always a fix. Hoffman put the soap back on the side of the basin and sat down on the bed, ignoring Max's attempt to slobber over him. I like clarity, he said. It's never been this hard before. Even the hammer strikes. We were pretty sure what the options were. We'll know when to run. You can't make a decision yet. It's probably not even yours to make. Hoffman smiled ruefully. See, you always nail it. We've had a lot of practice at running Vic. It's different this time. Yeah, we're stuck on an island. That wasn't what I meant. He braced his elbows on his knees, head bowed. Charles Wright. If we have to evacuate, then our only chance on the mainland is dispersing in small groups. We'd be spread over a hell of a big area. Beats keeping all your eggs in one basket. But how do we defend the settlements? How do we stay organized as a state? Who gets the doctors, the gears, the ravens? Do we abandon the emulsion field here, or try to keep drilling and shipping the stuff back to the mainland? That's routine stuff, Vic. We've always been concentrated in one defensible area before. He didn't say the word stranded. But that was probably what was getting to him. She understood his fears only too well because she'd been there too. It wasn't just the animosity between the COG and the Hammer Strike survivors who felt betrayed and abandoned by it. It was about somehow becoming less than human. I survived the worst of it out there on my own, Bernie said. All I had was a couple of rifles and a knife. A COG made up of villages can make it too. Hoffman took off his armor and stacked it by the bed. Then he pulled something out of his shirt pocket and handed it to her. Charles drawn up a list of plans. Everything from staying put here to returning to Port Farrell, to breaking up into five groups or ten or fifty, to living at sea on the ships indefinitely. Lots of options, and none of them good. Bernie took the folded sheets of paper, still trying to work out why this was hitting him harder than she expected. Perhaps it was cumulative, that he'd had to do so much shit, year upon year, crisis after crisis and now it had finally reached critical mass and felled him. Doesn't that reassure you? she asked. Her mind was now on the small detail that she understood all too well, food production. How would they divide up the livestock? How would they farm on the mainland? And how are we going to deploy gears if we're hundreds of kilometers apart and we don't have enough fuel? It was starting to sink in. It wasn't the scale of the logistics that was getting to Hoffman. It was people. It was the possibility of a tight-knit family being broken up. But that wouldn't affect us. Bernie realized she'd assumed that the important people, the people she liked and cared about, would always be together at the heart of this. Delta Squad would always be there, as would Dizzy. Hoffman, Michelson, Trescu. And even Prescott would still be running the show. It was just the civilians who would be affected. But it wouldn't be that way and now she knew it. The settlements would need to run themselves and that meant the command would need to be divided too. Got any places in mind? She unfolded the handwritten papers and leafed through them. Charles Neat Draftsman's lettering listed names of places that meant little to her until she saw one out of alphabetical order. Anvil Gate. Bernie couldn't imagine many people who wanted to end up there. She wasn't sure if it was possible to know a man too well but she could certainly think like Hoffman. He'd say it was a pragmatic choice, a place he didn't just know like the back of his hand but that he'd also held under siege, and he would have been right. And he couldn't get the place out of his system. She grabbed him in a playful headlock and rubbed her knuckles vigorously on his scalp. She could feel the slight drag of stubble. He didn't even protest. You daft old sod, she said. This is the worst scenario plan. We could still be here in ten years. I prefer to think the worst and get a nice surprise. But I'm still waiting for one of those. Well, there's me. 
You weren't expecting to see me alive again. That's true. He nodded, staring past her at nothing in particular. You'd come to Anvil Gate with me, right? Even if it meant losing contact with your buddies? She hadn't really thought that through, but the answer was automatic. Goes without saying. I thought it was best to check. But I keep the dog. Sure. I know where I fit in the pecking order. He was trying to make a joke of it all, but he'd never been much good at that. He took off his holster belt, draped it over a chair, and vanished into the cramped bathroom to run the shower. Shit. I'm sorry, Bernie. Just venting. It might never come to that, but you have to think the unthinkable. She went on braiding her hair. Max scrambled off the bed and sat by the door, looking at it expectantly. I know. Look, I'm taking a patrol out to see if we can find Seb Edler's animals. We're going to need them. Promise me you won't have hysterics if I'm late back. She heard the soap drop on the shower tray, then nothing except for the hammering water. Vic? The water stopped, and he was so quiet that she wondered if he'd collapsed. He was a heart attack kind of bloke. Vic? You okay? Goddamn, just like the old days. Just remembering the last time I stood in a shower telling someone. Telling Margaret that the world was going to ratchet, that's all. Bernie could gauge where he'd reached on the despair scale now, the final days before Prescott decided to deploy the hammer. He hadn't even told his wife the strikes were coming until he was allowed to. She knew he despised himself for that. You can talk about her, Vic, Bernie said. You can say her name. Don't shut out the dead, or else you erase them. Okay. I won't have hysterics. He was still sidestepping the issue. Who are you taking? Girls' day out. She said. Anya and Sam. And Alex Brand. She says she's getting skills fade. Two sergeants on one patrol. Hoffman emerged, toweling his back. Two women in a kitchen. Marcus and I manage it. Yeah. But he's Marcus. He tried to ruffle her hair, thwarted by the unfamiliar braids, and settled for a peck on the cheek instead. See you later, babe. Don't take any stupid risks for a few cows. She picked up her long shot. We're just doing girls' stuff. Bringing back the groceries. Mac perked up and trotted after her. He wasn't terrific on steep stairs. Here was a dog that would fight polyps and take down armed stranded, but needed a bit of encouragement to walk down flights of steps. No, that was unfair. He actually seemed to be limping this time. When they got to the ground floor, Bernie examined his paws. He flinched and whimpered. Okay, maybe you're not swinging the lead, she said. You want to stay behind and take a nap? Vic won't mind. Then I'll get Doc Hayman to take a look at you when I get back. She gestured up the stairs, but he sat gazing at her, looking a little martyred. He wanted to stick with his mum. She gave him a piece of rabbit, and he trotted after her across the parade ground. Sam was loading the pack horse with Alex Brand while Anya sat on the tailgate, poring over recon images. Max snuffled on the photographs and then squeezed past her to jump into the back. Ooh, like the hair, Sarge, Sam said. Alex looked up and frowned. Very South Islands. Bernie did a twirl. Everybody ready for the roundup? Shouldn't we take the farmer along? Don't cows recognize people? They do. But I don't want to take a skittish civvy back into the contaminated zone. Bernie reached into the pack horse and pulled out a small sack of cattle nuts. This is doggy treats for cows. Shake this bag at them and you're their friend for life. I'm not going to pretend I'm confident about this. Goat's fine. Cow's scary. And there's a bull, too. We might just find chunks if they've run into polyps. Bernie opened the driver's door. And don't forget we've got two missing dogs as well. Now I've got to move one of the herd before we go, so let's familiarize ourselves with basic cow recognition. Everyone knows what a cow looks like, don't they? Alex climbed into the back seat with Sam. I think so, Mataki, she said. 
She had a half-smoked cigar tucked in the rolled cuff of her sleeve and her hair was dyed a vivid red. Bernie wasn't sure what she used to keep it that color but it had to be a wild plant dye. If she'd found it herself, that was a survival skill of sorts. There was hope for the girl yet. I'd better get a stake out of this. Bernie didn't know Alex well, but she knew that Baird hated her guts, and that was enough to make her wary. For a moment, Bernie felt a pang of uneasiness at being among strangers. She was used to deploying with certain people, gears she staked her life on, and all she could think about was how hard it would be to be separated from them even if Hoffman was with her. For fuck's sake. After all this, after all I've survived, and I'm scared of change that'll save my life. Bernie had survived two wars. She'd fought the grubs back in the islands, she'd sailed halfway around Sarah, she'd been raped, she'd nearly starved to death, and she'd killed stranded out of revenge. It was hard to believe that there was anything left to scare her at this stage of her life, but she was back where she belonged, and she didn't want to leave. Place had nothing to do with it. It was all about people. The pack horse wove through a crowded naval base that now reminded Bernie far too much of a stranded encampment. An overwhelming need to rejoin the COG army had sent her on a terrible journey across Sarah, and fear of descending into savagery like the stranded she encountered along the way had kept her going, even when it would have been so easy to just lay down and die. God! What's going to be left of us? Anya tapped the back of her hand discreetly as it rested on the gear lever. Are you okay, Bernie? Just getting old, ma'am. Not you. You're indestructible. Mom always said so. So was the COG. It had always felt permanent, embedded in history, the invincible world power. There'd been tough times, but the COG went on regardless and even a global war spanning generations couldn't bring it to its knees. Now it was cowering on a remote island, clinging to an old enemy for comfort. How long had it actually existed? A century, that was all. It was just a blink in the history of Sarah. Everything had its time. Yeah, I'm good at survival, Bernie said. I've even got a batch to say so. Every person on this island was a survivor. Everyone here was alive despite the grubs or the hammer strike or both. Bernie tried not to think about the vast majority of people across Sarah, the billions who had simply done the ordinary, inevitable thing and died.